In this tutorial, we will create a BMI app that can work with metric and imperial units, an iOS theme calculator that also has a light mode, and a Photoshop-inspired app that can change the brightness, vibrance, rotation, scale, and lots more of any image. To make them, I will use tkinter, the default user interface framework in Python, and I will cover all of it before making the apps. I start with the basics, things like buttons, sliders, and text. Then I go over how to create pretty much any kind of layout, including responsive and scrollable ones. Finally, I cover styling, which will include animations, themes, and scaling images. By the end of this video, you should be able to create basically any kind of user interface in Python. And if you enjoyed this video, check out my paid course where I cover seven additional apps. A responsive weather app, an iOS timer, a map viewer, a paint app, a stock market tracker, a snake game, and a QR code generator. You can get the course for about $15, and buying it helps me massively to create these larger videos. And well, with that, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Alright, so let's get started with T Kinter. And already, I want to start by making one app that is going to be very simple, but it is going to look something like this. In here, we are converting miles to kilometers. We have an entry field, we can type any kind of number, and if you convert it, you get the output in kilometers. A very simple app, but it is going to cover all of the basics of tkinter. Although, let's talk about these basics first. To make any kind of app in tkinter, you need three major components. The first one is called widgets. If I show the app again, a widget, for example, could be a button, it could be some text, it could be an entry field. All of these are widgets. tkinter has quite a few of them. You're going to learn all of them. Although for now, I'm only going to cover three different ones. Text, an entry field, a button, and another bit of text. Besides that, we have layout. This one determines how the widgets are arranged on the window. For example, in the app you can see here, we have a top-down arrangement where we have three different rows. And then inside of the middle one, in here, we have two different columns. One for the entry field and one for the button. This would be a very simple layout. Obviously, you can make much more complex ones. Finally, we have style. Style, for example, determines the color of the button, the font of the text, the size of this text, and so on. We could also set the background color and lots of different things. All of this is inside of the style. If you understand these three main components, you are going to have a fairly easy time designing whatever kind of app you want to create in tkinter. That being said, each of these parts can be quite extensive, and I have lots of videos on every single one of them, and to understand them in detail, it is going to take you some hours. Now, to get started with this app here, I am going to skip over a lot of the details that I will cover in future videos. So, let me explain how you can follow along for this video. There are three ways you can approach this. How I would recommend you to follow along is to download the code and then just play around with the code and follow along as I create this app from scratch. That way, you're not going to get too lost and you can just play around and change some individual values and see what happens. Besides that, you can also follow from scratch and don't worry too much about the details. Because at this stage, you don't really need to understand every single bit, you just need to have a very basic overview of how tkinter works with all of the individual bits. Finally, you can also skip this video and go straight into the separate parts. You are not going to miss anything. Although I guess if you follow this video, you have a tiny bit of a head start to see how the different parts connect with each other. But just to emphasize for this video, you don't have to understand every single bit of tkinter. I am just going to cover the really basics and over the next couple of videos, we're going to flesh out all of this in a lot of detail. So just relax, follow along, and if you understand even 10%, you already have a really good start. So let's jump in and let's create an app. Here I have a completely empty Python file. And to get started, I want to import tkinter, and this is usually abbreviated as tk. Besides that, I also want from tkinter import ttk. Inside of ttk, we have all of the widgets that we actually want to use, while tk gives us the basic logic. Once we have that, we can create a window, or the main window we put everything else on. This we create with tk and then tk. This we have to call, it's going to return an object that I want to store inside of a window variable. 
For this one, you do want to be careful here with what letters are uppercase and lowercase. Basically, everything is lowercase besides the second T. With this, we have a window. Although, if I run the app now, nothing is going to happen. Although we don't have a crash, that's usually a good start. To actually see something, we have to call what is called the main loop. Let me add another section here called run, and I want to call the main loop method on the object we just created. Now if I run this, we have a basic window. And on this window, we can already make some changes. For example, I can get the window and set a title. This is just a string, let me call it demo. If I run this now, in the top left, we have demo. Besides that, we can also set the size of this window. This we do with window.geometry. In here, again, we are going to need a string. This string wants a width and a height separated by an X. For example, in my case, I want the app to be 300 pixels wide and 150 pixels high. If I run this now, we have a much smaller app. Next up, I want to create the first widget. This, let me add another section here called title. And the widget I want to create is called a label. This label I want to store in a variable. Let me call it title label. Label in tkinter is just a fancy word for text. And this label we create with ttk dot label. In here, we need a couple of arguments. The really important one is we need to set a master. And the master is basically the parent, which in our case is going to be the window. The way you want to think about it is that this label needs to be in some kind of container. And the only container we have right now is the main window. After that, I want to create some text. So the actual text this label is going to display. In my case, I want to display miles to kilometers. And with that, we have a label widget. Although if I run the app now, we cannot see any kind of text. The reason for that is that we need another kind of method to place this label on this window. Tkinter has quite a few of those, but I'm going to use the simplest one, it's called pack. Now if I run this again, we can see miles to kilometers. Although what I am quite unhappy about is the font size. This one we can also change by adding another font named argument. And in here, we need a string, then we need the font and the font size. The font size in my case is 24 and the font I want to use is called Calibri. Now if I run this again, we have a much larger piece of text. What you can also do is add something like bold in here. That one would give me bold text. Next up, I want to create the input field. If I run the app again, the input field is going to be this area here. For this one, I want to have an entry field next to a button. Although what is really important here is that both of these widgets are inside of a larger container. So essentially we have to create three different widgets here, but let's go through it step by step. First of all, I want to create what is called a, let's call it input brain. This is going to be TTK and brain. This, like the label, is going to need a parent or a master, which again is going to be the window, which means I want to set the master to window. Besides that, the frame doesn't need anything else. Now I have a frame that I can put widgets into, and I want to put an entry inside of this frame and a button. The entry we create with TTK and entry, this one now also needs a master, but the master now is going to be this input frame, which means input frame in here. For the button, I want to have TTK and button. And once again, the master is going to be the input frame. Although the button is going to need a second argument and that is going to be the text. Let me call this one convert. This will be the text the button is going to display. What we now have to do is take both of these widgets, place them inside of the frame, and then place the frame itself inside of the window. And that is going to happen the same way we have placed the label using the pack method. Which means I want to get my entry widget and I want to pack it or place it with the pack method. This I also want to do with the button, which means button.pack. 
With that, we have these two widgets inside of the input frame. Finally, I want to get the input frame and pack it on the main window. If I run this now, we can see we have an entry field and a convert button. Let me move this a bit to the side. And the way you have to understand this, this input frame here is a frame around these two widgets. And this we have placed using the pack method. And what pack does is it places widgets below each other. We first have the title label, this is the first one here, and then we have the frame, this is the second one here. And inside of the frame, we have these widgets here. We have an entry widget and we have a convert button. Since those are also placed with the pack method here, they are on top of each other. I hope that makes sense. Once again, if you don't understand this, don't worry too much about it. I will explain all of this in a lot more detail. Although now I have a problem. I want this entry widget and this button next to each other. For that, we can add an argument inside of pack. And this I want to do for both the entry widget and the button. The argument I want to add is called side, and the side here is going to be left. If I run this now, we have the widgets right next to each other. What you can also do in here is set some padding. So pad X could be 10 pixels, for example. And if I run this now, we have a bit of a gap between the entry field and the button, this area here. A similar thing I want to do to the input frame. In here, I'm going to set padding for the Y axis. This one could be, let's say, 10 pixels. And now we have a bit more space on the top and the bottom. Because of this pad Y 10 pixels here, we have a bit more space above and below this frame. Now, finally, we need one more widget. And that is going to be the output. In here, I want to have an output label. This, like the title label, is going to be TTK and label. This one is going to be inside of the window container, which means the master is going to be the window. And for now, I'm going to set some text. Let me call it output. This output label we now have to pack on the window so we can see it. And there we go. We have output all the way at the bottom. Although for this one, I don't really like how small the font is. As a consequence, I'm going to steal the font from the title label and paste it in here and remove the bold part. With that, we have output that looks kind of similar to the title, except a bit less bold. For this pack method, I want to set a bit more vertical padding, let's say five pixels. And with that, we have our basic app. Now, I can add a number in here and click on the button, but nothing is going to happen. For that, we have to add a bit of functionality. The most important one is inside of this button. Whenever a user is pressing the button, I want something to happen. And for that, we want to add the command argument. This one wants to have a function. Let me call it convert. This is going to be a function, and this function we have to create. I want to define convert, doesn't need any arguments. And then here we could, for example, print convert. If I now run this again and I click on convert, we can see convert in the bottom because of this print statement here. What you really want to be careful here is that you only want to pass a function in here. You do not want to call this function. The function is going to be called by the button itself. So be careful with that one. Next up, whenever I'm pressing the button, I want to get the content of this entry field. And there are two ways of getting this. The first one, the easier one, is we can get the entry widget itself and then run the get method. If I run this again, I can type some text in here, let's say 10, and now if I click on convert, we get 10. That's a pretty good start, but that's not usually the method you want to use to get values from a widget. It's not particularly efficient. You will learn later why. Instead, what you want to do is create a separate variable that holds the value of this entry widget. And tkinter has specific objects for that. For example, in my case, I want to create an entry integer. This I create with tk and int var. And make sure to call this one. This is going to create a separate variable that can store and update values. And this I want to connect to this entry widget using the text 
variable, which I want to set to entry integer. Anything we're adding inside of this entry field will be stored inside of this entry integer. Also, whenever we're updating this entry integer, we're going to update the content of this entry field, although this isn't what we are going to do for this video. Once you have that, you can, inside of the convert method, instead of entry, I want to get the entry integer, although the get method still works just fine. If I run this again, I can type a number in here, I can click on convert, and we're going to have the same result. So far, this wasn't particularly useful. But where this system becomes much more powerful is labels can also have their own variable. For example, since I want to change the output label to the result of this conversion, I want to create another tkinter variable. This I called the output string, and this I create with tk and string var. Again, don't forget to call it. Now, this variable is going to work kind of like the int variable, except it is going to store a string instead of an integer. Also, I just realized I kind of messed up the naming convention here. This shouldn't be entry int like this. This should be entry int like so. Let me fix this right away. I want to have entry int here and enter it all the way at the top. But back to the output label. Now we have a variable that can store the data for a label. This I want to connect to this output label. Once again, for that, we need a text variable. The text variable here is going to be the output string. And let me put all of this over multiple lines so it's a bit easier to see, like so. Now, if I run this, you will already see some difference. And that is, let me scroll down a tiny bit. When we created this output label, we have set a text. But after assigning this text variable here, we cannot see any more text inside of the app. The reason for that is that a text variable overrides whatever text is inside of the label. And this we can use to update the label dynamically. For example, when I am pressing the button, I want to get the output string and I want to set a new value. The new value could be, let's say test for now. If I run this again and I click on the convert button, we now have test in here. With that, we are able to get data and update the widgets. So now we can combine all of that to actually make the app work. First of all, I want to get the mile input. This is what we're getting from the entry widget. So this line here, I can just copy it in here, like so. With that, we have the miles. This I want to convert to kilometers. Let me call it km output. To turn miles into kilometers, we need the miles itself, so mile input, and multiply it with 1.61. One mile is always 1.61 kilometers. And this kilometer we want to output in the label, like so. And now if I run this again, I can type in a 10 in here, convert this, and we get 16.1. I can do this multiple times, let's say a 2, and we get 3.22. I can also add larger numbers in here. This is still going to work just fine. Let's try one more time. And again, this is looking really good. And with that, we have some basic functionality. So with about 37 lines of code, we have a functioning app that at the very least does a basic thing. Although if I run this again, this doesn't look very good right now. The problem for tkinter is that the default styling methods are very limited. But to account for that, tkinter has external modules that you can work with. The one that I'm going to use, I want to import with ttk and bootstrap. This is another module that you have to install. And that is going to happen either in the terminal or in the PowerShell. For example, if you are on Windows, you want to type pip install ttk boot strap and run this again. In my case, this isn't going to do anything because I already have this installed. And on macOS, you would type pip3 install ttk bootstrap. You would have the same result. With that, we can use all of this. And the way you will use this is you are importing ttk bootstrap as ttk. 
Basically, what's going to happen is that TTK Bootstrap takes all of the TTK widgets and adds more styling options, which means I can simply comment out this one here. We can already see an update. If I type a 10 in here, we can convert, and this entire thing already looks much better. That's a really good start. What we can also do, instead of setting the window with tk.tk, .tk, we can get ttk.window. Run this again. And now we have to expand the window a tiny bit, and we get the same kind of styling. Although what we can do now is we can set a theme name. And in here, we have a lot of different themes we could choose from. For example, the one you have seen earlier is called Journal. If I run this again and expand the app, we're going to fix this later. Now we have a different kind of app. And well, most of what you see is a different button color. But the rest still works just fine. A dark color you could use here would be called Darkly. And this one is going to look something like this. Although this doesn't change any kind of functionality. There we go. This is still looking pretty good. And with that, we have a basic tkinter app. We have covered styling, we have covered widgets, we have covered layouts, and we have covered functionality. All of the basics of tkinter. Although over the next couple of videos, I will flesh out all of this in a lot of detail. And we're going to start by talking about all of the widgets that you have available. I'll see you there. Let's get started by creating a basic window with some widgets. That is going to look like so. In here, we have one large text box where I can write some text over multiple lines. I also have another widget, and that is a single line entry. So in here, I have one line of text. Besides that, I have a button that if I press it, it is going to print something. You can't see it right now, but it definitely works. Finally, there's one more element. This bit of text here is also what we are going to add. Although I jumped ahead a tiny bit, before I start coding, I do want to cover a tiny bit of theory. The most important part is that widgets are the building blocks of tkinter. Which means anything you see, like a text, a button, a checkbox, any kind of menu, or any kind of frame, is always going to be a widget. The best way to think about it is anything you see in a graphical user interface is going to be a widget. And understanding widgets is incredibly important to understanding any GUI framework. As a matter of fact, any framework you are going to use in any language is going to work like that. You always place widgets in such an arrangement that you get some kind of interface. It doesn't really matter if you use tkinter, react, or something like flutter. In the most basic sense, they work in the same way. Although there are lots of other differences. But they all use widgets. Inside of tkinter, we have two sets of widgets. One is called TK widgets and we have TTK widgets. They do sound fairly similar and they are, but TTK widgets is what you actually want to use. The original TK widgets were made in the original part of tkinter. They do work and we are going to use some of them, but most of the time they do look quite outdated. All of them were made in the 90s and the styling really doesn't look proper anymore. TTK widgets, however, have been added much later and work in the same way, but look much better and have some extra functionality, which is why we are going to use those primarily. And that is all we need to get started. So let's jump into the code and let's have a look at all of this. Here I have a completely empty Python file. And the very first thing that I do have to do is to import tkinter. This is usually abbreviated as TK. And once we have that, I already want to execute the code just to see if we're not getting an error. And I don't, which is a good sign. That means I have tkinter installed. If you're getting an error, you probably want to check how to install tkinter. With that covered, I want to create a window. And this window we create with tk and then uppercase t and lowercase k. And this we have to call. What this is going to return is the actual window that we can place everything else in, which means I want to store this inside of another variable. Let me call it window. When you look online, you see quite a few different names for this kind of variable. A lot of people call it root, or you see app quite often. I prefer to use window, but it really doesn't matter. Choose whatever you think is best. 
But once we have that, we do have a window that we could show. However, if I run the code now, we can't see anything. The reason for that is that we need one more method. And let me add another label here and let's call it run. What we have to do to actually see something is we have to get the window, the one we just created, and call main loop on it. And don't forget to call it as well. Now if I run it, we can see a basic app. You can also resize it. All of this works pretty well, although it doesn't do very much right now. And let's talk very quickly about what main loop is doing. It does a couple of things. The main loop has two major functionalities. The first one is it updates the GUI. That way, if you write some text or update any kind of widget, you actually see the result. Besides that, the main loop is also checking for events. This means without the main loop, there wouldn't be any way to check for button clicks, mouse movement, closing the window, or anything the user could potentially do. All of this combined means that our app couldn't run without the main loop, which is why we always have to call it. But other than that, it is pretty straightforward. Although there is one thing that you do want to consider. This main loop here runs until we are closing the application, which means if I write something afterwards, let's say print hello and run the code again, we can see the window, but we can't see this print hello. Only when I close the app, we get hello, which means the code is stopped on this line here and only when we close the window, then we get to the next line. In most instances, this isn't going to be an issue, but sometimes you do want to be aware of it. But all right, with that, we have a basic window. And there's already a couple of things that we can do. For example, we could add window.title, and this is going to be method, so we want to run it. And in here, we can add a string that changes the name of the app. In this case, I'm going to call it window and widgets. If I run this again and expand the app a tiny bit, we can see window and widgets all the way in the top left. Another thing that you can do is set the geometry. This is another method, so window.geometry. In here, you can do a couple of things. The most basic one is at the width and the height of your app, at least when it starts. And this you do with a string again, and tkinter expects a string with the width, then an x, and then the height. Kind of a weird format, but it is what it is. For example, if you wanted to have an app that is 800 by 700 pixels, you want 800 x 700. Actually, let me change this to a 500 so you can see it a little bit better. Running this again now, we're getting another app that is 800 pixels wide and 500 pixels tall. The numbers we specified here and here. Later on, we are going to learn a few more methods to influence the window. But for now, I don't want to get into too much detail because it's a tiny bit more advanced. What is much more important is that we want to create widgets. That is going to be the actual lifeblood of our application. And remember what I said earlier, we have TK widgets and we have TTK widgets. And just to get started, I want to create a TK widget. One that we are going to see fairly often is called tk.text. This is a multi-line text input. Although when we are creating it, we have to give it at least one argument. We have to tell it what its master is. In our case, the master is going to be the window, the main application. So master is going to be the window. The way you want to think about it is that the master is basically the parent. When we are creating this text box, where do we want to put it? In my case, I want to put it right on the window. For now, don't worry too much about it. We are always going to place widgets on the window. But later on, when I talk about layouts, we're going to change this quite a bit. Just don't worry too much about it. This is all we need to create a basic text input box. Although if I run the code now, we can't see anything. The reason for that is that this line here only creates a widget and tells what the parent is. We don't actually place it in a visual manner. For that, we need one more method. And tkinter has quite a few different ones. The simplest one is called pack. If I run this and run the entire app, now we can see a text box. And this one can work over multiple lines. So in here, I can write as much as I want. This always works. When we get started, 
we are creating one widget with this line here. And this widget has a master, which is the window, which means this TK text is going to be a child of this main widget here. And what Pack is doing, if I draw the entire thing, this one here is the main window, the one we created here, and we have placed the widget in the middle of the top. This is what Pack is doing. It takes a widget and it places it in the middle on the top. You can customize this quite a bit, but for now, I'm not going to worry too much about it. And with that, you can create and place a basic widget. Although in practice, this is not exactly what you see. What you see much more often is that people store this widget in a separate variable and then call pack on this variable separately. Which means I want to create another variable. Let me call it text. And this variable is going to contain the widget, meaning I want to get rid of this pack. And on the next line, I want to call text.pack. The result is going to be the same. Although now I do have access to this widget with the text variable, which I am not going to use for this part, but in later tutorials, this is going to be really useful. And this is what you see most of the time in tkinter when you're creating and placing widgets. And with the basic logic covered, let's talk about TTK widgets. Those are the widgets you actually want to use most of the time. And to use those, we first of all want to import them properly to use them easily. This happens with from tkinter import ttk. ttk is just another submodule of tkinter. So you can just import it from tkinter and that's all you need. After that, you are using ttk widgets like you would use tk widgets. For example, I want to create a label. And this label I create with ttk dot label. Like we have done for the text, we have to set the master. And this once again is going to be the window, which essentially is going to be the parent. Besides that, for the label, we need a text argument. In my case, I want to go with this is a test. With that, we have a label and this label I want to pack on my window. If I run the code now, we have a text widget. This one doesn't do very much, but it, well, displays some text. And this is also a very good illustration of what the pack method does. If this one here is the window, so we have a window like so, what pack is doing is it takes a widget and it packs it all the way on the top like a stack. So text was our first widget, and then we had the label widget that we placed right below. And since we called pack on the text first, number one here, this one is on top. And the label had number two, so this one is right below. Which means if I place those two around and create a label first, like so, we should have this widget all the way on the top. If I run this again, they can see we now have the text on the top. I hope it makes sense so far. I am not going to go into any further depth in terms of layouts until we get into the proper layout section. For now, all you really have to understand is that we are using pack to place widgets on the window. So that is a label. Let me actually rename the comment here, TTK label, and this I want to call TK text. There are two more widgets that I do want to cover in this section. The first one is called TTK entry. This is a single line entry widget. Let me save it under entry, and this we are creating with TTK and entry. And here, once again, as always, we have to set a master, which is going to be the window. And once we have that, I want to get entry.pack. Now, if I run this again, in the bottom, we have another entry widget. And in here, we can write a single line of text. If I press enter, nothing happens. But at the very least, it is working. And finally, I want to create a TTK button. Let me save it in a variable called button. And this button I create with TTK.button. And here, once again, as always, we need a master, which is going to be the window. And besides that, we need a text for the button. This I get with text, like for the label. And let me call this one a button. This button we have to place on the window with the pack method. And if I run this, we have a button that we can press. So this one is working pretty well. Although this button doesn't actually do anything right now. 
To make it do something, we have to add another named argument in here. And this named argument is called command. This one wants to have some kind of function. For example, this could be a button function. This button function is just a regular Python function. So all the way at the top, I want to create the button function. I don't need any arguments. And in here, I just want to print a button was pressed. And now if I run this and I press on the button, we get a button was pressed. Which means every time we are pressing this button, we are executing this function, the function we have created up here. And what is super important to understand here is that this is just a function. You do not want to call it. That would cause an error. The reason why you don't want to call it is you only want to call this function when you are pressing the button. So the button itself calls this function. So with that, we have the basic widgets. These are the widgets you are probably going to use most of the time. Now with that, what I want you guys to do is an exercise and then we can finish this part. What I want you guys to do is add one more text label and a button with a function that prints hello. The label, the one you are creating here, should say my label. Let me put this one in quotation marks like so. And this label should be between the entry widget and the button. Those two we have created here. The label I want to be between those two. And all of this should be fairly straightforward. So pause the video now and try to figure this one out. Let's get started with the label. That's the easier part. The label, I want to let me add the exercise label here. And I want to call this the exercise label. This is once again, just going to be ttk.label. And in here, we need a master, which is going to be the window. Besides that, I want to have a text. And the text should say my label, the one I specified in the exercise. With that, I have the widget and this widget, so the exercise label, I want to pack on the window. If I run this now, you can see I have my label all the way at the bottom. The issue is this my label should be between the button and the entry widget. So we have to move it. Since we know that packs respects the order of our code, what we want to do is to move this text label between the entry and the button like so. That way, we are placing the first label all the way on the top. Below there, we have the text, then we have the entry, then we have the exercise label, and then we have the button, which means the exercise label is between the entry and the button. So let's run all of this again. And there we go. My label is between the entry widget and the button, which means all we have to do now is to create the exercise button. This I want to store in the variable I called exercise button. And this is going to be ttk.button. Inside of it, as always, I need a master, which is going to be the window. Besides that, I want to have some text. The text here doesn't really matter. Let me call this one the exercise button. And just to see that this is working, let me place the exercise, not the label, but the button on the window. And if I run this now, you can see all the way at the bottom, we have the exercise button. That is a really good start. Now we just have to create a function that makes this button print the word hello. I want to create the exercise button function. Doesn't need any arguments. And what I want to do in here is to print the word hello. Inside of the button, I have to add the command argument. And this is going to be the exercise button function. Once again, remember, you do not want to call this. You just want to pass the function in here. The button itself is going to call this function. And now if I run this and I press on the exercise button, we get the word hello. With that, we have covered the absolute basics of tkinter. Now there's one more really quick thing that I do want to cover. And that is inside of the button, the function you pass in here doesn't necessarily have to be a function by itself. It could also be a Lambda function. I'm going to duplicate this line here and comment out the original. 
And I'm going to replace this exercise button function with a Lambda function. Inside of this function, all I really want to do is to print the word hello. The result is going to be the same, meaning if I run the code now and I press on the exercise button, we get the word hello, which means that these two lines here are identical. Although you probably want to use the second one because this one is much easier to use. Since we only want to do something fairly simple, a lambda function here would be perfectly fine. Also, if you're not sure about lambda function, this is probably something you want to look into for a tiny bit at least. For any kind of GUI, lambda functions are pretty important, especially for buttons. But well, with that, we have the absolute basics of tkinder. So far, our app is pretty static. So in this part, I want to get widget data and change widgets. And for that, we have to cover a couple of things. The first part is that there are two major ways to get data from a widget. The first one is called tkinter variables. This is the one you want to use most of the time. Although this one is a tiny bit more advanced, so I'm going to cover it in the next few parts. For now, we're going to use the get method. Lots of widgets have fairly obvious data that the user would want to get. Hence, we have a dedicated method for it. The best example here is the entry widget. If we run the get method on it, it is going to return the text inside of that widget. And that is the easiest way to get data from a widget. So let's play around with that. And once we have that, we can change the widget with that data. All right, once again, I have a completely empty Python file. And the first thing I want to do is to import tkinter as tk. And since I do want to use the nicer widgets, I also want from tkinter import ttk. And once we have that, I want to create a window. This I want to store in a window variable. And this we create with tk and tk. Finally, to see something, I want to run the entire thing. And this I do with window.main loop. Like so. And if I run this thing now, we can see we have a basic window that we can work with. On top of that, I also want to change the title, which I do with window.title. This I called getting and setting widgets. Let me run this again. And you can see we have a much better title. So with that, I want to create some widgets that we can work with. I want to create a label. I want to create an entry widget and I want to create a button. And this could already be a pretty good exercise for you. See if you can remember what was done in the last part and create the label, an entry and a button and see if you can figure this one out. All right, let's get started by creating a label and this we get with TTK and label. Once again, we need a master and this is going to be the window. For the content or the text of this widget, I want to set some text. It doesn't really matter what it is, just choose whatever you want in here. Finally, I want label.pack. This is going to be the label. Besides that, we have the entry, which we're getting with TTK and entry. In here, we just need a master, so I can copy from the label and paste it in here. And finally, I want entry.pack. For the button, we need ttk.button, the master once again, and we need a text, and this could be the button. To show the button, I want to pack the button. And with that, we have the three widgets. Let me run the code, and this is looking pretty good. I have some text, I can write something in the entry, and I can press the button. So this is working really well. Now, what I want to do, is when I'm pressing the button, I want to add a command and this is going to be the button function. Inside of this button function, whenever I press the button, I want to get the content of the entry widget. So let's create that function. For that, all the way at the top, I want to have a button function. It doesn't need any arguments. And in here, I want to get the content of the entry this entry here. So how can I get that? And for that, we have the get method. All we really need is entry.get. This is going to return the content of the entry widget. So if I print it, 
I can run the entire thing again. And now if I press the button, nothing happens. The reason for that is that nothing is inside of this widget. But if I write some text and print and press on the button again, we get if I write some text, whatever I've just written. This works with literally any kind of text. And now if I press the button without any content, you can see we have an empty line. So this is working just fine. This get method here for a couple of widgets is the easiest way to get the information. However, you do have to be really careful here because lots of widgets do not have a get method. The label, for example, doesn't have such a method. So if I run label and press on the button, we're getting an error. The error being that label object has no attribute get. So this would not work here. I got to change it back to entry because this is the only one that really works amongst all of the widgets that we have right now. So with that, we can work on the next part and that is to change widgets. Let's talk about that bit. Every single widget in tkinter has a config method and this is what you're using to update the method, at least in a very basic way. For example, inside of the label, we can use the config method to update the text. This one should be fairly straightforward. And since this is so simple, there's a shorthand in tkinter. This one looks like that. We are getting the widget and then kind of like indexing, we are passing in a named argument. In this case, text, the same text we have used up here. And then we can assign whatever new value we want to assign to it. The same thing we have done up here. Both of these methods are identical. You can basically choose whatever you prefer. So let's play around with them. Back in the code, whenever I'm pressing this button here, I also want to update this label. For that, let me add another comment here, update the label. I want to get my label and I want to run the config method. Inside of this, I want to change the text of the label. And this let's for now go with some other text. That is all we need. Let me run this entire thing. And now if I press on the button, we get some other text. So this is all we need here. Now, what you do see fairly often is that some people use config, other people use configure. The result is going to be the same. So if I press on the button again, we get also some other text. Right now, both are working just fine, but I think at some point config is going to be removed. So you probably want to use configure most of the time. That being said, this kind of thing here is not really what you would want to use. Instead, you would go with label and then text, and then you can assign the new value. So in here, I can set some other text and comment out the line we have just created and run the entire thing again. And now if I press on the button, we are getting the same result, which means those two lines here are equivalent. They do the same thing. And since this one here is a bit more concise, I think this is what you would want to use. But once again, it really doesn't matter, whatever you prefer. And now that we do have that, we can connect updating the label and getting the content of the entry widget. So what I want to do is I want to update the label to whatever text is inside of the entry widget. And for that, I don't want to print the entry widget. So let me get rid of the print statement here. Instead, I want to save the content, let's call it entry text, as another variable. And the value here is just going to be a string. And this string I want to use down here for my label. And this should be all I need. If I run the entire thing again, I can print a new label. And now if I press on the button, we get a new label. This also works multiple times. So some other text, I press the button, we're getting some other text. With that, you can get information from a widget and you can update an existing widget. And that is basically all you have to know for the basics. Although for now, this is quite limited. I guess what I could be covering is that besides the text, there are quite a few attributes that you could target. For example, what you could do is you can get the entry and there is the state. 
the state determines if the widget is enabled or disabled. If I left it like this, after I press the button, the entry widget would not work anymore. Let me actually try. If I now write in here, let's just call it test, and I press the button, the entry widget is going to be disabled, which means I, even if I click on it, nothing is going to happen. Although we did update the label, so it is still working, but after we're pressing the button, it is disabled. If you want to know all of the possible things you can do with a widget, all you have to do is call the widget you want to look at, and then the config, let's call it configure method, without any arguments. This is going to return all of the options. If you print that, you get what is being returned. So let me press on the button and close and expand this a tiny bit. In here, you can see all of the options you can work with. For example, I have used the text and I have also used the state. If I can find it really quick down here. So text and state. And well, there are quite a few more. Throughout this entire series, I'm going to cover basically all of them. For now, don't worry too much about them. I'm going to comment out this part to not make it confusing. And that was quite a bit of information. So let's do one more exercise and then we can finish this part. What I want you guys to do is to add another button that changes the text back to some text, the one that we have seen in the original. On top of that, after the button was pressed, the entry widget should be enabled again. When we are pressing this button here, the entry widget is disabled. When we are pressing the other button, the one you are going to create, it should be enabled again. And pause the video now and try to add this new button with the added functionality and see if you can figure it out. Let me start by adding the exercise button. This is just going to be another TTK dot button with a master being the window. For the text, I just want to add, let's call it the exercise button. Finally, we need a command. And the command, once again, is going to be a function. I'm going to create it right here below the exercise. Let me call this one the reset function. It doesn't need any arguments. And in here, I want to do a couple of things, but they're going to come in a bit, so I'm going to add pass for now. This function I want to call when I press the button, so reset function. And also, don't forget, I want to pack the exercise button on the window. If I run the entire thing now, I have another button that I can press, but nothing happens. That is the functionality we can work on now. There are two things we have to cover. Number one, we have to change the text back to some text. Let's work on that. I want to get my label once again. And in here, I want to change the text. And the text I want is some text. That should already reset the label. So let me run it and I can write some other text and press the original button. And there we go, we have some other text. However, now if I press the exercise button, we go back to some text. The problem we have is that the entry widget still doesn't work. That fortunately we can change quite easily. I want to get the entry widget. In here, I want to target this state. And this state, I want to set to enabled. I can run the entire thing again. I can write whatever I want in here. I can press the button. And now the entry widget is disabled. But if I press the exercise button, we have some text again, and I can work with the entry widget again and write something else. And now once again, if I press the button, we go back to the entry widget disabled and we have updated the label. And this I can do as often as I want. And with that, we have added a fair bit of interactivity to our app. It's not very much, but at the very least, it's a start. Although in the next part, we're going to make all of this significantly more powerful. In this part, we are going to cover tkinter variables. And this is what you probably want to use most of the time to make widgets interact with each other. tkinter has a bunch of inbuilt variables, and those are designed to work really well with widgets. What that means is that these can be automatically updated by a widget, and they can also update the contents of a widget. But fundamentally, 
we are still talking about basic data structures, like a string, integers, or booleans. For this part, I am primarily focusing on a string just to keep things simple. But, well, so far this probably doesn't make too much sense. So let me give an example. Let's say we have a label and an entry, and both of those should always have the same text. Whatever I'm writing inside of the entry is also going to be the text of my label. Coincidentally, that is actually what we are going to make. Let me show you actually. The project we are going to build is going to look something like this. In here, whatever I write in the entry is going to be the text of the label. So those two widgets are very closely connected. And this we couldn't do so far, but we can do it quite easily using a tkinter variable. Basically how it works is we are creating a string variable. So a tkinter variable that stores a string. And this variable automatically gets the value of the entry and it automatically sets the value of the label. That way both of those are always going to be connected. It's not part of the slide, but a string var also sets the value of the entry. So if you had two entry widgets, they could also be connected using a string variable. I think all of this is going to be much easier to understand when we actually implement it. So let's have a look at this in code and let's see how far we get. Here is a nearly empty Python file. I have imported tkinter and ttk. With that covered, I want to create a window and I want to run the window. This we have seen a couple of times by now. I want to create a window variable and in here tk and tk. I guess while we're here, I also want to set the title of this thing to tkinter variables. Once we have that, I want to run the main loop. And if I execute all of this, we can see a basic window. It doesn't do very much right now, but it's a start. So with that, I for now want to create two different widgets. I want to create a label and I want to create an entry widget. And once again, if you want to practice, create and pack them on the window yourself. But in my case, both of those are going to be TTK. One is going to be a label. The other is going to be an entry. Although besides that, both need the same master, which is going to be the window. The label, however, needs some kind of start text. Let me call it label for now. It doesn't really matter. We are going to change it very soon anyway. And once we have that, I want to pack the label and I want to pack the entry. And let me add a tiny bit of white space, run the entire thing. And there we can see we have a label and an entry field. Although they are not connected right now. And for that, we need a tkinter variable. This I want to create in a separate section. In here, I want to have a tkinter variable. This you create with tk, and then you need the name of the variable you want to create. The one I want to create is going to be a string variable. And this you have to call, it's a separate object. This object I want to store inside of a separate variable. I'm going to call this one a string var. And besides a string var, you also have an int var, you have a double var, and you have a boolean var. Depending on what value you need. But string var is what I'm going to use for this video. For the next part, when we talk about the buttons, I'm going to use other kinds of variables as well. How this is going to work is that this string var is going to contain some kind of string. And when we pass this into the label, it is going to overwrite whatever the text is. So for example, if inside of this string var we have hello, then this hello would overwrite the text. On top of that, we can also connect the string var to the entry. And this would mean that the entry widget overwrites this string var, which means this widget and this widget have to be connected to this string var. And for that, we have another named argument. It is called text variable. Both a label and an entry have the same one. So in here, I want to pass in the string var. And that is actually all we need. If I run the code now, you can already see one change. Let me expand the window a tiny bit. We used to have a label here and it disappeared. The reason why it disappeared is because the string var doesn't have any value right now. So the label does exist, but it's empty. So we can't see it. 
However, if I start typing in here, you can see the label text again. And the reason why this is working is that both the entry and the label share the same data. And this is a very powerful system. What you can also do is let me create another entry. I can just copy this one and call this entry2 and entry2. And if I run the code now again, we have two entry fields. If I type in the first one, the second one is also updated. And if I update the second one, the first one is also being updated. The reason for that is that these three widgets all share the same string or string variable. And that way, whatever is in one is going to be in the other as well. And that is a really powerful way to connect different widgets. It's super, super useful. What you can also do is set a start value for this string var. This you do by adding one argument that is called value. In here, you can set basically whatever you want. For example, in my case, I want to go with start value. Now, if I run this again, we have start value as the start value for all of the fields and for the label. Although I can still change them to whatever I want. In this case, though, I don't want to use the start value, but this is something you could do. On top of that, what you can also do, if I get rid of entry widget 2 and instead create another button, this is going to be TTK button with master being the window. And for the text, let's go with button. This button I have to pack. And if I run the entire thing now, we can see we have a button that doesn't really do anything right now. For that, I want to create another function. Let's call it button function again. We don't need any parameters. And in here, I want to print the content of this string variable. And this we can do quite easily because the string variable has a get method, which means all I have to do is add the command named argument for my button and pass in the button function. And now I can run the entire thing again. And let me type in test in here. The label still updates. And if I press on a button, we also get test. We can also write something else. And if I press the button again, we get write something else. Finally, there's one more thing that I do want to cover. And that is you can also set the value of any of these variables. Let's say after I press a button, I want to set the value of this string var to button pressed. This I do with string var and set. And in here, I just want to add the value I want to set it to button pressed in my case. If I now run this thing and let me write just test, test, test. And if I click on the button, we get button pressed. And you can also see this is updated in the entry and in the label as well, because these two share the same data. And with that, we have tkinter variable. Although I think it might take you a couple of minutes to get your head around it. But once you understand it, it's super useful and really powerful to connect different widgets. And ultimately, a much better system than using get. Basically, any widget in tkinter either has a text variable or just a variable. We're going to see quite a few more in the next section. But before we get to that, I want to do some exercises. Specifically, I want you guys to do this. I want you guys to create two entry fields and one label. They should all be connected via a string variable. Also, set a start value of test. And well, that should be all you need. And pause the video now and try to implement all of this. Let's get started by creating another TK string var. This I want to assign to the variable. Let me call it exercise var. And in here, we already want to set a start value. Now this you could do in two different ways. You could either get the exercise var and set it to the string test or you could set a start value. So in here, the value is going to be test. Both of those are going to get you the same results. So let me stick with this one. It's a bit more concise. Once we have that, I want to create two entry fields and one label. And this should be one label. So let's say entry one and entry two. 
Since they are both going to be identical, I can just do this by copying the text. I want to have ttk.entry, the master is going to be the window, and the text variable is going to be the exercise var. And then I also want to pack both of them, although this should be one and this should be two. Finally, I want to create a label and let me call this the exercise label. And I am very bad at spelling exercise. But for this one, we need TTK and label. Master is going to be window. I'm going to say that a lot. We don't actually need a text here. All I really care about is a text variable. And this is going to be the exercise var. Finally, I want to pack this label. And with that, we should actually be good to go. If I run the code now, you can already see we have two entry widgets and a text or a label widget. And all of them have test. If I change the test in either of the entry widgets, we get something else. Once again, this is working because they all share the data, which means if you update one, you update all of them. And with that, we have string variables, a super powerful concept. In the next part, we will talk about buttons. And in there, this system is going to become even more powerful. So I'll see you there. In this section, we are going to create some buttons. Specifically, we are going to create this app here. We have the normal button, this one we have already seen. Then we have checkbox buttons and we have radio buttons. How they work in detail, I'll explain while I make this section. But these are the main buttons we are going to work with. So there are three major kinds of button. We have a button, a check button and a radio button. And a really important thing here is that to use them properly, you are going to need tkinter variables. The stuff I have covered in the last section. But well, let's jump right in and let's have a look. Here I have a new Python file and I already have some imports and I'm creating the basic window. The last thing I need is I have to run the entire thing and this I do with window.main loop, which means if I run the entire thing now, we can see we have a basic window. I do want to make two minor changes. First of all, I want to create a title and I call this one just buttons. Besides that, I also want to set the geometry of this app. There's no particular reason for it. I just think it looks better. I want to set the width to 600 and the height to 400. If I run this now, we have a slightly larger window, which means now we can work with the buttons. And let's start with the most basic button. This one we have already seen. Let me just create it again. I want to have a button and this I get with ttk.button. Once again, we need a master and this is going to be the window. Now I have used this named argument here quite a bit and you don't actually have to use that. Instead, what you can do is just pass in window or whatever master you want to have for this widget as the first argument in here. The first argument is always going to be the master. That way you don't have to write so much. Besides that, for the button, you need some text for the name of the button. Let's say a simple button. Finally, we have to pack the button so we can see it. And there we go. We have a simple button that we can click on. Although right now, since the button doesn't have any function attached to it, it doesn't do anything. That we can change quite easily. And let me put the function right below the button so I keep everything organized. I want to create a function. Let's call it button function. In here, we don't have any parameters and I just want to print a basic button. This I now have to attach to this button via the command. So in here, I want to pass in the function. If I run the entire thing now, I can click on the button and we can see a basic button. Besides that, instead of using a proper function here, you could also use a lambda function like so. So lambda and print and we have a basic button. Running this again, once again, I can click on the button and we get the same result. Once again, if you don't understand Lambda functions, definitely check out a dedicated video for it. It's really important to understand for GUIs. I am going to use it quite a bit. You might be wondering, what if you have a function, let me return to button function. What if you have a function with parameters? How could you incorporate that? Because when we are calling the function here, we can't call this function, so we couldn't pass in arguments. If you understand how functions work, this should be quite easy. 
I'm going to cover this in the next section in a bit more detail. For now, just think about it and maybe you can figure it out already. It's not that difficult. But, well, this is all we need for the basic button. We have seen all of this already, so there shouldn't be anything new so far. Although there's one more thing that we can do. And that is, the button can also have a text variable. Let me create one as a separate variable. I once again want to have a tk and a string var. Don't forget to call it and I want to assign it, let's call it button string. And this we can pass in here for the button string. If I run the entire thing now, we have an empty button. The reason for that is that this button string is now overwriting the text. And since there is nothing inside of the string var, we have a button without any text. So it looks like it's just a basic button. That we can change by setting a basic value for the string var. I'm going to call this one a button with string var. And let me fix the typo. There we go. If I run this now, we have a button with string var. And this is basically all you need for a basic button. It really doesn't do that much more. Later on, when we talk about layouts and styling, there's going to be a bit more, but for the basic button, this is pretty much all you are ever going to need. So with that, we can come to the next kind of button, and that is a check button. This one, let me create a basic check button. I'm going to call it check. This one we create with TTK and check button. In here, as always, we're going to need the master, which in my case is always the window. Then we have the text. Like the normal button, I want to call this one check box one. And that is all we need for now. So let me pack this checkbox and see what we get. There we have checkbox one. And in here, I have a checkbox. I can click and unclick this. Also, I click this quite fast away. If I restart this, by default, we have this other kind of value, which is, I guess, neutral. Besides that, we have on and off. But once we click on it, we can't go back to the neutral position. Another argument you can pass in here is command. And this works like in the normal button, meaning you could just add any kind of function you want. In my case, I'm going to go with lambda and just print check button. This function is going to be run every time we are pressing on this check button. Let me run this again. And now anytime I am clicking on the checkbox, we get check button, which is pretty useful. And now you might be wondering, how could we get the value? Or in other words, how do we know if this check button is on or off? We couldn't do something like check.get. If I run this and click on the checkbox, we get the check button object has no attribute get. Quite unfortunate, so we couldn't use that one. Let me undo all of this. And I just want to print the word check button. To store and check the value of check, we need a tkinter variable. Let me add it here. I want to have a check var. The value here is actually quite open ended. We could, for example, use a tk string var. The one we have already seen. And this we now have to connect to this checkbox and that we do. I guess I could put all of this over multiple lines so it's a bit easier to read like so. A checkbox doesn't have a text variable. Instead we have just a variable. And this is going to work the same. So in here I want to add my check var. The reason why it's not called text variable is because this variable doesn't set the text of this checkbox. Instead, the check var is going to store the value if this box is ticked or not. And that I can now check. So whenever I'm clicking on this box, I want to get my check var and now I can use get. If I run the app now, you can see we already have one difference. And that difference is that this box right now is not neutral anymore. Instead, it is empty or unticked. And if I click on it, we get one or we get zero. And those values, since we can only store string vars, is going to be a string. I guess I can demonstrate this. The value we get returned, I want to put inside of type. And if I run this again, click on the checkbox, we're getting a string returned. 
It only looks like we get zeros and ones, but we are storing them inside of a string variable, so they are being converted to a string. Although that doesn't have to be, because we could, instead of a string var, use an int var. The result is going to be the same. If I run this thing now and click on checkbox, we still get zeros and ones. However, now, if I use type on what we're getting returned once again, what we're storing now are integer values. And that should illustrate quite well that we are working with different data types. We have an int var for the tkinter variable and we have a string var. While those two are different, the most basic thing you have to understand is that we are just storing basic data types of Python inside of slightly more complicated containers. That's all that's happening here. You could also add in here a boolean var. And if I run this, we have the same result, except now we're getting boolean values. And this might be the data type that makes the most sense here. So if I run the same thing again, we're getting true or false, depending if this thing is ticked or not. And this is why it is really important to understand tkinter variables to work with buttons. For the check button, if you want to check the value, you basically always need a tkinter variable. For simplicity, for this one, I want to keep on working with an integer variable. This one, let me run this again, we are always getting ones or zero. Although we could change that, because inside of this, we have what is called an on value and we have an off value. And those, well, I think they're quite self-explanatory. On value is the value that's being returned when this value is turned on or when the box is checked. This, in our case, should be a number because we are working with integer for the storage. Let's say the on value could be 10 and the off value could be 5. If I now run the entire thing again, I can click on the checkbox and we get 10 and 5, depending if it's on or off, or checked or unchecked. And if you want to change the start value, you would have to work inside of the int var. So in here, if I set value to 10 and run the typing again, now the box by default is checked. Cool, so this is working quite well. Which means now we can work on the third kind of button, and that is going to be a radio button or rather radio buttons, because you basically always want to use multiple. I want to start by creating radio one, and this we get with ttk.radio button. For this, once again, we need a master, which is going to be the window, and then we need text, and this I want to call radio button one. Since I do want to have two radio buttons, I'm gonna duplicate this and change the one to a two, both for the name and for the variable. And now, I just want to pack radio one and radio two so we can actually see them like so. And if I run the entire thing now, we have two radio buttons, but now you can see something weird. Let me restart the entire thing so I can explain what I'm doing. Right now, both radio button one and radio button two are unchecked. But if I click on either of them, all of a sudden both are being ticked. So something weird is happening here. The super important thing you have to understand about radio buttons is that each of the widgets has to have a value. That is going to be just another named arguments. So in here, we have a value. The value here could be basically anything. Let's say for the first button, I want to have radio one. And for the other button, I want to have the integer two. Now, if I run this again, I can click on each button and they don't trigger together anymore. If you don't set a value, the default value is going to be zero. And if you have the same default value for every single radio button, tkinter gets a bit confused. You basically always have to set a custom value here. Now, other than that, you can use this radio button like the buttons we have seen already, which means you could also add a command like so. And this, once again, could be just a function or a lambda function. Let me go with lambda because all I want to do is print something. And the something I want to print is the value of this radio one. And once again, I want to put all of this over multiple lines so things are a tiny bit easier to read, like so. We once again have the problem that we couldn't use radio one dot get. If I run this and click on radio button one, we get that the radio button object has no attribute get. Instead, what we have to do is kind of the same thing we have done for the check variable. 
we once again have to create another, let me call this one a radio var. We have to create a tkinter variable. And for this one, we have a bit of a problem because the value for this one is a string and the value for this one, radio button two, is an integer. The best way for that, I find, is to use a string var. And this one is going to convert any kind of integer into a string. And that way you can work with it. And this you have to set as the variable for this radio one button. So radio var. There we go. And now you can use the radio var and get the value. Meaning if I print the entire thing and I click on radio button one, we get radio one. That is the value we specified in here for the value. So far, we basically have a check button. What makes radio buttons different is that the idea is you have this tkinter variable in multiple radio buttons. Let me add it for this button here, radio button two. I want to have a variable as well. And this is going to be the same radio variable, which means that this radio button and this radio button are both connected to this radio var here which by default isn't particularly useful. If I run the entire thing again, I can click on one and we always get radio one. Where this system becomes really useful is when I get the radio var from somewhere else. Let's say all the way in this button function. I want to print radio var and get the value. If I now run the entire thing again, I can click on radio button one and I click on the button, we get radio var again. And if I click on radio button two, we get two or the value inside of radio button two. And the really important thing here is if I reorganize everything a tiny bit, the basic idea of a radio button is that only one button is ever activated. Meaning we could have multiple buttons and only one of them would ever be true. And then the value is going to be stored inside of this tkinter variable. And we could get it, for example, with a button. A checkbox is different to that because inside of a checkbox, you can have multiple values that are ticked or unticked. Whereas for a radio button, only one value is ever ticked. I can actually demonstrate this as well. If I wanted to create a second checkbox, let me create one right below. I want to have check two, and let me be consistent with the naming here. This check should be a one and a one here. Check two is going to be another TTK check button. The master is going to be the window. The text is going to be check box two. And let's say for the command, I want to have another Lambda function that for now is just going to print test. And all of this, I also have to pack. So check two dot pack. If I run this again now for the checkbox, we can have multiple values and each of those are essentially self-contained. Whereas for the radio button, we only have one value ticked. This is quite different. Although that being said, if you really wanted to, you could connect those two check buttons quite easily using the check var. For example, if I click on check var, instead of printing something, I could also get check var and then set the value to the off value. Let's say a five. This would be five in this case. I can now run this. And right now checkbox one is ticked. But if I click on checkbox two, checkbox one is not ticked anymore. And I can retick it and click on checkbox two. Checkbox one will always be false. That way you can connect these two buttons if you want to, but by default, they are not connected. Whereas for radio buttons, they are always connected. Although the connection here happens via the tkinter variable. And then here, sometimes you can get into minor problems. For example, if I set the value to one for both of them and run the entire thing again, if I now click on one of them, both are going to be ticked because they both have the same value. What basically happens is tkinter checks what is inside of the string variable. Right now, this could be a one. And then it checks if this value is identical to the value inside of each widget. If it is, it's going to check this radio button. If it is not, it is not going to check it. 
So if these values aren't unique, you are going to have some slightly weird behavior, something you do want to keep in mind. But other than that, this is kind of all you need for the radio buttons. So with that, we have radio buttons, we have check buttons, and we have the basic buttons. With that, I want to do an exercise, and then we are done. And the exercise here is going to be a tiny bit more extensive. Let me copy and paste it in. It's going to look like so. I want you guys to create another check button and two radio buttons, and they are going to be very connected. For the radio button, each radio button should have the value A or B. If you click on either of the radio button, you are printing the value of the check button, the one you're going to create in a second. And also, if you tick either radio button, you're also unchecking the radio button. So as soon as you click on the radio button, you get the value of the checkbox and you uncheck the checkbox. And then for the check button, if you tick the check button, you print the currently selected value for the radio value. Also, you want to use a T Kinter Boolean value for the check button. Try to implement all of this yourself and see how far you get. First of all, I want to create the radius. And let me call this exercise radius so it's a bit easier to read. Now, in here, I want to have exercise radio 1 and I want to have exercise radio 2. Both of those are going to be created in basically the same way. I want to have TTK and radio button. The master, as always, is going to be the window. Then we have text. And in here, let me call them radio and this is going to be radio a and radio b that way we have a bit of an indication if we're working with a or b to actually get that value we have to set well the value and this one is going to be either a or it is going to be b to store this value we need a t kinter variable let me call this the radio string and this one is going to be tk string var I'm going to use string var because a and b are both going to be strings. If they were zero or true or false, this would be a different kind of tkinter variable. Although string var is the one you're probably going to use the most. Besides that, I want to create a function that we can work with. And this, let me call it radio function. In here, no parameters. And basically what I want to do, when I'm clicking on either of these, I, first of all, want to set a command, so I'm connecting them with the radio function, like so. When I'm calling this function, either I want to get the current value of the check button, and I also want to untick the current check button. The problem we have right now is we don't have a check button, so we have to create that one first. I want to create an exercise check, and this is going to be TTK and check button, in here, we need a window. The text is going to be the exercise check. And this one is also going to need a variable. And this one is going to need an on and an off value. And we don't have to set an on or an off value because 0 and 1 is perfectly fine here. And there's one thing I did forget, because we are not placing anything on the window right now, which I can do with exercise radio 1 dot pack then exercise radio 2 dot pack and then the exercise check dot pack and that is some atrocious spelling before i'm running this i want to add pass inside of the radio function so we're not getting an error running this now we can see we have a few more things so something is definitely working we now just have to give it some proper functionality and the first thing we are going to need now is to actually add tkinter variables so we can work with all of this. The exercise radio already has a string variable, although I didn't connect it to it. This we can do all the way at the end. We need a variable, and the variable is going to be the radio string, the one we created here. And let me put the entire thing like so. We have our data, we have the widgets, and we have the layout. I think that system makes the most sense. Besides the radio string, I also want to have a check, and this is going to be a Boolean value, because remember in the exercise, 
we want to use a tkinter variable for booleans. Which means in here, I want to have tk and boolean var. This boolean var, I now want to place inside of my exercise check. And here I need a variable, and this is going to be the check boolean variable. With that, I can access the value inside of my radios and inside of my check buttons. Which means I can finally work on the radio function. In here, I want to get the value of the check button that is currently selected. And I'm just going to print it, so we're going to keep things simple. I want to get my check bool, and I want to get the value. And that is all I need for that part. If I now run the entire thing again, and I click I want radio A on radio B, we are getting false. And that seems correct because the exercise check is not checked right now. If I do check it and click on either radio A or B, we're getting true. So this is looking pretty good. Next up, I want to set the value of the check button to false. That way it's not going to be checked. This I do with check bool and set. And in here, I want to pass in false. If I run this again now, I can click on the exercise check, and if I click either on radio A or B, it is going to be unchecked. So that is going to cover the first part of the exercise. For the next part, we have to work on the check button. And we only really have one bit left, and that is that ticking the check button prints the value of the radio button value. That is going to be so simple, we can do all of this inside of a lambda function. So in here, I want to have lambda. And this is going to print the radio string, and I want to get the value. The last thing I need is this should be command. And this is going to be very hard to read. Let me put all of this over multiple lines, like so. I assume you have a much wider monitor than I do, so you probably don't have to do this. But in my case, I want this to be visible on even smaller monitors. So I'm a bit more constrained. There we go. This is a bit easier to read. We have our exercise radio 1, radio 2, and the check. And the check now has a lambda function that prints the current value of the radio buttons. So I can run the entire thing. And now if I click on, let's say, radio A, I have the exercise check. And I can do this for B, and we get B. This is working pretty well. And with that, we have the different kinds of button, at least the basic ones that you can work with in tkinter. On top of that, I think you have a pretty good understanding at this point about tkinter variables. I am going to keep on using them quite a bit, so definitely make sure that you have at least a basic idea about how they work. There's one more topic I do want to cover, and that's going to be a shorter one. And that is functions with arguments inside of a button. And the key knight among you might have seen we have already fixed all of this. Because when we called the print function, this one here, we literally called a function with an argument. And this one was only executed when we are actually pressing the button. Which means with this lambda here, we can call functions with arguments inside. It's literally as simple as that. Although alternatively, you could also create a function that returns another functions and have arguments via that. So let's explore both of those. Here I have a Python file. If I execute this, you can see we have a basic tkinter window. It doesn't do anything right now, but I want to add two widgets. Let me add a comment here. I want to have an entry. This once again we get with ttk.entry. This one is going to need the window as the master, and I want to pack this entry widget. Besides that, I need a button. This I get with ttk.button, and here we need the window as the master, and for the text, I just want to have button. This button I also want to pack. If I call this pack and execute it, we get an entry widget and a button. And basically what I want to do, is this button should have a command that enables us to call some kind of function. Let me call it the button function. And this button function needs to have an argument. The argument is going to be the content of this entry widget. 
To get the content, we could use get here, but I want to do this properly. So I'm going to create an entry string, and this is going to be a tk string var variable. And let's set a start value to test. This entry string I now want to pass into this button function when we are calling this function. Although the function doesn't exist right now, so let's create it. All the way at the top, I want to create a button function. This now does need to have a parameter. Let's call it the entry string. All I really want to do in here is to print a button was pressed. On top of that, I also want to print entry string dot get. With that, we have a basic setup. And try to think ahead. If I were to execute all of this, what would we get? I suppose the best way to find out is to actually run this program. Meaning if I execute the code, we can see in the bottom left, we already have a button was pressed and test. Which is if I move this widget to the side, this is what we have gotten from this function. The problem is we got it without pressing the button. On top of that, if I press the button, as much as I want, nothing is going to happen. So let's talk about what the problem here is. The problem with this line right now is that Python executes the code from the top to the bottom. Like so, that should be fairly obvious. And when it comes to this line here, it sees a function. And since we are calling this function with this bit here, Python is executing all of this. Which means we can see a button was pressed and we can see the value of this string variable here. The issue then, however, is that this function is going to return none because we don't define a return value. As a consequence, the value that this command is going to get is a none which doesn't do anything. We don't get an error, but when Python tries to execute anything here, it's getting command none and simply nothing is going to happen. As a consequence of all of this, we can see these two values when we are starting the program and afterwards nothing happens when we press the button. And well, there are two ways to fix this issue. The easiest one, the one that you are probably going to use basically all the time, is you just wrap this function inside of a Lambda function. This lambda here tells Python to only execute this code when we are pressing the button. The reason why this works is that this lambda function by default is not being called. And then the lambda function itself returns this function and then this is what the command value sees. Which means now, if I execute the code, we can't see any value. And if I type in here and press on the button, we can see a button was pressed and test. And I just saw I made a mistake because this entry widget needs to have the text variable, like so, and this should be the entry string. Now let's try this again. Now we can see test inside of the entry widget, and if I press button, we can see a button was pressed and test. On top of that, if I change the value in here to something else and press the button again, now we get a button was pressed and something else, meaning this is working quite well. And if you understand return values and functions, this should be fairly straightforward. Although you could make it more explicit. So let's say that you really do not want to use a Lambda function and you insist on using a function that you can call like this. If you insisted on doing that, you would have to create two functions wrapped inside of each other. Let's start with the outer one. Let me call it outer function. And this one is going to have a parameter. Let's call it parameter. Inside of this function, we're going to define another function. And this one I'm going to call the inner function. This one doesn't have any parameters. And this function is actually going to execute the code. In here, I want to print a button was pressed. And on top of that, I want to print the parameter, which in this case is going to be this entry string which means we can run the get method on it. Once we have that, all I have to do is to return the inner function. And with that, down here, I can call the outer function and this should still work. Meaning if I run the code now, 
nothing happens, that's a good start. And if I click on a button, we can see a button was pressed and test. And if I change the text to something else, this one is also going to work. When we come to this line here, Python is going to execute this function. So we are executing all of this. Inside of this function, we are creating another function. This one is going to get a simple string and prints it. That one's quite easy. And it also gets the value from the parameter, which is the one we created down here. The important part is this return in a function, because this is what's being returned to the command argument. So when we press the button, this is what we actually get. Once again, if you understand functions and how they exchange values with return, this should be fairly straightforward. So I hope that was helpful. And most of the time, you don't really have to think about it too much. If you want to call a function with an argument, you just use lambda and then the function you want to call with the argument. In this case, the entry string. That way, all of this works perfectly fine. Let's talk about event binding. First of all, what does that even mean? And events can be lots of different things. The most common one are keyboard inputs. Although an event can also be a widget getting changed, a widget getting selected or unselected, or a mouse click, motion, or wheel. All of these are different kinds of events. And what is super useful is that these can be observed and used. For example, you could run a function when the user is pressing a button. That is the main idea of an event. And events are very easy to use. Basically, all you have to do is to bind an event to a widget. This could, for example, look like this. We have a widget, and then we use the bind method, and then we have the event and the function. The event format is always going to be modifier, type, and detail. For example, if I wanted to check Alt and the A button, I would go for Alt, key press, and A. And once we have that, we can run whatever function we want to use. So that's all we need. Let's have a look at all of this. Here I have a tkinter file and I already have a couple of things. If I execute all of this, you can see we have a text field, we have an entry widget and we have a button. Although there's no interactivity right now, nothing is going to happen. And what I want to add is a couple of events. There are quite a few, I am just going to give some random examples. But let's get started slowly and let's do a basic example. I want to get my window, so the main widget. And on this, I want to run the bind method. In here, we need an event and we need a function. For the function, I'm gonna keep it simple and just use a lambda function. And this one is just going to print an event. For the event, we have to get the proper format. And this is always going to be a string. Inside of that string, we need the modifier, we need the type, and then we need detail. The example I gave in the slides was if you want to check for the Alt key, a key press, and then the A button. There's just one more thing that we have to do, and that is this thing needs to be enclosed in a smaller than and greater than sign. It's a bit weird. I don't know why it's necessary, but you kind of need it every single time. Also, this is key pressed with an uppercase P. With that, I can run the entire thing. And if I have the window selected and I press Alt and A, we are getting an error. And that is that Lambda takes zero position arguments, but one was given, which means when we are calling this function here, tkinter automatically inserts one argument in there, which we do have to capture. That we can do quite easily with Lambda. We just have to add event here, and now this should be working. Again, with the window selected, I can press Alt and A, and now we get an event. This I can do multiple times, and with that, we have keyboard input. And just for detail, let me print this event to see what we get. So I want to print the event. If I run this entire thing now, and I press Alt A, we are getting an event that has a couple of attributes. For example, it tells us what the current character is, it tells us the position on the widget, and that's kind of all we really need. This bit here is the only really important part. 
If you understand this system here, it is pretty straightforward. And there are quite a few different events that you could be working with. There's a very good website that accounts for all of them. That one looks like this. I'm going to add a link in a second. And in here, if you scroll down, you have a list with all of the events you could possibly work with. And well, in here, you have, for example, the F keys, you have the keypad, and well, you have lots of other things that you could be working with. That is basically all you need to understand the basics. So with that in mind, let's play around with this a tiny bit more. And let's create some more events. Although before that, there's one important thing. That this event right now checks if we are anywhere on the window and pressing Alt and A. However, I could also change this to only work with the button. And I just realized that I changed the naming convention of the button here a tiny bit. Let me fix that. This should be button properly spelled. Both is fine, I just want to keep things consistent. Now we have an event that is connected to the button. So what does that mean? And I think it's best to explain this when I actually run the app. Here we have the app, and if I now, anywhere on this window, press Alt-A, nothing happens. However, if I press on the button, and now I press Alt-A, we get the event back. If I click inside of entry, I press Alt-A, nothing happens. What you have to understand here is that if we are clicking on the button, tkinter selects that button. And only if that is the case, we are running events on this widget. And if we don't have the widget selected, we are not running any kind of event on it. So that's an important thing to understand here. A really good way to visualize all of this is to use window.bind. And in here, we can check for one event that is called motion. And now for this one, I want to create a separate function. Let me call this one get position. Once again, remember, you do not want to call this function. Instead, I want to create it, get position. And this one needs to have one parameter. It always needs the event. And what I want to do in here is to print an F string that is getting us the X position. And this we can get with event.x. And besides that, I also want to have Y. And this is going to be event.y. Let me use some semicolons in here. That way this is going to look a bit cleaner. And now every time I am moving the mouse, tkinter is going to tell me the position of the mouse. So let me run the entire thing and show my mouse. Now you can see wherever I am on the window, we have the position of the mouse. If I go all the way to the top left, we have zero and zero roughly here. And all the way in the bottom right, we have 599 and 499, which is basically the window dimension, minus one. And with this, you can get the mouse position wherever you are on the tkinter widget, which can be super handy. However, one important thing you do have to understand here is that right now we're doing all of this on the entire window. If I change this to only work with the text, so the text field we created up here, and run the entire thing again, if I keep my mouse on the bottom of the window, nothing is going to happen. Only if I start to hover over the text widget, we can see the position. And this stops once I leave the text widget. Depending on what widget you bind the event to, you are going to get different results. Well, obviously. I guess the way you have to understand this is that tkinter only checks the event on the currently selected widget. Although the window is always selected. Another useful thing to consider is that you don't necessarily always need this entire format. Sometimes, for example, you just want to check for any kind of key press. You don't really care about what specific key or what modifier. You just want to check any kind of key press. If that is the case, let's actually check for it. I want to get my window. I want to bind an event. And in here, I just want to check for a key press, nothing else. If that is the case, you could just add key press and don't worry about the modifiers. So let me add lambda event and I want to print a button was pressed. I can run this now. And now if I press any of the buttons, we get a button was pressed. And I'm still getting the input when I move the mouse. All of this is working just fine. 
I suppose we could make this a bit more elaborate by turning this into an F string. And in here, we can get event and character. If I run this now, I can press any button and we can see what I have pressed. That way, you can always capture anything on the keyboard. Let me move this key press right below here so the entire thing is a tiny bit more organized. Finally, there's one more thing that I do want to cover. Let's say we want to check if the user has selected the entry field and then we want to run some code. This we can also do. I want to check my entry widget and in there I want to bind an event that is called focus in. And this, once again, is going to be a lambda event. And I just want to print entry field was selected. And before I run this, let me comment out all of this so we can see a bit easier what's going on. So if I run it, and now if I select the entry field, we are running this statement here, which gets us an entry field was selected. I can do this multiple times. So if I click on the button and return to the entry field, we get the entry field was selected. I can still use it as normal, but now every time I select it, I get a function that I can use for whatever purpose. This also works the other way around with focus out. And in here I have an entry field was unselected. Let's try this one now. And now I have the field selected and I have the field unselected. Pretty simple, but very, very powerful. Once again, check out the website. It covers all the options that you could ever need. So any kind of event is going to be covered in here and you just have to look for what you need. Let me put the list actually all the way on the top here. So it's very easy to find. You can also find it in the notes to this part. And all right, there's one more thing that I want to do and that is going to be an exercise. And that one is going to be, I want you guys to print mouse wheel when the user holds down shift and uses the mouse wheel while the text is selected. The text being this text box here. And for that, you will need the website. So check it out and then try to figure out this kind of event. Pause the video now and see if you can figure it out. Obviously, we have to start by getting our text widget. In here, I want to bind an event. For the event, we need a smaller and greater than symbol. And now we have to figure out how to combine shift with the mouse wheel. Let's open the website for that. In here, first of all, we need a modifier. The modifier is going to be shift. So that one is easy. I want to start by adding shift in here. Then I need a dash. And now I have to figure out the mouse wheel. For that, let me use a text search. I want to have a mouse wheel. There we go. This one is very easy to get. Which means all we have to do now is add a mouse wheel here and then we are good to go. I can then add another Lambda function with event and all I want to do is to print mouse wheel. Like so. And this should be all we need. If I run the code now, and I use the mouse wheel by itself, nothing happens. But if I hold down shift and use the mouse wheel, also nothing happens because my mouse isn't over the text field. But if I'm over the mouse field and I use the mouse wheel, we get mouse wheel, meaning this is working really well. And this is basically all you have to know about events. It really isn't that complicated. The main issue here, I think most of the time, is figuring out the proper format for the event. But if you play around with this for a bit, it should be fairly simple. In this part, we are going to learn about two new widgets. They're called combo box and spin box. And let me show you what we're going to make. It's going to look like this. This is the app for this part. And a combo box is basically a drop down menu. In here, I can select different items. And then I can also get the item and place it, for example, inside of a label. A spin box is this kind of selection menu entry thing where I always have predefined values. This could either be a number or it could be a letter or literally anything else. So this is what we are going to create. And it's not that hard to make. All you really need 
is a basic widget and you have to assign a list of values to this widget. And also you can connect a tkinter variable to select this widget and use it for basically anything else. That is all we need, so let's jump into some code and let's have a look at this. Here we are in the code and I already have a few lines of tkinter code. If I execute all of this, we can see a basic window. By now, all of this should be fairly familiar. And I want to start by creating a combo box. This we do with ttk.combo box. In here, as always, we are going to need a master, which in my case, as always, is going to be the window. On top of that, like any other widget, I want to assign the widget to a variable. Let me call it combo. Once we have that, I can pack this combo box, fix my typo and run the code. And there we can see a drop-down menu. Although right now it doesn't have any values. To get the values, we need some kind of list. Let me create one, let me call it items. And this is just going to be a list. And I think for the demo, I used ice cream. I had pizza and I had broccoli. You might notice I am recording all of this right before lunch. But this list I now want to assign to this combo box. And this we do, well, we can do it in a couple of different ways. The one you probably want to use is by going with values and in here assign the items. If I run the code now and I select the drop down menu, we can see the different items. In here, this one is working pretty well. Alternatively, Besides this values, you could also use either config or configure. And then here you can set the values to whatever the items are. Like so. This line and this line do the same thing, which means I could comment out the first one, run this again, and we have the same items in the drop down menu. As always, I would recommend this one here because it is more concise, but both options are perfectly valid. Besides that, what you can do is to create a tkinter variable. Let me call it the food string. And this one is going to be a tk string var. And this string var you can assign to this combo box with a text variable. I want to assign the food string. Although if I run the entire thing, by default, nothing is going to happen, which means the box is empty when we start the app. The reason for that is that we don't set a starting value for this food string. That is quite easily changed. All you have to do is set a starting value and I want to get the items and select, let's say the first one. That way on startup, the selected item should be ice cream. Let's try. And there we go. We have ice cream in here and we could select something else. Still, this works just fine. And for the basics of a combo box, this is basically all we need. Although there's one more really cool thing that you can do, and that is events for a combo box. Like we have seen in the last part, you can get the combo box like any other widget and bind an event to it and then run a function. And the combo box has one special event that is unique to it. And this you call with a double smaller than and a double greater than symbol. And in here, you have to type in combo box selected. What this does is it executes a function every time we are selecting any kind of item inside of it. Let me create a Lambda function with an event in here. And I just want to print test anytime we are selecting an item inside of this combo box. So if I run the code now and I select pizza, we get test. I select broccoli, we get test. This one is working just fine. I guess something slightly more useful here, we could get the food string and then get the value. That way we are going to print whatever value is being selected. So right now we have ice cream, then we have pizza, and then we have broccoli. That way you can extract the values from this combo box quite easily. As always, using the tkinter variable with get is the best way to get any kind of value and pass it around. It's fairly simple. And this you can now connect, for example, to a label. And this is going to be TTK and label with the window as the master. 
And this combo label, I want to pack on the window. If I run this, we can see that we can't see anything. Let me add some text in here so we can see what's going on. Here we have a label. So if I run this again, we can see a label. This label, I now want to change to whatever is selected inside of the combo box. For this one, you could work with the tkinter variable, the food string. For example, what you could do is set the text variable and set this one to the food string. If I run this now, we already have ice cream. If I select pizza, we have pizza. And if we have broccoli, I have broccoli. That is one way to approach it. Although it's quite limited because we can't influence the string. So I don't actually want to do it. Instead, what I want to do is when I'm clicking on combo box selected, I want to get my combo label and I want to run config on it. In here, I want to set the text and the text is going to be an F string with selected value is going to be the food string and get. Now I can run this again. By default, we get a label, but as soon as we select anything, we get selected value pizza or broccoli or ice cream. And well, this is basically all we need. So this is a combo box and this is pretty much all you need. The main things you have to understand is that all of this is just a widget. The main difference compared to other widgets is you have to create a list and assign this list to the values. Other than that, you can use it like any other widget with a tkinter variable and then with events. Although there's one special event, combo box selected. So with that covered, we can cover the next kind of widget and that is called a spin box. And I realized I have combo box with lower KC. It should be an upper KC. That kind of annoyed me. A spin box works very, very similar compared to a combo box, which is why I covered them in the same bit. You are creating it with ttk.spinbox. And in here, you need a master, which is going to be the window. This I also want to assign to a variable. I'm going to call this one spin. Once we have that, I can pack the entire thing and run the code. We have another widget that is an entry field with up and down arrows where we can select predefined values. And now, like for the combo box, to assign actual values, you have to get spin, then the value, and now you need some kind of list. This could, for example, be one, two, three, four, and five. If I now run the entire thing, we can select between one, two, three, four, and five. Although, since you very often work with numbers inside of a spin box, there is an easier way to get lots of numbers. What you have to do is to define a from, and really important here, you need an underscore. And this is determining the start value. Let me set this one to a three completely random values. And then you need a two. And this one doesn't have an underscore. Let's set this one to 20. The underscore next to from here, you always need. And if you don't add it, you're going to get an error. There are some predefined values that you cannot mess with. Don't forget that. It's a very easy mistake to make. Once we have defined this from and to value, we can run the entire thing again. And now if I click on up, we get the values from three all the way to 20. Another thing that you could do in here is to add an increment value. This is essentially the step size. For example, if I set this to a three, run the entire thing again. Now we are starting with a three, but then we move in increments of three. Although here you do have to be a bit careful. Let me go all the way up and I do reach the highest value of 20. And now if I go down, we have 17, 14 and 11. So the numbers here are not consistent. It's a little bit annoying. Basically what Tikinta does, it tries to go as high as it can get in terms of the two number. But if it gets to a 21, in our case with the increment of three, it limits the maximum number to a 20. So that way we actually change the number and the increment doesn't really work anymore. It's just something to be aware of. It can be kind of annoying, but quite workable. There are two more things that I do want to cover. The first one is that there is a command inside of a spin box. In here, for example, we can use lambda without any parameters and just print a button was pressed. Or I guess arrow is a bit clearer because if I run this again, 
and I'm running this command every time I'm clicking on an arrow. If you want to have a bit more control, so you only want to run a function if the user presses up or down. You couldn't use command, but like the combo box, a spin box has special kinds of events, two actually. We can use spin and bind an event with a function and the event here is, once again, we need a string and now two smaller than and two greater than operator signs. Inside of this, we have increment and we have decrement. Increment is triggered when we press the up arrow, decrement when we press the down arrow. And this we can connect to a lambda event. I just want to print either up or I want to print down. Now I can run the entire thing again. And if I press on up, we get up and an arrow was pressed and the same with down, an arrow was pressed. Depending on the level of control you want to have, you can either use command or you can use an event. Both work perfectly fine. Finally, the last thing you want to be aware of is you can use spin along with the tkinter variable. For example, I could create a spin integer and this is going to be tk int var. In here, you could also, as always, define a start value. Let's go with 12. This spin integer, I now have to connect to the spin box. And for that, I want to separate all of this over multiple lines. That way you can see it a bit better. In here, I want to create a text variable, and this is going to be the spin integer. And now we have 12 as the start value. And I can change it like so. And this would also update the integer. For example, if I print the value, instead of an arrow was pressed, I want to get spin integer and get. And now if I run this again and I press up or down, we get the various numbers. Very simple to work with. Most of this should be quite familiar at this point. And with that, there's only one more thing that I do want to do for this video. And that is an exercise. I want you guys to create a spin box that contains the letters A, B, C, D, and E. On top of that, what I forgot to copy in is I want you guys to print a value whenever the value is decreased inside of the spin box. So I'll pause the video now and try to implement this one. I am going to start by creating exercise letters. And this is going to be a list with A, B, C, E, and E. Once we have that, I want to create an exercise string. And this is going to be a TK string var. And then here, I do want to have a start value, like we have seen in the combo box with this part up here. I want to get my exercise letters and select the first item. Once I have all of that, I should probably create the exercise spin box. And this is going to be TTK dot spin box. In here, for the master, as always, we have the parent, and I want to have a text variable, which is going to be the exercise string. Let me put this exercise spin on the window widget with pack, and now we already have a start value. The problem is, let me run this again, actually, just to demonstrate what's happening. If I start the app, we already have another spin box that says A. That happens because of this string var here. However, if I press up, we're getting to zero. The reason for that is that we haven't assigned these letters as the values for this spin box. That we can do quite easily. You could either get the exercise spin and then get the values and assign the exercise letters in here. If I run this now, I can go up and down and we get the different letters. Although, if you already know that you want to have this list inside of this widget, you can just, when you create it, assign the values with the exercise letters, and then I can get rid of this one here, and we should have the same result. So now, I have the same result. That is pretty good. We are nearly done. We have covered the first part, now we have to work on the second one. 
that I want to print the value whenever the value is decreased. And this we have covered up here. I only want to print the value when we are decrementing the value. I want to get my exercise spin and bind an event. The event I want to bind is going to be decrement. And inside of this, I want to get my lambda with an event. And here, I want to print the exercise string. And I just want to get the value. That should be all I need. If I run the code now and I press up, nothing happens. But if I press down or I decrement, we get the different letters. So with that, we are done. And this is giving us two new widgets that are quite useful, especially combo box, I feel is a really commonly used widget. The next widget I want to cover is a canvas. And a canvas is essentially a widget that allows us to draw various shapes. For example, we could draw a square, a circle, lines, text, and quite a few more elements. In the most basic sense, what we are doing is we are recreating paint inside of tkinter. Or at the very least, we have the basic tools to do so. I already have prepared some code. The only difference compared to what we've seen in the past is I do not have TTK. I only have TK because that's all I need. But if I run this code, you can see we have a basic window. I want to create a canvas, which is one specific kind of widget. This I want to store in a variable that I'm also going to call canvas. And in here we need TK and canvas. Like any other widget, this is going to need a master, which is going to be my window. Once I have that, I can pack this canvas. And if I run the code now, we can't see anything. However, the widget does exist. The problem is by default, it's, well, invisible. We can't change that. The easiest way to do so is by giving it a background. In here, you could choose basically any color. For example, I could use white in here. If I run it now, we can now see a white background. This would work with any other color. Red, for example, would look like this. There are quite a few more colors you could be using, but I'm going to cover them later. For now, using basic names is fine. And I'm going to stick with white. That's, I think, the easiest color to work with. With that, all we really have to do is go through the different methods that the canvas object has. For example, one that I think is very simple is called create rectangle. This, for the first argument, is going to need a tuple. And this tuple is going to determine the dimensions of the rectangle we are going to draw. To make this work, we need the left point, the top point, the right point, and the bottom point. Let me actually use values here. For the left, I want to go with 0. And for the top, I also want to go with 0. For the right side, I want to have 100 pixels. And for the bottom, I want to have 200 pixels. And now if I run this, we can see we have a kind of rectangle, or at least the outline of one. A better way to visualize this is changing these numbers to 50 and 20. That is a bit easier to see. So what we have here is a rectangle or the outline of a rectangle. And this one is 50 pixels from the left, this side here. Then we have 20 pixels from the top. That's this part here. The right side, this one here, is this line. And then the bottom, 200, is down here. We are defining the four sides of this rectangle, and Tkinter uses that to create a rectangle. Another option we have to make this look a bit better is a fill color. And for this one, again, you could use basically any kind of color. For example, red would be fine. And now we have a red rectangle with a black outline. If you want to get rid of the outline, you would set width to zero. Width here refers to the border width. If I run this now, we only have a red rectangle. And well, basically now we have a ton of different options that we could be using. The best website for that, let me open it. This one here, it's a little bit old, but it still works perfectly fine. On this side, you have a canvas widget and the canvas widget you can see has a ton of different options. The one I have looked at already or the one we're working with right now is create rectangles. You can already see in there, we have canvas, then create rectangle, and then left, top, right, and bottom, and then the different options. The different options you can find here. 
And you can see there are a lot. I could, for example, set the width to 10. This one gives us a very thick border. And besides that, I can also specify a dash. In here, we need a tuple that specifies what is called a dash pattern. Let me use some random numbers. If I run this now, we get a certain kind of dash. What this dash here means is the first number, the one in my case, tells me how long each dash should be. And the second number, two in this case, is how big the gap is, which in this case is going to be twice as wide as the actual pixel. If I change this to, let's say, four and two, and run this again, we now have a slightly different look. This is something you have to play around with quite a bit to really get the idea. You could even add more values in here. Let me add a one and a one, run this again, and now we get even weirder results. But mastering the dash pattern is, well, something that I'm not too concerned about. So do this in your own time if you are really interested. Another option we have is the outline. This determines the color of the border. In here, once again, we need just a color, and now we have a green outline. I think at this point, you get the idea with this thing. It's not terribly complicated, and if you go through the list, it's quite easy to work with. Which means I can work with another one. Another very simple option is called Canvas and Create Line. You might already guess what this one is doing. It draws a line. And then here, we need start x and start y and then end x and end y. And other than that, we still have basically the same options we have seen for the rectangle. Let's say I want to go from 0 and 0 to position 100 on x and 150 on y. If I run this now, you can see we have a line. Oh, and I forgot to mention, right now I've just used numbers. You could also place all of this inside of a tuple, you would get the same result. The same applies to the rectangle. You could just have the numbers and everything would still work just fine. I just think using a tuple here makes it a bit easier to read. And for the line, we could, for example, use fill again. Let's fill this one with yellow. Possibly a bit hard to see. Yeah, it's gonna be very hard to see. Let's go with blue. That is much easier to see. Besides that, we also have canvas and create oval. This one works quite similar compared to the rectangle. We are specifying the left, the top, the right, and the bottom. And then Tkinter is going to draw a circle or rather an oval inside of these limitations. Although if you have a rectangle with these dimensions, so if I go 0, 0, 100, and 100, we are going to have a circle. Like this, I want to fill this one, let's say with green. There we go. We have a circle right now, but if I change this 100 to a 300, we have a oval. I'm going to change this to 200, so we're not drawing too many things on top of each other. Also, I want to turn the coordinates into a tuple to keep things a bit more consistent. Besides that, we also have a create polygon. For this polygon, I'm going to do all of this inside of a tuple. We always need x and y positions. So we have x1 and y1, then we have x2 and y2, then we have x3 and y3, and Tkinter is going to connect all of them. So once again, let me go with a point at 0 and 0. Then I want to have another point at 100 and 200. And let's say a point at 300 and 50. Running this now, we have a triangle because the point we have drawn consists of three points. So let me visualize this. Our first point is 0 and 0. That is the point up here. The next point is 100 and 200, which means we're going 100 pixels to the right and we are going 200 pixels down. The final point is 350, so we are going 300 pixels to the right and 50 pixels down. And we're ending up on this point, which you could see better if I remove the drawing, this point here. And in here, you could add as many points as you want. You could also work with fill. Let's say fill. We haven't used white yet. And for another point, I want to have for x 150 
And you could also work with negative points, let's say negative 50. Okay, that um, it works, but it's very hard to see. Let's go with gray. There we go. Now we have a polygon on top of everything else. There's one more basic method I do want to cover, but at this point, this becomes fairly repetitive. I want to create an arc. For the arc, we basically start like we have started for the oval, which means I want to put them like this. For these methods, we are drawing always a rectangle, and then we're filling the rectangle either with a rectangle itself, an oval, or now an arc, so a partial oval, essentially. To visualize this, let me actually copy this circle here, or the coordinates for the circle, and I also want to comment out the polygon so we can see what's going on. If I run the code now, you can see something weird on the circle. The green bit here is the circle, and on top of that, we have this slice cut out. If I fill the arc, this is going to be even more visible. Let's say fill with red. Here you can see, by default, the arc covers one quarter of the entire square. These numbers you can specify. For that, you need a start point, and this by default is zero, which means if I run this thing now, nothing changes. However, if I change this to a 45, now the thing looks like this. The way you can understand this number is this line here is angle zero. And a whole circle around this, well, circle is 360 degrees. With this line here being 45 degrees, what we have specified here for the start point. And by default, the arc goes counterclockwise by 90 degrees. This we can also change. For that, we need another argument here that is called extent. By default, this one is 90, so if I run it, nothing changes. If I, however, change it to 180 degrees, it looks like this. We are starting here at 45 degrees, and then we are going 180 degrees around the circle. So this point down here is degree 225. Besides that, there is one more interesting argument in here, and that is called style. In here, we have to specify specific tkinter options. This could, for example, be tk, and now all in capital letters, pi, slice. And let me fix the typo, like so. If I run this, we cannot see any difference because this is the default option. However, what we can do is change this to arc. And if I run this now, you can't see anything because the arc only draws the border. If, however, I change the outline, which is the border color, to let's go with yellow, run this again. Now we can see very faintly there's a yellow half circle. Again, for this one, I want to change the width to 10 so we can see it easily. There we go. Now it's a bit more visible. Let me actually change the color to red. There we go. Now this is much more visible. Also, I want to put all of this over multiple lines. Otherwise, this is going to be quite hard to read. There we go. These are basically the main options you can work with. Besides arc and pie slice, you also have chord. Running this gets us something like this. Um, I am messing this up with the width. Let me change this to 1. The difference compared to a pie slice right now is kind of hard to see because we are drawing half a circle. Let me change this to a smaller number, let's say 140. And I want to go with pi slice. Running this now, I get part of a slice. The part that chord is going to change is it's going to take away this bit here. It's going to be easier if I actually use it. So instead of pi slice, I want to have the chord. Now you can see we are not drawing this bit here anymore. That's the only difference between the two. And with that, we have an arc. And this covers another really important part. Besides that, you can also... I want to comment out everything so you can see things a bit easier. Besides all the shapes, you can also draw text with canvas and create text. For this one, you have to start with a position. Let me go with zero and zero, and then a text argument. This is some text. If I run this now, 
we can see some parts of a text all the way in the top left up here. The problem we have with the coordinate right now is this point here, 0 and 0, is this point. But we are placing the center of the text, which means the actual bounding rectangle of the text looks something like this. Which is fine in general, but right now it doesn't help us too much. I'm going to change these numbers to 100 and 200, and there we go. Now we can see this is some text. And once again, you can also fill this thing with different colors. Let's go with green. Now we have some green text. Another option we could be using is width. And this specifies the width of the text. If I change this to a 10. Now the width of the text is 10, and Tkinter tries to fit everything inside of this width, which means we have a ton of line breaks. And once again, if you go through the list, you can find a few more options, but those are the main ones. You could also change the font, or if the text is justified or not, there are quite a few different things you can do here. The last important thing that you really want to care about is you can also display widgets with a canvas, which is a super powerful feature. Let me use it. We need canvas, and this is called create window. For this, first of all, we need a position. This is just x and y. Let me go with 50 and 100. Now we need a window argument. And important here, this window has nothing to do with this window up here. They just happen to be called the same. The idea is inside of this canvas, we are creating a separate tkinter window. And this we are using for drawing and drawing a widget specifically. And this window wants a tkinter widget. For example, ttk.label. And with this, I realized I do actually need TTK. So let me import it all the way to the top from tkinter import TTK. I should check my notes a bit better. For this one, we now need a master, which doesn't really matter, but we still need it. And then we need some text. For the text, this is text in a canvas. This one, we don't have to pack. If I run this now, we have this is text in a canvas. And once again, we are placing the center of this widget, which is 50 pixels from the left. Since the text itself is wider than that, we are going a bit outside of the bounding box, which is totally fine to do, just be aware of it. And widgets, for some reason, aren't being clipped off, they are still visible. I have no idea why, it's just the way it works. I'm going to change this 50 to 150, and now this looks a bit better. And this is actually quite interactive. For example, besides a label, we could also use a button. And this would still work. You could even press on the button and execute functions. All of this works perfectly fine. As a matter of fact, for scrolling through a window, you want to use this method here. For the more advanced parts, we are going to see this quite a bit. It's super useful. And with that, we basically have all that we need for the basic canvas widget. I'm going to comment this one out as well. And now I want to do an exercise that I think is going to be quite fun. I want you guys to use event binding along with the canvas to create a basic paint app. So wherever the mouse is, I want to draw something. So when you move the mouse around, you can see a line being drawn. So pause the video now and try to figure this one out. For this one, I, as always, want to get my canvas and I want to bind an event. The event I'm looking for is called motion, which means I am checking for a movement of my mouse. And if that is the case, I want to draw on canvas. This function doesn't exist right now, so let's create it. Define draw on canvas. In here, remember, for the parameter, we are always going to need one for the event. From this event, we can get an x and a y position. So x is going to be event.x and y is going to be event.y. And these points we can use to draw on the canvas. Although for that, I want to have one more thing, and that is the brush size. I'm going to use this in a bit again. So I want to define this as a global variable, brush size, and let's go with four. Now that I have that, I can get my canvas and create an oval. We need a left, a top, a right, and a bottom. Let's say this point here is the mouse cursor. I'm going to call it M. Around this point, 
I want to draw a circle every time we are moving the mouse. And this point is going to need four different arguments. For the left side, I want to go from the mouse position and then half the brush width, which in our case is going to be four over two, or this number here divided by two. That is going to give us the left position. The same thing I want to do for the top. For this one, I want to go up by four over two. And for the right side, I also want to go by four over two. That way, the entire width of the thing is four pixels, which is our brush size. I want to get X minus my brush size over two. The same thing for Y, except now we need Y, which is going to be the brush size divided by two again. For the right side, I want to have X and then plus my brush size over two. And finally, for the bottom, I want to have Y plus my brush size over two. That is all I need. If I run the code now and I hover over the canvas widget, we have a very basic drawing app. It doesn't look terribly good, but at the very least it is working. One issue we have right now is that we are only really drawing the outline. Let me fill this thing with a black color. And now this is already looking a little bit better. I think the brush size is also a tiny bit large. I can change this to a two. And this is improving as well. But well, this is a very basic drawing app. And you can see here, if I move the mouse really fast, you can see the individual points we are drawing. Besides that, another cool thing that I realized you can do is I also want to create a canvas method with find. And this one is going to be called mouse wheel. If I'm using that, I want to get a brush size adjust function. I'm going to create this here and this is going to be brush size adjust. As always, this needs the event. And for this one, I want to update this brush size, which means I have to create a global variable that is called brush size. And when we are doing this, let me print the event to see what we get. If I now use my mouse wheel, we are getting a couple of different arguments. The one I care about is called delta. If I move my mouse wheel forwards, it's going to be plus 120. And if I move it towards me, it's negative 120 or backwards, I guess. For your mouse, these numbers might be slightly different, but the actual number doesn't matter. I only care that it's positive or negative, which means I can use this inside of an if statement. So if the event dot delta is greater than zero, then I want to increase my brush size. Let's say brush size plus equal four. And else, if it is negative, then brush size negative equal four. With that, if I run this again, and let me actually show my mouse, that's going to make all of this a bit easier to see. The drawing still works, but now if I scroll forward, we have a much thicker mouse. And if I scroll towards me, this becomes very, very small. Although here you can see an issue, I am scrolling just towards me, and the number gets smaller and smaller. Let me actually start this again. So right now, the line is very thin. But now I'm scrolling towards me, so the line should get smaller. I'm scrolling quite a bit towards me and more and more towards me, and the line just gets thicker. The reason for that is when we're using the brush size here for these numbers, it doesn't really matter if the number is positive or negative. The larger the number gets, or rather the larger the absolute number becomes, the larger the circle is going to be. Which means as far as the brush is concerned, 20 is the same size as negative 20, or almost the same. They're slightly different, but the larger the number itself, the larger the brush size. This I don't like, which means at the end of this function, I want to get my brush size and I want to limit it between two values. For that, we can use minimum, and this is going to pick the smaller numbers between two arguments. So in here, I can have my brush size, and the maximum number I want to have is going to be 50. So let me run this again. And now I'm scrolling forward. And this is the largest size that I can have for my brush. Kind of hard to see, but it definitely works. This function, I want to wrap inside of a max function. This one works like minimum, except this one selects the larger number. And then here, 
I want to have a zero. That way, our brush can never go below zero. If this number becomes negative, the max always chooses the zero. So now I can run this again, and I can increase the size, and I can decrease it, and at the minimum, we get this line here. And that is a nice basic paint app. You could play around with this quite a bit more to add colors, and we are going to do that later, but for now, I think this is a pretty good start with the Canvas app. The next widget we are going to look at is called Tree View. And if Canvas is Paint, Tree View is essentially Excel, or rather, we are going to create a table. This one is going to look like this. In here, we have a bunch of different entries that we can look at. We could also delete entries, like so. And you can also select multiple entries and work with them. It's a fairly straightforward table that is quite easy to work with, and well, that's what we are going to create. Once again, I have some code. If I execute the entire thing, we have a basic window. The one thing that is new are these two lists. I'm going to use them to create some random names in a bit. For now, just don't worry about them. I want to create a widget, and this is called tree view. This we create with ttk.treeView. As always, I want to store this in a separate variable, and this I'm going to call table. In here, we always need the master, which is going to be the window. And let me just pack the entire thing to see what we get. By default, we're getting a plain white square. Although, if I go to the top, we can already see we have some kind of top row that doesn't do anything right now. That we can change. Inside of this, the idea is that you are defining some columns. For example, what I want to do is I want to have a column called first, then last, and finally email. If I run this now, you can see we have three different columns, although you can't see the title right now. We have to add what is called headings. So I want to get table and then specify a heading. And now I have to get the name of the column. And this is what we specified here. The first column is called first, the second one last, and the last is called email. Which means for the first column, I want to get my first column and the text in here is going to be first name. And now if I run this, we can see we have first name right in the middle. To get it to the left side, we have to add another argument inside of the original tree view. And this is called show. And in here, I want to add headings. Now if I run this, we get first name on the left side. By default, tkinter is showing some elements on the left side or in the first columns. And with this option, we are disabling that. Cool. Now, besides that, for the last column, I want to have, let's call it surname. And then for the email, I want to have the email. And with that, we have different columns. And then here, you could add as many as you wanted. And with that, we can cover how to insert values into a table. This we're doing with table and the insert method. In here, we need a couple of arguments. The first one is called parent. And this is usually going to be an empty string. What this means is you want this item to be attached to this table and not have any intermediaries. Later on, we're going to learn, you could also attach this new item to an existing item inside of the table. And then you would get the name of this item inside of the table as the parent. But if you leave it empty, you're going to attach it to the main table. Besides that, we need an index and we need the actual values. For the index, for now, let me go with zero. And the values is going to be a tuple. And since we have three columns, first, last, and email, we need three values in here. Let's call this John. For the surname, I want Doe. And for the email, I want to have John Doe at email dot com or whatever you want to add in here. If I run this now, we have a first name, a last name and the email. So this is going to create one entry, but I want to create a hundred entries. So let me comment this out. And instead, I want to create a for loop. So for i in 
range 100. And I want to use these values here to create random names. For that, I'm going to need one more module, and that is from random import choice. Choice we can use to pick one item from a list. And this could actually be a really good exercise for you. It's not going to be the main exercise for this video, but try to create from these names 100 entries and add them to the table and see if you can figure this one out. I want to create a first name, a last name, and an email. The first name is quite easy. I want to have choice and then first names. The same for the last names. I want to choice and pick a random item from the last names. For the email, I want to create an F string. And for this one, I want to have the first name. Then I want to have the last name, like so, and then add email.com. This information we can now turn into a tuple. Let me call it data. And here we have first, we have last, and we have email. Finally, I can actually get the table and insert the values. Once again, for the parent, I want to have an empty string. Besides that, for the index, for now, I'm going to go with zero. And then for the values, I want to have data. Now I can run this and we can see we have a table with a ton of different entries. This is looking really good. And there's one very quick layout thing that I do want to do. Inside of pack, I want to fill and add the option here for both and then expand. I want to set to true. I'm going to explain those values later, but if I add them, we are going to fill the entire widget with entries. That looks much better. And obviously, you could also change these values as much as you like. So for example, in the demo app, I don't use the first name for the email. I only use the first letter of the first name. So index zero here. And now we have some slightly different email addresses. Now let's talk about index. And the best way to understand it is if I play around with the value. For this one, we need parent with an empty string. For the index, by default, this is going to be zero. And for the values, I want to have something that's easily visible. Let me go with xxxxx, then we have yyyyy, and then we have zzzzz. If I run this now, all the way at the top, we have the values that I just specified with this entry here. If I change this index to a one, we are placing it on the first index. So below the first element. And this I can keep on doing three. We have three items on top and so on. The question now is if you wanted to add an element at the end of this table, how could you do it? I guess in our case, we know there are 100 elements. So I could add 101 in here and now all the way at the bottom, we have the entry I just created. But sometimes you don't know the end of the table. And for that, we can use TK and end. That way, the new item is always going to be inserted at the end. And I just realized this needs to be all in uppercase letters, like so. And now this is working. If I scroll all the way to the bottom now, we are always at the bottom. And that is what index is doing. There are two more things that we have to understand. We have events inside of a table and we have items. And those work really well together. So let me start with events. There's one special event that a table or a tree view has. We need two smaller than and two greater than signs. And then here we have tree view select. This is going to be triggered every time we are selecting an item inside of the table. For now, let me just lambda with event and I want to print the event that we are getting. So if I run this now and I click on one and we are not getting very much. As a matter of fact, the event is always going to be the same no matter what we click on. The event here, you can basically ignore. What you rather want to do is get table and then what is called selection. This gives us the currently selected items. So now if I click on something, we get a random number. And I can click on multiple items. The number is always going to be a bit random. So what does that actually mean? If this one here 
is the table. This table is populated with lots of items. This could be one item, this could be another item, this could be a third item. Basically, one item is one row of data. This is the item we are going to talk about in just a bit. Oh well, we are talking about it right now. And each of those items has a specific ID. This was what we have seen, something like IO and then two numbers, 45 for example. These numbers we can use to select items from this table. And this I want to do in a separate function. So let me define item select. This I want to run in here. So item select. In here, I need one argument for the event. Although since the event is basically pointless, I'm going to add an underscore in here to indicate that I don't care about this value. In here, once again, I want to print my table and then the selection. So if I run this now, I can click on various items and we get some random ID. This random ID I can now use. The way you use it is you want to get the table and then the item. And in here, you can add the table.selection. If I comment this out, there's going to be one problem. Because if I click on this, you can see we don't just have the ID, we have a tuple that has one element inside of them, and that is the ID. The reason for that is we can select multiple items. So if I select Thompson and hold shift, we have a bunch of different items. The way you are going to work with this is inside of a for loop. That'd be an easy way. So for i in table dot selection, then I can use table and item. And then here, I want to look at the item. This I could, for example, print and let's see what we get. If I now click on, let me show my mouse again. If I click on Lisa Thompson, we get text, nothing, image, nothing, and then values, Lisa Thompson, LT Thompson, and so on. Those are the main items, although there are a few more. For this video, I want to keep it simple. So in here, I only want to show the values. Now, if I show this again, I can click on one item and I can select multiple by holding down shift and we always get all of the different items or rather the actual values. And with that, we have also covered items. So let me get rid of the comment. And this is covering the basics of a table. Although there's one more thing that I do want to do. I can find another event. For this one, we only need one smaller and greater than symbol. And in here, I want to look for delete. If that is the case, I want to delete items. This delete here stands for the delete key on the keyboard. So in here, I want to delete items and create a function for the event. Again, we don't care about it, so an underscore. And let me just print delete so we can see what's going on. If I now run the entire thing and I have the table selected and I click on delete, we get delete. And I want to use this to actually get rid of a value. And this, I think, could be a really good exercise for you. Try to figure out this function here. The one method you need is called table.delete. In here, you can pass an item, and this is going to delete whatever item you pass in here. And that is going to delete the selected row. Although you have to figure out how to actually get all of the items. So pause the video now and try to figure this one out. Basically, what we have to do is very similar compared to this. In fact, let me copy it. And I again want to look at my entire selection. But now I don't want to print it. Instead, I want to get my table and delete it. And then here, I want to add I. So now if I run this again, and I can select a couple of entries. Let's go with those two. And if I click on delete, they disappear. This works with as many items as I can select and they always just disappear. That way we have quite a fancy table that works really well. And let me try to delete all of the values inside of this table. Then you can see it very well that this is indeed working quite good. Cool, so with that, we can delete items inside of this table.
or rather rows that usually makes a bit more sense. And with that, we have the basics of a table. Now tables do get quite complicated, so there's a lot more stuff that you could cover. But if you got so far and you have a documentation, this shouldn't be too hard. Let's create some sliders. Specifically, we are going to create this app here. Inside of there, we have a couple of sliders and a few progress bars. Right now I'm dragging the top one and this one is connected to a progress bar. On the bottom, you can see another progress bar and another slider, and those are also connected, meaning I can drag the slider and influence the progress bar and also update the text. Besides that, I can also write inside of this box over multiple lines. Let me add quite a few. And on the right, I can drag the text up and down. That is going to be the project for this part. And let's cover some basics. In Tkinter, there are two main widgets to create sliders. One is called a progress bar and the other is a slider. And both show progress in one dimension. This could either be the horizontal or the vertical axis. You can define this yourself. In terms of differences, the slider can be moved by the user or it can be set independently. Meaning you can either use the mouse or you can use something like a Tkinter variable. The progress bar works a bit differently. This one cannot be set by the user, so mouse input is not activated. Basically always need some kind of tkinter variable or something external to set it. But other than that, the two widgets work kind of in a similar way. So let's have a look. I already have a few lines ready. If I execute all of this, we can see we have a basic tkinter window. Nothing special. So let's start by creating a slider. A slider is called TTK and scale. This I want to store inside of a variable. I'm going to call it scale. In here, as always, at a minimum, we need the master, which is going to be the window. And once I have that, I can pack this widget. Now I can run this and we have a basic slider. I can move this around, but right now it doesn't really do anything. To get some interactivity, we have to add a few more arguments. The one that is the most useful, I feel, is called command. And this one works like a button. Anytime we are clicking on the scale, we are activating this command. Meaning in here, we need either a function or a lambda function. I am going to go with a lambda function. And I want to print, let's say, test. I can now run this. And if I click on the widget, we can see we are getting an error. The error being that Lambda takes zero positional arguments, but one argument was given. Which means when we are calling this Lambda function, ttk.scale enters one argument automatically. This we have to capture with a parameter, which we can do quite easily. I'm going to call it value. And just to see what happens, let's print this value. I can run the entire thing now, and if I move the slider around, we can see the values that this slider has right now. They start from zero and go all the way to one. These are the default values. And those you can change quite easily. We have seen the same thing from the spin box. You need from and underscore, don't forget that. In my case, I want to set the start value to zero. The end value is going to be set with two. I'm going to set this one to 25. With that, I can run the entire thing again, drag this thing around, and now we can see we have values from 0 to 25. Works pretty well. Before I continue, I want to put all of the arguments on separate lines, otherwise this is going to be difficult to read. Another argument you might want to consider is called length. And this one sets the length of the scale. So if I set 300 in here, we get a much longer slider. Although in terms of functionality, we have the very same numbers. Finally, we have what is called orient. And by default, orient is horizontal. I can run this now, and we have the same outcome. However, you might already see where this is going. I can set this to vertical, and now we have a vertical slider. That still works in exactly the same way. Finally, the last thing I do want to cover for a slider is you can set a variable. And this variable is just going to be a tkinter variable. 
Meaning before I create a slider, I want to create, I'm going to call it scale int, and this is going to be tk int var. This I can set as the value for the variable. Let me add scale int in here. If I run this now, nothing is going to happen. However, what I can be doing is, for example, set the start value of this tkinter variable to, let's go with 15. If I now run this, we can see that the start value is 0, the end value is 25, and this value here is 15. Which is already quite good at demonstrating how these two numbers work together quite well. Or, well, not numbers, more like widgets. You get the idea. I guess there's one thing I should cover, and that is that this scale int only stores integer values. That's why it's called integer variable. Which means if I, inside of the command lambda function, get my scale int and get the value. If I now run this again, I am only getting integer values. In the original, we had floating point numbers. So be aware that how you store this data is quite important. If you really wanted to store floating point numbers, you would need a double var. This one stores floating point numbers. Now I can run this again. And now we have the same output as before. I guess I can stick with this one. Seems to work quite well. Although I do want to change the name here from scale int to scale load. Cool. And with that, we have all of the basics of a slider. It really isn't that complicated. Which means next up, we can work on a progress bar. This we get with TTK and progress bar. As always, I want to store this inside of a variable. I'm going to call this progress and window for the master. And I want to pack the progress bar widget. If I run the code now, we're getting an error because this scale int should be scale float. Let's try it again. In the bottom of the window now, you can see we have a progress bar. Problem is, I can't click on it, nothing is going to happen. The reason being here that there is no mouse input for a progress bar. Instead, what you want to do is to use take in the variables and connect them via variable to this widget. For example, I could use scale float and now you already see we have some basic progress bar in here. And if I drag this thing down and up, you can see the progress changes inside of the progress bar. Although there's one thing that I forgot. Let me run the entire thing again. By default, we know that the slider currently is set to 15. And this 15 we have down here as well. But we don't know how far this progress bar goes. Although we do know it starts at zero. If I drag the entire thing all the way to the top, we get to zero. That part should be fairly obvious. You might be tempted for this one to set a two argument, like we have done for the scale. Unfortunately, this one works slightly different. The value you want to specify here is called maximum. If I set this one to 25, I can now drag my slider all the way to the bottom, and then we have a full progress bar. And this way, we can connect these two widgets quite well, and they work really, really well together. These are the two arguments you basically always want to use with a progress bar, although there are quite a few more. And to demonstrate them, I'm going to set all of this over multiple lines. That way I have a bit more space. The next one is called orient, and this one we have already seen. In here, for example, I can set this to vertical, and we have a vertical progress bar, although it works in exactly the same way. I don't want this to be vertical. I'm going to set this to horizontal. So now we have the starting point again. We can also set what is called the mode. In here, we can either set the terminate, which is what we already have, no change, or we can set this to indeterminate. If I run this, you can see the difference between the two. Now we don't have a complete progress. Instead, we just have a small bar. It's kind of hard to explain, but you can see it pretty well. Besides that, we also have length. This one, like for the slider up here, we can set the length of the progress bar. Let's go with 400. 
And now we have a really long progress bar. That still works with the slider, so no change there. With that, we have all of the main arguments that you could use for progress bar. Although there's one more thing that is a little bit weird. And that is that a progress bar has a couple of special methods. They're called start and stop. For example, if I set progress.start, run the code, you can see this thing starts by itself. And since we are changing the number, let me move it to the side. Let me close it actually. Once I click on start, the progress bar is going to start some progress. And this progress can also influence the variables, the one we have set here. Because of that, we are also going to change this scale here. Let me run the entire thing again, actually. You can see that when we start in the program, the indicator for the slider went down automatically. And it can't go any further, but if I move it, now the two are kind of fighting with each other. So you have to be really careful when you're using start. Generally, I wouldn't really recommend using start. There isn't usually a good reason for it. When you're using a progress bar, you want to have some external data set that gives you the data for this progress, like a download, for example. Using the start by itself probably is never really going to be useful. Although besides that, we also have stop. Although this one doesn't do very much because we are stopping this once we get started. I suppose a better way of approaching this is I want to stop this progress as soon as I click on this scale. This means instead of printing the value, I now want to get the progress and stop it. Let's try this one now. And now if I click on the slider, the progress bar doesn't go weird anymore. There's one thing I forgot, and that is inside of the start method, you can set a step size. Or rather, you can determine how often this start method is updating the progress bar. For example, if I set 1000 in here, this is in milliseconds, meaning 1000 milliseconds are one second. If I run this now, nothing happens, but after one second, we get some minor progress. So if that is your thing, this is also what you could be doing. Although in my case, I don't want to use the start method, so I'm going to comment it out. All right, there's one more widget that I do want to cover, and that is called scrolled text. Let me fix the typo. This scroll text we have to import because it's basically a compound widget. Let me import it first, and then you can see quite well how this is going to work. To import this, we need from tkinter, and we want to import scrolled text, all in lowercase letters. Once we have that, just be aware that this scroll text is not a widget in itself. It works rather like TTK. This one contains other widgets, which we can use down here. I want to create another variable. Let's call it scroll text. And now I want to get my scroll text and then dot and no uppercase s and scrolled text. And this is now going to be a widget. So this one needs a master. Once I have that, I can get the scrolled text, pack the entire thing. And now if I run it, we have a text field where I can type quite a bit. Let me go all the way to the bottom. And there you can see on the right, we have a scroll bar. Works quite well. This one is, well, quite straightforward. What you really have to be aware of here is that this is not one widget. Basically, we have a normal text widget and then on the right, or the scroll bar, we have a slider. We could make this ourselves, and later on, I'm going to have one part where we do make this thing ourselves. But for now, if you just want to have some simple text widgets, this is how you would go on about it. You can also set some custom parameters here. For example, you can set the width to, I don't know, 200. Let's see what we get. Possibly a bit much. Let's say 100. There we go. And you can also set the height of this thing to 20. And that doesn't do very much. Let's go with five so you can see it really well. There we go. Now we have a very short text field. But other than that, this scroll text you would use like a text widget. 
Now, I am not going to use this very much. I just want to cover it so you have a basic idea of what it is in case you see it. In my case, usually when you create a GUI, it is much more efficient to create your own scroll text, which means this is not going to be terribly relevant. Instead, I want to do an exercise and then we can finish up this part. I want you guys to create a progress bar that is vertical, starts automatically, and also shows the progress as a number. On top of that, there should also be a scale slider that is affected by the progress bar. Pretty much what we have done with these two widgets here. Pause the video now and try to implement this yourself. Let's get started by creating the progress bar that is vertical, that starts automatically, and that shows the progress as a number. Since we do have to store some data here, I want to create, let me call it the exercise, and this could be an integer. This, as always, is going to be an int var with no starting value. Once we have that, I want to create an exercise progress bar, and this we get with ttk and progress bar. For the master, we need the window. Then for the orientation to be vertical, I need to set orient to vertical. Besides that, I also have to declare the variable for this widget, which is going to be the exercise integer. With that, I can fix the typo and pack this widget. Let's see what we get. That's looking pretty good although it doesn't do anything right now. For that, I want to get exercise progress and start the entire thing. Trying this again now, we have an automatically starting progress bar. That covers most of the first bit, so we got so far. This bit here. Next up, we have to show the progress as a number, which means we are going to need a label with TTK and label. The master is going to be the window. Besides that, we are going to need a text variable, which is going to be the exercise integer. Don't forget to pack this label. And let's see, this is looking really good. Cool, I'm quite happy with this. Although here you can see one quite weird thing, and that is that this number is, well, a floating point number. We have point zero. I don't actually know why Tkinta is doing that, but when you're using an integer variable and set it as the text variable and the original number is a floating point number, like what we get from a progress bar, then Tkinta stores it as a floating point number but rounds it down. It's kind of weird, but this is basically never going to be an issue, so not too much to worry about. This covers the entire first part. For the next bit, we have to create another slider that is affected by the progress bar. Let's call this one exercise scale, and we need TTK and scale. The master is going to be the window, and in here, I want to have a variable, which is going to be the exercise integer. This exercise scale, I now want to pack. I can now run the entire thing. And now we can see we kind of have a problem. That is the slider is always all the way on the right. The reason for that is that the default values for a slider are between zero and one. To fix that, all we have to do is set a from argument for the slider, which I want to set to zero, and a to argument to, let's go with 200. And let's see what change that is going to make. Now we can see that the slider goes all the way to the halfway point. And if we change this to 100, we can see that all of this is working as intended. There we go, this is looking really good. And with that, we have the basic sliders inside of tkinter. The last change that I do want to make is I want to set the orientation of the original scale widget to horizontal. That way this thing doesn't look as cramped anymore. And this is what you have seen in the demo more or less. In this part, we are going to cover something slightly more advanced, and that is frames and parenting. Frames are just another widget. 
but you wouldn't really use them by themselves. Instead, use them to create better layouts. And for the better layouts, you are going to need parenting. Let's talk about it. So far, for the parent, we have always used the window itself. But that is very often not what you want. For example, if we are going to create a menu, you want to have every single menu item to have the actual menu as the parent. Or if you have a tab entry, you want to have every single widget inside of the tab with the parent being the tab. We're going to cover both of those cases in the next two parts. So I'm going to go into a bit more detail. But for both, you need more control over what the master is. What we're going to cover for this part is a complex layout or a slightly more complex one. Because what you can do is you can create a container widget and use that to organize your widgets. And then you can place the container widget somewhere on the window. The container widget here is going to be the frame. This one is called TTK frame and this is an empty widget. How you are going to use it is you are placing other widgets inside of it and then you place the frame. That way you are placing all of the widgets inside of it as well, which is really powerful to create more complicated layouts. For now, we're going to keep it fairly simple. But in the next major section, we're going to cover layouts in a lot of detail. So don't worry about too much for now. What you should take away from this part is how parenting works. Once again, here we are in the code. If I run all of this, we have an empty window that has a custom size, 600 by 400 pixels. What I want to start with is I want to create a frame. This I want to store in a separate variable. And this we create with ttk.frame. This one, like any other widget, is going to need a master, which in this case is going to be the window. Once we have that, I can pack this thing. And if I run it, we can see that we can't see anything. The reason being that frames are invisible. That being said, there's one way to visualize how a frame is going to look like. Right now, the window has this certain size. This I want to comment out. If I run the code now, we can see something like this. We basically only have the top control buttons. I can extend it, but by default, we have this size here. This happens because tkinter, or the window, tries to have the size of the widgets inside, which right now is an empty widget with no size, so we get something like this. But for a frame, we can set the width, let me go with 10, and we can set the height. In here, I want to go with 20. If I run this now, we have a very small window. I guess the numbers here are a bit small. Let's go with 100 and 200. That is looking a bit better. We have a width of 100 pixels and we have a height of 200 pixels. The numbers we get here and here. Another way you could visualize a frame, which I think is even better, is you could set a border with border width. And this, I'm going to go with 10. Although by default, you're not going to see anything. Also, there shouldn't be a typo in there, border width like so. This is looking better. Now we have a border width, but the border has no color, so it's invisible. For that, we have to set a relief. And for the relief, we have a couple of inbuilt options. The one I'm going to use is called TK and Rich, all in uppercase letters. If I now run this, we get the frame we have seen earlier. Except right now it has some kind of border thingy. The default for the relief is flat. With this one, you don't see anything. Besides that, we have raised and we have sunken. Those look like this or like this. It basically starts to look like a button. Another option is called groove, like so. And this one, I guess, is even better. Let's stick with this one. The relief option you're not going to use too often because most of the styles here look quite outdated. And later on, we're going to learn better ways to style it. Now we can actually start the interesting bit. And that is the parenting. Or I guess a more appropriate name in Tkinter would be master setting. 
Right now, the master was always the window. So the first argument we placed into any widget was always the window, which we created all the way at the top. This does not necessarily have to be the case. What we could, for example, do is create another label, or it could be any widget. You create this always in the same way, TTK label in this case. And now for the master, I want to set the frame. Other than that, I want to have text and this I want to call label in frame. You also still need to pack this label. And if I run this now, we can see a couple of things happened. The first one is that we have the label inside of the frame. However, besides that, the width and the height of the frame have changed. We don't have something like this anymore. Instead, we have, well, just this size here. So what happened? Well, the issue you have to understand here is that TTK primarily tries to set the size of a widget by its children. In this case, the frame only has one child and that is the label. And that overrides the width and the height. If you don't want that, there is an option to disable that. You will get the frame again and the option is called pack and propagate. This is a method, so we have to call it and in here, we can either set false or we can set true. If you set true, we are setting the size of the widget by its children. If we set false, we get the original size, meaning we are using the width and the height we have used for this tkinter widget. You can also set multiple children inside of one frame. For example, I could create another button and this one is also going to have the frame as the master. For the text, I'm going to go with button in a frame. I want to pack the button. And there we go. Now we have a button inside of it. And you can see we are cutting off the button a tiny bit, meaning that tkinter constrains the size of these widgets quite a bit. Let me increase the width of this widget to 200. Now this looks a bit better. And that's kind of all you need to set the master to something other than the window you have created. Right now, this doesn't seem too useful, but let me demonstrate one instance where this could be powerful. Let's call this example. I want to create another label. Let's call it label two. This label is going to have the window as the parent. And for the text, I want to have label outside frame. This label to I now want to pack. And now we can see that the label is outside of the frame, which is giving us quite a bit of space in here. However, now if I get the original frame and only pack it after label two, if I run this now, we can see we have the label on top and below that we have the frame itself with the widgets inside of that frame. Let me move it to the side. This label here is all the way on the top. And below that, we have all of the other stuff. This frame here and all of the children of the frame. What is even more powerful and what we are going to learn more about later. Let me return frame.pack to its original place. So this thing is going to look like so again. You can also inside of pack set a side. By default, this side is always the string top. But it doesn't have to be. You could also set left, for example. Let's see what this gets us. And now we have the frame on the left side with the label outside of the frame being on the top. This, however, we can also set to the left side. And that gives us two widgets right next to each other. With this system, you can create pretty powerful setups. And again, we're going to learn much more about this later. But for now, this is all I want to cover for this bit. Let's do an exercise and then we are done. What I want you guys to do is to create another frame with a label, a button and an entry widget and place it to the right of the other widgets. Pause the video now and see if you can figure this one out. Let's start by creating, I'm going to call this the exercise frame. This is going to be TTK and frame. This one has the parent of a window. I am not going to pack it just yet. Instead, I want to create a label, a button and an entry widget. 
Since those are not going to be doing anything right now, I am not going to store them inside of a variable. I am just going to create TTK label. The parent is going to be the exercise frame and the text is going to be label in frame two. Right after creating this, I want to pack it as well. I can copy this one now. Instead of a label, I want to have a button. The other arguments can stay identical. And finally, I want to have an entry widget. This one doesn't have a text argument. Once I have all of those, I want to get my exercise frame and pack it. Running this now, we are getting a couple of other widgets all the way on the top right. Although I realized the text here, this one shouldn't be labeled, this should be button in frame two. Let's run this again, and this is looking pretty good. Although the last thing that we do have to do is that when I'm packing the exercise frame, I want to set a side and the side should be left. Although this one has to be a string. And now we have another widget to the right of it. This one doesn't have a border around it, so it looks a bit different, but it's basically the same thing we have done in the original frame. And this kind of system, you can push quite a bit. For example, you could have one widget inside of a frame, which is inside of another frame, which is inside of the window. But once again, all of this, we are going to cover in much more detail in just a few sections. In this section, we are going to cover tabs. Let's have a look. This is what we are going to create. We have a basic set of widgets inside of one tab. Then we have another tab with some other widgets. The widgets in here work as expected and you can just play around with them. This is what we're going to create. And the widget we need is called TTK Notebook. The way this is going to work is that we want to set a couple of children to this notebook. This is almost certainly going to be a frame. And each frame is then going to become a tab. Since you can add lots of widgets to a frame, you can use that system to make widgets visible or invisible. It's honestly a fairly simple system. Here's the code. If I execute all of this, we have a basic window. And I want to create a tab widget. Or rather, I want to create a notebook. Let me call it notebook. And the widget we need is TTK and notebook. This one is going to have the window as the parent. I can pack this notebook right away, although by default, we can't see anything. The notebook by itself is going to be invisible. The only thing you are going to see are the tabs inside of it. Since we don't have any tabs right now, nothing is going to be visible. Which means I have to create a couple, let me call it tab one, and this is going to be TTK and frame. For the parent, I now want to set the notebook. While we are here, I want to create a second tab. I'm going to call it tab two. And this one also has the parent as the notebook. With this, I can run this again. We still can't see anything. What we now have to do is inside of the notebook, we have to add, and this is going to be tab one. And this wants to have a text. This text is going to be the name of the tab. I'm going to call this one tab one. Then I can duplicate it and change this one to a two. And now we should be seeing something. There we go. We now have two tabs, which means you can just place widgets inside of either of the frame, and then they're going to be visible inside of the respective tab. For example, inside of tab one, I'm going to add a tiny bit of white space. I'm going to call this tab one. Inside of tab one, I want to create a label with TTK and label. This one is tab one for the master and for text. I want to have text in tab one. Don't forget to pack this widget. And with that, we can see we now have some text in the first tab. Although tab two doesn't have anything right now, but we certainly have a good start. In the demo inside of the first tab, I also had a button, let me call it button one, TTK and button with tab one as the parent and the text is going to be button in tab one. 
Besides that, I also have to pack this button. And now we have text and we have a button inside of tab number one. Tab number two still doesn't have anything. All of that is going to happen inside of tab two. In here, I want to create label two, which is going to be TTK and label with tab two as the parent. The text is going to be, I guess, text in tab two makes the most sense here. This label two, I also want to pack. I have text and a button in the first tab and in tab number two, I have tab two. So this is working quite well. There's also going to be an entry. Let me call it entry two. And this is going to be TTK and entry inside of tab two. And there's nothing else in here and entry two and pack. And now we have the stuff you have seen in the demo. Honestly, this wasn't very difficult. All of these widgets work like anything else. If you understand how to set the master, this system should be really, really simple. Or at least I hope it is. Which means we can already do a challenge. What I want you guys to do is to add another tab with some buttons and text inside. Let's say with two buttons and one label to be a bit more specific. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out. I want to start by creating another frame. This I'm going to store inside of tab exercise and it's going to be a TTK and frame with the parent being the notebook. Inside of that, I want to create button exercise one with TTK and button, the parent being tab exercise and the text could be button one. It doesn't really matter what it is. This button exercise one, I also want to pack. And with that, I can just copy the entire thing and add another button here. All I have to do now is change the one to a two. The one in the name or the text should also be a two. That is going to give us the buttons. Besides that, I want to copy this one more time. I want to create a label which I get with TTK and label. This is going to be label. There we go. Now we are packing this one as well. With this, we have all of the widgets and the frame to put them inside. Next up, I want to get the notebook and add my tab exercise, like we have seen up here, which means besides that, I need a text and this is going to be tab exercise. Let's try this one now. And there we go. We have tab one, we have tab two, and we have tab exercise with button one, button two, and the label. That's pretty much it. I hope you can see how this system is fairly straightforward. There shouldn't be too much that can go wrong. I guess the one thing you want to be aware of is that this frame here, or these frames here, are not going to be packed themselves. For that, we're using this add method. For completion here, you don't actually have to set the notebook as the parent. For example, if I change this notebook to a window and run this again, we get the very same outcome. Although all of these other widgets do need the frame as the parent. I just think setting the notebook as the parent makes the most sense here, but choose whatever you want. In this case, it doesn't make too much of a difference. Let's talk about menus. In tkinter, you are creating a menu with TK menu. Be aware here, we are using TK, not TTK. But other than that, the widget is fairly straightforward. However, there's one thing you have to understand to create more complex menus. And that is that you are always using multiple TK menus and you nest them. Sometimes you can nest quite a few of them at the same time. And this can get a bit confusing and a bit complex. Let me give you an example. If you want to create a simple menu, you will place a TK menu inside of another TK menu and then this TK menu becomes an option. Now, what does that mean? Let's say we have our normal application. The entire window is the blue frame here. Inside of there, we have TK menu. This is the main menu. This would be just a normal top bar like you've seen in basically any other application. 
Inside of that, we are placing another item and this would be the TK menu. This would now be one of the entries inside of this menu. But other than that, both of these are just TK menu widgets. The red menu, though, can now have a couple of extra options. Meaning here we actually have items we can pick from. I hope that makes sense. You could make all of this even more complex because you could place for a sub menu a menu inside of a menu inside of another menu. For this example, I kept the colors constant. The main menu is the yellow one. Inside of there, we have a red sub menu or one item inside of the main menu. Inside of that menu, we have another menu. This would be one of the items in here. Inside of there, we could have other entries, like so. And we could even have other menus in here. This would still work. The system overall can get quite complicated. But, well, once you understand the basic logic, this really isn't too difficult, as long as you understand the nesting principle. Let me actually demonstrate what we are going to make. It's going to look like this. We have a menu with a couple of entries and inside of one, we have a submenu. On top of that, we also have a checkbox in here that we can check and uncheck. Finally, there is a separate menu button. It's basically a button with a menu, although it works like a menu. And that is all we need. Let's have a look at this in code. Once again, I have a few lines of code ready. If I execute all of this, we have a plain tkinter window doesn't do very much. In here, I want to create a menu. This we create with TK and menu. Like any other widget, this is going to need a parent, which in my case is going to be the window. On top of that, this widget I want to store inside of a variable that I'm going to call menu. While this menu is just another widget, we are not using the pack method on it. Instead, to turn it into the menu of the window, you would use window, configure, and then you would set the menu to the menu. If I run this now, we can't see anything. The reason for that is that this menu by default is invisible. We can only see the children inside of it. And since we don't have any children right now, we can't see anything. But that we can change quite easily. Let's start by creating one sub menu. I want to create TK menu again. Although now the parent is going to be the menu, the one we just created, this one up here. This I want to store as well in a variable. I'm going to call this one the file menu. The name is basically arbitrary. With this, we have an entry, but if I run the code, we still can't see anything. The reason for that is that we need one more line of code. We need to get our menu and then the method add cascade. For this one, we need two arguments. First of all, we need what is called the label. This is the text you are going to see. I'm going to call this one file. Besides that, we need a menu entry. This is the file menu we just created. And now we should be seeing something. There we go. In the top left, we now have file. Although if I click on it, we just see something empty that is doing some weird stuff. There are two reasons why this is happening. The more important one is that this file menu doesn't have any entries right now. To give it some, we have a couple of different options. The one you are going to use the most is the method add command. This one, like add cascade, has a label. Let me call this one new. And then we have a command. This one could be any function. In my case, I'm going to set a lambda function that is going to print new file like so. And now if I run this again, I can click on file and we have a new entry. If I click on that, we have a new file printout. That's pretty good. Although if I click again on file, you can see we have this separator thing. If I click on that, we are creating another window that is kind of weird. Although the menu still works, but this isn't the desired behavior. To fix that, when we are creating the file menu, we have to add one more argument, and that is called tear off. By default, this one is true. 
and that means you can tear away the menu and have it as a separate window. I do not want this behavior, so I'm going to set this to false. Running this again now, inside a file, we only have the menu entry. This is looking like a proper menu. And let's go through the entire thing again, just to make sure all of this makes sense. We have the entire main window up here. That is the entire window. That one should be fairly obvious at this point. Inside of that thing, we have a menu. This is the entire menu bar up here. For that, you need the menu widget itself. And on top of that, you have to run window configure and set the menu as the menu. Inside of that, we have right now one menu or one submenu that is called file menu. This is the file we have created here. For that, we need another TK menu and we have to get the original menu and add cascade. Then inside of this file menu, let me clean this up a bit. Inside of this file menu, we can add different entries with, for example, add command. There are a couple more entries, but add command is the one you probably want to use. If you got this far, the worst part about understanding menus is basically over. Because now we could run this add command a second time. Besides new, let's say I also want to have open, which is going to print open file. Let's run all of this again inside of the file menu. I now have new and open. Let's still both do a command. Cool. This is working quite well. And I guess Besides add command, there are a couple more methods you could use. A really simple one is called add separator. Don't forget to call it. If you run this one, we now have a separator between the menus. This one doesn't really do anything, but it's a nice way to separate the menu entries. To get all of the entries, this website here is pretty good because if you scroll down, you have a couple of basic options and below that, you have all of the methods you could use. For example, we have used add command and we have used add separator. There's also add radio button, add check button. Those are quite obvious, I think. And you can also delete and do quite a few more things, but I want to keep it simple. If you want to go into more depth, check this out in your own time. I want to create another sub menu. This I want to store in a separate variable. Let me call it the help menu. This again, we create with TK menu. Once again, menu is going to be the parent and tear off. I want to set to false, like the one we have created up here. This sub menu, I now have to attach to the main menu, which means I want to get my main menu. Then I want to add cascade. The label here is going to be help. And then the menu is going to be the help menu. I can run this now and there we have a second menu item. This one, if I click on it, doesn't do anything because there are no entries, but file still works just as before. For this one, I want to have one item. Let's copy the add command from the file menu, except this one should be for the help menu. In here, for example, the label could be help entry and this one just prints help. It doesn't really matter what it is. And this we have already seen a couple of times. So if I run this, we now have a second menu besides file menu. This one is pretty straightforward. Let's do something a bit more interesting. For this help menu, I now want to add a check button. This is going to work basically like the normal check button that you have seen in the buttons a couple of sections ago. Although first of all, we need a label. And this label I just called check. Since we're working with a check button in here, we can set an on value that I want to set to on and we have an off value that I want to set to off. These two values we have to store somewhere. For that, I want to use a tkinter variable. I'm going to call this one help check string value. The value here is going to be tk and a string var. This variable I now want to set for this check button so variable is going to be the help check string. That should be all we need. Let me run this. And if I click on help now, we have the check entry. I can click on it. And now we have this entry checked. I can click on it again and it disappears. Cool. 
Once we have that, we can always get the value from inside of this tkinter variable. For example, inside of this add command, instead of printing help, I want to get help check string and get the value. Let's try all of this. Inside of help, I still have the check entry. I can click on it and it still works. And now if I click on help entry, we get either on or if I unselect the check, I get off. So this is working pretty good. With that, we have created some basic menus. And once again, the main difficulty here is the nesting. That we always place one menu inside of another menu, but they are the same widget. Besides that, we can also create a menu button. This is a separate widget that is called TTK and menu button. This as always is going to need a master. In my case, this is going to be the window and we need a text like any other button. I'm going to call this one the menu button. On top of that, this needs to be stored in a variable. Menu button is a good name here, I think. For this button, we need the normal pack method because this one functions well like a button. Menu button and pack. And now we have a menu button. Although if I click on it, nothing happens right now because we don't have any entries. That being said, once you got this far, you can just add TK menus to it. Let me create one TK menu. In here, the parent is going to be the menu button and tear off is also going to be false. This I want to store, let me call it button sub menu. Once we have that, we basically want to do what we have done here. We want to set the sub menu to the parent menu via configure, which means I want to get my menu button. I want to run configure. And here I want to set the menu to my button sub menu. Let's try this one now. And now if I click on the button, we still can't see anything. The reason for that now is that this button sub menu doesn't have any entries. Although that we can change very easily, all we need is the button sub menu. I want to add a command. For this, we need a label with entry one or whatever you want to add. And we have a command that is going to be lambda in my case, that is going to print test one. If I now fix the typo and run this, this should be working. Now we have entry one. I can click on it and we also get entry one. Besides that, we could also add a check button. For this one, we can just leave it like so. I guess I can call it check one. I can run this now. And now we have a check button in here that I can click on. Works like any other menu. It's kind of similar compared to the menus you've seen before, but not that much. The main difference is that now you have a menu button and for this one, you have to configure the menu to be the proper menu. Oh, and what I forgot, this configure, you could simplify a tiny bit. This is what we have seen earlier. Besides this line, you could get the menu button. In here, you could get the menu and the value of this menu could be this button sub menu. The result would be the same. If I run it, we still have the same outcome. Choose whichever you like more. It's really up to you. Both are equivalent. We are nearly done, although I want to do an exercise. This exercise I want to place before we are setting the menu to the window. I want you guys to add another menu item to the main menu. Like file menu and help menu, you should create another menu. The one difficulty for this one is that this new menu you're going to create should have one sub menu meaning a menu inside of the menu you are going to create. For that, you want to read this website, the one I just talked about. I want to start by creating an exercise menu. This is going to be TK and menu. In here, the parent is going to be the main menu and tear off, I want to set to false. Just to make sure that we have one entry in here, I want to get this exercise menu and add a command. For the label, I just want to have exercise test one. 
This is actually all we need. You don't have to specify a command if you don't want to or don't need to. Finally, to see this menu, we have to get the main menu and we have to add cascade. Like we have done here and here. We need a label, this one I called exercise. The menu is going to be the exercise menu. With that, I can run the entire thing. And now we have the exercise menu with exercise test one. And I can see I have a typo. This should be exercise, like so. With this, we have covered the first part of the exercise. The next one is a bit more interesting. I want to add a submenu to this submenu, meaning we have a sub submenu. This submenu, I want to store in another variable. I'm going to call it exercise submenu. Although this one, once again, is just going to be another TK menu. With menu being the parent and tier off being false. The way you have to think about it is that this exercise submenu, we want to add to the exercise menu, like we have added the exercise menu to the main menu, which we have done with add cascade. Which means I want to get my exercise menu and add cascade. Once again, we need a label. Let's call it more stuff. Besides that, we also need a menu. This is going to be the exercise sub menu. Now if I run this, inside of exercise, we have more stuff. And this one doesn't do anything right now because it has no entries. But that we can change very easily. For this exercise sub menu, I want to add a command, like I have done for the exercise menu, which means I can copy the exercise menu add command and change this to exercise sub menu. With a new label, some more stuff. Now I can run this, and if I now click on exercise, more stuff, we have a sub sub menu. This could then be literally anything. Once again, the nesting here is the complicated bit, but all we have really done is we have the main menu all the way on the top. This is where everything else goes in. Inside of this menu, we are adding one exercise menu. For that, we are creating a TK menu widget and we are using add cascade on the parent menu to create this menu item. Although this add cascade, we can do on any menu item. For example, on this exercise menu, we have added another sub menu. And I'm fully aware that this can be kind of confusing. Definitely go through this slowly and make sure you understand every level of nesting. Although with that, we have finished the menus. In this part, I'm going to talk more about how to change the window. So far, we only really changed the title and the size of the window, but we can do quite a bit more. We can, for example, change the opacity, the position, the full screen status and the title bar and quite a few more things. Although all of this is really simple. So let's jump right in and let's have a look. Once again, I have the basic setup that we have seen multiple times by now. I can execute this and this is what we get. So far, we always change the window title and the window geometry. For the window geometry, we always specified the width and the height of the window, which right now is 600 by 400. Let me run the window again. 600 by 400 specifies the width and the height of the window. Although you can extend this a tiny bit. Inside of this string, you can also add the position of the window. This you do by adding a plus, then you give the left position of the window, another plus, and then the top position. If you add numbers in here, you are going to place the window or the top left of the window and then the rest is going to follow. For example, if I change these numbers to zero and zero, I now have a window starting in the top left. If I change the left number to 100, we now have a slight gap to the left side. Finally, I can change the top number to 200 and now we have even more space to the top. You're probably not going to use this very much, but in some circumstances, it can be really useful. What you do want to use much more often, however, if I run this again, by default, we always have this feather here or the logo of T Kinter. This you can also change. 
Although for that, you need a specific kind of file. It's called an ICO or ICO file. Inside of the file folder, here are all of the Python files I have used so far. Besides that, we also have a file called Python. And this, if I show you the properties, is an ICO file. This is what you need for the title bar. Once you have that, all you have to do is get the window and icon bit map. And now you need the file name. In my case, this is python.ico. Now I can run this again. And now on the top left, we have the Python symbol instead of the tkinter symbol. If you look online, you can find lots of websites that convert a PNG or a JPEG file to an ICO file. It's completely free and very easy to do. And it does make quite a difference in terms of how your app is going to look. So I would definitely recommend designing your own logo. Although, well, it can be something quite complex. Besides that, we have a few more, let me call it window attributes. For this one, for example, we could set a window min size. For this, we need a width and a height. A tkinter can never be smaller than these two numbers. For the width, let's say I want to have a minimum number of 200. For the height, I want to have a minimum height of 100. I can now run this thing again. And if I scale the window, this is the smallest I can scale it to. It never goes smaller than that. We also have a maximum size. Let's say for this one, I want to have 800 by 700. I can run this again. And now I can only scale the window to this size here. Let me move it a bit further to the top, like so. This is the maximum I can scale it to. There's one more entry that's useful here, and that is called window and resizable. For this one, you can specify if the app can be resized either in the X dimension or in the Y dimension, or horizontally or vertically. For example, if I set X to true and Y to false, we are only able to scale the app in the horizontal dimension. Let's try this one. And now if I scale the app left and right, this one works as before. However, I cannot scale it up or down. This one simply doesn't work. It's very hard to see, but well, try it yourself. Most of the time, you are not going to use this or the max size. They are quite rare. However, the minimum size I would always set because if you don't set it, the user could minimize your app to a size of zero and zero, which would look very strange. Besides that, you can also get screen attributes. So the screen your app is running on. The two important aspects you want to know here are the width and the height of the screen your app is working in. This you would get with window and winfo underscore screen width. Don't forget to call it. This is a method. This method is going to return the width of your screen, not the app, the actual display. This I want to print, and after I run this, I get 1536. This is the width of my monitor. I can duplicate this. The same thing is going to work with the height. Meaning I can run this now, and the height of my monitor is 864 pixels. This information very often can be surprisingly useful. For example, the exercise we are going to do in a couple of minutes is going to be about starting the window in the center of the screen. And if you know geometry and this information, this is quite easy to do. But let's first do some other things. In here, I want to set some window attributes. And I realized the naming here is not ideal. This is actual window attributes, whereas this one was rather window. Let me rename this to window sizes. That's much more appropriate. The reason for that is that a window has actual attributes. For example, in here, we could set the alpha value. For this one, you can set one additional value. And this value has to be between 0 and 1, with 1 being full transparency and 0 being the app being completely invisible. Let me set this to 0 0.5, run this again, and now we can see we have a transparent window. Works pretty well. If I set this to a 1, we have the proper window, and if I set this to 0 0.1, we get a barely visible app. Besides that, we can also set top most. 
If you set this value to true, you can run the entire thing again. And let me change the transparency back to one. If I run this again, you can't see any difference. The app still works just as before. However, if I now bring in the folder you have seen a second ago, this folder is always behind the window. Even if I have it selected, it's always behind the window we just created. And this happens because of this topmost being true. It sets the window we currently have on top of any other window. Besides that, there are a few more attributes, but those can cause problems. For that, I want to add a security event. All I really want to do is add window.bind, and I want to check if I am pressing the escape button. If I am doing that, I want to run a lambda function that quits the window, which I can do with window.quit. So if I run this now, I have a window open. If I click on escape, the window disappears. The reason why I want that is because some of the attributes can make it impossible to close the window. One example for that could be window attributes. And in here, one option you can use, and they always start with a dash. I don't exactly know why, but you just have to add it. You could disable the entire window. For this, you have a Boolean value that is either true or false. The default here is false, but if you set it to true, the window is going to be disabled. Let me run it. And now, no matter where I click on the window, nothing is going to happen. The only way I can close the window is by pressing on escape because of this line here. But the window itself doesn't do anything. Finally, another thing that you can do is to set the window to full screen. If you have set this one and you start the app, it is going to start in a full screen mode. Although if I run this right now, we're going to get an error. There we go. The reason being that this part here, we cannot set the full screen because we have a max width and a max height. And this is smaller than my monitor. The problem is this one here. Let me disable it. And on top of that, I also want to disable the disabling of the window. And also, I want to disable topmost because we don't need them right now, and I want to focus on the full screen. Now if I run this, note here in the top right, we don't have any menu items or title bar. So we can only close the window if we press on escape. And this we can do because of this line. If we didn't have it, we would have to use the task manager to close it, which is kind of annoying. But with that, we have the basic window attributes. There's one more thing that I do want to cover. And that is, let's call it the title bar. Also, I want to comment out the full screen so we can see what's going on like so. Now, for the naming, what I want to do now is this thing here is I think called a title bar. This you can also hide. That you do with window and override redirect. I have no idea why it's called like that, but if you set true in here, you don't see any title bar anymore. Which makes it kind of annoying to close the app, so we have to close it via the event. But this is super useful to create nicer looking apps, because if you don't have the title bar, you have much more options in terms of styling. The problem is, if you have something like this, you also are not able to resize the app, which is, well, a problem. For that, tkinter has another widget that you can use. It is called TTK and size grip. For this one, I want to set the master to the window and I want to store it inside of a variable that I call grip. This grip we could, for example, pack now, but this is not what you would want to do. But if I do it, we have this kind of app here. And if I use it, I can drag the window again. Although right now I can only move it left or right or scale it in the horizontal axis because of this resizable. If I comment it out, run this again, now I can properly resize the app. And the position here is very awkward for this thing, but we could change that. Although for that, we need a different kind of layout method. We're going to cover those in much more detail in the next major section. But what you would use for this one is called place. In here, you can specify a relative X position, which is going to be 1.0, and a relative Y position, which is also going to be 
Finally, you want to set an anchor, and this is going to be South, East, or SE in short. If I run this now, we have the size bar in the bottom right, and this is much better. Now we can resize this window. The way, let me place it like this. The way place is going to work is we have the entire window and we start at position 0.0, .0 and all the way on the right, we have 1.0. And any point in the middle here, we can choose from. This works either on the horizontal axis or on the vertical axis. And those you get with relative X or relative Y. If we get 1.0 for both, we end up in the point in the bottom right. And this is where we are placing this size grip. The anchor is going to set which point you are placing. The way you want to think about it is that there's a rectangle around this widget. And by default, we are placing the top left or the northwest point. We, however, want to set the southeast point. So the bottom right point should be in the bottom right corner. I'm not going to go into too much detail. We're going to cover all of this in much more detail in just a bit. But this is all you need to create a window without a title bar, which can be super powerful. With this, we have all the methods for a basic window, and this gives you a ton of control over how you want to style your app. Or it is going to give you much more control later on in terms of what you want to do. All right, with that, I want to do an exercise, and the exercise I am going to place right here, below the window creation. Because what I want you guys to do is to start the window in the middle of the screen. So pause the video now and see if you can figure this one out. First of all, I want to declare some variables. I want to get my window width, and this could be any number. I'm going to go with 1400. This, by the way, is going to overwrite this 600 here. As a matter of fact, I want to comment out this geometry here entirely. Besides that, I want to have a window height. This I want to set to, let's go with 600. Besides that, I need to know my display width and my display height. Both of those I am getting from this down here, so I can just copy them. I want to get my window info screen width and the window info screen height. That is all the information we are going to need. Once we have that, we can declare a variable for the left point and for the top point of our window. And the way you want to think about it, this one here is going to be the entire window we are working with. This one has this display width and this display height. Inside of this display, we want to add our app right in the middle. The problem is when we are placing this window, we are placing this top left point. And for this top left point, we have to figure out the left and the top position. For that, first of all, I want to get the center of my display roughly this point here. This I get by dividing the window width by two and the window height by two. That way I get exactly to this point. Once I have that point, I can simply subtract half my window width and half my window height. And then I get to this top left point. Let's start with the left side. I want to get my display width and divide it by two. From that, I want to subtract my window width and also divide this by two. That is all we need. The same thing for the top, except for this one, I want to get my display height divided by two and subtract my window height also divided by two. Once we have all of that, I can actually set window and the geometry. For this one, I now want to create an F string. In here, we need the width x the height. The width is going to be the window width and the height is going to be the window height. After that, we have to add a plus and now we need the left point and another plus with the top point. Those are the two points we have just created here and here. Which means now, if I run all of this, we are getting an error. The error you can see down here. 
we have a bad geometry specifier. But the numbers look kind of okay. The problem here is that tkinter is expecting integers, but we got floating point numbers. Python always creates a floating point number whenever you divide two numbers. This we can fix quite easily. All we need is to wrap all of this inside of an integer function, and then we're going to convert the float into an integer. So now if I run this, there we go. We have our app right in the middle of the window. And with that, we have covered all of the really basic parts you need to know about tkinter widgets and the window. So for the next major part, we can work on the layout. Layouts are one of the most important part of any GUI framework. They can also be one of the most annoying parts because it's probably going to be a very common thing for you that you want to place a widget in a very specific spot, but somehow you just cannot place it there, which is a very frustrating thing to work with. So let's talk about layouts and what you can do in tkinter. There are three major methods that you have to be aware of. The most common one is called pack. This one takes a window and lets you stack widgets in a certain direction. By default, you are going from the top to the bottom, which means the first widget is all the way on the top, in the middle, and then you place other widgets below it. While you're doing that, you can also customize things quite a bit. For example, you can tell widgets to take up the entire horizontal space or the entire vertical space, or both as well, that also works. Besides that, you can also stack widgets in different directions. For example, you can go from left to right, right to left, or bottom to top. Other than that, pack is fairly simple and, well, that's kind of all you have to know about it. We're going to do a lot of examples later on with this one. The next layout method is called grid. This one works by creating a grid over the window. And this grid you are then using to place widgets in a certain position with a certain size. This could, for example, look like this, like this, like this, and you can also place widgets on top of each other with an overlap, like so. This system gives you a ton of flexibility. You could, for example, change the height of each row or the width of each column. Grid is generally the system you want to use if you want to create really complex layouts. Again, we're going to do a ton of examples later on. Finally, we have the place method. This one is kind of the simplest because you just take a window and you place widgets with a certain position. You can also change the size and this one is fairly straightforward. You always have an X and a Y position and you're using that to place the widget. With that, we have the three major tools that you are going to use. And what is super important that you have to understand is that you can combine these layout methods very easily. As a matter of fact, this is what you have to do to create any kind of complex layout. For that though, you do want to be aware of a couple of things. The most important part is that you are going to rely very heavily on parenting and frames. That way you can combine different layouts and keep them organized. Basically what you are going to do is you are placing one layout inside of a frame and then you are placing that frame. That way you keep everything much more modular and much easier to maintain. Let's do an example. This is going to be our main window. This I want to separate into two parts. For that, I'm going to use pack. We have a frame on the left that is a bit more narrow and a larger one on the right. Inside of the left one, I want to use the grid method, like so, to place a couple of other widgets, like so. This could, for example, be a simple menu with a couple of vertical sliders. Inside of the right frame, I want to place a couple of widgets like so. I can place them wherever I want since I am using place. With that, I have created a fairly complex layout that is still quite maintainable because each part works inside of a frame and it makes it very easy to change things. We never create a layout that's too complicated. What you can also do is mix different layouts inside of the same frame. For example, you could place another widget on top of a grid. That way you can basically create any kind of layout. So with that, we have the basics that you need. And let's do a couple of examples. Although I really want to emphasize for this part, I only want to have a couple of very basic examples. 
over the next couple of videos, we are going to expand on all of this quite a lot. As always, we have a super basic window. If I run all of this, we have a simple window. Doesn't do anything right now. Inside of this one, I want to create two widgets. Let me call it widgets. I want to have label one and I want to have label two. I'm creating both with TTK label. The parent or the master is going to be the window. The text is going to be, let's say label, and this could be label one or label two. On top of that, there's one more thing that I do want to do. When we are creating the label, we can style this very easily by giving it a background. For this, we can just choose plain name colors like red. Or besides that, we can also use blue. That makes it much easier to see what's going on. These widgets I now want to place somewhere on the window. And for that, we have the different layout methods. The easiest one is pack. This one we always use by getting a widget, let's say label one, and packing it. In the simplest sense, you don't need any arguments. And I can just pack label one and label two. If I run all of this, we have label one and label two. Although in here, you can specify a couple of different things. For example, you could specify the side. One could be left, and this always has to be a string. Or the side could be right. If I run this now, we have the label on the left and on the right. Still in the middle though. We could also use bottom here. Also works just fine. And if we have the left side for both widgets, we are stacking them on top or to the right of each other again. Besides that, you can also tell a widget to expand. And this is either true or false. By default, it is false. If I set it to true, however, the widget is going to take up the entire available space. Which means in our case, the entire available space on the x-axis is this space here. Although we have label two, which takes up this vertical space here, which means the entire space the widget can take up is this width and this height. To make this even more visible, we can use the fill argument. For this one, we can either use X, Y, or both. And this one tells the widget if it is going to fill the entire available space. Let me run this actually, then you see what I mean. There we go. Now label one is going to fill the entire available space. Whereas if I only set this to X, we are only filling the horizontal space. If I set this to Y, we are only filling the vertical space. You can do that with the other widget as well. If I expand this, or I set expand to true, now we are splitting the entire window by two, which means tkinter is quite smart about it. If you have two widgets that are expanding, they are intelligently separating the space that is available. And let me set this to fill both. And then we get something like this. This is one way to place widgets. Besides that, we have the grid method. For the grid, we have to start with some basic setup. We have to get the window, and then we need column, configure, and we need, I think you can already see where this is going, we need row configure. For this one, we are determining, first of all, the index of the row, and then we need a weight. Let's go with one for now. With this, we have created one column. I can create a second one by duplicating this line and setting this to a one. And let me add a third one with the index two, and the weight for this one could be, let's say two. With that, we have three different columns, although the final column is twice as wide as the other columns. So if I draw the entire thing, we have one column here that has a width of one. We get a second column also with the width of one. And then we have a final column and this is as wide as the other two columns combined. The same thing we can do for the row. In here, I want to have a first row with the index zero and a weight could also be one. This information we can now use to get our label. Let me use label one and use the grid method. In here, we have to specify a row. Let's start with zero and a column. This one I can set to one. If I run this now, 
we have the label in some position. It's kind of hard to tell what's going on. Although if I draw on this, we have roughly one column here, one column here, and then we have the wider column here with the width of two. The reason why this is so hard to see right now is because the label only takes up the minimal amount of space. So the space it needs to display the text. But this we can change as well. And the argument we need here is called sticky. This one tells it to which border the widget is going to stick. And this one needs compass directions. For example, I could place it here just north. That way, the widget is always going to stick to the top part of the cell. I can also add another direction, south. That way it sticks to the north and the south. And if I add all of the directions, then it's going to stick to all four sides. And now you should see a bit better what's going on. We have column zero, column one, and then column two, with column two being twice as wide as column one and two. If I add label two in here, this is going to be even more visible. For this one, I still want row zero, but now I want column zero as well. Now I can run this one again, and there we go. Now we have label one and label two and an empty column. This I can make even more complex by adding another row, and this one is going to be row one. If I run this now, we can see we have split the entire thing in half. What I can also do is place label two and make it take up this entire space. For that, I have to tell it to occupy this column here and this column here. This I do with the column span method. Although first of all, we have to change row to one, column to one, and then we need column span. I want to tell the widget to span two columns. And if I run this now, we can see we have label two occupying two columns. Once again, I will go into much more detail later on, but if you understand this system, you understand 90% of it. It doesn't get that much more complicated. The final layout method we have is called place. For this one, again, I want to have one widget and I want to place it although this should be a dot. We need an X position and we need a Y position. For simplicity, let's start with X being zero and Y being zero as well. If I place this now, you can see we have label one in the top left. What you have to understand about this one is that when we are placing the widget, the actual position we are placing is the top left, this position here with the entire window being a coordinate system that goes like so and so. The one thing that can be kind of confusing here is that if you want to go downwards, you have to increase Y. The higher this number is, the further down we go. In computers, basically any kind of layout always works like that. If you only know high school geometry, this can be kind of confusing, but you get used to it quite fast. If you do any kind of game development, they use the same system. Although X is a bit easier, if you want to go further right, you have to increase X. This one should be quite straightforward. Let's say I want to say X to 100. If I run this now, this distance here is 100 pixels. The same thing I can do for Y. If I set this to 200, we have 200 pixels from the top. We know in our case, the window has a size of 600 by 400 which means if I set the Y position to something like 380, we should have label one almost at the bottom. And there we go. This looks pretty good. You can actually also specify a few more things in here. You have the width. I could, for example, set this to 200 and you have the height. This I could set to, let's say 100. And now for run this, we can, well, only see part of the widget. That's because it is so far down. If I set this to 200, now this is more visible. We now have a widget that is 100 pixels from the left. This number here, it is 200 pixels from the top. That is this number here. And it has a width of 200 and a height of 100. With that, you can place a widget basically wherever you want. And all of these numbers are absolute. So we always have pixel positions. You can, however, 
if I am placing label two with the place method again, use relative numbers. For this one, you would use relative x and relative y. What you have to understand about this one is that now we don't have pixel positions. Instead, what we are doing for this one is this one here is the entire window, and we are declaring that the top left point is position 0 and 0 for x and 0 and 0 for y. The bottom right position, this one here, is going to be 1.0 for x and 1.0 for y. Which means if we have relative x 0 and relative y being 0 as well, we are going to be in the top left position, this point here. Let's try this one. Let's try. And there we go. Label 2 is in the top left position. If I change this to 0 0.5 and 0 0.5, now label 2 is roughly in the middle. Or to be more specific, we are placing the top left point. This one is right in the middle of the window. I can actually demonstrate this by reducing the size of this thing. They can see this label 2 is always in the middle, even if we change the size of the window. This, however, doesn't apply to label 1, because for this one, we only have pixel positions. Generally, when you're using place, you want to use relative positions. You can also set the relative width. Let's say if this one is 1, now the widget is taking up the entire space, like so. Although, keep in mind here, we are cutting off the widget a tiny bit. This one here is the entire width of the window, and widget 1 is going to have the entire width as well. However, we cannot see this part here because the widget is starting on this position. So some bits are cut off. To change that, we would have to change what is called the anchor. This is the point you're actually placing. If this one here is the widget, we are always placing this point. And then the rest of the widget is going to follow. By default, we always place the northwest point. But we could also place the southwest point or the southeast point or the northeast point. Besides that, we could also place the center. Let's try with this one. If I place in here, this has to be a string. I place the center. Now we are placing the center of the widget and we are filling the entire window width. We could also change this to southeast and there we go. Now we are placing only the right point, which means if I move this a bit to the side, the point we are placing is the southeast, meaning this point here is right in the middle of the window. And then the entire width is going to be something like this, which means once again, we are cutting off some parts. You can play around with this a lot and I would recommend you to do so, but this is all you have to know for the basics. And well, these are the three major ways to place elements inside of a window. Over the next couple of videos, I'm going to go into a lot of detail. For this video, I'm not going to add an exercise. Instead, I would recommend you to go over all of this and make sure you at least have a very basic understanding of how this is going to work. Ideally, create a few more labels and just place them wherever and see if you can work with all of them at least reasonably okay. In this video, we are going to cover the pack layout method in tkinter. The project we are going to make by the end of this video is going to look something like this. It's nothing too complicated, but definitely enough to understand the basics of this layout method. Let's talk about it. In the most basic sense, pack works by stacking widgets in a certain order. By default, we are stacking widgets from the top to the bottom. Which means the first widget is all the way on the top, and then we have widgets always below that. You can already tell here, we have a couple of ways to customize this. For example, we can tell a widget to take up all of the horizontal space or all of the vertical space, like so. To create these kind of effects, you have three different arguments that you have to understand. The most important one is the side. This one determines which side the widget is added to. The options here are fairly straightforward. We have left, we have right, we have top, and we have bottom with top being the default argument. Besides that, we have expand that is true or false. 
This one determines the vertical or horizontal space in which it can occupy. Can here is the key word, because expand only determines how much space a widget potentially has. It doesn't tell you how much space it is actually going to use. Fundamentally, what you have to understand is that in Tkinter, we have a disconnect between the space a widget can occupy, for example, this widget for here, could theoretically occupy this entire space. But the widget itself might only occupy this area here. We have to specifically tell the widget to actually occupy all of this additional space here. It doesn't do it automatically. For that, we have one more argument, and that is called fill. This one determines how much space the widget is actually going to occupy. The arguments we can use here are x, y, both, and none. None being the default argument. This one tells the widget to be as small as it possibly can. However, if we specified x in here, we would tell the widget to take up all of the horizontal space, which would make the widget look something like this. If you understand these three arguments, you can use pack really well. Although there are two more arguments that you do need to understand. Both of those are for the padding. Those two are incredibly easy and I'll cover them at the end. Don't worry too much about them. So let's go into a bit more detail. For the side, again, we have left, right, top, and bottom. And this determines the direction of the widgets, or rather how we are stacking these different widgets. The four options we have are top, bottom, left, and right. I don't think I have to explain all of this too much. It should be fairly straightforward. Let's get started by playing around with this argument. Here I have some basic tkinter code. I am importing tkinter. I have a basic window with a title and a geometry, and I'm running the main loop. That way, if I run the entire thing, you can see a basic window. On top of that, I have created a couple of widgets. Most of them are labels with some basic text and a background. That way, it's easy to see what's going on. Finally, I have a button that doesn't do anything. You cannot see any of these widgets because I am not placing them on the main window. But this I want to do by adding another section that I'm going to call layout. For this one, I want to place all of the labels using the pack method. I have label one, label two, label three, and the button. If I run this now, you can see we have the basic pack order. We start all the way from the top and we are going downwards with each widget taking up the minimum amount of space. This packing order we can customize. Let me select all four of them and in here I want to specify a side. By default we have top. If I run this one we cannot see any difference. However if I change this to let's say left, now the widgets are being placed from the left and we're going further to the right. With the first widget being placed all the way on the left, the next widget is to the right of it, and then so on. The same is going to work with right. And finally, we also have bottom. There we go. This should be quite straightforward. You can also combine different sides, meaning not all of those have to have the same side. For example, the first label could have the side right, and if I do that, we get some slightly weird outcome. I'll talk about this later. For now, just ignore it. With that, we have the basics of the site. Next up, we have the expand method. This can be either true or false. This one determines how much space a widget can occupy. Again, can is the really important word here. Also, the widget only expands in one direction. Let's talk about this one. Once again, we have a window and we are placing one widget and then we are placing the second widget. This is the one we have seen already. What you might assume here is that expand expands this widget all the way left and right. But that is not the case because the width of a widget is not set by expand if the side is top or bottom. Instead, we would only set the height of the fourth widget. Or in other words, height is set by expand but only vertically in this example. And I'm pretty sure this is kind of confusing, and for that I have made a couple more slides. 
The most important thing you have to understand in tkinter about layouts is that there are two kinds of space. The space in which it can occupy and the space in which it will occupy. By default, in which it will only be as big as the content it needs to cover. For example, if we have a label, the label widget is only as big as the text it needs to display. But that being said, even by default, the widget can occupy much more space than that. For example, here we have another window and we have a couple of widgets inside. All of these widgets will only occupy the space that they need to display the content. For example, if all of these are labels, we would have the space to cover the space of some text. This is the space the widget is going to occupy. This is actually what we have already seen. If we return to the app, and let me change the bottom here to top again, like so. When we place all of these widgets by default, they are only taking up a tiny amount of space. You can see this via the background. The widget essentially is always only as big as the text. The exception here is the button. This one is a tiny bit wider, but not that much. So by default, this is the size we get for every single widget. However, all of these widgets can occupy more space. The amount of space they can occupy determines on the side. Right now, our side is top, which means we are placing the widgets in a downward direction. So top is our current side. With that, the widgets could occupy the entire width of the container, which in this case right now is the window. The same is going to be the case for the bottom side. In either case, widgets are going to occupy the entire width of the container. And expands is going to tell them to take up all of the available space in that direction. For example, if we add one more widget here and set expand to true for this one, then it's going to take up the entire rest of the available space, but only in the current direction that we are working in, which is this downward direction. Meaning the widget is going to take all of the remaining vertical space. And on top of that, it is also capable of occupying the entire horizontal space. And just for completion's sake here, when the site is top or bottom, widgets can be as wide as the entire container and the expand method determines the height of the widget. If the site is left or right, then the widget can be as high as the container and expand determines the width. I hope all of that makes sense. This is definitely something we have to play around with. Here we are back in the code and I want to add the expand method to label one. By default, expand is simply false. If I run it like this, we're not going to see any difference. However, if I set expand to true, then the first label is going to occupy basically the entire vertical space. We are starting all the way on the top here and we're going all the way to the bottom. Tkinter here is fairly intelligent. It knows if there are other widgets and those need to occupy their space as well. But other than that, we are occupying the entire height of the window. We are telling the first label to occupy as much space as possible and the other widgets take up the minimum amount of space, which is exactly the space they need to display the text. Although that being said, as you can see in here, all of these widgets still are very small. All we are telling them now, for example, for the first label, that this widget can take up all of this space. But we are not telling it to actually fill this entire space, which means we have a ton of space around the first label, but we're not filling that. We're gonna cover that in just a bit. On top of that, we can also set multiple widgets to expand being true. And Tkinter separates the space here intelligently. Although right now this is kind of hard to see. I think a better way to illustrate this is if I set the first and the last widget with expand being true. Now you can see we have the first widget covering the entire, almost the first half. And the bottom also gets the same amount of space. Like so. In between, we have the other two widgets only covering the minimum amount of space. And this is also going to work with the other directions. For example, if I change top to left, then we can see if I expand this a tiny bit, we now have the same issue again. 
the two middle widgets only occupy the minimum amount of space, whereas the first table takes up as much space as it can. Same with the button, like so. This, however, doesn't feel particularly satisfying because we need one more argument to make all of this work properly. For that, we have the fill method. This one can be x, y, both, or none. And this determines if a widget will occupy the available space. By default, this is going to be none, which is telling the widget to only be as large as it needs to be to cover the content. If we set this to x, we are telling the widget to cover the entire horizontal space. If we set this to y, we are covering the entire vertical space. And when we set this to both, we are covering the entire space that is available. Let's have a look at this one. Once again, we are in the code. I want to set this back to top. So it's a tiny bit easier to see what's going on. For the first widget now, I want to specify a fill method. The one you probably want to use most of the time is called both. And if I specify this one, now my first label covers the entire space it can potentially take up. I could set this to X only, then we are covering the entire width. And if I set this to Y, then we are covering only the entire height. For this one, I want to keep it at both. The same we can do for the button. Let's say for this one, I want to fill this thing in the Y direction. There we go. We have a button that covers the entire available height. And now I can also demonstrate that widgets by default cover the entire width, even if we don't use expand. For example, for label two, if I set fill to both, we can see that the label didn't grow in the vertical direction, but now covers the entire width of the window. Which means if I only set this to Y, we're not going to see any difference because the widget doesn't have any available space it could take up. Although if I set this to X, we can see the entire width is being occupied. So these are the three major arguments you have to understand. Site, expand, and fill. And I don't think they're particularly difficult. Although since this is really important, I want to add an exercise in here. And I want you guys to recreate this kind of layout. Pause the video now and see if you can copy this. I guess let me move it a bit to the side so you can see what we have already. There we go. Now pause the video and try this one yourself. What we can see here is that the first label and the button at the end only occupy the minimum amount of space, meaning those don't have expand. Whereas label two and the last of the labels are occupying as much space as they can, which means those two get expand. Finally, label two doesn't have any fill because the widget itself is very small. Whereas all of the other widgets do fill up the available space shouldn't be too hard to replicate. The site remains identical for all of them. Although for label one, pack should not be true, so I'm just going to remove it. Although fill is going to be both. If I run this again now, we have the first label all the way in the top, and this is already a good starting point. So first label is done. Label two, however, is going to need quite a bit of work. This one is not supposed to be filled, but I do want to expand the entire thing. I'm going to set it to true, and there we go. Now we have label two with a ton of white space around it. If I compare it to the goal, this is looking pretty good. Next up, we have to work with label three. This one, I also want to expand, so expand is going to be true, and I want to fill this one as well. Fill both, let me run this again now, and we are almost there. This is starting to come together quite well. The issue we have right now is that the button is way too tall. That happens because expand is true for the button. Let's remove it. Let's try this again. And we are nearly done. The last thing we have is that the button doesn't fill the entire width, like we have done in the goal. The reason for that is that right now the button only fills the vertical space, but I want it to fill the horizontal space. And now we can try this. And there we go. We have replicated the entire window of the exercise. If you could figure this thing out yourself, you are understanding about 90% of the pack method. The rest is going to be fairly simple. The last two arguments inside of pack are two kinds of padding. 
The first argument is either pad x or pad y, or both, I guess. This one creates space around this widget, which means we are essentially creating a larger box around this widget and filling the box with empty white space. It is not going to be visible. Besides that, we have iPad X or iPad Y. This one creates padding inside of the widget, which means that we are expanding the widget itself. Or in practice, we're not filling the entire space with white space. Instead, we are expanding the widget. Let's play around with this one as well in the code. I think that's going to explain all of this much better. For label one, I want to add pad Y. If I set this to, let's say, 50 pixels, now we have something that's very hard to see. To make this a bit more visible, for pack 2, I want to set fill to both. That way we can see where label 1 ends and label 2 begins. Let me run this again. There we can see. What this pad Y has done is it created padding around the top and the bottom of the widget. That way we have a bit of space. And the larger the number gets, the more white space we have. The same thing you could also do for pad X. If I set this, let's say, to 100, now we also have a ton of white space on the left and on the right of the widget. All of this is padding. I think this one is fairly straightforward. Besides that, we also have iPad Y and iPad X. Although for now, I only want to cover iPad Y because conceptually this can be a tiny bit complicated to understand. Let me run the code again. Now we can see that the widget is quite a bit larger. We are covering this bit of extra space. This happens even though label one doesn't have any expand method. The reason why it occupies more vertical space is because of this iPad Y. We are essentially pushing the widget to be a bit larger by the amount of padding we specify. This is in contrast to pad X. This one creates white space around it. I hope you get the difference here. Most of the time, you are only really going to use pad X because iPad Y, you don't really need that much if you understand expand and fill. They basically fulfill the same task. That is going to leave us only with one more thing to cover. And that is that you can combine different sides inside of the pack method. Although if you're doing that, the order of the pack calls really, really matters. On top of that, usually you don't want to combine different sides. I'm going to cover this in the next video, but using frames to organize a layout is much, much cleaner. First of all, to make this as easy as possible to see, I want to remove the padding and instead set expand to true for all of them and also fill both for all of them. This I also want to do for the button, like so. Now if I run this, we have four identically sized widgets. But let me change the top for the side for the first widget to left. If I run this now, we can see that the first label takes up a huge amount of space. And why is that? Let me put the widget to the side here. The main thing you have to understand is that the first time you're calling pack with a certain kind of side, this side is going to get priority. Which means right now, the first label is going to try to occupy as much horizontal space as it possibly can. Then it sees these other widgets here, but all of them are set to top. Which means the horizontal space is going to be ignored. As a consequence, they only get as much space as they need to display their text. You can see here the largest label is this one, the last of the labels. This one occupies the most amount of space. And this one determines the width of all of these widgets. That is the reason why this label gets this much horizontal space. And since there's no other widget in the vertical axis, it occupies the entire height of the window. After that, the other widgets only get this remaining amount of space and they, well, divide the space between the three of them. Once again, you can be really fancy with this kind of system, but most of the time you want to use frames to organize all of this and that's going to be much cleaner. Again, I'm going to cover this in the next video. 
Although this is something that you want to practice, which means we can do another exercise. Here is one window that is a tiny bit more complex. Try to create this one yourself and see how far you get. You probably have to experiment quite a bit, but it's certainly doable if you could follow along so far. First of all, I want to set top to all of the sites. If I run this again now, all of the widgets occupy the same amount of space. Next up, for label 2, I have set the site to left. What this one is doing is, let me move this window a tiny bit to the side. Tcanter sees that we have three widgets that occupy the top direction. And since the first site that we are looking at is top, it starts with that. This means Tcanter tries to get the entire height of the window and separate it into three different areas. We have one, we have two, and we have three. There you can already see this determines the height of our widgets. Besides that, Tkinter sees that we have one widget that has left. However, this one comes after the top, which means Tkinter tries to push this first label as far as it can, but it can only push it up to this first line here because we have two other widgets with the top side. This constrains the height of the first label. This also determines the height of label 2. This is the entire height. Finally, for the width, like so, Tkinter knows that there's no other widgets inside of our sites that occupies any horizontal space. So label 2 tries to take up as much space as it can. The only constraint is last of the labels, this one needs to have the minimum amount of space to occupy last of the labels, the bit of text here, which sets the maximum width of label 2 to this point here. And with that, we have the basic layout. The last thing we had to do, if I show it again, we had some padding around the first label. This is quite easily done. I want to have pad X for 10 and pad Y. I've set this one to 10 as well. If I run this again now, Here's what I created in the exercise. And once again, this kind of setup can work, but most of the time it is much easier to use frames to make all of this much easier. And that's going to be in the next video. I'll see you there. In this video, we are going to cover pack along with frames to create more complicated layouts in Tkinter. What we are going to create is going to look something like this. We have a fairly complicated layout that has lots of individual elements that come together quite well. This is quite easy to do if you know how to combine pack with frames. Although for all of this to work, you should already know how pack works and how frames work, along with parenting. Check out the previous videos for more detail, but I will assume you know at least the basics. Just to reiterate, Using pack along with frames is going to make it much easier to create more complicated layouts. Basically, what you want to do is always create single direction layouts. With the only exception that some of these items are frames that contain their own layout. For example, we could have one window like this, and in here we have one frame, a normal widget, and another frame. Note here that this entire widget only goes in a single direction. There's nothing else in there. However, inside of the first frame, we have two widgets and inside of this frame, we again only have a single direction. But if we combine the two, we are already creating a slightly more complicated layout. This we can make even more complex by adding another layout inside of the final frame. And this one could be a normal widget and another frame. And in this final frame, we could add a few more widgets as well. With this system, we are able to create really complicated layouts without worrying about the pack sites too much. And again, if you don't know what pack sites are or why they can be a problem, check out the previous video that explains all of this in quite some detail. And just for comparison, here is the widget we are going to make. This one has one frame all the way at the top. Then we have a widget here. And at the bottom, we have one larger frame. And this one consists out of two frames one that goes like this, and a second one that goes like so. 
all of the layouts inside of this widget are single direction layouts, which makes them much easier to handle. That was quite a bit of talking. Let's have a look at all of this in code. All right, here I have a really basic setup. If I execute all of this, we can see a basic window. Although on top of that, I do have quite a few widgets. There are four labels and two buttons, all of which have the window as the parent right now, or the master to be more specific. This I already want to change. The first two labels should have one frame as their parent and the final three should have another frame as their parent. To keep all of this organized, I want to have slightly more detailed comments. Let's get started by creating a top frame. For this, I want to have a top frame and this I create with ttk.frame. This one is going to have the parent or the master of the window, but then label one and label two are going to have their master as the top frame. This is already giving us the first part that we need to make all of this work. This I can now use to create another section here. I'm going to call this layout. Actually, let's be a bit more specific and I'm going to call this the top layout. I want to get my label one and I want to pack this without any other arguments for now. The same I want to do for label two. And now if I run this, we can see that we cannot see anything, even though we have used pack. The reason is that we haven't packed this frame or the top frame to be more specific, which means we do have labels inside of the top frame, but the top frame itself isn't placed anywhere, which is the reason why we can't see anything. To fix that, we also have to get the top frame and pack this one. Now if I run this, we can see two labels. This I can now use, for example, for label one and label two, to fill the sides and I'm going to add both in here. If I now add this, we can't see much of a difference. The only difference that we can see really is that label two has become a bit wider. It became the same size as the first label. The reason for that is that right now both of these labels are constrained by the frame width. And the frame is only as wide as the widest widget, which is the first label in this case. That again, we can fix by also adding fill and both for the top frame. And now let's have a look. Now it covers the entire width of the window. By the same logic, I could use expand here and set this to true. Now we can't see anything. But that being said, we know that this top frame here is going to occupy the entire height of the window. The reason why we can't see it is that we don't expand label one or label two. If I expand the two like so, we can see we have both labels covering up the entire window. This is the first part. Next up, I want to place label three, which again is just going to be another label with some text and the background color. This is not going to have a parent, so window can remain. Although I'm going to add a comment here for the middle widget. Tkinter doesn't care very much if you combine labels or frames or any other kind of widget, which means I can also add the middle layout here and simply get my label free and pack this thing. If I now run this, we have another label all the way at the bottom. This one, since we didn't specify any fill or expand argument, it is only going to occupy the minimum amount of space it needs to display the label or the text itself. However, if we set expand to true, now we get some slightly more interesting behavior. What tkinter is doing now is it sees that we have a top frame and label three. Those are the only two widgets inside of the window. This window here, which we know because both of these have window as their master. Because of that, tkinter is separating the entire vertical space into two parts, this one here, and this one here. I hope this already makes it quite easy to see why using parenting here is really useful. Because what we can do now, for example, for label one and label two inside of the top frame, we could, for example, set the side to left. And now we get this kind of layout, which already is quite a bit more complicated. And doing this kind of thing without parenting would be kind of a nightmare. Next up, I want to create the bottom frame. 
For this one, I want to create a variable bottom frame, which is going to be TTK frame as well. The parent here is going to be the window. However, for label three, button and button two, the master is going to be the bottom frame. Once we have that, we can create the bottom layout. For this one, I first of all want to place my button. And for now, I'm just going to use pack and nothing else. The same thing I want to do with button two, although between the two, I want to have label four, which I also need to pack. With this, we have the three widgets. Finally, we have to pack the bottom frame as well. Bottom frame dot pack, like so. Now if I run this, we can see we have the other three widgets at the bottom. Although if I compare this to the demo, we have to get a slightly different layout here. I first of all want to change the side to left, like so. And now if I run this, these three labels are right next to each other. The problem is they're not expanding. For that, actually, let me show it again. Right now, we're telling T Kinter to look at this top frame here and to take up as much space as possible, then to look at this widget here and to take up as much space as possible. And then we have this final frame here and this one doesn't get any expand. So it's only as large as it needs to be. That I want to change, which I do with expand. And this I want to set to true. If I now run this, we have a slight improvement. Inside of the window layout, we have one direction and we are separating this into three parts because we have three widget, this one here, this one here, and this one here that compete for space. Because of that, we have three equally sized spaces, this one, this one, and this one. The problem in the bottom one frame is that these widgets are not being told to expand. So they only take a minimum amount of space. This we can also fix very easily. I just want to add expand being true. And now we can't see any difference. The reason for that, if you check out the last video, if you missed it, is that pack only works in one direction. Right now, our side is from left to the right. So we are going this way. And expand only expands the widget in the current direction, meaning it tells the first button to take up as much space as possible, same for the label and same for the final button. And then this one here is going to be the size of the frame. To make it take up even more space, we once again need the fill argument. And this I want to add to all of the widgets. And now if I run this, this is looking much better. Now we're telling both the frame and all the widgets inside the frame to occupy as much space as they can and fill the entire space as well. Although what I also want to do, if I compare this to the demo again, we have a bit of padding around this. This area here, I also want to add, which if you use frames is very easy to add. All we have to do inside of the bottom frame, I want to add pad X is 20 and pad Y is 20. If I run this now, we have a bit of padding around this. And with that, we have a couple of basic ways to create more complicated layouts. It doesn't really get that much more complicated. You essentially always create a single frame and then you pack widgets in one direction inside of this frame. And if you combine enough of these, you end up with slightly more complicated layouts. And those are also much easier to understand and to implement. Now, you could replicate all of this by using the site very cleverly in tkinter to get really complicated layouts. The problem with that approach, though, is that this really often ends up with very complicated layouts that are really hard to maintain, which is why I would recommend to always stick with one directional layouts and then add frames to create greater complexity. That's basically all you need. All right, and with that, I want to do an exercise and then we are done with this part. What I want you guys to do, I want you to create three more buttons and another frame. The frame should be on the right side inside of the bottom frame, this bottom frame here. And the buttons inside of this extra frame should be stacked vertically inside of it. The result of all of this should look something like this. The buttons should be here. Let me put it a bit to the side and pause the video now and try to figure this one out yourself.
we have to get started by creating a few more widgets. This I want to do all the way at the top. I'm going to call those the exercise widgets. First of all, in here, we need an exercise frame. This, once again, is just going to be another ttk.frame with the parent being the bottom frame. This is going to be the only difference compared to what we have done here and here. Because for both of those, the frame always had the window as the master. This frame here has another frame as the master, which is perfectly fine to do. After that, I want to create button 3. And this is going to be ttk.button with the exercise frame as the master. The text can just be button 3. This should be a string though, and I should also fix my typo. I can copy this two times. This should be button 4 and button 5, both for the variable and for the name. That is going to be all we need to create the different widgets. Now we have to place them. This I want to do all the way after the exercise comment. In here, first of all, I want to place the buttons. I have button 3, button 4, and button 5. All three of those should be packed. Since the stacking order is going to be vertical, I can just leave the default argument, which is the top side. Although I do want all of the buttons to occupy as much space as they can, which means I want to set expand to true and fill to both sides. Once I have that, I can place the actual frame. And this I called the exercise frame. I want to pack this one as well. And if I run this, let's just see what happens. We are getting something. The problem we have right now is that this pack is very small. It only occupies this area here. To fix that, we have to do a couple of things. First of all, I only want single direction layouts, which means the side here should be left. Like so. And let's see what we get now. Now it places this thing in the middle. That's a good start. Besides that, I also want to set the fill. And this could either be Y. There we go. Or it could be both. Both work perfectly fine. I tend to prefer both because it just works most of the time. But once again, both here are perfectly valid. Finally, what you could also do is set expand to true. And that's going to make these buttons a tiny bit wider. With this expand being true, we are telling this frame here to divide the space into four equal parts. We have number one, number two, number three, and number four. And all four of those have the same width. With that, we have created quite a complicated layout. In the next video, we are going to cover grids. This one is going to be even more powerful. So I'll see you there. In this video, we are going to learn about the grid layout. What we are going to make is going to look like this. I am fully aware this looks horrible, but that's not the point of this lesson. What I want you guys to do is to understand how to create a grid and how to place elements in here. Let's talk about how it works. When we are using the grid method, we are creating a grid. Inside of this grid, we can determine the number of rows and columns. On top of that, you can also set the width and the height of each column or row. You can see this one quite well. For example, this cell here has a certain amount of width and a certain amount of height. This you can set yourself quite easily. Once you have that, you can place widgets in columns and rows. And on top of that, you can also specify how many cells a widget is going to occupy. For example, this could look like this, like this, or like this, where you have one widget overlapping with another widget. In the most basic sense, this is a very simple system. However, there's one limitation you need to be aware of. Like with pack, grid only determines how much space a widget can occupy, but not how much it will occupy. And this difference is important. Inside of the pack method, we had the fill argument. Inside of a grid, we are using sticky. This one works like this. This could be one cell inside of our table. And we can specify to which border the widget is going to stick. In here, we have north, east, south, and west. 
and this we use to place a widget inside of here. By default, a widget is always going to be right in the middle. However, if we, for example, specify sticky north, then the widget is going to stick at the top. This would look something like this. Note here that the size of the widget hasn't changed. However, when we define two arguments in here, like north and south, in that case, the widget is going to retain the width, but is going to occupy the entire height of the cell. Let me clean this up a tiny bit. Our widget is going to stick to the north and to the south, which means the height of the widget is going to occupy all of this. However, the width of the widget is going to be determined by the content. For example, if we have a label with some text, then the width of the text is going to determine the width of the widget. Although, if we specify all four directions, north, south, east, and west, let me clean this up a bit. If we have all four directions, we are telling the widget to stick to all four sides of the cell. And that way, we have one widget that is quite large, or, well, as large as the cell it's in. That is quite a bit of stuff to cover, so let's jump right in and let's have a look at some examples. Here I have some very basic code. If I execute all of this, we can see that we have an empty window. That window we're getting from these lines here, and we are running main loop on the window we created. Besides that, we have quite a few different widgets, but right now we are not packing them, so they are not visible. We have four different labels, and each of them has a background color. Besides that, we have two buttons, and we have an entry widget. All of these I want to place using the grid method. For that, first of all, I have to define a grid. For that, you take the container, and you run two methods. The first one is called column configure. This is going to create one or multiple columns. For now, I only want to create one, at least on this line of code. This needs two arguments. First of all is the index, and the index here is going to be column zero. Then we need what is called the weight, and this is going to determine how wide this column is. For now, I'm going to set it to one. Once we have that, I want to duplicate this thing and change the zero to a one. With that, we have two columns. I want to duplicate this thing another time and change the column to a row. The index now being zero and the weight being one. With this, what we created is, this is our window and we have two columns, one and two. This is what we are getting from here. Besides that, we have one row. This is what we are getting here. I want to place a widget. To place label one, I have to get the widget, label one, and then use the grid method. I have to specify a row and I have to specify a column. For both of those, we have to use the index numbers we specified earlier, meaning the column could either be zero or one. Let me set it to zero for now. The row right now always has to be zero because we only have a single row. With that, we are placing label one. Let me run the code and there we go. We have one label. The same thing we can do with label two. I'm going to copy this entire line, change label one to label two. The row, I'm not going to touch. The column, I'm going to change to one. If I run this now, we have label one and label two. And here we already have the first issue. That being that the cells we are specifying, let me draw them on here. We have column one and we have column two, and the two are separated roughly here. Besides that, we have one row. The issue we have right now is that there's a ton of white space both around label one and label two. And this comes back to the issue that is kind of annoying in tkinter, and that is that these cells only create a space for the widget, but we are not telling the widget to occupy that entire space. As a consequence, we are ending up with a huge amount of white space. Sometimes you want that, but most of the time you probably don't. So let's get rid of it. To get rid of it, we need the sticky argument. In here, we have to specify north, south, east, or west. The order of the letters here really doesn't matter. And let me just run it like this. Now this is looking much better. We are telling the widget to stick to all four sides. Although I guess I jumped a bit ahead. 
For now, let's get started by just specifying north. If I run this now, the widget sticks all the way to the top of the cell. I can do this with the other sides as well. For example, if I specify sticky to west for the first widget, and then I also add sticky with east, then we can see we have each of the widgets on the side of the window. Although I guess if I flip this around with east and west, now we can see where the borders of these cells are. Although that's not usually how you would use sticky. Instead, most of the time you specify two sides. For example, east and west tells the widget to span the entire width of a cell. You could also specify north in here, and then we are sticking the entire thing to the top. You do have to play around with this a tiny bit, but eventually it's gonna come quite handy. Although most of the time you just specify north, south, east, and west, you are occupying the entire cell and you are done. That is basically the fundamental thing you have to understand about grid layouts. I guess what we can do is create a few more rows and columns and then play around with this quite a bit more. I want to have three columns in total, zero, one, two, and three. And already, if I run this after creating more columns, you can see the layout has changed because now we have column zero, column one, column two, and column three. So the space we have for each column is going to be less. What you can also do is change the weight of each column. For example, if I change this to a two, then we have even less space. Let me add a higher number so you can see this a bit better. We still have zero, one, two, and three columns, but the final column is going to be much wider than the other columns. I can demonstrate this quite well by placing label three this one is going to be in row zero, but column three. And I want this to go from east to west. There you can see we have a really wide label. We can actually make it even easier because these three lines are basically identical. They all have the same weight. We just want to specify a different index. For that, we can also add a tuple in here for the index and just call this zero, one, and two, like we have done before. And this is going to give us the same thing, which means I can get rid of this. Now we are creating three columns with the index zero, one, and two, all with a weight of one. And then we have a final column with the index three, and this is much wider. So if I run this, we are getting the same thing. The majority of the time you are going to have columns or rows that have the same weight. And then using tuples for that is much easier to read. For the rows, I also want to have multiple I have one, two, and three. Or well, four rows in total, but you get the idea. And like with the columns, I can also change the weight. Let me change this one to a three. Now if I run this, all of our stuff is at the top because this is where the original row zero was. This one here is row zero. And before we had the other rows, this was the only one. But now we have a ton of stuff down here. So all the existing elements we had were pushed upwards. But these cells I can now use quite easily. For example, let's go with label two. Instead of row zero, I want to place this one at row one. If I run this now, it is a bit further down. And let me change sticky to north, south, east, and west. Then you can see this a little bit better. There we go. This is looking pretty good. This could also be column two, or it could be row two. Like so. The system here, I hope, is quite easy to understand. It really doesn't get that complicated. So we can cover the next part, and that is either column, span, or row span. Let's start with row span, since I do have quite a few rows that I'm not using. Row span is telling the widget how many rows it should occupy. By default, this is one. If I run this, we are not seeing any change. However, if I change this to a two, now we're occupying two rows. And if I change it to a three, we are occupying all of the rows. Let me draw this actually. In this widget right now, we have four different rows. This one here is row zero. Then we have roughly here row one, row two, and the rest is row three. This one is much taller than the other rows because we have given it a greater weight. And this row span is telling the widget to occupy 
this starting cell, then another cell, and then another cell. Those numbers are 1, 2, and 3 for the argument. The same thing you can also do with the columns. Let's use label 3 for that. I want this thing to be in row 1, and the column for now should be column 0. Also, I want to have north, south, east, and west. So if I run this now, we have label 3 on the left side. However, I want to specify column span. This widget should span three columns. If I run this now, we have a much wider widget that is overlapping with label 2. To make this even more visible, we can cover one additional concept. That is two different kinds of padding. If you have watched the pack video, this should be familiar. We either have pad X or pad Y, and this is going to expand the space around the widget to give some space between the current widget and any neighboring widgets. Meaning pad X or pad Y creates space around the widget. Besides that, we have iPad X or iPad Y, and this one is expanding the border of the current widget. It essentially makes it larger. Back in the code, to make this label free here visible, we want to add pad X, let's say 20, and pad Y, let's go with 10. Although before that, I want to fix the typo. Let's try it now. There we go. There is quite a bit of space in the X and the Y axis. Although on the X axis, this side, we have a larger amount because pad X is twice as large as pad Y. And if you changed pad Y to iPad Y, we can see, well, not much of a difference, but let me add a much larger number in here, 100. Gonna be much more visible. There we go. Basically, what happened now is that this used to be row zero, then we had row one, row two, and then down here, row three. Originally, label three occupied this height here. But because of iPad Y, we are pushing the widget up and down by quite a bit. Or not really pushing, we are rather expanding it quite a bit. What you want to be careful about here is that this is shrinking other cells. Label 1 in particular has become much smaller. So do be careful with this one. I only want to use pad Y with 10 pixels. Like so, this is much cleaner. What can also be really useful, let me place label 4 with the grid method. You can place elements in the corner. For example, this label 4 I want to have in the bottom right corner. For that, I will need row, that is the maximum, which is row 3, and I want to have the maximum column, which is also number 3. Running this now gets me label 4, but not in the ideal position. Instead, this widget should be in the bottom right here. For that, we can use sticky. I want this to stick to the southeast. If I run this now, there we go. The label is all the way in the bottom right. Even if we resize the window, it will always be in the bottom right. I guess I didn't mention it, but the grid always scales along with the window. Which lets you make really cool stuff. I think at this point, this is becoming quite repetitive. Ultimately, using grid is quite simple. It really doesn't get that complicated. That being said, there's one thing that can be kind of annoying. Grid has a tiny bit of a uniformity issue. Which means when you have cells with content, their width is not what you would expect. Let me do an example. Let's say we have a grid like this, and we want to place two widgets, one and two. Inside of this example, we have zero, one, two, and three columns. They all have a weighting of one. Let me use a color like this. They have one, 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 and one. They are all supposed to be equally wide. The issue is, if this cell here is empty and this cell here is empty, then tkinter is going to make the existing cells with content wider than they are supposed to be. There is a formula to calculate the exact numbers, but most of the time you don't need that because you don't want this behavior at all. Because it's, well, inconsistent and kind of annoying. But let me demonstrate this issue first. I want to comment out the third column. And I also want to comment out all of the other rows besides the first one. Besides that, I also want to comment out what we have done for label 2, 3, and 4. 
That way I can focus on one specific thing. I already have label one with a grid and this one occupies the first row and the first column. I am just going to copy this and change column zero to column two. If I run this now, you can already see the issue quite well. This column here and this column here, they have the same width, but this one here in the middle is much less wide. I guess much less wide is a bit of an exaggeration, but it is less wide than the other two. The reason for that is if a column or a row has a widget in it, Kikinta is going to give it a bit more space. That being said though, you can fix this one quite easily. All you have to do is add one more argument and that's called uniform. In here, you are supposed to add a string and you can give different columns a similar uniformity. In practice though, you are hardly ever going to use it. Most of the time, I just add an A for every single row or column, like so, and then every single row or column have a uniformity. I can run this now, and now we have all the columns having the same size, or a uniform size. This is still going to work with the weighting. And that way, you have much more expected behavior. With that, I can get rid of label 2 and uncomment everything else, like so. This stuff here I want to uncomment as well, like I have done this stuff here. All of those are going to get uniform. Also, I want to change the weight of column with the index 3 to a 2. And now if I run this, we get something that looks very much like the example I had earlier. That one looked like so, and we are definitely getting there. That is leaving us just with the exercise, and then we are done with this video. What I want you guys to do is going to add the buttons and the entry field. As a reminder, the demo app I had looked like this. You have to add this button and this button and the entry field. Try to figure out in which row and which column they are and see if you can place them as well. Shouldn't be too difficult. So pause the video now and try to sort this. We know that button one is very easy to place because we have row zero and we have column three. So this button is in the top right. It has to have these values. For button two, this one here, I know we have one row here and we have one row here. And besides that, we have one column here, another column here, and that brings us then to this cell, which means this one is going to be column two and row two. Let's start by placing those two, and then we can work on the entry field. I want to start by placing button one with the grid method. For this one, I know that the row is supposed to be zero and the column needs to be three. If I run this now, we have the button in the top right, but the button doesn't fill the entire available space. This we do by using sticky and adding north, south, east and west, which is what I am always using, but you could change the numbers here around as you want. This could be north, east, south, west. It really doesn't matter. Tkint just cares about the numbers being present in there. I can duplicate this line now and button two. I want to place in row two and column two. Let's see, this is looking pretty good. Finally, we have to place, let me open it again. We have to place the entry widget. This one is a tiny bit more tricky. For example, we know that this button here is on row two, which makes all of this row number three. The issue is the entry is not perfectly centered in here. That would be roughly this line. Instead, what I have done for the entry is I have taken up row two and three and placed the entry widget in the middle of that, which places it roughly here, which means we want to have column number three, but then for the row, we want to start on two, but occupy two rows in total. That should be fairly easy to implement. I want to get my entry widget I want to place it using grid. The row 
is going to be two and the column is going to be three. Like so, if I run this now, we have the entry widget right next to the button. To push it down, I want to add a row span. It should occupy two rows. If I run this now, there we go. This entry field is now in the position we had before. You could make this a bit more explicit by adding sticky to it, although that would give us a really large entry field. Like so. That's a bit weird because entry only allows one line of input, but it certainly works. In this case though, I don't want to add sticky in here. I guess we can add sticky for east and west. Like so, that I think is a bit better. With that, we have all of the basics of the grid method. I hope it wasn't too bad. If you understand grid, you understand the most common layout method in tkinter. This one, especially for more complex layouts, you are going to use all the time. In this video, we are going to cover the place layout method. What we are going to create is going to look something like this. Once again, not a particularly pretty app, but it definitely teaches you quite a bit. On top of that, this one is quite flexible. And here you can see a couple of different effects. I'll explain them as we go along. So let's talk about place. Widgets are placed by specifying the left, the top, the width, and the height of the widget. This is a very flexible system. Also, I think a fairly simple one to understand. Although, when you are placing widgets, you can do this in two ways. You can either use absolute or relative values. Let's start by talking about absolute values. For this, we once again have a window or any kind of container, it doesn't really matter. And this container right now is 400 pixels wide and 800 pixels tall. If we want to place a widget inside of this, we would have to specify at least two, but ideally four values. These four. The values we absolutely have to specify are these two values here. Those are crucial. With these points, we are placing the left and the top of the widget, which is this point here. In this particular example, the top left of the widget is 100 pixels from the left side and 200 pixels from the top. Besides that, we can also specify the width and the height of the widget. These numbers are optional. If you don't specify them, the widget is going to have the size of its content. Let's do another example. We have a widget all the way at the bottom. For this one, we once again would have to get the top left point. This one has zero pixels from the left, and from the top we have something like, let's say, 500 pixels. The widget is about, let's say, 200 pixels tall, and it has the entire width of the window or the container, which is 400. And that's it. I hope the system makes sense. Besides that, we have relative values. For this, again, we have a window or any kind of container. But instead of specifying a specific width or height, instead, we separate this thing into a coordinate system that starts from zero and goes all the way to one. And this we do both for X and for Y, which means that this point in the top left always has the coordinate 0.0, .0 and 0.0, .0. one for Y and the other for X. The bottom right point of the container then is 1.0 and 1 point for both axes. That way, if you want to place a widget, you would have to do it like this. Instead of specifying a specific distance like we have done here, we are telling the widget or the left side of the widget to be 10% of the width of the widget or 20% from the top of the widget. We can also do this with the width and the height. For example, we can tell the widget to have 40% or 10% of the width or height of the container. Other than that, the system works in exactly the same way. So if we do another example, for this widget, the left position is still going to be zero. Let's put a zero here. For the top position, this one is going to be a bit larger. Let's say this one would be 0 0.6. The height of the entire widget would be I don't know, let's say 0.2. Finally, the width of this thing is going to be a one because I want this to cover the entire width of the container. Once again, that's basically it for the basics of place. It 
Well, it's quite simple. So let's have a look at all of this in code. I already have a few lines of code ready. If I execute all of this, all we can see is a basic window. The reason for that is that these widgets are not being placed on the window. Let's create a layout then. I am going to start with label one, and this I want to place using the place method. For this one, we at the very least need X and Y coordinates. And let me use some really simple numbers, X being zero and Y being zero. If I run this now, we can see label one in the top left. I guess I should talk about the widgets we have. We have three labels, label one, two, and three. They all say the same thing. Basically, they just have different background colors, red, blue, and green. Besides that, we have a button. Since we only have one button, I guess I can rename this just to button. There we go. Now, if I run this again, we can see label one in the top left. The reason for that is that the entire container, the window in this case, is going to be a coordinate system that goes something like this with the origin point being up here, or rather more specifically up here. This point is zero and zero. If you want to go further to the right, we have to increase X. And if you want to go downwards, we have to increase Y. So plus Y and plus X. If you are only familiar with high school math, this might be a tiny bit confusing because in high school math, if you want to go up, you have to increase Y, which we are not doing in this case, which can be a tiny bit confusing. You will get used to it quite fast. And well, all we have to do now is play around with these values. For example, if I change X to 100 and Y to, let's go with 200. If I run this now, we can see a difference. What we have is X being 100, meaning we have a distance of 100 pixels between the left side of the container, this side here, and the left side of the widget. This distance is 100 pixels. Other than that, we have Y, and this tells us that from the top of the container to the top of the widget, we have 200 pixels of a difference. What we can also do is set a width and a height. For example, the width could be 200. Actually, let's go with 300, so we have different numbers. And for the height, I want to go with 50. Let's run this now, and there we go. The widget is much wider and a tiny bit taller. By default, a widget is only going to take up the space it needs to display the text, which by default would be something like this. But if we specify numbers for width and height, we are setting the width in this case to 50, and the height is going to be 300. That's very hard to read, sorry about that. We can play around with the numbers here quite a bit. For example, X could be 300, Y could be 100, and let's say for the width we have 100, and for the height we have 200, and now we get a different kind of widget that is all the way on the right. To understand the numbers here, we know that the entire widget is 400 pixels wide. This thing is 400 pixels. And we are placing the left side 300 pixels from the left side of the window. This distance here is 300 pixels. On top of that, we are setting the width of the widget to 100 pixels, meaning this distance here is going to be 100. As a consequence, the widget ends exactly on the right side of the container. After that, for Y, we have 100, meaning this distance here is 100. And then we are setting the height to 200. So this one here is 200. All of that, I think, should be reasonably straightforward. With that, we have covered the absolute positioning. Besides that, we can place label 2. And for this one, I want to use relative positions. This we do in a similar way. We still have to specify X and Y values, except now they're called relative X or rel X and relative Y or rel Y. In here, just to get started, I can again set zero and zero. Running this now, we can see label two all the way in the top left. Although now I don't specify pixels. Instead, if I set this to 0 0.5 and let's set y to 0 0.2. The top left position of the widget, this point here, is exactly in the middle of the window, meaning we have 0 0.5 to the left 
and 0 0.5 to the right, 0 0.5, like so. And then from the top, we have 20%, but I think it's not too difficult to understand. If we use different numbers, let's say 0 0.2 and 0 0.1, we should be a bit closer to the top left. We can also specify the width and height in a relative way. This we do with relative width or with relative height. For this one, let's say I want to have 40% of the width of the container and let's say 50% of the height. And if I run this now, we have a much larger container. I think the numbers here are fairly straightforward. I, well, I don't think the system is very difficult, so it shouldn't be too hard to understand, but drop a comment if you think it's super complicated. What we can do as an exercise to make this a bit more interesting is I want you guys to place label three. Label three should be positioned using absolute numbers, meaning we have X, Y, we have the width and we have the height. And label three should be exactly in the same position as label two, meaning you have to convert these numbers to X and Y positions. Pause the video now and see if you can figure this one out. All right. To convert these numbers, you have to know the size of the container, which in our case is the window. For example, for X, we have to convert 400 by 0 0.2, which is going to be 80. Y is 0 0.1 of 600, which is just 60. The width is 40% of 400, which is 160, like so. And height is 0 0.5 of 600, which is 300. That should be all. If I run this now, we can see level 3 covering all of label 2. That looks pretty good. And well, with that, we can see that relative and absolute positioning works pretty well together. Although that being said, you do want to use relative positioning. I can demonstrate why quite easily. Here we have the app again. Right now, this is looking really good. But once I start to move the window around, we get some massive differences. The problem here is that label two is relative. Let me move it to the side like so. The only widget that scales along with the window is label 2, this one here. It scales along with the widget because we are always using relative values. Whereas label 1 and label 3 have absolute positioning, so those two do not move regardless of what the window is doing. If you wanted to scale those, you would have to update the value every time you are changing the size of the window, which would be kind of a pain. In 90% of the cases, you want to use relative positioning because this one is much more flexible. There's one more case that I do want to cover. I want to place this button. And where I want to place it, let me run the app again. The button should be in the bottom right corner of the window, down here. This I can't really do right now, although we can get started. Once again, I want to get my button. I want to use the place method and I want to use relative positioning. Let's set relative x to 1 and relative y to 1 as well. If I run this now, we cannot see the button. The reason is that we are placing the top left of the button in this corner here, but then the rest of the widget goes in this direction and this direction, meaning the button is this yellow outline, which is just outside of the window, but we just cannot see it. This obviously is a problem, so we have to learn about another argument that we can control what is called the anchor. When we're using the place method, the anchor controls which point is placed. By default, if this one is the widget, we are setting the top left point. But this you can customize. And here we have all the points you can use. The default here is northwest, which is telling tkinter to place the left and the top of the widget, which is giving us this point. That's the default one. That being said, we could also tell Tikinta to place the southeast of the widget, and then we will place this point here. Besides that, you could also tell Tikinta to place the center of the widget, then you will place this point. If you know the grid method, this should look fairly familiar. Let's play around with it. For my button, I want to set the anchor, 
and that is atrocious spelling. That looks much better. We need a string, and I want to place the southeast point. Running this now, now we can see the button. This one works as always, it's a button. To see a bit better what's happening here, I am going to place the center. Now we can see, we can only see the top left area of the button. The reason for that is we are placing the center of the button in the bottom right of the window, or the container to be more specific. That way we can only see the top left and the rest is cut off. I do want to cover one extra case, and that is using the place method along with a frame. I want to create a frame with TTK and frame. The master here is going to be the window. After that, I want to create two widgets. One is going to be a frame label, which is going to be TTK and label with the window as the master, and the text could be frame label. On top of that, I want to give this thing a background color, which we can set to yellow. That's the one we haven't used yet. Besides that, I want to duplicate the entire line and change frame label to a frame button. This is going to be TTK and button, and the button is not going to have a background color. Also, this should be frame button to be a bit more consistent. What I now want to do is to place this frame using the place method and also add these two frame labels inside of this frame. And for that, I have already seen one problem. And that is that this label and this button need to have the master as the frame. Because I want to place those two inside of the frame. This I want to do in another section. I'm going to call this one layout. Uh, frame layout looks good. First of all, I want to place the frame itself, which I do with the place method. And this one, I want to have the relative x position of 0 and the relative y position of 0 as well. That way it's in the top left. The width, I want to have 0 0.3 and the relative height is going to be 1. That way, if I run the entire thing, we can't really see it. But the frame we have just created is going to cover an area roughly this size. And I am very, very bad at drawing straight lines. Inside of this, I want to place the frame label and the frame button. I will start with the frame label. I'm going to use place again. For relative x, I want to have 0. Relative y is also going to be 0, meaning this label is in the top left. And besides that, I want to cover the entire width, so relative width is 1, and relative height is going to be 0 0.5. And there we go. We have a frame label that covers one third of the window. What you really have to understand here is that place always works relative to the container, which in this case is the frame. Right now, the width of the frame is this width here. Which means when we are specifying relative width of 1 for the frame label, we are telling this frame label here to cover this entire width, the width of the container. If the frame label had the master as the window, then it would cover the entire width of the window. What you want to keep in mind here, the parent or the master is incredibly important for layouts. But once we have that, I also want to place the frame button. This one should take up the bottom half of this container. Relative x should still be 0, but relative y should be 0 0.5. The other numbers I think can remain the identical. And that is looking pretty good. We have separated the space in half. And I can even drag the window around. This is still working just fine. Cool, I'm really happy with that. On top of that, for this button here, the one we created earlier, I want to set the anchor to southeast, so all of this looks a bit better. Righty, with that, we have covered all of the basics of the place method. All we have to do now is an exercise and then we are done. What I want you guys to do is this one here. Create a label and place it right in the center of the window. The label should be half as wide as the window and be 200 pixels tall. Also, give it a background color to make it a bit nicer to look at. Which color you want to choose is entirely up to you. 
I am going to start by creating an exercise label. This is going to be TTK and label. The parent here is going to be the window. Text is going to be the exercise label. Finally, I want to have a background color. Let's go with orange. This exercise label I now want to place. The position here has to be right in the center of the window, which means I want to have relative x being 0.5 and relative y should also be 0.5. Running this now, we get the exercise label, although it's not perfectly centered. The point we have centered is the top left of the widget. What I want to do is to place the center of the widget right in the middle of the window. For that, I have to set the anchor to center and I am somehow unable to spell anchor. Let's try it now. And there we go. This is looking much better. Finally, we have to set the width and the height of the label. It should be half as wide as the window and 200 pixels tall, which means the relative width is going to be 0 0.5 and the height is going to be 200. I can run this now and this is looking pretty good. On this line, I realized I didn't mention, but you can combine these values quite easily. So you could, for example, set the relative width and the height in pixels. They work together really, really well. The same could also be done with X and Y. For example, I could set X to, I don't know, 200. And I think since the entire window is 400 pixels wide, this is still putting us in the middle of the window. You do want to be careful using this though, because if you now resize the window like so, things start to get a tiny bit weird. So just keep that in mind. There's one important issue that you have to understand about tkinter layouts. And that is the widget sizes, because that can be a tiny bit tricky. Let's talk about it. In tkinter, every widget can have a custom size. However, what you also have to understand is that this size will always be overwritten by the layout methods. You basically have two places where you can add a size of a widget, but one is prioritized. For example, if we have something like this, we are creating a label. This label has some text, but much more important, we are giving this label a width. This specific width in this example is going to be 50. Really important here, this is not pixels. Tkinter uses a really weird measurement system where this 50 is the width of 50 characters. It's kind of weird, but don't worry too much about it. What is much more important for now is that we have two different kinds of width. We have the width I've just talked about, and then we have the width of the pack method. Because in here, we are telling the widget to fill the entire horizontal space. As a consequence, Tkinter has to decide, is it going to use this width here or this width here? And the default answer for Tkinter is going to be this one here. Tkinter always relies on the inbuilt layout methods as the main layout tool. So if you have two different kinds of width, the actual width you are going to get is the one from the inbuilt layout method. Now this might seem quite simple and most of the time it is, but in some cases this can cause problems with the layout, which is why I want to talk about it. I already have a couple of lines ready. If I execute the entire thing, we have an app with two labels inside. Both labels have a background color. I am importing Tkinter at the top, then I'm creating a window. After that, we are creating two labels. And after that, we are placing both labels using the pack method. Finally, we are running main loop to see the window. All of this should be fairly simple. And now we can start working on the layout itself. Or more specifically, I want to give label two a custom width. Label one is going to be a reference, so I'm not going to change this, which should make it a bit easier to see what's going on. Both labels are right in the middle of the window. If I now change the width of label two with the width parameter, I can give this a width of 50. If I run this now, you can see we have a much wider label two. Also, what I really want to emphasize here is that the entire width of the window is 400. This width here is 400 and this is in pixels. However, this width here of the label is this dimension here. And this very obviously is not 50 
pixels. That is not the unit we are using. Instead, what Tikinter is using is 50 widths of a character. It's a very strange measurement. You are not going to use it that much anyway, so I'm not going to go into much detail. But just be aware, we are not using pixels. All right, but with that, we have a custom width. What we can also do inside of label two, when we are packing it, we can set the fill. And this determines the actual size of the widget. If I in here set this to X and run this again, we can now see that the second label covers the entire width of the window, which means that this fill X here covers the entire window, while this width here is simply being ignored. In practice, you could just remove it, and this is what you probably want to do. 99% of the time, you simply want to use the layout methods to create the size of a widget, because that way the entire system is going to be responsive and, well, using hard-coded numbers can be a problem. For example, if I remove this fill here, we can see our label has a certain width again, but now if I resize the window, this doesn't change. We always have the same width of the label, which is going to be a problem if the window gets too small or if the window gets really large. This is a general thing you want to understand for layouts. You basically always want to have flexible layouts. Otherwise, things can break very, very easily. With that covered, I want to do one more thing. Right now, we looked at the pack method, but we also have to look at the grid layout. For that one, I want to give my window a couple of columns and a couple of rows. Let me start with the column, with column configure. I'm going to create two columns, zero and one. Both are going to have a weight of one, and I'm going to set the uniform to A. This I can now duplicate, and I want to have a row configure. I also want to have two rows with zero and one with the same weight and same uniform argument. That way we have four cells with an identical size. Inside of this one, I now want to place my label one and label two, which means label one dot grid. This one I want to place in row zero and column zero. I can duplicate this entire line, change label one to label two, and this one should be in row one. Now if I run this, we can see we have two different sizes for the labels. This once again happens because of this width here. However, I can overwrite this quite easily. If I, for example, for label two, set sticky to north, south, east, and west, we now have the label covering the entire cell. So once again, the inbuilt layout method is overwriting the custom width we have set inside of the widget. If you were using the place method, the same thing would happen. This can be fairly confusing and frustrating at times, so I hope this helped. Another important part of tkinter is the stacking order. This one determines which widget is on top of another widget. So in here, I can place different widgets on top of each other. Especially when you use the grid or the place layout method, this can become quite important. Because for both of those layout methods, it's very easy to place widgets on top of each other. So you need to be able to control which widget is on top of the other. For that, the most basic thing you have to understand is that widgets are always placed on top of other widgets when they are created. Really important here, not when they are placed. For example, we have two labels, both are TTK label and nothing else. The arguments here really don't matter. And then we are using the grid method to place them. Once again, I am ignoring the arguments here, but just imagine they are on top of each other. In this case, label two is going to be on top, but this is because we are creating label two after we are creating label one. If we switch this around, then label one would be on top of label two. The grid method itself doesn't have any influence on that. It's kind of confusing to be honest, but well, it is what it is. On top of that, you can also raise widgets to the top of all of the widgets or on top of another widget. For this video, I have something slightly more complex ready. If I execute this, I have two labels, label one and label two. On top of that, I have two buttons in the bottom right. We have raise label one and raise label two. Later on, those are going to control which label is on top, although right now they don't do anything. Inside of the code, I am importing tkinter, I am creating a window, then I'm creating four different widgets. 
I have two bits of text and two buttons, button one and button two. After that, I have the layout section. In here, I am placing the two labels using the place method. The arguments here are basically random. The one important thing is that those two labels are overlapping with each other. That way I can show you which label is on top of the other. Besides that, we have the buttons. And the only important thing here is that both buttons are in the bottom right. That I achieve with relative y being 1 and relative x being 1 or 0 0.8. That way both buttons are in the bottom right with button 1 being a bit further to the left. The anchor here is really important. That way we're placing the origin point of the widget in the bottom right of the widget. With that covered, we can start talking about the actually important part. And that is that right now we have label 1 being below label 2. The reason for that is that we are creating label 1 before label 2. I can demonstrate this by creating label 2 before label 1. Now if I run this, we have label 1 in front of label 2. However, the layout method, so place in this case, has no impact on this whatsoever. If I place label 2 before label 1, we get the same outcome. And if I place label 2 after label 1, we still get the same result. In my case, I want to start with label 1 and then create label 2. This means that label 2 is on top of label 1. Now, to control the stacking order, you have a couple of different approaches. The easiest one is called lift. For example, after I'm creating the widgets, label 1 and label 2, remember here, label 2 is on top right now. So we have label 2 on top. But I could get my label 1 and then run the lift method on it. This elevates label 1 on top of all of the other widgets. Alternatively, I could get label 2 and then run the lower method on it. That way, we are lowering label 2 below all of the other widgets. So let me add both in here so you can see them in the code a bit easier. We have lift and we have lower. Besides that, what we can also do, let me comment out lift and lower for now. Inside of the button, let's say for label 1 for now, I want to add a command. This command is going to be a lambda function because it will be very simple. I want to get label 1 and what I could do is simply run the lift method. If I now run this again, note here label 1 right now is below label 2. But if I click on raise label 1, we can see label 1 is on top of label 2. And what we can also do, if I copy the command here, now for raise label 2, I could get label 2 and lower it. So now if I run this again, and now if I click on raise label 2, we are lowering label 2. The naming here doesn't really make sense, but I'm going to change this anyway in a second. So lift and lower, you can use quite well. Besides that, you could also use TK raise. And that does the same thing as lift. Let me add it for both. And now if I run this again, we can raise label 1 or raise label 2. And that way, we can control which widget is on top of the other. You might be wondering now, what is the difference between lift and TK raise? And quite honestly, I have no idea. They seem to be doing the exact same thing. So you can use whichever one you prefer. It really doesn't make much of a difference. So with that, let's do an exercise. I want you guys to add a third label and a third button, meaning label three here and button number three. The command for button number three should raise the third label all the way to the top. Pause the video now and try to implement this one yourself. This should be a fairly simple thing to implement because all we have to do is duplicate label two, change this one to label three. I also want to change the text to label three and for the color, we can go with blue. After that, I want to create button number three with button number three. This one should be race label three. And for this one, I want to have label three and then TK race. With that covered, I have to cover the layout for both the label and the button. For label 3, I once again want to use the place method. And here for the arguments, I do want to have a different position so we can see this a bit easier. The numbers I went with x being 20, y being 80, the width is 180, and the height is simply 100. 
Finally, I want to place button number three. For this, I want to copy button two, change it to button number three. The only change I'm going to make here is relative x should be 0 0.6. If I run the entire thing now, we're getting an error because I have some weird typo in here. Let me fix that like so, and that is looking much better. Now let's try this. There we go. Now we have label three. For this one, if I click on raise label one, now we have label one all the way on the top. The same thing we can do with label two, and then we have label three. So all of this is working quite well. And you can very easily control which label is on top. This would also work with literally any other widget. I am simply using labels because they are the most easy to work with, and I can visualize easily what's going on. Now, there's one more thing that I do want to cover, and that is that both for TK raise and lift, we can add one argument, and that is called above this. By default, TK raise puts a widget all the way on top of all of the other widgets. But if you want to have a widget only on top of another widget, you would use above this. For example, for label one, when I'm clicking on TK raise, I want to only elevate it on top of label two. So if label three is on top, then label one would not be elevated all the way to the top. It would still be below the third label. I hope that makes sense. Let me illustrate actually. So now we have label three all the way on the top. If I click on raise label two, we have label two all the way on the top. And now if I click on raise label one, we have label one all the way on the top. Although more specifically, label one is now only going to be on top of label two. If I raise label three all the way again, and now I raise label one again, nothing is going to happen because label one already is on top of label two. I hope the logic makes sense here. If you think about it for a couple of seconds, it should be fairly straightforward. I suppose to illustrate this a bit better, if I raise label two all the way to the top, and now I raise label three on top of it, now if I click on raise label one, the green bit is going to be on top of the red bit, but below the blue bit. So raise label one, there we go. Label one is on top of label two, but below label three. The above this argument would also work with lift, I can run this again, and we would have the very same outcome. Once again, I don't really know what are two different methods for the same thing, but choose whatever you want, it really is up to you. A really important aspect of tkinter is toggling widgets. What that means in practice is something like this. We have a label and I want to toggle it, meaning I'm switching it on or off, or visible or invisible, whatever you want to call it. This is actually quite simple if you know what you are doing in tkinter. So let's talk about it. Inside of tkinter, you don't really hide or show widgets. Instead, what you're doing is you're removing or adding widgets to the layout. Chances are you already know how to add widgets. This either happens with pack, grid, or place. But all of these methods also have the opposite. For example, for the pack method, we have pack forget. And this one does the opposite of the pack method, it removes a widget. All of this can also be done while the app is running. And if you know how to use it, you can hide and show widgets quite easily. I already have a couple of lines of code ready. I am importing tkinter, I am creating a window, and I'm running the entire thing. So this is what we're getting. But now we have to cover a couple of things. For every single layout method, we have to look at the actual layout method and how to do the opposite. And let's get started with the place method. This one I think is the easiest one to understand. We first of all have to create a button. Let me call it TTK and button with the window being the parent and the text is going to be toggle label. Finally, this one is going to get a command that I'm going to call toggle label place. We're going to create this one right away under the place method. So all of this is a bit easier to put together. Toggle place method, no need for parameters. And for now, I'm just going to add pass in here. Finally, I want to add the button and let's use the place method for that. Since the button isn't going to do anything besides being clicked on, the position here doesn't matter. Let's go with X being 100 and Y being 50. So now if I run the entire thing, in the top left, we have a button. 
Although I guess it's a bit too far down. Let's change this to 10 and 10. Like so, now we have a button in the top left that I can click on, but nothing is going to happen. To make something happen, we need another widget. I'm going to call this one label, but it's going to work with any widget. And in here, I want to create TDK label with the parent being the window and the text is going to be a label. And this label I want to place in the center of the window, which means label.place relative x is going to be 0 0.5, relative y is going to be 0 0.5, and the anchor is going to be the center. Let me fix my typo really quick. And if I run this, now in the middle of the window, we have a label. What I now want to do is if I click on toggle label, this label should either be hidden or shown. I'm going to start by simply making this label disappear. This is going to happen inside of this function. To achieve that, all we have to do is get the label and then place forget. This is going to remove this label here and well, then we can't see it anymore. So now if I click on toggle label, the label disappears. Although the problem is if I click on it again, nothing is going to happen because well, we can only really forget it once. This doesn't work a second time. But the basic logic is in place here. We have a widget that's visible in the first place and then we make it invisible. But to make this actually interesting, we want to have a proper toggle functionality. And for that, I want to create another variable. I call this one label visibility. By default, this one is simply a Boolean value of true. This I want to update inside of this function, which means this needs to be a global variable. So global label visibility. I should probably rename this a tiny bit. Let's call it label visible. That is making much more sense. And essentially what I want to do, if I'm clicking this button, I'm going to check if the label is visible or not, which means if label visible, if that is the case, I want to forget this label. Besides that, I also want to get label visible and set it to false. Once I have that, I can create an else statement. And now if I'm running this function here, I know the label is not visible because label visible is false. If that is the case, I want to set label visible back to true. Finally, all I have to do is run this method here again. I am reattaching the label to the window or to any kind of container. This would also work with frames, which means I can simply copy this entire line here, paste it in there. And now if I run the entire thing, I can click on toggle label, the label disappears, and I can click on it multiple times. And now we'll make it appear or disappear. And this is basically all you need to toggle a label or literally any kind of widget. So for example, this label here could also be a button. Now we have a button and this one would still work just fine. Although I'm going to keep it being a label. And this is the basic logic that you have to understand. Besides place, we also have grid. So let's work with this one next. I now want to work on the grid. For this one, first of all, we have to create a couple of rows and columns, which means I want to get my window and run column config figure. I want to have two rows, zero and one that have the same weight. Let's go with one. And I also want to set uniform to a so they are the same size like so. Besides that, I am duplicating the entire line and change the column to a row. Although I only want to have a single row. So this isn't going to be a tuple, it's just going to be a zero. With that in place, I want to create a label and a button exactly the same thing I have done here. As a matter of fact, I'm going to copy all of this and paste it in here and uncomment the entire thing. The button is going to be basically identical. The only thing that's going to change is I'm not going to use place. Instead, I'm going to use grid. The button is going to be in column zero and row zero. For the label, I still have label visible being set to true. I am creating a label but I'm not using the place method to place it. Instead, I'm going to use grid. 
the label I'm going to place in column being one and row being zero. If I run the entire thing now, we are getting an error that we are using a function that doesn't exist right now. Let me remove it and run the entire thing again. There we go. We have toggle label right next to a e label. Although nothing is going to happen if I click on the button. For that, we have to create the command once again. This one is going to be toggle label, except now we are using grid. The basic logic here is going to be the same as in place. But let's create the function itself. Define, I called this one toggle label grid. No need for parameters. And then here, we are going to do the same thing we have done up here. But for good practice, let's do it from scratch. And if you want to practice yourself, try to do all of this yourself. All you need here are grid and grid forget. But in my case, I want to start by creating global label visible. That way we can change this variable here from inside of the function. If the label is visible, I want to get my label and I want to run grid underscore forget. Besides that, I want to set label visible to true. This we can already test. If I run the entire thing now and I click on toggle label, the label disappears. Although if I click on it a second time, nothing is going to happen. That is the functionality we have to work on right away. So else I want to set label visible back to true. And then I have to run this grid method here one more time. So I can just copy it, paste it in here, and now this should be working. Let's try. If I now click on toggle label, the label disappears. If I click again, nothing is going to happen. So something went wrong. I can already see the problem. This label visible here should be false. Now let's try it again. If I click on toggle label, it disappears. If I click again, it reappears. This is looking really good. Cool. With that, we have the grid method. And this basically works in the same way that this place method here is going to work. And both of those are working really well because the layout isn't really affected by other widgets. So where we are placing the label isn't really affected by the placement of the button. Each of those either have their unique positions, like in place, or their own unique cells, like in the grid. This is going to be different for the final layout method, and this is going to be for pack. For this one, once again, I want to copy the button and the label, place them in here and uncomment them. And those I simply want to place using the pack method. Also, let me get rid of this command here, so we're not getting an error. If I run the entire thing now, we get the two widgets right next to each other. What is really important to understand here is that the position of this label is influenced by this button. The pack method always places widgets on top of each other. And this is kind of a problem when we're using pack for get. Let me demonstrate and then you're going to see how this is going to work. Although I want to make some changes. This button, I want to have all the way at the bottom of the window. So I'm going to pack it after the label and the label I am going to set to expand to cover the entire window. If I run the entire thing now, the label is basically in the middle of the window and the button is all the way at the bottom. Now we can work with this. If I press on the button, I want to run a function, which means I have to use command again, and I want to toggle label pack. For this, we have to create another function, toggle label pack. Once again, no need for parameters. And in here, I can already demonstrate what the problem is going to be. If I simply run label and pack forget, try to predict what is going to happen. But, well, let me run the entire thing. And now if I click on toggle label, the button is going to be all the way at the top. The reason being that originally the label covered all of this space and then the button was placed at the bottom here. But since we got rid of the label, this entire thing here disappeared and the button is now all the way at the top. And this is going to be a problem that we have to account for. And accounting for that is going to be your exercise. What I want you guys to do is to fix the code so that the button stays at the bottom. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out. As a tip here, try to use a widget that is by default invisible. 
Righty, this solution here is if I run the entire thing again. By default, we have two widgets. We have a label and we have a button with the label taking up this entire space here. What I want to do is create a third widget. And this one is going to cover the same space as the label. Although it is not going to have any content. This could either be a frame or a label without any text. Both would be fine. In my case, I'm going to work with a frame. And this frame is only going to be placed when the label is invisible. That way the button has something to be stacked below. But let's implement all of this step by step. First of all, I want to create another widget. This is going to be the frame. This is simply going to be TTK and frame. And the parent here is going to be the window. We're not going to place this one right away. Instead, inside of the toggle label pack function. I want to once again set the label visible as a global variable. And now I can use the if statement again. If the label is visible, then I want to pack forget the label. I also have to set label visible to false. But now what I also want to do is to get the frame and pack this one. On top of that, since the frame is supposed to take up the entire space that the label has taken, I want to set expand to true. So expand is going to be true. And now if I run this, I can click on toggle label and we have the same problem. And the issue here right now is when we are placing the widgets, this label here comes as number one and then we are placing the button number two. So in the original widget, we had the label something like this position and then we had the button below this position here. And the button moved all the way to the top once we removed this label here. The problem now is that once we're adding this frame with the pack method, we are adding it below the button. So the label is going to be here, which for our purposes is not going to be useful. We have to find some kind of method to place the frame on top of the button. And this we can do quite easily because the pack method has another useful feature. That is called before. We can tell the frame method to pack a widget before a certain other widget. The widget we want to pack the frame before is the button. And now if I run this again, I can click on toggle label and the button stays all the way at the bottom. The reason for it is that now we have created this frame here and packed it before the button. So it is going to be in this position. If you play around with this, this should become fairly obvious. Although most of the time when you're hiding or showing widgets, you want to use either place or grid because this tends to get a tiny bit more complicated. But let's finish it and then we can wrap up this video. I want to have else. I first of all want to get the frame again and now run pack or get. This frame should only be there when the label is not visible. Once the label is visible, it is going to take up the entire space of this frame. Which means I also have to get the label back, which I'm doing with the pack method. And this one needs expand being true. And also we have to use before again. I want to have this label before the button. And finally, label visible is going to be true. Let's run this one. And now if I click on toggle label, this one is working really good. So with that, we can toggle widgets. Hope that was helpful. In this video, we are going to combine the different layout methods in tkinter. What we are going to make is going to look something like this. Here we have a fairly complex UI that also scales along with the window. This is what we're going to create. And for that, we're going to use place, pack and grid. They all work together really well for all of this. Later on, when we can style things, this is going to look actually good, but we are definitely making progress. And before I jump in, I do want to talk about the layout here. It's quite important to understand. On the most fundamental level, we are separating the UI into two parts, which is going to be two frames. One is here and one is here. Both of those are placed with the place method. 
inside of the left container, this one here, we are mostly using the grid method. For example, here's one row, here's another row, and here's a row at the end. And then we have a couple of columns, there are three in total. You can see this quite well with the sliders, they are on the left and on the right column. Although that being said, in the bottom, there is one frame that covers the entire width of the column. Inside of that one, we are using the pack method to place these two checkboxes. Finally, the entry widget here at the bottom, it's kind of hard to see. This one is placed using the place method. That way, it's always at the bottom in the middle. After that, we have this entire area. For this one, I am using the pack method to create these two areas. With each area being one frame, and inside of the frame, we are creating another directional layout that is just going to contain a label and a button. I already have a few lines of code, and I realized the title I didn't change from grid. This should be combined layout. But other than that, we have a window that's 600 by 600 pixels. Although there's one thing I already want to do, and that is I want to get my window and set a minimum size. Like so, the minimum size should be 600 by 600. That way the window cannot be too small, which would end up looking very strange. Once we have that, we can start by creating the main layout widgets, I call them. For this one, I have a menu frame and I have a main frame. Both of those are going to be TTK and frame, with the parent being the window. Those two I now have to place, and this I do, let me add another comment, main place layout. I'm going to use the place method to place these two frames. For example, I want to have the menu frame, I want to use place, and now I have to specify an X position, a Y position, a width, and a height. Since I want the menu frame always to be on the left side, X is going to be zero, and Y is also going to be zero. You could use relative values here, but since we are using zero, it really doesn't matter. It's going to give you the same result. Although for the width, I do want to get the relative width. This is going to be 0.3 in my case. And finally, for the height, I want to have a relative height that is going to be 1. If I run this now, we can't see anything because frames by themselves are invisible. Although we can make this visible by creating a TTK label with the parent being the menu frame. And this one is going to have a background of red. This I want to pack right away. And in here, I'm going to set expand to true and fill to both. If I run this now, we can see the entire area of the menu frame. With that, we can create the main frame. And the main frame is going to take up the entire remaining space. Which means for place, I want to set a relative X position. And this one is going to be 0.3. I know I have to use 0.3 because the width of the menu is also 0.3. That way, those two start on the same point. The Y position, though, is still going to be 0. Both of the widgets are supposed to start on the top of the window. After that, I want to have a relative width, and this is going to be 0.7. The number here should be obvious. With the width and the height, we have a total number of 1. So we are covering the entire rest of the window. Finally, I want to have a relative height, and this one is going to be 1. To visualize this, I want to copy the label and change the background color to yellow, and the master is going to be the main frame. Let's try this one now, and there we go. We have covered the entire area of the window. I can also resize this, and this is looking pretty good. I guess if you make the window too large, the left side is going to become quite large, but I'm not going to worry too much about it. Let me comment out those two lines. I'm going to reuse them in a bit for some debugging, just to see what we are doing. Next up, I want to create the menu layout widgets. I guess we could just call this menu widgets. 
For those, I have to create quite a few different widgets. To save some time, let me just copy them in. We have to create all of these widgets. We have three buttons, button one, button two, and button three. Then we have two sliders, slider one and slider two. Then we have a toggle frame. And inside of this toggle frame, we have two toggles, toggle one and toggle two. Both of the toggles are just going to be check buttons. I guess just to get started, I can comment out the toggle frame. So we only have a couple of buttons and a couple of sliders. These I want to place now. Now I want to create the menu layout. Since I want the menu to have the grid layout, I have to create the columns and the rows, which I do by getting my menu frame and then creating column configure. I want to have three columns, which means I'm going to create a tuple with zero, one, and two. The weight I'm going to set to one. Besides that, I want to create a row configure and I want to have three and four rows in total, all of which have the weight of one. Once I have that, I can actually place things. For example, I can get menu button one and I want to use the grid method. The button here should be in row zero, column zero as well. And let's just see what we get. We get an error because I have made a typo. This should be column configure. Let's try it now. And there we go. We can see button one in the top left. The button doesn't cover the entire area. For that, we are going to need the sticky argument. And I want the button to stick to the north, south, west, and east of the container or the cell. And now if I run this, we have button one in the top left. Finally, I want this button one to be a tiny bit wider. For that, I'm going to set the column span to two. It's going to be very hard to see right now, but this button is now going to span two columns. Once I have that, I can duplicate the line. And now I want to place button two. This button is going to be on row zero, but on column two. It is only going to span one column though, and I want to stick the widget to all four sides of the cell. Let's run this one now, and there we go. We have button one and button two, with button one being much wider than button two. If I expand the window, you can see this much better. To really make these columns and rows consistent, I want to add the uniform argument, uniform, and I'm going to set the argument here to A. It doesn't really matter what it is as long as those two are identical strings. Now if I run this, we can actually see that button one is twice as wide as button two. That looks much better. After that, I want to place menu button three. This is again going to use the grid method. I want to set the row to one and the column to zero. Column span is going to be three and sticky is going to be north, south, east, and west. With that, we are creating a button that spans the entire second row. The result is going to be three buttons in this kind of layout. Next up, I want to place the sliders, these two sliders here. Both already have the orientation of vertical. That way they're going up and down. And just to demonstrate, I want to have the sliders here and here, which means I want to get my menu slider one and I want to use the grid method again. The row should be number two here and column is going to be zero. I want the row span to be two. And finally, I want to set sticky to all four sides. So north, south, east, and west. Running this now gives me one of the sliders. Although I don't like how close this is to the buttons. To account for that, I want to set pad Y to let's say 20 pixels. And now we have a bit of a distance between the two, which I think looks much better. This I can now duplicate because I want to place slider two. For this one, I want to have column two and row two can stay the same. In fact, all of the other arguments can also remain identical. If I run this now, we have both of the sliders. This is looking really good. 
With that, we can place a slightly more complicated layout, and that is the toggle layout. The one I have created here and commented out for now. This one is going to be one frame and the frame consists two toggle or two check buttons to be more specific. In terms of my layout though, I can work with these separately. For example, I first of all want to get my toggle frame and use the grid method to place it. I want this one to be in row number four and the column is going to be zero. Although I want this frame to span the entire width of the container. So column span is going to be three. What I also shouldn't forget is I want to set this to sticky with north, south, east, and west, just to be sure. And if I run this now, we can't see anything. The reason is again, frames are invisible. We can use the TTK label again I created earlier. I now want to set the toggle frame as the master, run this again, and there we can see we are covering the entire bottom bit. So I want to comment this out again. And now I want to use this area to place these two toggle buttons. For that, I'm going to use the pack method. I want to get my menu toggle one and pack the entire thing. Since I want both of these toggles next to each other, I want to set the side to left and I want to set expand to true. This line I can now duplicate and change toggle one to toggle two. And let's see what we get. That is looking really good. We have both of the toggles right next to each other. I hope here you can see how it is really easy to combine different kinds of layouts. We have created the main layout using the place method. Then we have created a grid inside of one of the frames. And inside of this grid, we have created another frame with the pack method. That way using containers gives you a ton of power. Finally, what I want to do is I want to place the entry. Let me call it entry layout. For this entry, this entry doesn't exist right now actually. I want to create it when I'm importing all of the widgets here. I want to create an entry widget and this I do with TTK and entry. The parent is going to be the menu frame. This entry I now want to place using the place method. Since I want this entry widget to be in the middle at the bottom, I want to use relative x being 0.5, then relative y is going to be 0.95, and I want to set the relative width to 0.9. If I run this now, we get something slightly weird. Or well, if you understand place, this should be familiar. Right now, we are placing the top left point, and this one is right in the center of the container, right here. The reason we get that is because we haven't updated the anchor. For that, we have the anchor argument, and I want to place the center of this entry widget. Let's try it now, and this is looking much better. This entry widget is now always going to be all the way on the bottom of this container. You could have also used another row inside of row configure to place the entry widget using the grid method. Although in my case, I just want to demonstrate that you can combine different layout methods. Although that has its limits. You couldn't combine a grid and a pack method. For example, if I wanted to comment out this one here and use entry.pack without any arguments, run this, we're getting an error. The error message we get is cannot use geometry manager with pack inside. The reason is we already have the grid method in here. This though only applies to entry, place is perfectly fine. Ready, next up, we can create the main layout. Unfortunately for that, we need a few more widgets. So let me add another section called main widgets. And I'm going to copy in the widgets I'm going to need. Like so, I have one more frame that I called entry frame one. Inside of this frame, we have a label and a button called label one and button one. Both are super, super simple. The one notable feature here is that both of them have the parent or the master as entry frame one, this one here. 
This we're doing two times, one time here and one time here. Entry frame two, main level two and button two are basically identical to the first one, which means what I want to do, if I run the entire thing again, over this entire space here, I want to use the pack method to create two large areas. One could look like this and one is going to look like this. Both of these are going to be frames. Inside of each frame, we are going to place the label and then we are going to place the button. Which means we have to get started by placing entry one and entry two. For that, I want to get entry one and use the pack method. Since I want both of these frames next to each other, I want to set the side to left. Other than that, I want to set expand to true. So we are covering the entire horizontal space and I want to set fill to both. This I can now duplicate and set entry one to entry two. All of the arguments though can stay identical. This, if I run this again, is not going to be visible because once again, frames are invisible. But I can once again use these two labels to make all of this visible. The master for the first one is going to be entry frame one and the master for the second one is going to be entry frame two. If I run this now, this is looking pretty good. Although I do want to have some padding between the two. I want to create pad X. I went with 20 here and I want to create pad Y, which I also set to 20. Now if I run this again, we have a bit of padding around them. Righty, with that, finally, I can get rid of these two labels at the end and instead place all of these labels and buttons. I'm going to start with main label one. The side is going to be the top since that is the default argument. I can just leave this empty, although I do have to set expand to true and fill to both. This line I can duplicate again because now I want to place main button one. This one up here. This is also going to get expand true and fill both. Let's try it actually. There we can see we have the label and the button. What I don't like is that those two are right next to each other. To account for that, I'm going to give the button pad Y of 10 pixels. Now we have a tiny bit of space between the two. With that, all I have to do is copy all of this, duplicate it, and I can just change main label one to two and main button one to two. The result is going to look like this. And with that, we have a fairly complicated layout that is, well, working quite well. Obviously, we have no functionality, but in terms of layouts, this is basically as complex as Tkinter widgets are going to be. Now, that being said, all of this is still not particularly manageable because we have a ton of different sections and this isn't pleasant to work with. But all of this is going to be much easier managed when we are using classes. And this is going to be the next video. But if you want to challenge yourself, a really good exercise could be to convert all of this to a class-based approach. See if you can figure this one out. Although if you can't do it, don't worry too much about it. I'm going to cover all of this in the next video. I will guess I see you there. Let's talk about using classes in Tkinter. And what we are going to make is going to look something like this. This is the same layout we have seen in the last part, except now we are using classes to organize all of this, which is making the entire app significantly more manageable. Let's talk about it and then we can implement all of this. The most important thing that you have to understand is that we are basically always taking some kind of widget, usually a frame, but it doesn't have to be. And then we're adding widgets to this frame. And then in the end, we are placing this frame somewhere on the window. That way, we can organize lots of widgets very, very easily. If you understand basic tkinter, this shouldn't be too difficult to implement. Although to make all of this work, let me show you my setup. Here, I have two Python files open. On the left side, we have classes.py. This is what I'm going to work in. On the right side, we have the previous code from the last video. This is the same layout or the same app, except that we are not using any classes. So what we are going to do in this video is convert all of this into a class-based approach. That way I can switch between the two and illustrate what's going on. Now, 
First of all, we have to import the basics. This I can just copy straight away. I want to import TK into STK and I also want to have TTK. Now that we have that, I want to create a class. I'm going to call this app, but you can name this whatever you want. This app is going to become the window. Essentially, this bit here is what we have to turn into a class. The really important thing here that might be a little bit complicated is that this app is going to inherit from tk.tk, which means that the app here is going to be the main window. Let me implement it straight away. This app is supposed to inherit from tk.tk. In the function-based approach, this one here, we have stored this object inside of the window variable. In the class-based approach, we are storing the object itself. Once we have that, I want to call a dunder init method. For now, this one just needs self and nothing else. In here, there's one really important thing that we have to do before anything else, and that is to call super and dunder init. This ensures that this TK functionality works properly. Although besides that, we don't have to add any arguments, so this one can stay as it is. With these lines of code, we basically have replicated this one line of code here. So far, we have just become less efficient. But what we can do now is get self and, for example, set the title. The title could be something like class based app. This would be the equivalent of this line here. Let me expand it a tiny bit, like so. In the function based approach, we got the object, which we called window, and then we called the title method on it. This we can simplify here a tiny bit because the object itself is, well, self and we can still call the method on it because we inherited the entire object and this is one method of it. To illustrate how all of this is going to work, let me go all the way down in the functional approach and run window.mainloop. In the class-based approach, this would be self.mainloop without any arguments. With that approach, we can simply create an instance of this object and run it and if I execute the entire code now, we can see we have a window that also has the same title, class-based approach. There you can see it better. Although right now our app is one class that is a lot easier to manage. Not for now, but it is going to be much easier. So besides that, I want to also duplicate these two bits here, which means inside of window, I want to get self and I want to set the geometry of this class or this app. To duplicate this, I want to have the same dimension, 600 by 600. I can run this again, and there we go. We have a larger window. The same I can do if I duplicate this line. I can set the minimum size here. For this one, we just want two numbers with 600 and 600. That way, if I run this again, I cannot make the app smaller than 600 by 600. And with that, we have copied all of this here to set up our window. Although I do want to make some minor changes and that is I want to set the title and the geometry from the arguments that we pass into the class when we create the instance of it. Which means inside of app I want to pass in a title let me call it a class based app and then I want to add a tuple with the width and the height which in my case is 600 by 600 which means I have to update all of this a tiny bit to account for these arguments here, which I think could be a fairly good exercise for you. Try to update the code to account for these arguments. Pause the video now and see if you can figure this one out. First of all, we have to add two more parameters to init. I want to have a title and I want to have, let's call it size. The title is very easy to change because this one is just a string, which means inside of title, I can pass in the title. The geometry is going to be a tiny bit more difficult, although not very much. We basically have to figure out how to turn this tuple into a string. In my case, I am using an F string, which means I want to add an F in here. And the first argument is going to be size and zero. The second one is then going to be size and one. And now we should be good to go. 
I guess one more thing that we could be doing is right now, minimum size is static. We can also update this one, although we would use the same numbers we have used with geometry. So size zero and size one, which means if I run this now, we cannot see any difference. Although what I can do is change these numbers, let's say to 200 and 400, and now we get a different kind of window, although I don't actually want to do that. And I think with that, you can already see some advantages. With just one line of code, we can call the entire window and pass arguments into it. So when we actually use the app, this one is much easier to understand than these four lines here. And this is only going to become more advanced. For the next bit, I want to work on the menu. Let me show this again. Here is the app. What I want to work on is the left side, this bit here. In the original code, if I move this to the side, we have a menu. The menu is all of this bit here. A couple of widgets, all of those are inside of a menu frame. This menu frame here. Or rather, we are creating it here, we are placing it here, and then we are adding widgets here. On top of that, further down there, we are adding the layout of the widgets further down here, which all things combined is really annoying to manage. We basically have a huge amount of code that is really, really disorganized. This I can change very easily by creating another class that I want to call menu. This menu is going to inherit from TTK and frame. Basically, what we are going to start with is we are going to recreate this frame here. Except now we are not storing TTK frame inside of a variable. Instead, we are creating a whole new object. Inside of this, like with the app, we have to create a dunder init method. This one is going to need self, and on top of that, we are also going to need a parent or a master. Because inside of the init method, I want to call the super dunder init method, and this one is going to need one argument, and that is the master or the parent. The way you have to understand this is that this init method is basically the same as calling the object by itself. And for that, we always have to pass in the master, which in this case is going to be the window. With that, we have basically created another frame. This we can now use inside of the app. The way this is going to work, let me add a couple of comments here. I want to create widgets, and besides that, I have the main setup. All the way at the bottom, I am running the app. The widgets, right now, we only have self.menu, which is going to be the menu. Although, don't forget, when we are calling this menu here, we have to pass in the parent. And this could be an interesting exercise for you. Try to figure out what the parent is. The parent in this instance is self, because the app is tk.tk, .tk, what we call the window in the functional approach. And in the functional approach, we sort all of this inside of the window variable and pass this inside of the frame. In the class-based approach, let me move this a bit to the side, app itself is the window. So this app we are passing into the menu. That way, this menu is going to have this app as the master. Although if I run all of this, we can't really see very much. There are two reasons for it. Number one, this menu right now is just a frame and frames are invisible. Although even if they were visible, we couldn't see them because we're not placing this frame anywhere on the app. Right now, there's a parent or a master, but we don't actually position the frame inside of the parent. Which means there are two things we have to work on. Number one, I want to create a label that actually illustrates where the menu is. For that, I simply want to create a TTK and label, like so. The parent here, once again, has to be self. I don't actually want to have text in there. Instead, what I want is a background. This one can be read right now. Right after creating this label, I want to use the pack method. And in here, I want to set expand to true and fill to both. That way, this label is going to fill the entire frame with a red color. 
And let me move this a bit further to the right so we can see the entire thing. Right, with that, we should be having a menu that's at least visible. Although if I run this again, we still can't see anything because we have to place the frame itself. And this can happen inside of this class as well. Because all we have to do is get self, and now we can run, for example, pack, or we could run grid. We could run whatever we want. To keep it simple for now, I want to run the pack method. If I run this now, we can see all the way in the top, we have a tiny red bar. This we can set to expand being true, and we can set fill to both. And now if I run this, this frame is covering the entire window. Although in the original, if I expand this a tiny bit more, when we are placing the menu frame, this happens here, we are using the place method with all of these arguments. Meaning I can just copy them, move this a bit further to the side again, and now instead of pack, call the place method. This one has X being zero and Y being zero, so menu is always on the left side. It covers 30% of the width of the window and it covers the entire height. I can run this again, and there we go. Now we have the same position for the menu. Why this approach is really useful is I can now minimize the menu and inside of the app, this is what I'm actually working with. The entire menu is simply one entry. I don't have to worry about all of these different snippets that are in different places. The entire menu is in one spot, which makes it much easier to work with. Although right now the menu doesn't have any content, so we have to work a bit more on this. And let me move this a bit further to the right. There we go. Inside of the menu, I want to create all of these menu widgets. These ones here. For that, I'm going to create a separate method. I'm going to call this one define create widgets. This one needs self and nothing else. And in here, I want to create all of these widgets. So let me copy them. We have menu button one, two, and three. We have two sliders. We have a toggle frame. This one is a frame in itself. And this one has two children, menu toggle one and two. And finally, we have a frame. All of these I want to copy and paste them in here and also fix the indentations. There's one more change that we do have to make. And that is that all of these buttons and sliders don't have a menu frame as the parent instead I want to change all of the menu frame to self because all of these buttons should have this menu frame as the parent with the exception of menu toggle one and menu toggle two because those two are supposed to be a child of the toggle frame meaning those we don't actually have to change besides that the entry i forgot to change this isn't menu frame this should be self with that all i have to do is call this method self.createWidgets. And now I can run this and we can't see anything. Again, this happens because we are only creating widgets. We're not placing them on this frame. For that, I want to create another method. I guess we can call this one create layout. No custom parameters again. And what I want to do now is replicate basically this here, including this one as well. As you can see in here, we are using the grid method to place all of these elements, which means, first of all, what we have to do a bit further up, we have to create the grid for the menu. This I have done here with these two lines of code. So let me start by copying those two. And once again, I have to fix the indentation and move this thing a bit further to the side so we can see what's going on. I want to, first of all, create the grid. For this, I can minimize the create widgets method. I want to get this frame here and I want to set columns and rows on this, which means instead of the menu frame, I want to get self. Although the rest can stay identical, which means next up, I can place the widgets. For this, once again, I can copy all the stuff I have done here, all of this. And I can place it in here. Once again, we have to fix some indentations like so. 
And now we can work with this. And now we have a tiny problem. All of these widgets are only available inside of create widgets. They are in the local scope of this method inside of here, which means I couldn't access them inside of this create layout method. I guess there are two ways you could approach this problem. Number one, you could change all of these variables to attributes. So for example, you would turn this variable into an attribute using self, and then down here, you would use self.entry.place. That would be one approach. Although in my case, I don't want to go with that one. So let me undo everything. Instead, I'm going to be a tiny bit lazy here, copy all of this, and then place it inside of create widgets. That way we are doing all of this inside of one method and we are staying within the same scope. Not the cleanest approach. And if you had a more complex app, this would probably be something you want to work on more. But for this simple app, this is totally fine. At the very least, let me add some comments here. I want to create the widgets. Then I want to create a grid and then I want to place the widgets. And with that, I want to get rid of this TTK label here because we don't need it anymore. Now I can run the entire thing and there we go. We have the entire menu still works just as before, except now all of this is inside of one class and this finishes the menu, which means now I can minimize this. And now we can see menu is simply one entry that is much easier to work with. And if we wanted to work with it, we can simply open this and then change all of this and do whatever change we want to make, which makes maintaining all of this much easier. So in comparison, here's the original. We had just code for the menu here, 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 here. And this was very difficult to separate from the main widget, for example. So with that, we are making some good progress. Next up, I want to create main. If I run this again, main is this main area here. This one is actually really simple because what we want to do again is we have main.frame here, just another frame. This one we are putting on the window using the place method again. So this we can start on right away. I want to create another class and this one I called main. Once again, this has to inherit from ttk.frame. And let me move this a tiny bit further to the side. In here, like for the menu, we are going to need a dunder init method that gets self and it gets a parent. Spelled correctly as well, like so. And don't forget, super underscore underscore init and pass in the parent in here. This is the same thing we have done for the menu. So if I open the init method of the menu, we had all of this. Next up to actually see the main menu, I want to run the place method again. Although I can copy this from the original video, we are calling this place method here, which means inside of the init method of main, I want to call self and place and then place the widget in this position. To make sure that we can see this, I want to once again create TTK label with self as the parent, with background being red, and with the pack method setting expand to true and fill to both. With that, I can simply create this main method inside of the app, right below the menu, self, let's call it main, is going to be main with self as the parent. And if I run this now, we can see the main frame. Let me minimize the menu and get rid of TTK label here. We definitely know this is going to work, which means with that, let me show the app again. We can start working on the actual entries, these things here. This one, once again, is going to be one frame. Inside of the frame, we have one label with a background and then we have a button below. For that, I want to add a tiny bit more code inside of main. I first of all want to create a frame. So I can just call it frame and this is going to be TTK and frame. 
The parent here is going to be self. Inside of this frame, I want to have a label and a button. So let me create a label variable. Then I want to use TTK and label with the frame being the parent. Text is going to be, let's say, test one. And the background color is going to be red. After that, I want to create a button. And this is going to be TTK and button with the frame as the parent. Text is going to be, I call this one test one as well. Although let's call it button. That probably makes a bit more sense. These two buttons we now have to get inside of the frame. And this frame we have to place inside of the main frame. Let's start with putting these two widgets inside of the frame. For that, I'm going to use the pack method. So label.pack, expand should be true, and fill should be both. This I can now duplicate because the button is going to work in the same way. With the only difference that the button has padding Y being 10 pixels. Finally, I want to get the frame and pack this one as well. Although for this one, I want to set the side to left. Actually, I can copy all of this from the original. In here, we are placing all of this. If I find it really quick, we are placing the main layout here. We have entry frame one and entry frame two. All of this, I want to copy like so. So let me move all of this to the side again. And I want to use this pack method with all of these arguments. And with that, this should be working. Let's try now. And there we go. We can see the entry inside of the main frame. We are making a lot of progress. Now, this is starting to become a tiny bit messy because this frame here could be its very own class. And this, incidentally, is going to become your exercise. I want you guys to get this frame here and turn it into a separate class along with all of its children. So it should be a frame class with a label and a button. On top of that, I want you guys to set the color, the label and the button via the arguments, which means you should be able to use the init method of this new class to set the text of the label, the text of the button and the background of the label. And pause the video now and try to figure this one out yourself. Let's get started. First of all, I want to create a new class and this one I called entry. As always, we have to inherit from TTK and frame. Inside of that, we need the dunder init method. In here, we need self as always. Then we need a parent. Then we need three more arguments. We need the label text, we need the button, text, and we need the label background. These three arguments we need to cover the second part of the exercise. With that, inside of the init method, don't forget to call the super init method. And then here, you want to add the parent. This entry frame here is going to be this frame, which means inside of it, we can do all of this. As a matter of fact, let me cut out all of this and delete the frame. And instead, I want to paste all of these things in here. Now we have a label, a button. We are placing the label and the button, and then we are packing the frame. Although for this to work, we have to make some changes. First of all, label and button have not the frame as the parent. Instead, self is the parent now. For the layout, this can stay exactly as it was before. Although for the frame itself, we don't want to pack the frame, we want to pack self. Because remember, self is a frame that we can pack on the parent. With that, we can already create an entry frame in here. The one argument we have to pass in here for now is the self. Although all the other arguments we are not using right now. So let me simply pass in one, two, and three. It doesn't really matter right now. I can run this now. And there we go we have the very same result. And this is actually super useful because now I can duplicate this entry widget, run this again, and now we have two entry fields or frames. I can do this multiple times and there we go. We have lots of different fields. In my case though, I only want to have two 
but I hope you understand the principle here. Although next up, we have to actually cover these three parameters. And they are very easy to work with because all of them are going to be a string. The label text is going to be the text for the label, this one here, which means in there, I want to pass in the label text. The same thing for the button. I don't want to have a string button. Instead, I want to have the button text. Finally, let me add the comma here. For the background, we don't want to have hard-coded red. Instead, we want to have the label background. With that, I now have to pass in proper arguments in here. Let's say for entry one, I want to have entry one. Then for the button, I want to have button one spelled correctly. And for the background, I want to go with green. Let me duplicate all of these and paste them into the second entry. And let's call this entry two, button two. And for the color, let's go with blue. Let's try this again. And there we go. Now we have widgets that work perfectly fine. And now I hope you can see the value of this approach because this makes it really easy to create lots of widgets that are self-contained. For example, for the entry, we are only having one entry here, but this entry contains a huge amount of stuff. If I compare this to the original functional approach, we created the frame here, we created some widgets here, and then we set the layout here. And this was kind of messy because in there we had the second frame and all of this was really hard to follow. Whereas in this approach, we simply have one frame that contains it all and we are placing it wherever we need it. And with that, we have the entire app that is much more manageable because now we have logical parts to it that we can work with whenever we need. And this is what you want to use most of the time. As soon as you have any kind of complexity in your app, this approach is vastly superior. In this part, I want to talk about a really important part of tkinter, and that is creating custom components. What that means is to use tkinter or literally any GUI framework efficiently, you need to be able to create your own components. For example, when we use the classes in the last bit, we have created a couple of custom widgets. One example was the entry widget. What we created looked like this. And what is really important here is that this entire thing was one frame that we customized. So we gave it a label with a background and a button. And once we have that, we could create this multiple times. So we had another label and another button. Besides that, we also created this entire side panel as a separate widget. I suppose I should look at all of this in code straight away. Here's the code of what we just covered before. And all of this gives us this kind of app. The really important thing you have to understand here is that we are creating custom widgets. This entry here inherits from frame and adds more stuff to it. So this frame here. This we can do multiple times. We have one frame and we have another frame. This one here. Both of these were very easily created. We did all of that inside of main. In here, we can simply create one entry and another entry. I could duplicate this again, add entry three, button three, and for the color, I could go with green. If I run this thing now, we have a third entry widget. With this kind of system, we can create more complex layouts fairly easily and also keep them more manageable, which is why it is really important that you understand how to use all of this. I'm gonna practice it in this video as well, but definitely play around with this in your own time. Although more importantly for this video, what I also want to cover is that there are two ways to create custom components. The first one we have already seen is by using classes. Inside of a class, you inherit a widget and you add custom parts to it. This can create really complex layouts, but the downside is if you end up with too many small bits, you might have a ton of classes, which would be a bit annoying to manage. To account for that, we have the second approach, and that is a more functional approach. All we are doing in here is we are creating a widget inside of a function and then return the widget. This is a bit more limited in terms of what we can do, but the upside is we can create lots of small components inside of a class. Basically what you want to do, for any more complex component, you want to use a class. 
But inside of this more complex component, you want to use the functional approach to create simpler bits. All of this is going to make much more sense when we actually make the app. Speaking of which, what we're going to make is going to look something like this. In here, we have a couple of custom components. The most important one is each of those rows is one widget. And all of those are made using classes. Inside of this, we have three columns. We have a label, we have a button, and then we have this kind of thing with an entry and a button. For this final bit here, I want to use the functional approach. For the simple reason that this isn't particularly complicated, we simply have a frame with two widgets inside. It wouldn't really merit using a whole class, but I also don't want to create too much of a layout inside of the class itself in the init method. But well, let's jump into the code and let's have a look at all of this. Once again, I already have a couple of lines of code ready. If I execute the entire thing, we have a basic window with a title, but not much else. With that, we have to figure out how to create this kind of thing. What I want to start with is that these rows are always one widget. And this I want to create by using a class, which means I want to get started by creating a class. And this I want to call segment, I guess is a good name. This has to inherit from ttk.frame. Inside of this, I want to create a dunder init method. This one needs self, we need a parent. On top of that, we need a label text. And we are going to need a button text. That way I can customize the entire thing quite a bit easier. For reference, once again, inside of each segment, I have a label and I have a button. Once I have that, I can actually create the widget itself. For that, we first of all have to run this super init method and set the master to the parent. With that, we basically have a frame. And essentially what I want to do, inside of the global scope, I want to create all of the widgets. The important point here is I only want to call the segment and tkinter, or more specifically the class itself, should take care of everything else. All I want to pass inside of the segment is the parent, which is the window. Then I want to have a label text. Let's go with label. And I want to have a button text, button. And that is it. I don't want to do anything else inside of the global scope. The entire logic of this widget should be inside of the segment. That way we have one component that takes care of everything and we don't have to think about it too much. What this allows us to do is duplicate this a couple of times and we have different widgets that can do different things. For example, in this case, we would have different labels, let's say button and click or hello and test. It doesn't really matter what you place in here. The important thing that you have to understand is that we are creating a custom component that contains a huge amount of logic. To get started on all of this, inside of the segment class, I want to create a grid layout. For that, I want to get self and row configure. Although for this one, I want to have row zero with a weight of one, and that's basically it. Although with that, I can duplicate the entire thing, change the row to a column instead of a zero. I want to have zero, one, and two. I want to have three columns that all have the same weight, on top of that, I also want to set uniform to A, or it doesn't really matter what it is, but with this, all of the columns are going to have the same size, or more specifically the same width. Inside of this, I can now create a TTK label, and I can create a TTK button. Both are going to need fairly similar arguments. The first one is the parent, that is going to be self. Besides that, we also need text. This text we already have because we have the label text and we have the button text. For the label, I want to have the label text. For the button, I want to have the button text. After I have that, I want to use the grid method to place both of the widgets. The label is going to be in row zero and column zero as well. All of this I can copy as well because the button is also going to be in row zero, but column is going to be one. If I run the entire thing, 
we can see that we, well, cannot see anything. The reason for that is that this segment is not being placed on the window, which means we have created a component, but we are not placing it. For that, we need, well, a placement method. And this, once again, we can do inside of the component itself. All I have to do inside of the init method is self and then use one of the layout methods. I'm going to go with pack. With that, we can see the different layouts. Although right now, all of this looks a tiny bit weird. So not ideal yet. First of all, I want to set this to expand being true and fill should be both. Now if I run this, this is starting to look a little bit better. Although I need a few more widgets to make all of this look halfway decent. That we can do very easily because to create more widgets, all I have to do is duplicate this segment and we get more widgets. Although I'm going to change the text here so we can see a bit better what's going on. I will just add random words in here. It really doesn't matter what you add here. It's just for illustration anyway. Let's say exit. And now we have five different segments. This still isn't terribly visible because there's so much white space in here. The reason for that is that both of the label and the button only take up the minimum amount of space that I need to display the text. That we can change by using the sticky argument. And I want to set sticky to north, south, east, and west. Now if I run this, all of this starts to come together much better. What you can also do is inside of this pack method, set pad x to 10 pixels and pad y should also be 10 pixels. If I run this now, we have a tiny bit of white space between the widgets. And that is basically it. I don't want to repeat myself too much here, but what we have done is we have created a custom component called segment and inside of the segment we have a ton of logic. That way inside of the global scope this bit here we can simply create one component and this component creates something much more complex in the app. Just imagine if we didn't have this kind of setup we would have to create this code up here five different times and if we wanted to update any individual bit let's say this hello here we would have to go through a lot of code just to find this one part, which would be really annoying to work with. But in our setup here, all of this is very easily manageable, which is why you really have to understand this. Now, this is one way to create this kind of layout system. There is another way though. What we have done for now is we have used a class-based approach to organize our widgets. But this we don't have to do. We could also use a functional approach. Let's have a look at this one by translating our class-based approach to a functional one. Back in the app, I want to, all the way at the top, create a function. I'm going to call this one create segment. This one is going to need three different arguments. We need the parent, we need a label text, and we need a button text. For the keen eye among you, those are the same parameters we have used here. We don't need self because we're not using a class. Inside of this function, we are basically trying to recreate all of this and then return the result. Basically what that means is I want to create a frame, which is just going to be TTK and frame. At the end of the function, I want to return that frame, which essentially means that we are taking this frame here except now we are keeping it by itself. Although, first of all, we have to set a master for the frame, which is going to be the parent we are passing into the function, this parent here. Next up, we have to create the layout, this grid layout here. I suppose I could just copy the entire thing, paste it in here and fix the white space. We don't have self anymore. Instead, we want to set the frame with rows and columns. After that, I want to create some widgets. I suppose I should be a bit better here with the comments. What we have done in the class-based approach was also creating widgets. That way all of this is a bit easier to read. In my case, I want to copy all of this and paste it inside of the functional approach. Now we have a TTK label and a TTK button. Although once again, we don't have self anymore. Instead, I want to parent them to the frame, the frame we created up here. With that, we have the same thing we created inside of the segment here. Which means now that we are returning it, we can simply use it. Which means, 
all of this here, I want to comment out. And if I run this, we can't see any widget anymore. And let me minimize the class. Now you can see roughly the entire app. Instead of using a segment, I want to create create segment. And for the arguments, I have to get the parent, the label text, and the button text. These three arguments. If I run this now, we still can't see anything. Because what we have done inside of this function is create a widget, but we are not placing it. This we could have done inside of the segment very easily, because in here, we could simply run self.pack. This, unfortunately, we cannot do inside of the frame. Because we are returning the frame, we couldn't place it right away. Although what we can do, since this function here is returning a widget, we can on it run a layout method like pack, for example. And this pack could be expand true and fill both, like so. And now if I run this, we can see we have one widget. Although since we only have one, all of this looks a bit weird. But what I can do now is simply copy all of this. Let me add some white space, uncomment it. And instead of a segment, I want to use my function create segment. Since we're using the same arguments, all of this should still work. Also, don't forget, we have to add the pack method to all of them. Like so. And now if I run this, we have the same result. Although I did forget one thing, and that is the padding for X and for Y. Let me copy it from the segment class and paste it inside all of them. So we get exactly the same result. Now if I run this, we have exactly the same result. And we have done all of this by using either a function or a class. Both would be fine in this instance because we are creating something fairly simple. But once again, I want to emphasize if you want to create more complex layouts, having either something like this or something like this, let me uncomment it, is much easier to understand and to maintain than having a ton of widgets that you all create manually. For future videos, I am going to rely a lot more on custom components. So this is an important thing to understand. Which means let's do an exercise and I hope you can still keep up. All we have to do is an exercise and then we are done. What I want you guys to do is create a smaller widget inside of the segment class using a function or a method. Specifically, inside of this segment class, I want you guys to use a function to create another widget like we have done up here. Instead, now don't use a function, use a method inside of this class. What you should be doing is create a container that has an entry field and a button stacked on top of each other. The button should be set via the parameters and all of this should be inside of the third column of this segment. As a reminder, we are creating three columns and right now we are only using column zero and column one. At the end of this, all of this should look something like this. We have an entry field and we have a button. For all of my buttons, I use the text exercise, but this should be more customizable. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out yourself. All right, let's get started. I want to work inside of the segment again. Although first of all, what I should do is comment out all of these functions because I only want to work with the segment class. Inside of this one, I want to create a method. Let me call it create exercise box. For this one, we need two arguments. We need self, like for any method, and then I want to have some text. This is going to be the button text. Now, inside of this method, we have to create a frame. Like we have done up here with create segment, we always start by creating a frame. And this frame, we are returning at the end. Although this frame, while being TTK and frame has a parent of self or a master to be a bit more specific. At the end of this method, I want to return this frame. Although before we are doing that, I want to create a TTK entry. This one is going to have the parent of frame. And besides that, I want to have a TTK button. This one has frame as the parent, but also text is going to be the text that we are getting from the parameters. This text up here, we are passing in here. Once we have that, we have to place both of these widgets inside of the frame. 
And this I want to do with the pack method. Since both of the widgets are supposed to be on top of each other, I don't need a side, but I do want to set expand to true and fill to both. And that is all I need inside of this method. With that, I can minimize it. Now, inside of the widgets, I can call self.create exercise box and add the text in here. For now, let's go with exercise. If I run the entire thing now, we still can't see anything because once again, I forgot that we have only created a widget, we haven't placed it yet. For that, we need the grid layout method. So grid, I want to have a row zero and column should be two. On top of that, I want to set sticky to north, south, east and west, and that should cover it all. Meaning if I run this now, here we have a pretty good looking result. We have an entry field and we have an exercise button. I hope you can see the value of this because now inside of this class, when we are creating the widgets, we have all of this in a fairly logical layout. We are creating a label, a button, and then an exercise box. Now, this exercise box could be a separate class. That would be perfectly fine. But since it is so simple, it's only four lines of code, you don't really have to do that. It's kind of an overkill. Which means in this case, simply using a method to create something slightly more complex is perfectly fine and much easier to maintain. Although there's one more thing I do want to do, and that is that right now we always use exercise for the text for the button. But this I want to have a bit more customizable. So when I'm creating this segment, I want to have another parameter. And that is going to be the exercise text. This exercise text I'm going to pass into this function like so. And now when I'm creating all of these segments, I have to add one more argument. Let's go with test just to see if this is working. And there we go. Now we have test for all of these buttons. I could change this. The first one could be test. The next one could be something else. Then we have one to three. We could also have an empty button or we could have end. It doesn't really matter. But now we have different kinds of text in here and everything is still very easily maintainable. All of the customization happens in here and this is very easy to see and very easy to understand. And if you want to make changes, you have all of this contained inside of one class that is maintainable and very easy to work with. A really important part of any app is responsive layout. What that means is, let me run the app that we are going to create. It is going to look like this. Right now, we have an app with a couple of items stacked on top of each other. So far, nothing special. However, if I increase the size of this widget, we are at some point getting another kind of layout. And if I go even further, we have a different kind of layout. Which means, depending on the size of the window, we get different kinds of layout. Which is really important because I want the app to look good on basically any size. And some layouts simply don't work on a certain kind of size. For example, if I make this a bit smaller again, this kind of layout here only really works on very small windows. While this one here would only really work on a wide window. So I have to create different kinds of layouts. Now, that being said, implementing all of this in tkinter isn't the easiest thing to do. The reason for that is that tkinter doesn't have inbuilt tools to create responsive layouts, which basically means that we cannot update an existing layout. Instead, what we have to do is we have to create a separate layout for every window size, or at least for the layouts that we want to create. So for this example, I have created three different layouts. Let me actually show you. I think that's going to be useful. Here's the code that we are going to create over the course of this video. All the important stuff is inside of the app class. Basically, what you have to understand is that we have three methods. One for create small layout, create medium layout, and create large layout. Inside of them, we are simply creating a frame. We are adding widgets to this frame along with the layout method. And then we are packing the frame. Also, before that, we are forgetting the previous frame. That way, if we go from the small layout to the medium layout, we are not creating extra widgets. The really important part of logic happens inside of another class. This one is called size notifier. 
What this one is doing is it checks the size of our window or the width to be more specific. And if we reach a certain threshold, like 300 or 600 or 1200, then this class is going to call the functions we are passing into it or the methods in this case, which are going to be create small layout, create medium layout or create large layout. All you really have to understand is that we are creating three separate layouts and we are displaying each layout depending on the minimum size of the window. That's all that's happening here. As a matter of fact, let's talk about it really quick. What we are doing in the most basic sense, we are setting different breaking points for the minimum width of a layout. So for example, if the width of the window is 300, we want to have a small layout. If the width is 600, we want to have the medium layout. And if the width is 1200, we want to have the large layout. And whenever the window resizes, we are checking the width and if the window is crossing a new threshold. If that is the case, we are building a new layout and forgetting the previous layout. That is literally the entire logic, although to implement it, we do need a couple of things. The major difficulty that we actually have to face is in this step here. By default, we can use event binding to check when the window is resizing. The problem is this event is going to run on every resizing of the window, which is a problem for us because we only really want to check if the width crosses a certain threshold. So for example, we want to check if the width of the app crosses 300. We do not care if it goes from 350 to 400. That is completely irrelevant to us. We only care if we go from 200 99 to 300. That is the major difficulty that we have to implement. The rest is actually fairly simple. But I guess let's jump straight in and let's create all of this. To get started, all I have are the imports for tkinter and ttk. The reason for that is that all of the app is going to be handled by classes. The most important one is the app class. This one has to inherit from tk and tk. Inside of that, I want to call the dunder init method with self and I also want to have a parameter for the start size. Should be fairly obvious what this one is doing. Inside of the init method, I now want to create a super dunder init method, although this one doesn't need any arguments. Next up, I want to create a title for the app, which I called responsive layout. After that, I want to get the geometry of the app this one is going to set the starting size. The starting size we are getting from the parameters. This one is supposed to be a tuple with the width and the height. This I have to convert into a string, which I'm doing with an F string. I want to get start size and the index number zero. That is going to be the width. Then I want to do the same thing. So start size, except now I'm getting the first index. This is going to be the height. Once I have that, I want to run self.main loop to actually run the app. And this should be all we need to get started. I can now create an instance of this app. So app is app. For the starting size, I went with 400 by 300. If I run this now, we have a basic window. What I now have to figure out is how to get the size of this window when we are resizing it. For that, we need a certain kind of event. Before the main loop, I want to self.bind an event and the event we're looking for, don't forget the smaller and greater sign, what we're looking for is called configure. This kind of event triggers every time a widget resizes or changes the position. Just to illustrate what's happening, let me pass in a lambda function, don't forget the event, all I want to do is print the event. If I run this now, you can already see in the bottom, we have an event that is called configure. This event gives us the X and the Y position of the window along with the width and the height. So for example, you can see right now, we have a width and a height of 400 by 300, the exact same thing we have passed into the app. On top of that, if I am resizing the window, you can see we get a different kind of width and height. And if I change the position of the window, we get a different X and Y position. But now we do have a tiny bit of a problem or at least something to be aware of. If I'm resizing the window again, you can see for the width, we get lots of different numbers. Let me try to find a breaking point. What you can see in here, we are running a new event on every change of the window. 
and I get the width of 977, 988, 999, 1005. And in just a bit, I want to run a function to build a new layout when we are passing a certain kind of threshold. For example, our threshold could be 1000 pixels, which means if we go from 999 to 1005, we want to build a new layout, but only at this point. If we go from 977 to 988, I do not want to build a new layout, which means we have to add some code that we only build a new layout if we are crossing a certain kind of threshold. All of the logic I have put into a separate class. This class I called size notifier. There's no need for inheritance. And in here, I want to have a dunder init method. We need self as always. Then I want to have the window, which is going to be the main window, or in our case, this app here. Finally, I want to have what I called a size dictionary. For now, don't worry about it. I'll explain it in just a second. First of all, I want to get self.window as an attribute, which means self.window is going to be window. Next up, I want to turn the size dictionary into an attribute as well. Size dictionary as self is going to be size dictionary. The basic idea is that this size dictionary is going to have key value pairs, like any dictionary. The key is going to be the minimum size of the layout. And then the value is going to be the function that creates this kind of layout. Let me implement it right away, actually. We are going to create an instance of this class inside of the app. We don't have to store it in a variable, so we can just create it straight away. I want to have a size notifier. The window is going to be self. And the size dictionary is going to be a dictionary. I want to have for the key a minimum size, which I set to 300. The associated value is going to be a method. For example, if our minimum width is 300, I want to create a small layout. This one doesn't exist right now, so let me create it right away. I want to create a small layout. We need self and nothing else. For now, so I don't get an error, I'm going to add pass in here. The code we are going to write inside of size notifier really is just going to check if we are crossing this number and then we are going to call this function. Although to make this a bit more practical, I want to have two different layouts, at least for now. I want to create one at 300, the small one, and then I want to have at 600 pixels a medium layout. This one doesn't exist right now as well, meaning I have to create medium layout with self and pass. That means inside of the size notifier, if I am printing self dot size dictionary, I am getting a dictionary, I don't need the window right now, that has a key of 300, then a method, then another key of 600, and then another method. This is a good start, but I do want to do one more thing. And that is I want to order this dictionary. Right now it is already ordered. We are starting from a small number like 300 and going to a large number to 600. However, what we could have is a dictionary like this, where we are starting with the larger number. This would be a massive problem later on. So I want to order this dictionary right away. This is actually quite simple. All I need is dictionary comprehension. In here, I want to create a new dictionary with key value pairs. Next up, I need four and key and value in. Now I want the size dictionary and get the items. With this, we would essentially copy the dictionary that we already have. So if I run this, we can't see any difference. To sort all of this, I have to sort what is being returned from this items here. This I can do very easily with the sorted function. Now if I run this, we have a dictionary that is sorted. We can get to the next part. And that is going to be running this event here or binding it to the window. This I want to do inside of the size notifier. I want to cut it out and paste it in here. Although for this to work, I have to add self.window.bind because we want to check the size of the window, not the size of this size notifier, which wouldn't work because it's not a widget. And let me clean up the white space a tiny bit like so. The reason why I want to have this event binding inside of the size notifier is because I want to connect it to a method of this class. The method I called check size 
or rather self.check size. And this is going to be just another method. Important here, we need self and we need the event. Just to check if this is working, I want to print the event. This should already work. If I run this now, we can already see we have one event printed out. If I resize the window, we get lots of events. So things are still working just fine. We could already get started to create different kinds of layout. I guess for now, what I could do is I could print small layout for the small layout, and I could print medium layout for the medium layout. So we can see a bit better what's going on. These two methods I can already call quite easily. For example, when I'm checking the size, I could get self.size dictionary with a key of 300. And then don't forget to call it. If I run this now, I get small layout anytime I am changing the layout. This self.size by 300 is going to return this create small layout method. The brackets afterwards are calling this method. Importantly here, when we are passing the method into the other class, we're not calling it, we're just passing the method around, which is totally fine to do. What we now have to figure out is when to call which method. So when do we call the 300 method and when do we call the 600 method? For that, we need a couple of things. First of all, I want to get the window width. This one is really easy because all we need is event.width. Next up, I want to have a variable that tracks which sizes I have already checked. I call this check size. By default, the value here is none. Also, let me get rid of this function call here. Now, the logic that I want to implement is for minimum size in self.size dictionary. I want to toggle through all of the minimum sizes inside of this size dictionary. I can print right away what we're getting, minimum size. If I run this now, we get 300 and 600. The way I am going to use this is I want to have the delta size. This is going to be the window width minus the minimum size. And let me print right away what we're getting. We get 100 and minus 200. What these numbers mean is by default, this window has a width of 400. And we have two breaking points, one at 300. Let's say this is roughly here at 300. And we have another point at 600. Let's say this one is broadly here, 600. This delta is going to give us either this distance here or this distance here, which is going to be 100 and minus 200. This information is really useful because all I really have to know is what the smallest positive number is. Once a number goes negative, I know my window size, this point here, doesn't reach the next minimum size. But if the number is positive, I am greater than the smaller minimum size. So in this case, we have two options, 100 and negative 200. This negative 200 tells me that I haven't reached the next minimum size. But since this number here is positive, I know I have exceeded this minimum size, which is this 300 here. And since my window is 400 right now, we're on this point, we know we have reached this minimum size, but not the next one. All I really want to check is if delta is greater or equal than zero. If that is the case, I want to get my checked size and set it to the minimum size. Since delta is becoming negative once we don't reach the next minimum size, this checked size here is going to give us the proper minimum size. There's one thing we still have to do, and that is I want to check if the checked size is different from self.current minimum size. This is an attribute that doesn't exist right now, but I do want to create it. Let me copy it. And inside of the init method, I want to create a current minimum size. By default, this can be none. It doesn't really matter what it is. Also, this should be size. Inside of this if statement, I want to set self.current min size to the checked size. Checked size like so. This if statement here is really important because this one actually tracks if we have a change in our minimum size, which means in here, we can now run self.size dictionary 
and I can pass in self dot current minimum size. And this I want to run. Now if I run this, we get small layout and nothing happens if I just move it a tiny bit. Although if I move it a bit further, we get medium layout. And if I go back to small layout, this is working really well. However, there's one problem already, and that is if I go too far to the left, we get none. The reason for that is if our window is smaller than 300 pixels, we are, well, trying to get the index on this dictionary of a number that doesn't exist. As a consequence, this one here is going to throw an error. The best way around that that I found is to set a minimum size that is as large as the smallest size here. So in our case, I want to set the minimum size of the window to 300. That way, we can never have a smaller layout than the smallest layout. That is quite easily added here. I'm going to do this inside of the init method. I want to get a minimum height and I want to get a minimum width. The minimum width is actually the easier bit for the simple reason that I already have my self dot size dictionary and I only want to get the first key from it. For that, I have to turn the entire dictionary into a list. On this list, I want to get the first item. That is literally all we need. So next up, we have to work on the height. For the height, I simply want to copy what we are getting when we are creating the app. In my case, that is going to be 300. One way to get that is, first of all, I want to get the window, or to be a bit more consistent, self.window. Although in this case, window and self.window refer to the same object. It doesn't matter which one you choose. This one has a method called w info underscore width. This is a method, so don't forget to call it. Although, let me print it right away, minimum height, and well, let's see what we get. We are getting one, and that is going to be a bit weird. We know that the minimum height of the app when we are starting it is going to be 300. So why is this minimum height going to give us one? That is very strange. The reason for that is that tkinter can be a tiny bit weird. So when it creates and when it places a layout, there's a tiny bit of delay. At this point here, when we are creating the size notifier, we have created the widgets, but we haven't placed them properly yet. As a consequence, the size of the app is going to be one. To account for that, we have to call self.update. This is going to put everything in place. And afterwards, you can call the winfo.width or height, and then you get the proper numbers. So if I run this now, we are getting an error because size notifier doesn't have an update method. Instead, what we need is self window.update. Now if I run this, we are getting 400. And I just realized that is the width, not the height. I typed in width, this should be height. Like so, now if I run this, we get 300. That is much better. Uh, sorry about that. With that, I can get rid of the print statement here. And once I have these two numbers, all I have to do is get self.window and set a minimum size. The minimum size here is going to be the minimum width and the minimum height. Let's try this one now. I have the app and I can move it to be wider and taller, but this is the smallest it's going to get. All we have to do now is create different kinds of layouts. We are already calling them. So inside of these two methods, we have to create all of the layouts that we are going to use or well, the two layouts that we want to use. For this small layout, I want to have self.frame which is going to be TTK and frame. The parent here or the master is going to be self. Inside of that, I want to create four labels and to save you watching me type, I'm going to copy paste things into here. Like so. We have TTK labels four times. They all have self.frame as the parent. Then I'm setting the text to be label one. They all have a different kind of background. And afterwards, right away, I'm calling the pack method. For the pack method, all I'm really doing is I'm setting expand to true, fill to both, and then I'm giving them some padding. There's literally nothing complicated going on right now. The last thing that we have to do in here is self.frame and pack this entire frame. For that, I want to set expand to true, and I want to set fill to both. 
And now if I run this, we can't see any kind of layout. And this is a little bit weird because we are creating a layout here and we're also placing it on the window. So this should be working. Now, if I scroll down a tiny bit, we are calling this method inside of this line. The problem is if I add a print statement in here, let me call it test. I run this again, nothing happens, which means that this method here isn't being called. And that's the problem right now. The reason why it is not being called is because of this self.window update. If I comment this one out, run this again, now we can see our app. Basically, this self.window update causes this self.configure not to run. I'm not exactly sure about the reason why, but we can overcome it quite easily by moving this configure before the Windows update. Now if I run this, there we go. This configure is run before the update. As a consequence, it runs when we are starting the app. And with that, we can see our layout. With that, I can minimize size notifier. And now we can start working on the other layout. For the medium layout, I do need quite a few lines of code. I think the best way for this is to simply copy paste everything like so. And then let me explain it really quick. We are once again creating a frame. Although this frame has a grid layout, which means we need a column configure and a row configure. In this case, we have two columns and two rows. After that, we are packing the frame on the main layout so we can see it. And after that, I am creating four different labels. These labels have the same arguments that I used up here for the minimum layout. And here you can see a minor problem in tkinter. And that is, well, we have to create all of these widgets again. There's no efficient way to copy widgets from one master to another. Right now, we have a very simple layout, so this isn't too much of a problem. But if you had a more complex layout, this would be quite a bit of work. So, well, it's quite unfortunate, but we have to work with it. Other than that, we are using the grid layout method four times to place each label inside of one cell. I'm also adding some padding, but well, that isn't very much. And with that, let's try the entire thing. I have the small layout, and if I increase the size of the app, we get something very strange. Also a key error, and well, we have to cover a couple of things here. The first one, let me close this and get rid of the error message. The first problem we have is that once we create the medium layout, we are not discarding the small layout. That is quite an easy thing to fix. All I want to do for that is create self.frame as an attribute in the init method. This is going to be ttk.frame as well with self as the master. This self.frame I want to pack right away. Self.frame.pack. We can set it to expand being true and fill being both as well. Although this one doesn't matter very much because as soon as I create either the small or the medium layout, I want self.frame.pack underscore forget. This I want to do for both the small and the medium layout. Essentially what is going to happen when we are starting the app, we are creating a frame. By default, this frame is going to be empty. However, once we are creating the small layout, we are removing this frame and then creating a new frame for the same variable or well attribute. This is important because if we now create a medium layout, we can use the same attribute to forget the current layout and then create a new one. That way, if we go back to a small layout like this one here, we can once again forget the layout and create a new one. With that, we should be making some progress, although it's still not ideal. So now if I increase the size, we get something very briefly like so, but we're getting a key error none. This problem happens down here in the size notifier, more specifically, all the way down here. There's some kind of problem with self.current size. Let's print it actually. I want to print self.current minimum size. Now, if I run this, by default, we get 300. That's a good start. But if I resize the app, we get something really strange. We basically have an infinite loop. Let me close all of this. We had some kind of infinite loop where we kept on getting 300 and 600. And the issue here is 
let me find it really quick. This window.bind is being run whenever any kind of widget changes size or position. As a consequence, this is also going to be run when we are placing ttk.label. Also, this is going to be run on self.frame. The reason why this is a problem is because all of these labels here, all of these labels and this frame as well, they also get the configure event. And since they can change the size, we basically end up with the problem that these widgets here, or more specifically, the grid layout method changes the size. As a consequence of this change in size, we are calling check size, which in turn, once again, calls this function here, which once again calls the grid method. The result is we are creating an infinite loop where nothing is going to work anymore. And Tkinter gets really confused. Fortunately, this is really easy to fix. Inside of check size, I want to add one more if statement. This if statement is going to be the event.widget should be self.window. I only care about this event. And only if that is the case, I want to run all of this. Now, if I run the code again, I can resize the window. And now this is working perfectly fine. And we can change between different layouts. This is looking good. And with that, we are done. We have different kinds of layout and, well, we can move between them. Although I would really recommend you to go over this in your own time, especially this kind of logic here can get a bit tricky. But well, the exercise is going to be, I want you guys to create a third layout where all of the widgets are next to each other. For that purpose, I use grid, but you could use whatever you want. It doesn't really matter. And this layout should appear once the window is wider than 1,200 pixels. Pause the video now and try to implement this yourself. Alrighty. First of all, we are going to need another layout method. I'm going to call this one create large layout and we need self as always. And here, once again, this is going to be quite a bit of typing. So I'm going to just copy it from my notes. It's going to look like this, and it's fairly similar compared to create the medium layout. We are forgetting the previous frame, then we are creating a new frame with a column and a row, although now we have four different columns and just one row. This frame we're packing right away, and after that we're creating four labels that all, once again, have the same arguments. After that, we're using the grid layout method to place all of these labels. Although now we're using column 0, 1, 2, and 3, and row is always going to be 0. Now we have to figure out when to call this. And for that, I want to minimize all of these methods so things are a bit easier to see. When we are calling size notifier, we are passing in a dictionary. It's probably better to put this dictionary over multiple lines, like so. That way it's quite a bit easier to read. To this, I want to add another entry. 1,200, that's the minimum width, and I want to create large layout. And with that, we are done. I can now run this. I have a small layout, I have a medium layout, and I get a large layout. That's basically all we need. I guess what you could do if you have your own app, you could simply use the size notifier and use it for your own purposes. This one is quite reusable and it works really well. A really important part that I haven't covered yet is scrolling, which is going to look like this. We have a canvas and on this one, we have custom scroll bars that go up and down or left and right. Right now, this really doesn't look too impressive, but what we eventually can do with this is something like this, where we can create a frame that is scrollable. Although for now, we're going to keep it simple and let's start with some theory. In Tkinter, there are three widgets that can be scrolled. We have canvas, text, and tree view. The canvas is the most useful one since this one can display other widgets. We will cover that in the next part. But for now, let's get started with the basics. I am importing Tkinter, I am setting up a window, and I'm running main loop. The result is going to look like this. On this, I want to start by creating a canvas. This I want to store in a variable that I call canvas, and canvas we create with tk.canvas. 
In here, we need the parent or the master, which is going to be window. And just so we can see it, I want to set a background with a white color. This canvas, I want to pack right away. So canvas.pack, I'm going to set expand to true and fill to both. Now, if I run this, we can see the entire background is white. I guess for now, I can change the background to red. That is a bit easier to see. We can definitely tell the canvas covers the entire window. But that's not actually what we want. Instead, what I want is that the canvas is larger than the window. For that, we need one more argument, and that is called scroll region. This creates a larger canvas that we can use for scrolling. For this, we need four arguments. We need the left, the top, the right, and the bottom. The left and the top are basically always zero and zero. That makes it very easy to navigate. For the right, I want to set 2000. And for the bottom, I want to have 5000. For comparison here, the window itself is 600 by 400 pixels. So the canvas now is going to be quite a bit larger. Although if I run the entire thing, we can't see any kind of difference. First of all, we only have a red color for the canvas right now, which isn't particularly helpful. To actually see some scrolling, we need content for the canvas. In my case, I want to, the most important one, create a line. This line is supposed to go from the top left all the way to the bottom right, which means when we are creating it, I want this to start at zero and zero for the left and the top. The right is going to be 2000 and the bottom is going to be 5000. With that, we have the exact same numbers that we have used here. Although for a line, the first two are the starting position and the last two are the end position. Other than that, I want to fill this one with a color. Let's go with green. And then I also want to set the width so it's a bit easier to see. Let's go with 10. Now if I run this one, we have a line. Although we can only see one part of the line, but that we can work on. Besides the line, I also want to create a couple of rectangles. For that, I'm going to use a for loop. Let's say for i in range, and I want to create 100 rectangles. To create a rectangle, I need canvas and create underscore rectangle. This one is going to work kind of like the line. For each rectangle, we have to specify a left, a top, a right side, and a bottom side. Besides that, I also want to have a fill, which is supposed to be a color, which means we have to create five different variables. We need a left side, we need a top side, we need a right side, we need a bottom, and we need a color. All of these numbers are actually fairly simple, but since I do want to have random numbers, I need to import two things. I want from random import rand int and choice. Rand int is going to give me the positions, so left, top, right, and bottom. Basically, all I want to do is rand int from 0 to 2000 or from 0 all the way to the right. For the top, I want to have rand int with 0 and 5000, so all the way from the top to the bottom. For the right side, I want to have the left side plus a random amount. Let's say rand int with 10 and I think 500 is what I went with. Finally, for the bottom, I want to have the top plus rand int 10 and 500. For the color, I want to use choice. And choice needs a tuple with a couple of color arguments. And here I want red, I want to have green, I want to have blue, I also want to use yellow, and let's go with orange. With that, I can run the entire thing. And now we can see at least parts of some rectangles. And with that, I can also change the background of this canvas to white, and we can still see things. Or at least we can see the line for now. We didn't get lucky to see any kind of rectangle, but they are definitely there. If I run this again, now we can see them. With that, we can cover the actually important part, and that is a scroll bar. A scroll bar in tkinter is just another widget. We create this with ttk and scroll bar. This one needs a parent. Let's go with window, and I also want to store all of this inside of a variable. Let's call it scroll bar. For the scroll bar, we need one argument right away that you basically always want to pass in, and that is orient. For this one, you have horizontal or you have vertical. Horizontal is the default one, but I want this to be vertical. 
with that covered, I want to place this thing right away. And place was deliberate because I want to use the place method. This is basically what you always want to use for scroll bar, because this allows you to set relative x to 1 and relative y to 0 with a relative height of 1 and an anchor of northeast. That way, this scroll bar is always on the right side of the window. So I can run this now. And on the right side, we have a scroll bar. Although right now, it doesn't do anything. Now, this scroll bar works kind of like a slider. What that means in practice is we can give it one more argument that is called command. This command wants to have a function. You could pass a normal function in here, but most of the time you want to do one specific thing. You want to get a scrollable widget like the canvas and then get the y view method. This y view method is basically designed to work with a scroll bar. If I run this now, you can't really see any difference on the scroll bar. But if I move the scroll bar, we now have some scrolling, which is a good start. To actually see the progress inside of the scroll bar, we want to have the canvas and we want to run configure. The argument we need now is called y scroll command. This I want to set to scroll bar dot set. Now if I run this, we can see the scroll bar is working and we can use it to move around in the canvas. This is working really well. And basically what you have to understand, let me draw this actually. We have a canvas, that is what we created here. And then we have a scroll bar. That is what we created here. Those two are going to influence each other. The scroll bar is going to give us one size of the canvas. And this we are doing with this command and canvas.yview. This picks one part of the scroll region. However, we also have to go the other way, that the canvas influences the scroll bar. And this happens down here, with the scroll command is equal to scrollbar.set. This tells the scroll bar how tall the widget is and which section we currently have. You need both of these parts to make all of this work efficiently. But once you have it, you are basically done. So let me run this again. And we basically have all we need for the basic scroll logic. There's one more thing that we can do. And that is, let me put it above the scroll bar, mouse wheel scrolling. For that, I want to get my canvas again, and I want to bind an event. The event I want to look for is called mouse wheel. Be careful here, the W has to be uppercase. Once we're doing that, I want to call a function. And this could just be a lambda function. Don't forget the event here. And for now, let me just print the event itself. Now, if I'm over the canvas with a mouse and use the scroll wheel, we get an event that we can work with. On this event, what I care about is this delta. If I move my mouse wheel away from me, this is a positive number. If I move it towards me, this is a negative number. I think it is always 120, but your results may vary. Depends on your mouse and your operating system, I think. But the number itself here isn't really that important. The way you are going to use it is by targeting the canvas and then calling the y view underscore scroll method. This one tells the canvas to scroll in a certain direction. And for this, we need two arguments. We need the amount and we need the units. The units is kind of weird. You basically need a string that is called units and you never use anything else. So just always pass units in there. The amount is the much more important bit. For example, in here, I could simply add 20. Although this might be a bit large. If I now run this and I use my mouse as a scroll wheel, we are scrolling quite a bit, although this only works one way. In my case, what I want to do, I want to get the event, I want to get the delta, and I want to divide this by 60. Remember here, event delta was either positive or negative 120. If I divide this by 60, I am getting 2. Which seems like a reasonable number, but just play around with this. Whatever feels good is fine here. However, now we need one more thing. If I run this again, and I use scrolling, we are getting an error. And that is not actually the error I was expecting, because I had a typo. Now let me try this again. If I now use the scroll wheel, we get expected an integer, but got a floating point number. Basically, what you have to understand here is that tkinter for the scroll always wants to have an integer. 
So now if I run this again, I can use scrolling, and now this works perfectly fine with my mouse wheel. If you want to change the direction of the scrolling, you would just add a negative here. Depending on what operating system you are used to, you probably know different scrolling behaviors. For some people, if you scroll away from you on the mouse wheel, you want to go up, other people want to go down. I prefer that if I scroll towards myself, I am scrolling down, and if I scroll away from me, I'm going up. But this is a choice you have to make. But with that, we have all of the basics of using a scroll wheel to move along a widget. It really isn't that difficult. So with that, I want to add an exercise. I want you guys to create a horizontal scroll bar. And this one should be at the bottom. And with that, you are scrolling left and right on the canvas. On top of that, I want you guys to add one more event that the user can scroll left and right by holding down Control and the mouse wheel. Control or Command if you're on a Mac. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out yourself. First of all, I have to create a new scroll bar. Let me call it the scroll bar bottom. This is going to be TTK and scroll bar. The parent is going to be the window and orient for this one is going to be horizontal. Although since this is the default argument, you could just ignore it entirely. Let me place this one right away. I want to get this scroll bar and use the place method. For this one, I want to have relative x being zero and relative y being one. On top of that, I want to have the relative width being one and the anchor should be the southwest. Let's run the entire thing. And something definitely went wrong. Ah, I see, this shouldn't be scroll bar, this should be scroll bar bottom. Now if I run this, this is looking much better. All the way to the bottom now, we have another scroll bar. There is a tiny overlap between the two scroll bars down here. And for an actual app, you would want to take care of this, but in my case, I'm not worrying too much about it. With that, let's work on the functionality. We need a command argument, and this command argument we have seen here before. We still want the canvas, except now we don't want Y view. Instead, we want to have X view. I can already run the entire thing. Click on the scroll bar. You can't really see it, at least on the scroll bar, but in the canvas you can see, we can go left and right. To make it visible in the scroll bar, I want to have the canvas and I want to run configure. Now, instead of Y scroll command, I want to have X scroll command. And for this, I want to have my scroll bar dot bottom and use the set method. With that, I should basically be done. Now I can use the scroll bar on the horizontal axis. The vertical one still works perfectly fine and this is looking really good. Finally, I want to cover the second part of the exercise. Let me move it below because in here, I want to have canvas dot bind. And I think the only difficult part was to figure out how to combine the control or command with the mouse wheel. On Windows, this would be control and mouse wheel. I believe on macOS, it's actually the same keyword, but let me know if that's wrong and then I'll help you. Next up, we have to call a Lambda function or well, some kind of function, but Lambda is best here. I guess I can just copy the entire thing. I want to have a Lambda function. For this one, we need an event and then we have to call canvas and not Y view, but X view and scroll. The other arguments though can stay identical. With that, we should be done. Let's run this. And now I can use my mouse wheel to go up and down. And if I hold control, I'm going left and right. This is working quite well. And this is going to cover all of the basics of scroll bars, at least for the canvas. With that, I want to comment out all of this stuff because there are two more widgets that I do want to cover. The first one is the text widget. This we create, let me store it in a variable, tk.text. The master is going to be a window and I want to pack this right away. Text.pack with expand being true and fill is going to be both. If I run this now, we have a text box. I can type in this, but other than that, we have no scroll bar. To make a scroll bar work, I want to add some content to this text box. 
This I can do with a for loop for i in range. Let's go from 1 to 200. These numbers I want to use with text dot insert. And now I need two arguments. I need a position or rather a start index. And then I need some text that I actually want to write. The text is the easier bit. I just want to have an f string that says text with the current index, so i. The index itself is going to be the starting position. I already talked about it, but basically in here, tkinter expects something like 1.0, with 1 being the starting line and 0 being the character on that line. Since we do have the numbers from 1 to 200, we can simply turn this into an f string and put this as i. Now if I run this, we get a whole bunch of numbers. That's a good start, although I do want to have some line breaks. Those we create with a slash and the letter n. Now if I run this, this is looking much cleaner. We can already scroll around here by simply using the mouse wheel. So this is the default behavior, although we don't have a scroll bar. But this we can add quite easily. Afterwards, I want to have another scroll bar. Let me call it scroll text. And this is going to work basically identical compared to the canvas. In fact, I could simply copy all of the code here and paste it here. If I comment it out, I want to rename scroll bar in all of the places to scroll bar text. And let's go through it step by step. First of all, for the scroll bar, we are creating it. We are setting it to the window, we have an orientation, and then we have the command. Right now, the command is for the canvas. Instead, this one should be for the text. Other than that, the text widget also has a Y view method, so we can leave this one as it is. Next up, we have to tell the scroll bar that it is being set by the text widget. For that, I want to get rid of the canvas and replace it with text. For this one, I want to have configure, then the Y scroll command. And now I want to set scroll bar text dot set. That's all we need here. Finally, I have to place the scroll bar itself. And I want to have this one all the way on the right, which is what I already have here. So if I run the code now, we have a scroll bar. If you understood this for the canvas, this one should be fairly straightforward, which means I can comment out all of this and then cover the final one, tree view. For this one, I have quite a few lines already. Let me just paste them in and uncomment them. I am creating a table, and this table has two headings. We have one for the first name and one for the last name. Then I have a bunch of random first names and a bunch of random last names. Then I'm creating a for loop that creates 100 items that I'm inserting into the table. Finally, I am placing or packing the entire table. So if I run this, we have a table. I already covered tree view in quite a bit of detail, so check that bit if you're confused about all of this. It shouldn't be too difficult. Once I have that, I can simply, once again, copy the scroll bar from up here, paste it in here, and remove the comment. And let's go for the step by step, I guess. First of all, we have to create a scroll bar widget. And this one I'm going to call scroll bar table. This we create with ttk.scrollbar, the parent is the window, and the orientation should be vertical. Next up, for the command, I don't want to have text.yview, I want to have table.yview. That's the name of the widget we just created, or at least the variable we are storing it in. Next up, we have to configure the scrollbar itself. For that, I want to have the table, and this one has to configure y scroll command with scrollbar table and set. This is going to set the position of the scroll bar itself. Oh well, the position and the size. Finally, I want to get scroll bar dot table and place it on the window. For this, I already have all of the arguments here. So if I run this now, we have a scroll bar for this table as well. And that is it. The really important part here is that you understand how to use scroll bars with the canvas because this is the one you are actually going to use quite a bit. But it's generally a good idea to understand all of them. Although I think if you understand one of them, you understand them all. Another really important part for layouts are scrollable widgets. And this is what we're going to work on. We have a widget 
and we can scroll through it. This is also quite flexible. So if I extend it, like so, at some point we can't scroll anymore because the window itself is larger than the list. Like with the responsive layouts, Decanter doesn't have an inbuilt tool for scrolling, which is kind of a pain. But what we can do is have a scroll wheel on a canvas. On top of that, we can also add widgets to a canvas. If we combine those two, we can create scrollable widgets. But this isn't the most straightforward process and, well, you have to be very specific in terms of what you are going to do. For example, in the widget that we are going to create, this one here, you always use the pack method. Now you can use any kind of layout, but you always have to create some custom solution. That is going to make much more sense when you actually implement everything. Once again, I have a basic setup for the code. And just as a reminder, I want to create a canvas and this canvas is going to hold a widget. For that, I want to create a canvas with tk.canvas. The parent is going to be the window. And let's say for the background color, I want to go with white. This canvas, I want to pack right away. I want to set expand to true and fill to both. Running this gets me a white background. On this, I now want to place a widget. This I can do with canvas and create window. This one at the minimum needs two arguments. We need a position and we need a window. A window is basically the name for the widget we want to place. I want to place the widget at a position 20 and 50, completely random numbers. For the window, tkinter does expect a widget, like ttk.label. For this one, again, we need a parent or a master. I usually set this to the canvas, but it actually doesn't matter. Now we need a text, and the text is going to be, let's say, a label. If I run this now, we have a label. The master here doesn't really matter. I can set this to window, and we would still get the same result. Now, this isn't a picture. It's an actual widget. I can, for example, place a button, and this button is here, and I can even press it. It works like any other widget which is super useful because that way I can add some scrolling mechanic and then I have a scrollable container. Although all of this does get a bit more complex, so I'm going to do all of this inside of a class. Let me get rid of the canvas and instead create a new class. I call this one a list frame. It is going to inherit from ttk.frame and we need a dunder init method. This one needs self, it needs a parent, then I want to have text data. Finally, I want to have an item height. Basically how this one is going to work. I'm going to create a new variable to store it in. List frame seems fine. This is going to be list frame. This one needs three arguments. The parent is going to be the window or could be anything, it's really up to you. Then we need some text data. For that, I have a list of some random entries. This one is literally just a list with a couple of tuples inside and those are random strings. This is going to be our text data. And finally, I need the item height. This is going to determine if I run the entire thing again, the item height is going to be the height of one of those entries. They are always going to span the entire width of the container. So this we don't have to set ourselves. You can also see here, we have for the first entry label and button. And this is this label and this button. For the height, I went with 100, but you can always choose whatever looks best. Inside of the init method, the first thing we always need is a super dunder init method. For this one, we need a master, which is going to be the parent. Right after that, I also want to pack this list frame, which I do with the pack method. This is going to be expand set as true and fill is going to be both. Since we are just working with a frame, any layout method is going to be fine here. I'm just working with the simplest one to not overcomplicate things. Once we have that, I want to get my widget data. This is going to tell me some basic things that I need to make all of this work. For that, first of all, I want to turn the text data into an attribute. So self.textData is going to be text, not text list, but text data. Next up, I want to know how many items I have. This I called self.itemNumber. This item number we are getting from the text list, this one down here. 
I simply want to know the length of this list. I have one, two, and so on items, which means all I have to do is use the length function and then pass the text data in here. Finally, I want to have one more attribute, and that is going to be the list height. This is going to be the height of the entire list. This I get with self dot item number and multiply it with the item height. Next up, I can create the actual canvas that I want to use for scrolling. This is going to be self.canvas and then here pk.canvas. The parent is going to be self. And just so we can see something, I want to set the background to red. This self.canvas I want to pack right away. And I'm going to use the expand method. This should be true. And fill should be both. Let me run this straight away. And now we can see we have a canvas that covers the entire window. That's a pretty good start. On this canvas, we are now going to place another frame. I call this one the widget frame, although a better name would be the display frame. Essentially, what is going to happen? We are going to place all of our widgets inside of this frame. And then this frame, we're going to draw on this canvas. I think that's going to be quite difficult to understand. So let me explain while I'm implementing it. I want to have self.frame and this is going to be ttk.frame. The parent is going to be self. And now I want to use self.canvas.create underscore window. Once again, we need a position and we need a window. The window is quite simple. I want to use self.frame. The position actually is also very simple because I want to have zero and zero as a starting point. So the top left of the canvas. That being said, if I'm running all of this, we can't see a difference. However, what I can do now is give this self.frame a child. Let's work with TTK and label. The parent here is going to be self.frame and the text is going to be a label. I want to pack this right away without any arguments. Now if I run this, we can see label all the way in the top left. Not terribly visible right now, but you get the idea. At least it's working. One change we can already make is that we are placing the center of the widget right now. To make that a bit better, I want to place the anchor. And the anchor is going to be northwest. Now if I run this, we can see a label in the top left. That's much better. Although now things are getting a bit weird. We have this self.frame, but we are never using a layout method to place this frame. Instead, we are drawing it with the create window method. And that is creating some bits that are deviating from what you used to know about tkinter. The most important one is that this create canvas is now giving the space for the frame, which means I could set the width here to whatever number I want, it wouldn't matter. So the width of 200 is not going to make a difference. I could also set for the label fill to both we still couldn't see anything. The reason for that is, let me remove them actually, because they would be confusing. When we run create window, create window tries to find dimensions that are just large enough to display the widgets inside, which right now is just large enough to display this label. Although you could customize this. You can set a width, let me go with 200, and you can set a height. Let's go with 400 in here. So if I run this now, we can see a difference. If I expand the window a bit, the frame with this label is 200 pixels wide and it is 400 pixels tall. And this we can already use because I know, for example, the height is going to be the list height itself. Although I want to place all of this over multiple lines so it's a bit easier to see, like so. That is much better. Basically, what you have to understand now is when we are creating this frame, I want the frame to cover the entire canvas. But since we can't use pack, grid, or place, we have to do a bit of math here ourselves. Although the math is going to look as complex as this one, it's really not hard. The first part we already have because the height of the list is going to be self.list height. If I run this now, we can see we have a longer widget here that goes up to this point. For the width, I want to cover the entire width of the window. So right now, this would be 500. Let me change this to 500. And there we go. The label covers the entire window. 
Although if we resize the window, this breaks, but that we can work on. For now, I'm going to leave this at 500, but later on, we're going to make this flexible. What is much more important for now, we have to make this canvas scrollable as well. Right now, the canvas is as large as the container, so this TTK frame up here. But if you want to make this scrollable, it has to be larger. As a consequence, we have to give this a scroll region. This one wants four arguments. It wants the left, the top, the right, and the bottom. The left and the top are going to be zero and zero. Those are really easy. For the right side, I want to have the width of the list, which right now is going to be 500. And the bottom is going to be the height, self and list height. I should probably explain this in a bit of detail. We have a list frame, which is just going to be a frame. This is the parent of all of this. Inside of that, we have a canvas. And this canvas is going to, by default, cover the entire frame, like so. That being said, I want this canvas to be larger, which I'm doing with this line here. The width right now is hard-coded, so the width is always going to be 500. But the height, this part here, can, at least in theory, be larger than the window itself. It might be something like this. This entire canvas, I want to fill with a widget, which is this create window. This should fill the entire canvas, and then we are scrolling on it. Instead of creating a label, I want this to be a bit more flexible. I want to cycle over this text data here, which is going to be a for loop for item in text data. Let's make this self.textData. On top of that, if I run the entire app again, what we have is we have the index, then we have one bit of text, and then we have a button. The number here, we are getting from the for loop. For that, I have used the enumerate method, enumerate. With that, we are returning an index and the item. Let me actually print what we get. I want to print the index and I want to print the item. And I realized I made a fairly significant typo. This should be scroll region. Talking and typing is really not easy. There we go. We are getting the index and the content of the text data. This is the information we have gotten down here. This I now want to turn into a proper widget and then place it on this frame. Since that is going to become a tiny bit more complex, I want to store all of this inside of a method. I'm going to call it self.createItem. I want to paste in the index and the item. This I now want to create. I want to define create item. We need self, we need an index, and we need the item. I first of all want to create a new frame. This is simply TTK and frame. The parent here is going to be self.frame. Next up, I'm going to create a grid layout. This is simply going to be frame and row configure. We have only one row, so this is zero, and weight is going to be one. Then I can copy the entire thing and change this to column configure. I want there to be five columns. So zero, one, two, three, and four, all with the same weight. On top of that, I want to have the uniform argument and set this to A. Once I have that, I can actually create the widgets. This one is quite straightforward. I want to have ttk.label. The master is going to be the frame. Text is going to be the index. I want to have a label for the index. This is what we are creating right now. Then I want to have another label for, well, label. And then I want to have a button. And this button covers a whole bunch of columns. To display the text here, I simply am going to use an F string and pass the index in here. On top of that, I want to use the hashtag symbol. Next up, I want to place this widget using the grid layout method. The row is going to be zero and the column is also going to be zero. This I now want to duplicate. The text is not going to be the index. Instead, I want to have the item and the item has two parts because it is a tuple. We have label and button in this case. I only care about the one with the index zero. 
which would be label or thing, the first item. This I want to be in row 0 and column 1. Finally, I want to create one more widget, and that is going to be TTK and button. The text here is going to be item and 1, and the column will be column 2. On top of that, I want to have column span. This button is going to span three columns. Finally, the button is going to be sticky to north, south, east, and west. With that, we have a frame, and this frame I want to return. This is going to give me a widget. I can minimize this. If I run this now, we can't see anything. The reason for that is that this method returns a widget, but we're not placing it on this frame. But that is very easily done by using the pack method. This should be expand being true, fill being both. Then I want to have a bit of padding for y, this is going to be 4, and for pad x, this is going to be 10. Now if I run this, we are getting an error because I forgot an equal sign. There we go. Now we can see actual widgets. Although I cannot scroll right now, neither with the mouse wheel, and I don't have a scroll bar, and if I resize this thing, you can see that we don't actually have scrolling. We just displayed a whole bunch of items. But it's at the very least a starting point. What I want to start with now is some actual scrolling. And for that, I'm going to use the mouse wheel. All I have to do for that is create another section here for the events. This is still inside of the init method. Let me minimize the create window part. To get mouse wheel scrolling, I want to get self.canvas and then bind the mouse wheel. Although there's going to be one issue that we have to be aware of. Let me just run a lambda method with the event and print the event. If I run the app now and I have my mouse over the widgets and use the scroll wheel, nothing is going to happen. However, if I extend the app and use the scroll wheel over the red bits, we can see scroll wheel. The problem that we have right now is that this canvas.bind is only working for the canvas. But once we're adding widget to the canvas with create window, tkinter sees this as the mouse being active on this widget, not on the canvas itself, which is why the event doesn't work. This, however, you can fix quite easily with bind all. This adds the event to all of the children of the widget as well. So now if I run this with my mouse on all of these widgets, I can use the scroll wheel wherever I am, which means now I can create the actual Lambda function. What we need in here is self.canvas.yView underscore scroll. This one needs an amount and a unit. Once again, for the unit, tkinter just wants to have a string that says units. For the amount, you basically want to choose what works best with your computer. What I have used is negative integer and then event.delta divided by 60. Now if I run this, I can use the scroll wheel and go up and down. This is working really well. Although, once again, if I make this thing larger, well, I guess it still works, but if I make it full screen, we get some very strange behavior. Although, we are making progress. For the next part, I want to make sure that the list covers the entire width of the canvas. Right now, all of this is hard-coded. When I'm creating the window, it is 500, and when I'm creating the scroll region, this is also 500. But we do know how to get the width of a widget. We need, in this case, self and w info underscore either width or height. In this case, width. Also, don't forget to call it. If I now run this again, we can see the same result, because by default, the window is 500 pixels. But this would still work even if we have different numbers. This I also want to paste in for the width or the list, or rather create window. If I run this again now, although now if I run this, well, we can't see anything. The reason for that is that this w.width is 1 by default. Let me actually print it. If I print this, you can see what I'm talking about. I want to print self.winfo with, don't forget to call it once again, and if I run this, we are getting 1. As a consequence, the widget we are creating is 
all the way on the left here and it is one pixel wide. So not very helpful. To account for that, I want to bind the configure part again. So self.bind and in here, I want to have configure. This is going to run every time we are updating the size or the position of this container, this list frame here. It is also going to run when we are creating the widget for the first time, meaning we can use this to update the size of all of this and make this work again. Since we are going to use a couple of lines of code here, I want to create a separate method. I call this one self.update underscore size. Let's create this right away. I want to have update size. Remember here, we need self and event. For the parameters, we need self and event. In here, I want to get self.canvas again and run create window one more time with essentially the same arguments, all of these here, I want to pass into this one. And now if we run this, this is going to work again. Because essentially what is happening now, when we are creating this bit here, it changes the width to one, so we can't see it. But this configure is going to call this update method once when we are creating the layout, which is going to draw on top of this create window and that way we can only see the updated canvas. And this one has the proper size. I'm not actually quite sure why winfo.width works in here, but not in here. Tkinter can be a bit weird with that. If you play around with this, you will eventually understand this, but it's more of an art than a science, to be honest. What we can do is simply get rid of this thing here. This is still going to work. Now we also have scrolling. And more importantly, if I resize the window, we are covering the entire width because every time that we are resizing the window, we are calling this method here with configure and configure is going to update the width of this create window. The width is always going to be the full height of the container. That way, the frame we are going to place, this one here, is going to cover the entire width of the canvas. Also, I want to get rid of the comments here because we have a ton of logic. I want to keep this a bit more organized. Although we are almost done, we have the basic widgets and they work very well. The one problem we have right now is if I make the container really large, I can keep on scrolling and now this starts to look weird. The basic problem we have, if I make this smaller again, if the actual container is larger than the list, this kind of logic starts to break. So we have to account for that. That isn't terribly difficult. And all of the logic happens inside of update size. Let me minimize the init method. So all of this is a bit easier to see. The issue here is the height. We have a list frame and this would be something like this. It's just a frame, nothing else. Inside of there, we have a canvas and inside of the canvas, we have a frame. This frame could either be, let's say this tall, or it could be this tall. If the list is longer than the container, this one is perfectly fine. We have a normal scroll logic and everything just works. The problem is when we have a list that is shorter than the container. So the height here is what's causing the problem. What we have to do to fix that is if this list is smaller or well shorter than the entire container, I want to stretch the list to cover the entire height. Also, I want to disable scrolling because it shouldn't be possible if the list doesn't even cover the entire container. All we have to do for that is set a custom height. Right now, we always set the height from the init method, this height here. However, if the list doesn't cover the entire height of the container, I want to have the height of the container as the height of this window. Which means if self.list height is greater or equal then self.winfo not width but height. If that is the case, I want height to be self.list height. This is basically what we already have, but this height I want to have in here. Although for now, this isn't going to make a difference. So the same problem is going to come up again. And here we're getting an error because if this condition is false, we are not accounting for it. But that we're going to work on right away. If the container, so winfo.height, is taller than the list, 
If that is the case, I want the list to stretch out over the entire height of the container, which in practice means the height should be self.winfo and height. With that, I can run the entire thing again. And now if I maximize it, the list now covers the entire container. Although if I scroll up, we still get some weird scrolling behavior. All we have to do for this one, I want to get self.canvas and then unbind all the events for this one is going to be the mouse wheel. This is going to be the opposite of bind all, quite obvious, I think. So for the canvas earlier, we used canvas and bind all for the mouse wheel. If the container is taller than the list, I want to unbind this. So now if I run this, this is looking still pretty good. I can maximize this. And now if I scroll, well, I can't scroll anymore. That way we are simply covering the entire frame with a list and this looks quite responsive. The problem now is if I make this small again, I still cannot scroll because I removed the binding. But that we can fix quite easily. All I have to do is copy this entire line. And if the list is taller than the window height, I want to bind this event again, like so. If you're doing this multiple times, tkinter simply ignores the binding calls. So we can do this multiple times without a problem. With that, we are pretty much done. Now I can scroll, I can maximize the window, and I can't scroll anymore. If I minimize this again, I can scroll again. This is working really well. With that, let me minimize everything so things are a bit easier to see. We are pretty much done, although I do want to do an exercise. This is really important. What I want you guys to do is to add a scroll bar to all of this. First of all, we have to create the widget for the scroll bar itself. This is going to happen inside of init. In here, let's say before events, I want to create a scroll bar. This should be an attribute, so self. Let's call it scroll bar. This we create with TTK and scroll bar. The parent is going to be self. Orient should be vertical. Next up, I want to place the scroll bar. This I do with self. Scroll bar. Place. The positions here are going to be rel x one, rel y zero, meaning we are on the top right, and I want rel height to be one. With that, we are covering the entire vertical space. Finally, we have to set the anchor to northeast. With that, we should be having a scroll bar. Let's run the code. And there we go. On the right side, we have a scroll bar, although it doesn't do anything. And on top of that, it's overlapping with the buttons. So this isn't ideal. For this project, I'm not going to worry too much about it. But in an actual project, you want to have a better system here. For example, the entire container could be its own frame, and then you place a scroll bar to the right of it using the pack method. That way, it wouldn't be overlapping. With that, we have a scroll bar. Now we have to connect it to the widget itself, or more specifically, to the canvas, this canvas here. This requires us to add two more basic bits. First of all, when we are creating the scroll bar, it needs to have a command whenever we are clicking on it. And this command is going to execute self.canvas.yView. That way, the scroll bar is going to influence the canvas. Let's try. Now I can click on the scroll bar and move the canvas. This is working really well. Although we can't see it in the scroll bar itself. For that, we're going to need another line of code. What we have to do is to set self.canvas dot configure. In here, we need the command y scroll command. This is going to influence the scroll bar depending on where we are on the canvas. For that, we need self dot scroll bar dot set. And with that, I can run the entire thing. And now you can see the scroll bar only covers the appropriate amount. And this is working pretty well. Although you are going to notice here, the canvas has one slightly annoying thing. If I move the scroll bar really fast, you are going to see this. You can see we get some graphical glitches. And that is because sometimes the canvas doesn't keep up with the drawing, which unfortunately is not something we can really deal with. It's just a problem of tkinter. 
Although if you just use the mouse wheel, this isn't happening. With that, we have a scroll bar, but there's one more thing that I do want to do. That is, if we maximize the window and we can't scroll anymore, the scroll bar should disappear because it's not needed. For that, we don't need init anymore. Instead, I want to work inside of update size. In here, the if statement is what really matters. This if statement triggers if we can scroll, and this if statement triggers if we cannot scroll. If we cannot scroll, I want to hide the scroll bar, which we do with self.scrollbar.place underscore forget. With that, if I run the entire thing again, and I expand the window, at some point the scroll bar will disappear. This is looking good. Although, if I make the window smaller again, the scroll bar doesn't reappear, which is what we have to work on next. And this happens inside of this if statement here. All we have to do is place the scroll bar again. This is what we have done inside of the init method, this line here. I can just copy it, paste it in here, and now we should be good to go. Let me run the entire thing. There we can see the scroll bar again. This is working pretty good. Now, if I make the window larger, Let's full screen it actually. Now the scroll bar disappears and we can't scroll at all. However, if I make the window smaller again, the scroll bar reappears. I can make the window even smaller and this is still working really good. I suppose there's one thing I should mention. If you place or use any layout method on a widget multiple times, tkinter is going to override the previous layout method. Meaning if we call place twice, the last call is going to overwrite the previous one. Let's talk about using multiple windows in tkinter. What we're going to make for this bit is going to look something like this. Inside of this app, we have three buttons. If I click on the top one, open main window, we are opening another window. This is a completely separate tkinter window and inside of this one, we can create any kind of layout. Although in my case, I stuck with a simple one, but this could be much more complex. This window, you can also close inside of the window itself, like so. Or if I open it again, I can also close it inside of the main window, like so. Besides that, you can also create a more focused window. For example, sometimes you only want to ask a user a yes or no question. For that, tkinter has a more dedicated option that looks something like this. In here, you can click either yes or no. Let's click on no, and then it disappears. The input you can also capture and then use for whatever purpose. And tkinter has a couple of options for that. We're gonna explore all of them, but let's talk about it in a bit more detail first, and then we can jump into the code. Inside of tkinter, you have two options for extra windows. The first one is called a message box, and these are more specialized windows. For example, if you want to create an alert or a yes or no dialogue, you would use a message box. Besides that, you have top level, and this is going to create a whole new window. Inside of that window, you can create any kind of layout and use any widget you want. I already have a couple of lines of code ready. If I execute all of this, we have a window and we have a couple of buttons, although none of the buttons do anything right now. We are importing tkinter up here. We are creating a window here. We are creating three buttons here, and then we are running the main loop. All of this at this point should be fairly straightforward. But now I want to actually make these buttons do something. And I'm going to start with button number three. This is going to create a yes, no window. I want to trigger all of that inside of a function. So let me add a command method. I call this one ask yes, no. This function we have to create and I will do that all the way at the top. Define ask yes, no. There's no need for parameters. And in here, just to test if this is working, let's print test. If I run the entire thing now and I click on create yes, no window, we can see test. That's a pretty good start. What I now have to figure out is how to create an actual message box in here. And for that, we have to import something else from tkinter. What we need all the way at the top is from tkinter import what is called a message box all in lowercase letters. Inside of this message box, we have a couple of objects that we could use for a, well, message box. The option you have just seen is called message box dot ask question. Inside of this one, you have to add two strings. The first one is for the message box title. Let's call it title for now. 
Besides that, for the second argument, we need a string for the body. Let me call this one body. Like so. And now if I run this and I click on create yes new window, we can see we have another window with title, body, and then I can click yes or no. Let me click on yes and it disappears. And that is basically it. Although I suppose there's one more thing you have to understand. And that is that all of this here returns the answer, which means I can store what is being returned in a separate variable and then print answer. And now if I run this again, I click on create yes, no window. And if I click on yes, we can see yes in the bottom. And if I click on no, we can see no. That way you can use this one here to get the actual user input. And that's kind of all you have to know. If you got this far, all you really have to know is that there are different kinds of methods you can use to create a simple message box. And there's a really good website to explain all of them. Let me open it right away. It is looking like this. And in here, you can see all of the options you can work with. The one I've just used is called ask question. Besides that, I could ask OK cancel. I could ask yes, no. I could ask yes, no cancel. I could also show just an info or a warning or an error. And well, these are all very simple windows. Let's play around with a couple of them, but this shouldn't be too difficult. Here yeah, I'm back in the code and I want to comment out what I've just done. So this part here. Besides that, I want to get my message box and show info. For this one, I want to display some information. And now if I run this, click on the button, we have some information for the title, but no actual text. This happened because we need two arguments in here, one for the title and one for the body of the text, like we have done up here. Let's change this one right away. I want to call this one the info title. The second argument is going to be here is some information. Now if I run this again and I click on the button, now we have here some information. Besides that, we can get rid of show info and show an error. If I run this again, we have an error message. Looks basically identical, except now we have an X here. And with that, we have basically all we are ever going to need for these simple boxes. Let me add the link to the website here so you can find it yourself. It's super useful. With that, we have covered the simple windows. Next up, let's create some more complex ones. I'm going to minimize the ask yes, no function and create another one. This one I'm going to call create window. Doesn't need any parameters. And in here, I want to create a whole new window that can do basically anything a normal tkinter window can do. For that, we need a new widget. This is called TK top level. This is going to return an object that works kind of like the window in the sense that you can just add other widgets to it and then they are going to be displayed. Let me store this in a variable actually. Let's call it extra window. And just to get started, let's actually run this function when we are pressing this button here, which means on this button, I want to have a command that is creating the window. If I run this now and I click on open main window, we have another window. And this one, let me move it to the side, doesn't really do anything right now. The only thing we can really see is that we have multiple windows as the title for both of them. But this we can change. So let me close all of this. And what we can do with this window is basically the same that we can do with this window down here. For example, we could get the extra window and set the title to extra window. And we could also get the geometry and set this to, let me use a larger number, let's say 800 by 300. If I run this now, and I click on open main window, there we go, we have another larger window that we can work with. Although let's use smaller numbers, so this isn't getting too large. What I used in demo is 300 by 400, but these numbers are entirely up to you. On top of that, what you can do is create other widgets and place them in here. For example, what I have done, is I created TTK label and the parent here has to be this extra window. So extra window, and then we can add some text. For example, a label, and this I want to pack right away. 
running this now, I can click on open main window and we have a label inside of this extra window. I could do this another time, except now I want to use a button. Let me run this again. And there we go. We have a label and a button. Although with the wrong text in there, let me change it right away. This should be a button. And just to finish the demo here, what I have done, what you've seen in the opener, I have created another label. And this is going to be another label. And for this one, pack, I have set expand being true. Now if I run this entire thing, I can click on open main window. And there we go. We have another window. You could also use a grid method or a place method in here. It works like any other widget in tkinter. Finally, what I want to cover is how to destroy this window. And there's one very easy way. If I run this again, I click on open main window and I can simply close this window by clicking on the X up here and then it disappears. But besides that, I also want to be able to close the window by clicking on this close main window, which we can't do right now. For that, I want to create another function, close window. No need for parameters once again. And this close window, I want to call on the middle button, which means this one is going to need a command, like so. And all we really have to do now is somehow get this variable. Let me use it right away, extra window, although this wouldn't work right now. And I have to call the destroy method on it. The reason why this is not going to work right now is because this extra window only exists inside of the scope of this create window function. To fix that, we can simply declare it as a global variable, extra window, and now it is available everywhere, which means this function here should already work. I can open this window, I can move it to the side, and if I click on close main window, it disappears. With that, you should know how to use multiple windows. It really doesn't get that much more complicated. Although there's one exercise I really want to do. And that is that this kind of approach is not really ideal because it gets kind of messy. You're creating a ton of local variables inside of a function and you work with lots of widgets. This doesn't really feel organized. What you should rather do is create an extra class. Let me call it extra right away and put all of the stuff inside of this extra class. And that is going to be your exercise. So this extra class should be a top level widget and contain all of these widgets. And then you're creating this extra widget when you're calling the create window function. Pause the video now and try to implement this one. First of all, this extra has to inherit from TK pop level. With that, we are recreating this line here. Although for that to work properly, we have to call an init method that has self and nothing else. Inside of that, we have to call the super dunder init method. Although it doesn't need any arguments. Now we have recreated this entire line. Let me start by copying the title because all we have to do now is call self and then the title. The same thing we have to do for geometry, meaning I can copy this one as well, except for the class, we have to run self and geometry. And with that, we should already have a basic window, which means I can comment out all of this stuff here. And instead, I want to assign the extra class to the extra window. That way, this one here is still going to work. Let me run the entire thing now. And if I click on open window, we can see we have an extra window. That's a pretty good start. So next up, we have to create all of these widgets here, which is going to be very simple. I just have to copy them and remove the comment and fix the indentation. Besides that, now the parent isn't going to be the extra window. It is just going to be self. That didn't go particularly well. This is looking much better. Now the label, the button, and the other label are all children of the extra widget, which means I can try all of this again. I can click on open main window, and there we go. We have an extra window. And what is even better now is that the entire extra window is inside of a separated class. 
That way, when I'm calling the function, all of this is very easy to work with. And if you had the entire app, so all of this one here as well inside of a class, you wouldn't even need global. You can simply turn this extra window into an attribute and then work with this in any kind of method. The final part that you need to create good looking apps is styling. For styling, tkinder has a couple of different options. The first one is the inbuilt styling tools. For that, we have the widget options and we have the style object. Widget options you should already have seen. For example, when I'm giving a label a background, that is a widget option. The next one is external themes. This basically means you're importing a set of graphics and certain styles and you apply them to all of your widgets. Finally, we have external modules. These are literal external modules that people have made that build on top of tkinter and they are giving you a ton of extra functionality and extra styling which are incredibly useful. Now, unfortunately, there's one issue I really have to talk about, and that is that the inbuilt styling tools and the external themes just aren't very good. There are a couple of reasons why they are quite bad, actually. The most obvious one is that they just don't look particularly good. But besides that, they're also quite annoying to work with, and you don't have that many options. I am going to go over them, but I will not use them too much. Most of what I am going to use are the external modules, because those are actually really good and significantly more powerful. So let's talk about external themes and tkinter's inbuilt styling tools. For that, I already have a couple of lines of code ready. I am importing tkinter, I am creating a window, I am creating a label and a button. Finally, I am running the window, and that's literally it. Running all of this is giving me an app like this. It's probably a bit large. Let me make it smaller. Let's say 400 by 300. That is looking a bit nicer. What you can already do is add a bit more styling when you are creating either the label or the button. For example, what you have already seen is a label can have a background, and this is a background color. For example, this could be white. Although I suppose that's quite hard to see. Let's go with red. It's definitely visible. In here, you have a few more options. For example, you could also update the foreground color. Let's make this one white. If you spell this correctly, this is also going to work, like so. Now we have a label with white text and a red background color. Let me move all of this over multiple lines so it's a bit easier to read. Another option you have for customization is called the font. This one, well, it determines the font. The important thing here is this needs a tuple. This tuple should contain two parts. We have the font and the font size. The font size is really easy. This is just a number that determines the size of the font. Let's go with 20. The font is the actual style of the text. This one needs a string with the name of a font style. To get all of the fonts, what you have to do is from tkinter, you want to import something else. This something else is called font. Once you have that, you can print font.families and don't forget to call it. If you run a code now, you can see all of the fonts that you could be using. Let me pick one at random. Let's go with Jokerman. On your system, you probably have different ones, but just choose whatever you want in here. Jokerman, and there we have a font that's definitely visible. If you install external font themes, they would also show up in the list. So we can extend this quite easily. For the text, there are two more things that I do want to cover. The first one is called Justify. For this one, we have the options right, left, and center. What this one is doing, I think is quite obvious. It justifies the text. However, if I run this right now, the result would not be visible. For the simple reason that right now the text box is this wide, exactly as wide as the label. Because of that, it wouldn't really matter if you put the label on the right, on the left, or right in the middle. Since the label covers the entire area of the background, you are not going to see a difference either way. However, what we can do when we are specifying the text, we can add a line break in here with a dash and an N and then type on another line. 
if I run this now, we have text that is centered. If I change the center to left, we have left center text, and this could also be right. There we go. Now we have right center text. Although if you only have one line of text, let's say only a label, you wouldn't really want to use justify. Instead, you would rely on the layout methods. Those make it much easier to place the label in a certain position. Although you can certainly combine different ways of making all of this work. It's entirely up to you. With that, we have a whole bunch of style methods inside of the widget. That's a pretty good start. Although, if I run this, this still doesn't look terribly good. I guess we have quite a few options, but they are still limited. But with that, we are going to run into some problems. For example, I have a button. If I want to style the background of this button with background and red, if I run this now, we would get an error. We have unknown option background. On top of that, let me comment out the print statement at the top. This one's getting a bit annoying. If I run this now, we are just getting in the error that button has no option background. The same would apply to foreground. It's not available. Although font, I believe, does work. Let's copy this one, Jokerman and 20. Actually, no, it also doesn't work. The button doesn't have any of the label styling methods, which is very, very annoying. What is even worse? If you look online, for example, for this website here, you might have Googled how to give a button a background color and you found this. You'll scroll down a tiny bit and you find a code snippet like this. Where you can see we have foreground and background. So maybe the problem in my code was that I used background, but BG was the proper name. Let's try that one. Back in my code, I want to use BG. Let's go with yellow. But if I run the code now, we get unknown option BG. So what's the issue here? You might have already seen what the difference is. Just check out this code and then try to figure out what the difference is. The difference is that this person is only importing everything from Tkinter. There are no TTK widgets. And this is something I talked about all the way in the beginning. In Tkinter, we have TK widgets and we have TTK widgets. TTK widgets is what I have used most of the time. And those are the much more modern widgets. TK widgets I have used sometimes, like text, for example. These TK widgets can use this kind of styling, but they do look much more outdated. While the TTK widgets look more modern, but have a different kind of styling. Unfortunately, a lot of websites online have written these tutorials a long, long time ago. So this tutorial here probably wasn't updated in just about a decade, possibly longer. I would definitely not recommend any of their courses. Be careful with that one. So how can we style a button? For that, we need a whole new concept that is called style. What that means is we have to create a style object. Let me save it inside of a variable right away. We want to have TTK and style. Don't forget to call it. This is going to give you a styling object that can apply styles to every single widget inside of tkinder. I can actually use this right away. We can use style.theme underscore use for the argument. I want to use clam. If I run this now, we get an error unknown option BG because I didn't get rid of this background. Now let me try this again. And there you can see the button is looking a tiny bit different. That is because of this clam theme. If you are on a Mac or Linux system, this might not work. To figure out what themes are available on your system, you want to print style and theme underscore names. Don't forget to call it if I run this now. On my system, I have WinNative, Clam, Alt, Default, Classic, Wister, and XP Native. Let's use Classic for the theme use. And there we have a really old style button. I think the theme they are using is Windows 98. However, all of these styles aren't very good, so I'm not going to use any of them. Instead, what I want to do is I want to have style and configure the style I'm currently using. In here, we need, first of all, 
is string of the widget we want to update. And then we can set, for example, the background color to something like, let's say, green. The name of each widget always starts with a T and then the name of the widget. For example, a button would be a button. T button would style all of the buttons in your app. Meaning now if I run this, we have a button with a green background color. It's kind of hard to see, but it's definitely there. I think if we change this to foreground, this is much more visible. There we go. Now our button has a green text. In here, we can also set the font. Let me copy it from the label. I want to have Jokerman and 20, like so. Now if I run this, we have a button with custom text. What you can also do is set custom styles for every widget. For that, you would have to add another kind of text, whatever you want. Let's say new and then dot and then T button. This would create a new style for a button, but you could apply it specifically to a widget. If I run the code now, the button would have the default style. We would only get the styling back if I set a style for the button and this would be new dot T button. Now if I run this, we have our styling back. This style configure here is actually a lot more powerful. For example, right now, we only have the text of the button colored. But what if I wanted the text color to be different when I'm pressing the button or when I have pressed the button? We can create a style.map. In here, first of all, we have to target a certain kind of element. In my case, this is going to be new.t button. After that, we have to target one kind of attribute. This could, for example, be the foreground. But now we are assigning this a list. This list is going to be full of tuples. Inside of each tuple, we have the state and then the option for the color in this case. For example, if the button is pressed, I want the button to be red. However, if the button is disabled, then I want the button to be yellow. If I run this now, and I press the button, you can see the button is red. If I, inside of the button, set the state to disabled, then the button color would be yellow. And we can't click on the button because it's disabled. Inside of the map, you can then add more arguments. Let's say besides the foreground, I also want to have a background color. And I am very bad at spelling background. For this one, once again, I want to have a list. If the button is pressed, then I want to have a green background color. Another option here would be if the button is active, I want it to be blue. I should add a comma. And now if I run this, you can see that we have a couple of different background colors for the button. They are quite hard to see because we are styling the background behind the button. It's um, well, not ideal. Once again, this kind of styling is really annoying to work with. And very soon we are going to find much, much better ways to work with all of this. In fact, let's do an exercise and then we are done with this bit. What I want you guys to do for the exercise. I want you guys to add a frame with a width and a height and give it a pink background color. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out. First of all, we have to create a frame. This is going to be frame is equal to TTK dot frame. The parent is going to be the window. On top of that, I have to give this thing a height and a width. I'm going to use completely random numbers for width. Let's go with 100. Finally, I want to pack this entire thing. If I run the code now, we can't see anything because frames by default have no color. The frame now is kind of similar to the button in the sense that we couldn't just add a background with pink in here. We would just get an error. Instead, what we have to do, I'm going to cut this one out. Inside of the style, we have to configure a new widget, which means I have to use style.configure. For the widget, I used to have T button, but now I need T frame. Once I have that, I can set the background. Let's go with pink. If I run this now, we have a pink frame. With that, we have covered the inbuilt styling methods for Tkinter. 
this video is already getting a tiny bit longer, so let's finish it here. And for the next video, we are going to cover different kinds of themes. Another way to style a tkinter app is to use themes. Basically, what that means is tkinter has lots of external themes that you can import, and those themes are going to style every single element of your app. It sounds very simple, and these themes are generally fairly easy to use. However, you might remember a couple of videos ago, I talked about that external themes just aren't very good. To illustrate why, let me show you a list of all the available tkinter themes. Here is a list of all the tkinter themes. If you scroll down, you can see preview colors. And while some look okay, I guess this one here looks fine. There are some more. I guess this one is passable. But most of these themes look really old and outdated. For example, using this one here would just seem like you're making a Windows 98 app. Same for this one, same for these down there. Most of these themes just don't look good at all. On top of that, the styling here is very limited. For example, if you wanted to change any of these options here for this theme, you could maybe change some minor things, but most of these are hard set. So you kind of stuck with whatever you download, which somewhat defeats the point of styling because you want to have your own app. I wouldn't recommend any of these, but I do want to cover if you see it in some other people's code. What is broadly considered the best looking theme, if I go all the way down, is called Azure. If I search for it, we have Azure and we have Azure Dark. This we can get from GitHub. Let me open it really quick. In here, you can see we have a fairly good looking theme. It also tells you how to use it. And this is quite a nice theme to work with. To use it, you first of all have to download it, which you can do up here. You have to click on code and then download zip. This is going to download the entire thing and this theme you have to unpack. If I open my download folder, here we have Azure TTK theme main. This I want to extract all to the current folder. And then we get this folder here, Azure TTK main theme. And then there we have a couple of things. Although the only thing that we really care about is this theme folder here, because in there we have a dark, a light theme, and then some extra information. Inside of, for example, light, what we really have in here are a bunch of images. For example, here we have the radio accent, which is a blue dot. Same with for the on accent, this is just a button, which is also telling you why this is quite limited in terms of customization. But at the very least, we have a good looking theme. In my case, what I have done, I went to the main folder and copied the entire thing. After that, I have another folder. This one has an app. I'm going to open this in a second, but I want to paste all of this in here. This is going to take a second. There we go and rename it to, let me just call it Azure. Inside of this Azure, we now have the theme. Inside of the theme, we have dark and light. What I should have mentioned, this Azure TCL is really important. Also, if you're using this for your own app, you have to include a license. I That's just good practice. Let's open the app and let's implement all of this. The app I have just opened is what we created earlier this slightly more complex layout. Although I do want to change the name, this shouldn't be class-based app anymore. Let's call it theme-based app. Using the theme is actually incredibly simple. All we have to do inside of the init method of the main window. So wherever you create tk.tk, you want to do two more things. Before you create any kind of widget, you want to use the theme. For that, you want to use self or whatever your main window is, then tk, and then call. Inside of this, you need two arguments. The first one is called source. This tells tkinter to import something. The next argument now is going to need a path. The path that we want is inside of Azure and azure.tcl. This is the file we want to import which means the folder I want to go for is called Azure. In there, I want to have 
azure.tcl. If I run this now, we can't see anything, but we are not getting an error message. That's what I was looking for. To actually use this theme, we have to use self again, then .tk, and then call. Now we need two arguments again. The first one is called set theme. After that, we have to decide between a light theme and a dark theme. If I use the dark theme, now we can see some major improvement, although it's not perfect yet. Let me expand it a tiny bit. You can see most things work okay, but we have to change a few things. The sliders are the worst part right now, but things are definitely getting better. The main issue we have right now is inside of, I think all of this happened inside of menu. Inside of there, we have create widgets and further down there, we have the menu slider one and menu slider two. Both of those are TTK scales. The problem we have with this theme right now is that we are sticking them to all four sides. This is causing a problem. The theme only really works if you stick the slider either on the horizontal or on the vertical axis, but not both. Now for this, this fixes the slider and that's looking much better. Sometimes when using external themes, you have to be a tiny bit careful. Although besides that, inside of the dark theme, you could also use a light theme. And there we go. We have a different kind of theme that probably looks a little bit better. I know it's quite subjective. I guess one more thing that we can do is all of the buttons look quite close together. They should have a tiny bit of padding. That is very easily done. Inside of create widgets, we are placing all of the buttons here. All we have to do is give them a tiny bit of pad X. Let's go with four and pad Y should also be four. Now if I run this again, now we have a tiny bit of padding between the buttons. And if I increase the size of this window, here we go. This is looking much better. And that's kind of it for themes. All of the themes work either in this way or in a very similar way. And while this can give you some decent results, I really wouldn't recommend using it. Number one, for this theme, you either have a light color or a dark color, and that's all you can really do for customization. On top of that, since all of these elements are simply images, this also slows down performance. You notice this in particular when you try to resize the app. Let me show my mouse actually, and let me try to resize the app really fast. You can see the thing really struggles and cannot keep up at all. And I think that's really bad user experience. As a consequence, while themes can be a good way to get started, I just wouldn't recommend using them at all. They are much better ways to style your app. There's one important topic that I want to cover before I continue, and that is colors. So far, I always use the tkinter default colors. Those are, for example, red, white, blue, pink, orange, yellow. I think there are about 10 in total, which, well, is quite limiting. To create any color that you want, you would use what is called a hexadecimal value system. It sounds complicated, but it really isn't that bad. Hexadecimal numbers go from zero to F. That is going to sound confusing, but the numbers look like this. We go from zero all the way to nine, and then we continue with A, B, C, D, E, and F, with zero being the lowest number and F being the highest number. Basically, just imagine that these letters here are numbers in this kind of numbering system. The reason for that is that with the system, you can express a much greater range of values with fewer numbers. You see it quite often, actually, when you work with computers. To turn this into a color, you have to combine three of these numbers with the first value standing for red, the second one for green, and the final one for blue. This might look something like this. We have zero, eight, and F. This means that we have zero amount of red because zero is the lowest value. And in this case, it means we have the absence of red. Next up, we have D8. This one is roughly in the middle of the system, which means we have more or less 50% of green color. Although this is not an exact number here. Finally, we have F and this F stands for blue. 
and is the highest number in here, which means we have 100% of the blue color. Finally, to indicate that we are using hexadecimal numbers, you want to add the hashtag symbol in front of this. If you add this into tkinter as a string, tkinter is going to recognize this as a color. Let's have a look. For the code, I am importing tkinter and ttk, I am creating a window, then I'm creating three labels and place them right away using the pack method. Finally, as always, I'm running main loop so we can see the app. This is giving us an empty window because none of the labels has any text. Although they don't need any kind of text because I only care about the colors here. To give it a color, as always, we need, for example, a background. For this, so far, we always use something like red. With that, we have a red background color. However, now that we have learned about hexadecimal colors, we can set the background to the color I used was hashtag 0, 8, and F. If I run this now, we are getting a very bluish color. This should make sense because we have no amount of red and we have a huge amount of blue. That way, you would expect this color here to be quite blue. Although, since we do have a certain amount of green, that's the 8, this is not going to be a complete blue. I can actually demonstrate this if I copy all of this. I could, for example, change the 8 to an F and the F to a 0. What would we expect now for the color? Well, if I run this again, we are getting a pure green. Because for this one, we have no red and we have no blue. The only color that we have is green, and we have the full amount of green. So with that system, you could create basically any kind of color. Now, it's going to be really annoying to just experiment with each of these values, and nobody actually does that. Instead, what people are doing is they use some kind of editor, and they all have some kind of color picker inbuilt. For example, here I am in Photoshop. If I click on the color, you can see down here, we have a hexadecimal color system. Although this one looks a tiny bit different compared to what I have just used. Instead of three colors, we have six colors. Let's talk about that one really quick. Hexadecimal color values are always either three or six digits long. The one we have just seen looked like this. We have one digit for red, one digit for green, and one digit for blue. Besides that, we could also specify two digits for each color. Two for red, two for green, and two for blue. This second system here is a lot more precise because we have twice as many values for the red color, for example, as we would have in this system. Which gives you, well, a whole lot more options. When you use basically any color editor online, this is the system they are using. They basically always have six colors, but you don't have to use it. If you have a simple app, this system here is perfectly fine. Back in Photoshop, you can see right now we have FF, so we have a pure red color, and then 00 for green and 00 for blue. If I move around, you can see these colors change, and you can create basically any kind of color value. In total, I think this gives you about 16 million options. Definitely enough for any kind of style that you want. If you don't have Photoshop, you don't have to worry because Google has a color picker inbuilt as well. In here, you can simply move a color around and get basically any kind of hex value that you want. This is the value you're always looking for, which means I could literally just copy the value from this, return to my code editor, and paste the color in here, run the code, and there we go. We have the same color we just created which makes all of this quite efficient because you can now pick literally any color that you want. Let's do an exercise on this one. I want you guys to create a brownish color using hexadecimal values. You could use a color picker for that, although just to practice the system, try to figure out the numbers without using an editor. It should be fairly easily doable, but both approaches are going to be fine. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out. Let me copy the final label here and place it below the exercise. For this one, I want to work with just three digits. Let's start with F, 0, and 0. This is going to give us a pure red because we only have F and then 0 for green and 0 for blue. 
which means we have a pure red. This we now have to make darker to get some kind of brown. The best way of doing that is by increasing the amount of green. Instead of zero, let's go with an A. If I run this now, this is giving us a bit of an orangey color. If I reduce the amount of green, let's say to a six, this is definitely getting brownish. Although right now it's more of a dark orange. If I put this to a green, we are definitely getting closer. I guess if I increase this a tiny bit more to a five, this gets close enough to at least a light brown. And if I reduce the amount of red from an F to, let's say, C, this is very much a brown color. Doing all of this inside of Google gives you much easier results. You can just click on a brownish color here, something like this, and you have a lot of different brown tones you could work with. Before I move on, there are two more things that I do want to cover, and that is white and black. Right now, we always had a color, but how can we get a white and a black color? Those two are really easily done. I can just copy this. Black is the absence of all colors, which means zero, zero, and zero. Running this gives us a black color, and a white color is the opposite. We have every color 100% available, which means F, F, and F. With that, we have white. If you have the same color value for every color, you always get some shade of gray. Let me duplicate this. If I change 0, 0, and 0 to 8, 8, 8, we're getting a grayish color. With that, we have covered all of the colors. Let's talk about styling modules. So far, I mostly talked about stuff that you shouldn't do in tkinter in terms of styling. This is going to change now, because external modules are really good to add style and to use it easily. These external modules build on top of tkinter and improve certain parts of it. Most of them are styling, but they also add a few more extra functionalities. Custom tkinter and TTK Bootstrap are the really common options. I'm going to start with custom tkinter because this is what I think is the best option for tkinter in terms of styling. It's also the one I really like to use. Custom tkinter works by using the same widgets as TTK but it lets you customize all of them easily. On top of that, there are also some additional widgets and every single widget has a dark and a light mode. That way you can basically create any kind of style that you want. Before I jump into the code, there's one more thing I do want to cover. And that is that Custom Tkinter has a really good documentation. The site with all of the code is looking something like this. Although if you scroll down, you can already see some demos for the dark and the light mode. All of these elements are dynamically generated, meaning you can customize a lot of different things here. On top of that, if you go down a tiny bit further, you have the documentation. In here, on the right side, you have all of the different widgets and all of the elements of Custom tkinter. If I, for example, click on CTK label, there we have an example of the code, we have all of the arguments, and then we get a bit more information. This is literally all we need. And here you can see, for example, we can set the text, the width, the height, the corner radius, a foreground color, a text color, and a font. And all of this is very easily implemented. I suppose the best example here would be CTK button on the right. This is just a simple button. As you can see here, you can customize every single element of this button quite easily. If you contrast this with standard tkinter, where you have to create a style object and in there you have to create a map, none of this is necessary here. You could simply set a foreground color, a hover color, a border color, a text color, a text disabled color, basically whatever you want. There are lots of different options in here. So let's actually create a basic custom tkinter app. Although for that, first of all, we have to install custom tkinter because it doesn't come with Python by default. For that, once again, we either need the PowerShell or the terminal, depending if you are on Windows or on macOS. In my case, I'm using the PowerShell, so I need pip install custom tkinter. Although in my case, I already have this one installed, so it's not doing anything. If you were using macOS, this would be pip free install custom tkinter. Here we have a completely empty Python file. 
The reason why I have nothing ready is because we are not going to use any of the Tkinter widgets we have used so far. Instead, I want to import custom Tkinter. This is going to be kind of annoying to write. I usually abbreviate this as CTK. The best comparison here is that all of this is fairly similar to TTK in the sense that inside of this CTK module, we have a ton of widgets that we can use. For example, we can use this to create a window. This is going to be another window that I want to store in a variable. And then here we need CTK and then CT all in upper score and then K in lower score. Don't forget to call this. Once we have that, we can run the entire thing with window.main loop. If I execute the entire thing, we already get a window that is looking significantly better. A really important thing that you do have to understand is that this CTK window inherits from the tkinter window. As a consequence, we have all of the default arguments we could use for the window. For example, we could set a window.title. Let me call it a custom tkinter app. That is some terrible spelling. That looks better. If I run this thing now and increase the size, we have a custom tkinter app. Although I just realized there's another typo in there. That is looking better. Besides that, we can also set window.geometry. In here, as always, we need a string with a number. Let's go with 600 by 400. Running this now, we get a much larger window. With that, we have a window. Next up, we can create some widgets. For example, if we want to create a label, I want to store this in a variable. All we need here is ctk and then ctk with label. Just like with ttk, we need the master, which in my case is going to be the window. After we have that, I can set some text. This can be a ctk label. This is going to return a widget and this widget I have to place on the window with some kind of layout method. Let's go with pack. If I run this now, we have a ctk label. So far, we have some very basic functionality. This CTK label gives us a ton of options for customization. Just for reference, here is the documentation. What we could set, for example, is the corner radius, the foreground color, and the text color. I guess the foreground color here isn't the perfect name. This is essentially the background color. For this one, we can either use a tuple with a light and a dark color, or we can use a single color that is called transparent. For the colors here, we would either use a hexadecimal color or one of the inbuilt tkinter color names, which means I can set an FG color and set this to red. If I run this now, we have a red background color. On top of that, I can set a text color. Let's go with white here. With that, we have a white label. Also, I want to put all of this over multiple lines. That's going to make everything a bit easier to read. Another useful thing that custom tkinter has that TTK actually doesn't have is corner radius. This one determines the corner radius. I think that's quite obvious. If I set this to a 10, we now have rounded corners for this label. With that, we have a label. Next up, let's create a button. This we create with CTK and then CTK button. What you always have to be aware of you have C and T in capital letters, and then the K is a lowercase letter. Now, this button, like the label, is first of all going to need a master, which is going to be the window. Then we need some text. I'm going to call this one a CTK button. This button I want to pack. If I run this now, we have a CTK button. We can click on it, but nothing is going to happen. This button now is very easy to customize. For example, if we now set an FG color, for this one, let's use an hexadecimal color. We can use F, F, and zero. With that, we get yellow. On top of that, we can set the text color. And for this one, just to stick with hexadecimal colors, I want to have a black color. So I'm going to go with zero, zero, and zero. Now we have a yellow button. Although if I hover over it, we get the start blue. That we can also change, although again, I want to do all of this over multiple lines, so it's a bit easier to read. To change the hover color, we need, well, hover color. 
For this one, I want to have a slightly darker yellow. We started with F, F, and 0. To get a darker yellow, this should be, let's go with A, A, and 0. If I run this now, I can hover over it and we get a darker yellow. Other than that, the button works like in TTK, which means we can add a command. This could, for example, be a lambda or literally any function. But in this case, I just want to print E button was pressed. I forgot the semicolon. Now this should be working. And if I click on the button, we get a button was pressed. Now that we can execute a command, we can work on something really cool in custom tkinter. And that is to change the theme between light and dark mode. By default, custom tkinter uses the default theme of your system. In my case, if I run the entire thing again, if I show you the settings for Windows like this, right now, my system setting is dark. If I set this to light, things will need a second to load. But now you can see the app automatically switched to a light mode. If I go back to dark, things need a second again. And there we go. We have a dark style app again, which is really cool for custom tkinter because it already knows if the user has a dark or a light mode and it, and it adjusts for that. Although you can customize this yourself. If you want your app to run in light mode, or in my case, I want the app to run in light mode once I press the button. All you have to do is get CTK set appearance underscore mode. You can either set light or you can set dark. Dark is the one we already have, so I want to have light. Now if I run this and I click on the button, we have light mode. Although if I click on it again, nothing is going to happen. What is even better is that every single color you can specify usually isn't one color, but a tuple of colors. Let's say for the label, if we have a dark mode, I want this to be red. But if we have a light mode, I want this to be blue, which you simply do in this way. You have a tuple. The first argument is the light color. The second argument is the dark color, which means if I run this again, right now we have the dark mode. So the color is red for the label. But if I click on CTK button, now the label foreground color is blue because we have the light mode. This system works with every single color. For example, for the text color, I can have white for the dark mode and I can have, let's go with black for the light mode. If I now click on the button, now we have black text and a blue background color. Exactly what we specified in here. If you understand all of this so far, you understand the basics of custom tkinter. All you really have to do is look at the documentation and then pick and choose whatever widget you want. On the right side, you have CTK widgets. The one I just used was CTK. Then we have CTK button and CTK label. We also have a CTK frame that works like a TTK frame, although this one has a background color. Besides that, we have a text box. We would have a switch, although there's no image. We would have a scroll bar, also no image. Let me find one with an image. We have a slider. This one also doesn't have an image. Okay, uh, some bad luck, but let's play around with a few more. The system here doesn't really change. If you followed the series so far, you already know how to use all of this. Let's say for the next part, I want to create a frame. This one is going to be CTK and frame. Although I forgot CTK dot CTK frame. For this one, as always, we need a master, which is going to be the window. If I pack this frame now, you can see this already has a background color. If you don't like it, you can simply set the FG color to transparent. That way it disappears. This frame is going to work like any other frame we have seen so far, which means you can add elements in here. Let's say I want to add a slider in there. This we create with CTK and CTK slider. The parent now is going to be the frame and let's pack it right away. Slider.pack, there we go. Now we have a slider in here and this one works like any other slider. Just to visualize that this is indeed inside of a frame, let's remove the background color. Now we can see that there's a slight background behind the slider. If I'm adding some padding, let's say pad X is 20, 
and pad Y is also 20. Now all of this is much more visible. What you can also do is combine custom Teak Hinter with standard Teak Hinter. For that though, I have to import, import Teak Hinter as TK and I want from Teak Hinter import TTK. It is totally fine to combine TTK widgets with custom Teak Hinter widgets. Although most of the time, the TTK widgets, especially when you put them right next to the custom Teak Hinter widgets, they start to look really bad. So generally, I wouldn't recommend doing it. However, what you might want to do is use the Teak Hinter variables. Those work perfectly fine with the custom Teak Hinter variables. For example, for the label, I can create a, let's call it a string var, which is going to be TK and string var. For the value here, we could set a custom string. This string var, we can set as the text variable for the label. So string var, place it in here, and now we get a custom string for the label. Although, strictly speaking, custom tkinter also has inbuilt tkinter variables. We get those by simply using ctk, and then we can use string var, int var, and so on. Which means if I have ctk instead of tk, we're not going to see a difference. Right now, the ctk and the tk variables are identical. Although that might change in the future. If you are using tkinter variables and using custom tkinter, use the custom tkinter variables. With that, we have all of the basics of custom tkinter. It really doesn't get that much more complicated, which means we can do an exercise and then we are done. What I want you guys to do is going to look something like this. All the way at the bottom, we now have an exercise switch. This one looks absolutely horrible, but if you can make it look this horrible in custom tkinter, you definitely know how to change a lot of different things. Which means you have to look at the documentation, use the custom tkinter switch, and then make it look something like this. Pause the video now and try to implement this one yourself. We have to create a custom tkinter switch. Although, first of all, let me add an exercise text in here. I want to create a switch, and this we create with custom tkinter and then ctk switch. This one, first of all, needs a master, so window is the default argument here. Next up, I want to have some text. This is going to be the exercise switch. To get started, this is all we need, which means now I want to pack this switch. I have made an error, and you can already see I made a typo. The k here should be lowercase, which means ct lowercase k. Now let's try this. And there we go. Now we have a basic switch that by default is looking pretty good. We want to make this thing look absolutely horrible. So let's talk about how to customize this thing. And to customize anything in custom tkinter, the first step should always be look at the documentation. Here's the documentation. I still have the slider open, but I want to look at ctk switch. This one here this one has a huge amount of arguments we could be working with. I actually only used a small amount of them. You could make this look even worse. I guess we can start with the colors. I want to have a FG color of red. Don't forget the comma. Now if I run this, we get some bits of red. To get the other color, we need what is called progress color. This, in my case, I want to be pink. Now we have red or we have pink. I guess FG color sometimes here is a bit misleading. It's basically the background color, but you get the idea. Also, if you wanted to, you could add a tuple in here with red for the dark mode and let's say blue for the light mode. If I run this now, we have red as a default, but if I change this to the light mode, now this is blue. So once again, a tuple always works here to get the light mode color. Besides that, if you want to change the color of the actual button, you want the button color. I'm not sure if button is the proper name, but you get the idea. In my case, I changed this one to green. Now we have a green color for the button. Although if I hover over it, it becomes white. That I also want to change. And for that, we have the button hover color. 
I set this one to yellow. Now if I run this again and I have it over it, it's yellow. You can already see we have a ton of customization here. All of the colors can be changed. And this wouldn't really be doable if we used a theme because this one relies much more heavily on images. So those couldn't be easily changed. What we can also do, since all of this is dynamically generated, we could set a switch width. If I set this to 10, you should already be able to see what's going on. Now we have the width of the thing being much more narrow. And if I click on it, nothing is going to happen. Although if I change this to, let's say 60, now we can see we have a much wider switch. You can also set this switch underscore height to let's say 30. And now you have a huge switch thingy. If you want to make this thing look really horrible, you can set the corner radius and this changes the corner radius of the button. If I set this to a two, now we get a very thin slider. Although it all still works perfectly fine. I just made a mistake, I just realized. When we set the corner radius, we are setting the corner radius both of the button and the corner radius of the background. These corners here, uh, this corner as well. So with that, we have custom tkinter, or at the very least, the basics of custom tkinter. If you know TTK already, using custom tkinter is really easy. Basically, all you have to do is replace TTK and then the widget with custom TK and then CTK and then the widget name. For 90% of the time, this is all you have to do. To understand custom tkinter a little bit better, I want to convert a TTK app to a custom tkinter app. The app I want to convert is the more complex layout app I created earlier. If I run this, we get this app here. I want to convert all of this to the custom tkinter style. This isn't going to be very difficult and it's not going to take very long. Because of that, I want this to be an exercise right away. I want you guys to convert the app to use custom tkinter. It really shouldn't be too hard. So pause the video now. So pause the video now and try to figure this one out. To make sure we are not using any default tkinter functionality, I am going to comment out the import for tkinter and ttk. Instead, I want to import custom tkinter as ctk. If I run this now, we are going to get a lot of error messages. We have to go through this thing one by one and fix things. Starting down here. I want to change the title from class-based app to class-based app with ctk. With that, we have to look at the app itself, so the main app. For this one, I don't want to have tk.tk. Instead, I want to have ctk.ctk. That is actually all we need inside of the app because this one doesn't actually do very much. Next up, I want to work on the menu. For this one, we are inheriting from a frame. This I want to change to ctk and then ctk frame. Inside of the init method for this one, we just have basic stuff. So this can stay as it is. Although inside of create widgets, we have to make a couple of changes. First of all, the buttons are very easy to update. Instead of TTK, I want to have CTK and then CTK button. For the menu slider, we cannot use scale anymore. This one doesn't exist in custom tkinter. Instead, what we are using for this one is called a CTK slider, which means I want CTK and CTK slider. After that, we have toggle frame. This is going to be a frame, so ctk.ctk frame. Inside of there, we have a menu toggle one and menu toggle two. Check button doesn't exist in custom tkinter, but we do have a checkbox, and that's basically the same thing. I want to get rid of those and use ctk and then ctk check box. And that should be all we need. Finally, we have an entry widget. This one does exist in custom tkinter, so I want to have ctk.ctk and entry. The rest is just layout. All of this can stay as it is because it works with custom tkinter like it would work with ttk. I can minimize the menu. We should be done with this one. And that's the most amount of work. Inside of main, we have one frame. This I want to change to ctk and then ctk frame. 
the rest in here can stay identical. Finally, we have the entry in here. As always, I want to change the TTK frame to CTK frame. Inside of this one, we are using a label. This we can change very easily to ctk.ctk label. The same for the button, this should be ctk.ctk button. With that, we should be nearly done. Although if I run this now, we get one error message. And that is that orient inside of the menu doesn't exist. The reason for that, if I open the documentation, is ctk slider, we don't have orient, instead we have orientation. A very easy thing to change. Instead of orient, we want to have orientation. Let's try this now. Next up, we have a typo. There's no CTK label. I once again made a typo. Let me minimize the menu. The error message happened inside of entry. In here, this should be CTK lowercase k. Let's try this now. There's one more error message, and that is that custom tkinter for a label doesn't have background. Although, if I remove this one, it should be working now. There we go. Although, well, it's not ideal yet. We do have a couple of things that we want to work on. Most importantly, the sliders aren't great yet. But that is very easily fixable. All we have to do, if I minimize the app and the entry, Inside of the menu, when we are placing the sliders, that happens down here. I want to remove the east and west. Now if I run this, the sliders are looking much better. And let me increase the size a tiny bit here. This is all coming together much better. Although right now the sliders do look quite a bit thin. If you want to make them a bit wider, you can do that quite easily. All you have to do is go to the sliders and in here set a width. Let's go with 15, possibly a bit too thin, I guess 20 is better. Yeah, this one looks much nicer. If I maximize the entire thing, it still works. Next up, for the buttons, I want to have a tiny bit of padding, which means when I'm placing the button using the grid method, all I really have to do is to add pad X of four and pad Y of four. With that, we have a bit of padding and we are starting to run a bit out of space, but I hope you see the potential of custom tkinter because all of this is starting to look much better than default tkinter. Most importantly, it is really easy to change. All of the elements you see here can be customized. And if you have a bit of experience, you can actually create pretty sophisticated GUIs with that, that actually look modern. Another useful tool to customize tkinter is called TTK Bootstrap. This one, like custom tkinter, is an external module that you have to install. TTK Bootstrap is an external module that has really good theme support. What that means is, well, for custom tkinter, we customized every widget individually. For TTK Bootstrap, instead, we are creating one theme and applying this theme to every single widget. While this means that we have a bit less control, it makes it much easier to style widgets. Although, before we can use it, we have to install it. As always, this either happens in the PowerShell, if you're on Windows, or in the terminal on macOS. To install it, in my case on Windows, I would need pip install ttk bootstrap. If I run the code now, we get a short message and then we have it installed. If you're using macOS, you would use pip re install ttk bootstrap. And that would happen in the terminal. The code I am going to start with is looking like this. We are doing the usual imports and window creation. The really important bit is this. We have a label and then three buttons. Finally, we are running the entire app, so nothing special. If I run this code, we can see we have a basic app with three buttons and a label. To style this, we have to import TTK Bootstrap, which means import TTK Bootstrap. And just by importing TTK Bootstrap, we are already applying a new theme to our app. Meaning if I run the code now, 
we can already see we have much nicer looking buttons. Although to actually use TTK Bootstrap, what you usually see is that people import it as TTK. The reason for that is that TTK Bootstrap basically works like TTK, in the sense that all of the important widgets like label, button, and so on exist inside of it. And we are just accessing them, except if we are using TTK Bootstrap, they all look much nicer. Because of that, we don't need tkinter TTK at all. If I run the entire app now, everything still works as before. There's only one change that you absolutely have to be aware of, and that happens on this line here. When we are using TTK Bootstrap, we don't want to use tk.tk. Instead, we want to use tk.window. If I run this now, we can see we have a different kind of title bar with a custom icon. But other than that, not much has changed. The reason why we need this window is because with that, we can add one more argument, and that is called theme name. This is where the actual magic happens for TTK Bootstrap, because in here, we can, for example, add darkly, run the code now, and they can see we have applied a custom theme to the entire app. Another theme that we could be using is called journal. If I run this now, we have a completely different style. If you want to know all of the available custom themes, you have to look at the website. There's a full list. Let's have a look at that one, actually. The website is looking like this. And in here, you have lots of explanations in terms of what you can do. We can already see a couple of styles here. Although to find all of the styles at the top, you have to go to themes. In here, you find one theme that is called Litera. This is the default theme. On the left side, you can see light themes and dark themes. Let's have a look at all of the light themes. In here, we have Cosmo, we have Flatly, we have Journal, Litera, and a few more. Quite a few more, actually. Besides that, we also have the dark themes. Here we have Solar, Darkly, Cyborg, and again, a few more. All of these themes you can use immediately. On top of that, if you want to create your own theme, you would have to go to TTK Creator, and in here, you have an app that you can use to create your own custom theme. I'm going to cover that in the next part. Although before that, there are a few more basic things we have to cover. The most important part is if you look at this app here, you can see we have lots of different styles. We have primary, secondary, success, and so on. And all of these are different colors inside of a theme. But right now, if I return to my code and run the entire thing, all of the buttons have the same color. For example, I might want to have the first button as red, then another button could be, let's say, a warning. The final button could be some kind of green button. How could I get these colors? To learn how to do that, the best way is to start with the documentation. Here we are again. The important part you want to look at now is called getting started. The installation we have already covered. Next up, there is a tutorial. This covers all you have to know about TTK Bootstrap. Since the entire module isn't terribly difficult, this is quite a short page. Which means this could be a really good exercise. Read through this website and try to understand how to style individual elements using TTK Bootstrap. So pause the video now and try to figure this one out. I guess a quick solution here would be Using the boot style covers just about everything. This allows you to give certain widgets a certain kind of style. For example, one widget could have the style success, another widget could be info, and well, you have quite a few more themes. If you scroll down a bit more, you can see all of the themes here. You have primary, secondary, success, info, warning, danger, light, and dark. All of these can be passed into the boot style to get a certain kind of color. How you pass it in there, you can do in two ways. You can either import from ttkbootstraps.constants import everything, or if you go a bit further down, you can use a string that looks something like this. The module is really flexible here, so choose whatever you like. The recommended option, you can see it down here, is the dash. This one here. This is the one I'm going to use as well. In this one, you always specify the color first, and then if you want to have only the outline or the full color. I haven't covered this yet, but you can see it up here quite well. We can either have a button with a solid color 
or a button only with the outline. The solid color is the default, the outline you get if you add outline in the style. With that, we have all we need. Although I guess one more thing that I do want to cover to actually get a preview of how all of this is going to look, you can look at themes and I'm looking journal right now, which is a light theme. In here we have journal. You can see we have the primary, secondary, success, info, and all of the other colors. That way you have an idea of how this is going to look in the end. So here I am back in the code and let's start by coloring in the first button. I need the boot style with a string. Let's call this one danger. Now if I run this, the first button has a different color. Now it's orange instead of the default red. If you only want to have the outline, you would add a dash and then outline. Now if I run this, we only have an orangey label around it. And if you hover over it, like so, then you can see the full orange color. For the warning, you can add a boot style of warning. That is horrible spelling. That looks better. Now the warning is more yellowy. Finally, for the green one, I want to have a boot style that is called success. Running this one gives me a green button. While I only use buttons, these kind of styles would work with literally any widget. If I return to the documentation, you can see we, for example, have a checkbox, we have a progress bar, we have a slider, we have a toggle down here, we even have a calendar, we will learn about that later, and we have scroll bars, all with these colors here. Every single aspect of the app will be styled appropriately. All you have to do is use the Bootstrap TTK module and then use the normal widgets. That way you already get all the styles you want. I guess on top of that, you have to set the boot style, but that's a fairly small task. Since all of that is fairly simple, we can do one more thing. Here's the app we created earlier with the more complex layout. And I want you guys to style this entire thing using the TTK boot style module. Make sure to use a couple of different colors. And pause the video now and implement this one yourself. For this one, I want to comment out from tkinter import TTK. Instead, I want to import TTK boot strap as TTK. Just by doing that, the app already looks quite a bit better. Although we can make a few more changes. First of all, inside of the app, I don't want to use tk.tk, .tk. instead I want to use ttk.window. Doing that gives me a much smaller app, but well, we're getting a different title bar. Although once we have that, inside of the super.init method, we can now set a theme name. This theme name could for example be darkly, that one I usually like quite a bit. Or to stick with what we have already seen, we could use journal. This one would look something like this. Other than that, we don't really have to make too many changes because we are still using TTK and the regular widgets. Although I guess what we could be doing when we are creating the menu, not the init, but in create the widgets, for example, for the buttons, I could use different styles. For example, I could have a boot style for menu button one, that could be danger. That makes the first button orange. I could use boot style for the second button. Let's call this one success. Now we have a green and an orange button. For the third button, I want to have, let's use dark and outline. Running this one, we are getting a third button, although I don't really like the styling here, but well, you can see different kinds of styles. I think adding a tiny bit of padding here would make a lot of difference. When I am using the grid method to place all of the buttons, I want to add pad X of four and pad Y of four, like so. And this is a minor improvement. I think this is looking a little bit better, although the outline here doesn't work too well. I'm just gonna remove it like so, this is definitely looking better. Next up, we can also change the menu slider 
once again, for that, we need a boot style. Let's use one we haven't used yet. For example, back in the app, one that I haven't covered yet is called info. We also haven't covered secondary. Let's use those two. The first slider should have the style info. The second one should have the style secondary. If I run this now, we get two sliders, one that is dark blue, the other that is more grayish. After that, we can style the check button. I'm only going to cover one because this is probably starting to get repetitive. In here, now we have one check button being blue, the other still being red. I think you get the idea, so I'm going to stop this. But I think the app already made quite a bit of progress. Although there are a couple of things you want to be aware of. The most important one is that you still have the basic TTK widgets, which you see in particular here for the entries. Both of those are just labels with a background, and TTK Bootstrap doesn't style those. If you wanted to have a better color here, you would have to use a hexadecimal code to make a similar style compared to these buttons here, which certainly is doable. A really cool part of TTK Bootstrap is to create custom themes. This is very easily done because TTK Bootstrap gives you this kind of app where you can pick an existing theme, let's say journal I have already used, and simply change any part of it. For example, you could give it a different main color. Let's go with blue. You could give it a different background. The default is white. Let's change it to a really horrible green. There we go. You can literally change whatever you want. This is also very easily imported into any app you're using. To get started, there's only one thing you really have to do. You start by using either the PowerShell or the terminal. The command you need, you can find in the documentation. Let me open it really quick. Here's the website for TTK Bootstrap. You want to go to themes and in there is creator. This one gives you a command, python-m TTK creator. This one opens this program here. Let me copy it and return to the PowerShell and simply paste the command in here. If I run this now, we can see we have the app you have just seen. A really important part, do not close the PowerShell or the terminal. This would close this program here as well. Once you have it, you can simply give your theme a new name. Let me show my mouse for all of this actually. In the top left, you can set a name. I'm going to call my theme custom. After that, I can set a base theme. Let's go with Simplex. It really doesn't matter what you're starting with. With this one, you can now basically very easily change whatever colors you want. Let me use some colors that are very easily visible. Here we have a pink color for primary. And for the background, I want to use a visible color. Let's go with pure black. That is going to be really annoying to see. I guess we should make this a tiny bit less black. Let's go with a darkish gray. Definitely an improvement, but this is absolutely something you have to play around with for a bit. All I really care about for now is that you can see how easy this thing is to use. To use it, all you have to do is click on save, and then you get the message, the theme custom has been created. Although nothing else. Fortunately, that is because we don't need anything else, because with that, you can use this custom theme like any other theme in TTK Bootstrap. For example, here is the app we styled in the last part. The theme name we got here inside of the app class. We used journal so far. If I change this to custom, run the app again, here we have the theme I just created. It's literally as easy as that to use the theme. Other than that, what you can also do in the top left, you can set reset to get back to the starting point if you really don't like what you created. You can also import and export your theme. All of that works really easily. So with that, we can create our own themes. There's one more thing that I want to cover for TTK Bootstrap, and that is some extra widgets that come with this module. The app we are going to create is going to look something like this. In here, we have a couple of elements. The top part is a scrollable widget. This one comes by default, so you don't have to create it. Next up, we can show a toast. This one gives you a toast in the top right. After that, we have a tooltip. 
Then we have a calendar where we can pick a date and get the date. This one only prints the date, but you get the idea. After that, we have a better looking kind of progress bar. Finally, we have what is called a meter. This one is looking really fancy. All of these switches we are going to create in this bit. To get started, I already have a couple of imports. At the top, I am importing tkinter STK and TTK Bootstrap. Note here, I am importing TTK Bootstrap as TTK, not tkinter. After that, we have the window and we are running the entire thing. Finally, we are using the Darkleaf theme. With that, we can start creating some widgets. The first one is called scroll frame, which creates a scrollable frame. To understand this one in detail, I would recommend to read the documentation. Let's open it actually. Once again, here I'm on the website of TTK Bootstrap and you want to look at API. In here, we have a couple of extra parts that are really useful. The one I want to look at right now is called scrolled module. In here, we have scrolled frame and scrolled text. Scrolled frame is the one I really care about. This one gives you no picture, that's very annoying, but it gives you some code snippet on how to use it. First of all, you have to import a specific subpart of TTK Bootstrap. Although this one is basically just a frame, so you can create it like any other frame. You can pack it on whatever container you want. And then the important part is you want to populate it with some kind of widget. The only thing you have to do is set the parent or the master of these new widgets as the container widget you just created. Then these widgets are going to show up inside of it. Back in the code, the first thing that I have to do is from TTK bootstrap dot scrolled, I want to import scrolled frame. If you run the code now, we cannot see an error. That's a good sign that I didn't make a typo. Now with that, I want to create, let me call it a scroll frame. This is going to be a scrolled frame. As always, this one is going to need a parent, which in my case is going to be the window. I am going to pack this straight away using the pack method. For now, let's set expand to true. Although if I run this, all we can really see is a scroll bar. Since we don't have any widgets yet, this isn't going to do very much. To account for that, I want to create a whole bunch of widgets. This I do with a for loop for i in range 100. I want to create a TTK label and I want to create a TTK button. Both of those have the scroll frame as the parent, which means scrolled frame is going to be the master. And after that, I want to create a text that is going to be an F string that shows us the number, which is going to be I, this I we're getting from the for loop. For the text, I think I chose label with I and then button with I. After that, we have to make sure that we are packing these widgets and then they are going to show up. Let's run this now. And there we go. Now we have a scrollable thing that we can work with. I should have probably set fill to both. So this thing actually covers the entire window. Now if I run this, here we have scrolling that works for all of the elements. Although you can see if I scroll really fast, the graphics here really aren't working too well. So I would generally recommend to create your own scrolling system. I have covered this earlier on if you skipped it. I suppose what you can also do for the label and the button in the pack, you can set fill to X. That way they are covering the entire horizontal space. Now, the reason why I would recommend to create your own scrolling logic is because all of this is quite limited. For example, what if you wanted to have, if I'm drawing this, if you want to have some kind of setup where you have one widget covering this amount of height, and then you have one widget on the left for the label and then the button on the right. This, unfortunately, you couldn't easily do inside of this setup. Something you might want to try is create a separate frame with TTK and frame and the scroll frame as the master. The label and the button would then be parented to this one, which means here I want to have the frame and then I want to set this side to left. Finally, 
I want to pack the frame. If I run this now, this is kind of working. Although you can see we're not filling the entire space. We could try to set fill to X or to both. Although if I do that, all we're doing is setting the frame on the left side. You might be thinking this is going to be fixed when we set expand to true, but it doesn't. We still get the same result. This happens because of the drawing logic here. To get proper scrolling logic, you unfortunately have to create your own kind of widget. But okay, next up, we get a much more useful widget, and that is called a toast. A toast is a small notification. For example, in the bottom right of the window, you can get a message with some extra information. This is what a toast creates. This one, we once again have to import like the scrolled frame. We do this with TTK bootstrap dot toast import toast notification. I can already see there's a typo here, but other than that, this is okay. To use this widget, we first of all have to create it and store it inside of a variable. Let me call it toast and toast notification. This one doesn't have a master, but we do need to set a title. Let's call it, this is a message title. Besides that, we also need a message itself. I'm gonna call one, this is the actual message. Finally, I want to put all of this over multiple lines because we need one more argument in here. That would be the duration. This tells you how long the toast is going to be on the window. The number you need to specify is going to be in milliseconds, meaning if you want two seconds, you would need two thousands. One second is 1000 milliseconds. That is all you need to get started. The way you are using it is you get the variable that stores the widget and then run show underscore toast. If I run the app now, you can see in the bottom right, we have this is the message and it disappears after two seconds. Although you can see that the entire app disappeared after we have used this. This is a bug that happens if you use this show toast by itself. If I remove it, we are back to the normal window. Essentially what you want to do is to run this toast only if the user presses a button or does a certain kind of action. Only then you are calling it. I want to add TTK and button. The window is the master. For the text, I want to have show toast. Finally, the command is the important bit here. This is going to be toast and show underscore toast. I want to pack this widget straight away without any arguments because we don't need too many. Now if I run this, we have another button, show toast. If I click on it, we now have the message and now the window doesn't disappear anymore when the toast disappears. This covers the basics. I guess we can cover a few more arguments in here, but other than that, this doesn't become any more complicated. We can set a boot style in here. This could, for example, be dark. Let me run it now and show the toast. Now this is dark. We could also set this to warning. And now we get a yellow kind of button. Or, well, not button, but a warning. The one thing you want to be careful about is that this boot style here doesn't support outline. If I run this again, click on show toast, we now get an error that this thing doesn't have an attribute create outline frame style. You can only use the color. There's no other style available. I'm going to stick with dark. I think this one generally looks the best. Finally, there's one more important thing, and that is you can set the position. You have X padding, Y padding, and then the start position. The start position is the really important one. In here, you can set something like Northeast, Northwest, Southeast, or Southwest. These positions would refer to the different corners of your screen. For example, southwest would be the corner down here. Southeast would be down here. We have southeast, southwest, then we have north, east, and we have northwest. These are the different corners you can start with, and then you are using X padding or Y padding to get a bit of offset. For example, if you want to start with the northeast, you would add NE in here. And then you would use these numbers to get an offset. 
Let's actually play around with that. For X padding and Y padding, I want to start with zero so we can focus on the corner. I want to start with northeast. If I run this again now, I click on show toast. Now the message is in the top right. If I set this to northwest, run this again, click on show toast. Now it's in the top left. I'm going to stick with northeast. And for the numbers, I now want to have 50 and 100. This means if I show the toast, we have 100 pixels from the top and 50 pixels from the right. That covers everything there is to know about toast. If you want to read up on it, you can look at the documentation. You can find this here. You want to look at the toast module and this has a couple more arguments. I suppose the one I didn't cover is the alert. This one plays a sound if you are playing it. By default, it is false, and I think that's a better way to go on about it, but if you want your program to be annoying, do play a sound. Ready, next up, we can create a tool tip. This is going to be a very simple message that shows up once we hover over a certain element, like a button, for example. In fact, let's create a button right away with TTK and button. The master here is going to be window for the text. I want to have tool tip button. To make this a bit more fancy, I want to set a boot style. Let's call it warning. This button I want to pack right away. If I run the app now, we have a yellowish, orangeish button. I think the entire thing starts to be a bit crammed, so I'm going to add a bit of vertical padding. Pad Y is going to be 10 for both of the buttons. Running this now, this is looking a little bit better. This button, I now want to have a tooltip once we hover over it. For that, we need one more widget. This we get from the top. As before, we need from TTK Bootstrap, although now we need tool tip. And we want to import tool tip. This is going to give us the widget. Also, I'm gonna minimize a couple of things here. So the entire thing is a bit easier to read. All we have to do for the tool tip is we have to create an object from the class. So call the class itself. In here, we have to set a master and the master is going to be the element that we want to have the tool tip attached to. In my case, that is this button here. So the master is the button. Then we need a certain kind of text. Doesn't really matter what it is. Let's say this does something. If I run this now, I can hover over the button and we get this does something. If I go away from it, it disappears. Right now, this doesn't look too great, but we can style it using boot style. For example, what you could be doing is use light in here. Now we have some other kind of color. I think using danger here might be a bit better. Let's try this one. That kind of works. Now the boot style for tooltip has one specific thing, and that is called inverse. If you attach that one and hover over it, now you get the colors inverted. If we didn't use this, we had red text and I think a black background. With the inverse, we get white text and a red background. Inverse is the only styling you can use though. You couldn't use outline. This one doesn't exist. If I use it, we're getting an error. But I think inverse works really well here. There are three more widgets that we have to cover. The next one is a calendar. This is going to be another widget we have to import in a custom kind of way, like the ones we have used here. Although for this one, we need from TTK Bootstrap dot widgets. From this one, we want to import date entry. This date entry, I want to create and store in a variable right away. Let's call the variable calendar. The value is going to be date entry. This one doesn't need any arguments besides the master. After I have that, I want to pack it right away with some vertical padding. Pad Y, let's go with 10. If I run this, we now have a calendar that shows the current date. If I click on the calendar, I can even select other kinds of dates. I can go further wherever I want. And if I click on the date, we get to the current date. If I select one, we get the new date here and we can extract this one quite easily as well. To do that, let me create a button. I want TTK dot button. 
the window is going to be the parent text is going to be get calendar date the command is going to be some kind of command to print the current date this could be a function but in my case i'm going to add all of this into a lambda function what i want to do is i want to print the calendar Inside of this, we have an entry widget. This we have to target, and on this one, we can use the get method. The calendar is basically a compound widget. The compound here is an entry widget and a frame with a bit of content. All we really care about is the entry itself. Once we have that, I can simply pack the button, run this entire thing, and now if I select a certain kind of date, let's say the 1st of December 2022, I can get the calendar date and we get the 1st of December 2022. I suppose one thing to be aware of here, the calendar has the date first, then the month and then the year. If you are American and you're doing the calendar wrong, just be aware of that. The month is the middle part, not the first bit. That covers the calendar. Next up, we can create a progress bar. Although in TTK Bootstrap, this is called a flat gauge. Once again, we have to import this one. This module lives inside of the widgets. Besides the date entry, I want to import the flood gauge. Once I have that, I can use it. I want to store all of this inside of a variable that I call progress. And here we need TTK and flood gauge. First of all, we need a master, which is going to be the window. Besides that, we can also set a text in here. I will call this one progress so that we have something. After that, I want to pack this progress with some vertical padding. There you can see, we can see something, but this doesn't look too great yet. What you want to be aware of for this flood gauge is that it needs a lot of horizontal space. In my case, I want to fill the X and there we go. Now we can see this progress properly. Although right now, all we can see is a plain background. To make it actually work, we need a tkinter variable. Let me create this one at the top. I want to have, I'm going to call this a progress integer. This is going to be a tk int var with a default value of 50. This value we now have to attach to the progress, which we can do by setting a variable. Progress integer. If I run this now, there you can see we have some proper progress bar. If you update this integer, the value in here is also going to update. For example, what you could be doing is to create another slider with TTK and scale. The parent is going to be window. We want to go from zero to 100 with the variable of progress integer. I want to pack this one right away. If I run this now, I can use this slider to update the progress bar, which is working pretty well. This flood gauge also accepts a few more arguments. I will put all of the arguments over multiple lines, so this is a bit easier to read. One obvious argument we can use here is boot style. This could, for example, be info, now we get a different kind of color. Well, not that different. We could also use danger. Now it's red. Other than that, the really interesting argument in here is called a mask. This one is overwriting the text by default. Let me call this one mask for now. If I run this now, we can see mask. So this isn't too useful. However, what you can do, if you add curly braces in here, TTK Bootstrap is going to add the variable number in here right away. Which means if I run this now, we get mask 50. And if I play around with the slider, we get the number here updated right away. Which means I could, for example, add a percentage sign afterwards. And this makes it very easy to get a percentage as well as a visual indicator in terms of where you are on the progress. Those are the main arguments. Obviously, you can read up on it on the documentation. I haven't opened this one. Let's do it right away. Inside of the documentation, you want to look at the widgets module. In here, we have flood gauge. If I open this one, you can see a nice preview. And if you go a bit further down, you can see all of the arguments you could be using. There are quite a few, actually. We are very nearly done. There's only one more widget that I really want to cover, and that is the meter. This one looks like this. 
in here, we have lots of different things that we could be using. All of these arguments. This is going to be your exercise. What I want you guys to do is to figure this widget out yourself. In my case, I have a meter that's something like this. It's a red color. We have a full circle and we can see the numbers straight away. Try to read through this page and see if you can implement this one yourself. Back in the code, the first thing that we have to do is to import the widget. Since it happens inside of the widgets, from here, I want to import meter. Now that we can use it, all the way at the bottom, I want to add a meter. I'm going to store it inside of a meter variable and we create it with TTK and meter. Since we are going to use quite a few arguments, I'm going to start over multiple lines right away. The first argument, as always, is the master, which is going to be the window. For now, this is all we need. So I'm going to pack this thing, run this, and there we go. We have a meter that right now doesn't do anything. To actually use it, we have to first of all create an amount total. I want this to be 100. This is the maximum value. After that, we want to have amount used. This is the starting value, and the minimum is always zero. Let's say for this one, amount used should be 10. Running this now, we can see we already have a basic start. That being said, if I'm trying to click on it, nothing is going to happen. To make something happen, we have to set interactive to true. Now I can click on it and move this thing around. Other than that, you have lots of different arguments you could be using. For example, we have the meter type. This could be either full, that I believe is the default. Alternatively, you can use semi. With that, you get a semicircle that otherwise still works the same. You can also customize the text or add a subtext. Let's go with some other text. Now we get some other text, although the functionality doesn't change. You can also set the boot style. This works with literally every widget. I used danger for this one. This is giving us a red color. These are the basic arguments I think you want to use most of the time, although there are quite a few more. You could, for example, set the stripe thickness, you could show the text or not show the text, you could set the meter thickness, and lots of other things you can work with. You have a ton of options in here. And well, with that, we have covered quite a bit of stuff and this video is getting a bit long. So let's finish it here. A really important part of good looking user interfaces are animated widgets. So what we're going to make is this app here. Inside of that, I have a button. If I click on it, we have an animated sidebar. This has a button and it has a text field where I can write over multiple lines. If I write too many lines, we get a scroll bar. All of this is quite easily implemented. On top of that, we can also do all of this in light mode. We have the same sidebar, although now it's looking a bit brighter, but with the same functionality. So let's cover some theory first. In Tkinter, you can create animated widgets, but you do not have pre-built components for it. As a consequence, you have to make your own systems. For that, you need two major concepts. The first one is the after method. This one allows you to call a function after a certain amount of time. This you combine either with the layout methods or with configure. Those can update the position, the size, the text, the color of any widget. To go into a bit more detail, widgets can be updated in real time using either configure or the layout methods. For example, if you're calling a layout method multiple times, the current one overwrites the previous one. If we're calling button place once with X being 10 and Y being 50, and then call it again with 210, only the second one will be displayed. The previous one will simply be removed. That way, you can update the position and the size of a widget in real time. On top of that, you can use configure to update the text, the font, the colors, and all the stuff you can update inside of configure. I'm going to play around with this in just a second, but there's one more thing I do want to talk about, and that is when you're animating widgets, you want to use place, at least when it comes to the layouts, for the simple reason that only place can give you pixel by pixel positions. Imagine using the grid method for animations. Inside of the grid, you can only specify the current cell we are working in. 
you couldn't move a widget by one pixel to the right. Only place can do that, so we have to use it for animations. That being said, you could totally use grid for animations, it just wouldn't look good. This gives us a couple of concepts I want to practice already. I am using custom Tkinter to make all of this look good, but all of this would also work with the normal TTK apps. After that, I'm creating a window and I have one button. The one notable thing about this button is that for the X position, which we are placing with the place method, we are storing the position inside of a variable and this we're passing in here. We're going to work with this position in just a second. Finally, we are calling window.mainloop to run the entire app, which means if I'm doing that, we have a window with one button that doesn't do anything right now. To influence it, I need to run some kind of function, which I'm doing when the button is pressed. Let's call the function move button. This function we have to create, move btn. There are no need for parameters. And in here, we can use the place method or the configure on the button to update the button itself. Let's start with the place method itself because I want to move the button to the right every time we are pressing it. Since I want to use button X for that, I need to be able to influence this variable. In my case, I'm going to set it as a global variable using the global keyword. Once I have that, I want to simply increase button X by let's say 0.05 every single time we're pressing the button. To make sure that this is working, let's print button X as soon as we are pressing the button. Now, if I'm pressing the button, we get 0.05, 0.06, some weird stuff with floating point numbers, but that isn't going to make a difference. This number we can now use inside of the place method. Let me actually copy it. I want to place the button one more time with this button X. The difference now compared to the original is that button X becomes larger every single time. Let's try it. Now, if I click on toggle sidebar, it always moves a tiny bit further to the right. The numbers are quite large and we only move when we are clicking, but this is the first step to understand animations. Besides relative X and relative Y, you could also work with relative height, let's say. I guess we can use button X in here again. If I run this now, every time I'm clicking, the button gets a tiny bit larger. I think I should set button X for the starting height as well. I want to have rel height, it's going to be button X. Now if I run this, we start with a much larger button and every time I click, the button gets larger and moves to the right. You could also just use X and Y here, that would be perfectly fine. All of the animations work either with absolute or with relative numbers. That would cover the layout methods. Besides that, we can also use config or rather configure. For example, what we could be doing is declare a couple of random colors. Let's say red, yellow, pink, and green. Every time we are clicking on the button, I want to give the widget a new color. For that, I need some randomness, which means from random import choice. Every time I'm clicking the button, I want to get a color, let's call it color, and the value is going to be choice of colors. That way, let me print it really quick. I want to have my color, and I click on the button, we get one of the colors. Okay, we just got really unlucky in the beginning. I'm gonna add a few more colors in here so we have a bit more variety, like so. Now if I run this, we get much more randomness. That we can use to configure the button. For example, we could run button.configure. The argument in here, since we are using custom tkinter, would be FG color to get the actual button color. And this I want to set to the color. If I run this thing again, and now if I click on the button and move away from it, we can see we get different colors after every single click. If you were using normal tkinter, this FG color wouldn't work. You would need to use the default styling options, which are quite limited, which is why I'm using custom tkinter. It makes all of this much easier. But well, with that, we can update a widget in real time. What we now have to figure out is how to make Tkinter do all of the work for the animation for us. For that, we have to learn one more concept. That concept is after. And after can call a function after a certain amount of time. This one would look like this. It always has to be part of the window. We specify two arguments, the amount of time and then the function we want to call. The amount of time here is in milliseconds. 
Since 1000 milliseconds are one second, this number here would be one second. What is really important is that this can be circular. A function that is called with after can contain after itself. In this case, we could have a function like this. After one second, we are calling this function here. Then we are printing test and then we are running the function again. As a consequence, this function will run forever. Let's play around with this one actually. I want to create another function. I will call this one infinite print. Doesn't need any parameters. In here, I simply want to print, I suppose infinite is appropriate in here. This I want to start whenever we are pressing on the button. Meaning if I run this now, the button only prints infinite. But what we can do now is run window after, then we need the time and the function we want to call. Let's say after one second, so 1000 milliseconds, I want to run infinite print again. If I run this now, I can click on toggle sidebar. We get infinite once and after one second, we get it again and again and again and again. This is never going to stop. For animations, one second is quite long, but you could set this to even one millisecond. Now if I click on it, we get a whole bunch of infinites. I suppose 100 milliseconds is a good middle ground here. While we are doing this infinitely right now, you could also control this, for example, with an if statement. To keep on using button X, we could check if button X is smaller than 10 and only then run this. To make that work, we have to update button X. For that, I want to set button X as a global variable again and then increase it by a certain amount. Button X plus equal Let's say 0 0.5. Only if the if statement now is the case, I want to print infinite and to make sure that we see what's going on, I also want to print button X. Let's run this one now. If I click on the button, we get infinite, but only up to 9.5. Then the thing stops. With that, all we have to do is combine this function with this function to get an animated button, which is bringing us to one exercise already. I want you guys to animate the button so that it moves to the right side of the window after we are pressing it. If you combine this function and this function, this should be fairly easy to do. Pause the video now and see if you can figure this one out. First of all, I want to work inside of this function here. For that, when I'm pressing the button, I want to call the move button function. On top of that, I don't want to change the height of the button, meaning I'm just going to remove the relative height both inside of the function and when I'm creating the button in the first place. That way, we are only focusing on one bit at a time. With that, we can actually count to the animation. Inside of the move button for now, I am declaring a global button X, I am increasing button X, and then I'm calling button.place. So if I run this, we are moving the button a tiny bit to the side and we're also changing the color. I guess we should remove this one because that would be quite confusing. The issue we have right now is after we're clicking the button, nothing happens. But instead, what we want to do is call this function one more time. Or well, not just one more time, but until we are reaching the right side of the window. For that, I want to use the after method. I want to run window and then after. I want to get an update every 100 milliseconds and I want to call move button. With that, I can run this thing and we get some kind of animation. It's really choppy right now and it doesn't stop. The choppiness we can fix very easily. All we have to do is reduce this number and this number. I only want to update the position by 0.01 units and I want to update this thing every 10 milliseconds. If I run this now, this is a much smoother animation. To control it a little bit better, what we can do is use an if statement that if button.x, let's say is smaller than 0.9. Only if that is the case, I want to call the after method. If I run this now, the button is going to move. We have to wait a tiny bit. At some point, it should stop. There we go. Now it's stopping on the right side of the window. This isn't perfect, but I think for now it's good enough. So that covers basic animations. Obviously, this doesn't look very good. So let's make a good looking animated widget. What I want to create is some kind of slide panel. I want to create something like this where we can click on a button and then we have a side panel. 
This doesn't have to be on the right, it could also be on the left, it's quite flexible. This, first of all, has to inherit from CTK and frame. I forgot this CTK at the beginning. That way, we are simply creating a frame. When I'm calling the thunder init method, we now need a couple of arguments. The obvious one is self, and we need a parent. Other than that, we need a start position and an end position. The animation will then move between these two. Once we have that, as always, we need the super init method, and we have to set the master to the parent. I forgot the brackets here. After that, I want to create some general attributes. Basically what that means, I want to store the start position as the start position as an attribute. The same I want to do for the end position. End position like so. Other than that, I need the width of this thing. Self.width. The width I want to generate automatically. This is going to be the window. I want the widget to start here at position 0.0. .0. For the simple reason that by default the side panel should be on this side. If however the user clicks the button, I want this thing to slide to the left, let's say to position 0.3. The demos you have seen was the panel moving to the right, but in this case I want to move to the left. This thing is flexible though, both would work just fine with the same widget. But first of all, we need to generate the width, and the width we get from this distance here. That number we get with the start position minus the end position, and all of this needs to be absolute. The reason why this needs to be absolute, let me print the width self.width and create the widget. This, by the way, needs to happen before we create the button. Animated widget. I want to create an animated panel, which is going to be the slide panel. For this one, the master is going to be the window, the start position is going to be 0, and the end position is going to be 0 0.3, although this one has to be negative. Running this now, we get an error because I am incapable of typing, this should be an uppercase T. Now if we run this, we get 0 0.3. This is a proper width, but if we didn't use absolute numbers in here, we would still get 0 0.3, but if we used other numbers, this might be a negative number. For example, if I want to start my widget on 0.7, so somewhere on the right side, and then move it to 1, then we would get a negative number. Since this would create a negative width, we would get some weird results. As a consequence, always use absolute values in here. Also, spell them correctly, that tends to help. With that, we get positive numbers. The floating point weirdness here, you can just ignore. It's not going to make a difference. So, with that, we have a proper width, which means we can actually place the thing. I'm going to use self.place. Let me add a comment here as well. I want to get relative x. That would be self.start position. Relative y would be 0. Then we have the relative width. That would be self.width. And finally, I want to have relative height which for now would be one. Now if I run this, we have a sidebar all the way on the right. It's kind of hard to see right now, but it is the brighter stuff here, all of this. To make sure that this is a bit more visible, I want to set an FG color to, let's go with red. Now if I run this, this is much more visible. On top of that, to move the panel to the left side, I want to change these numbers back to zero and negative 0 0.3. That way, now the panel starts on the left because the start position is zero, so this self start position is zero. With that, we need a few more things. All of these numbers are for the animation itself, so animation logic. First of all, we have to track the position itself. By default, this will be the start position. This will become important in just a bit. Besides that, I want to toggle self.in start position. By default, this should be true. This is going to be a switch, and it is going to track if our widget is in the start position or not in the start position. If it is in the start position, we want to move towards the end position. If it is not in the start position, we want to move towards the start position. Which basically means this thing is going to determine the direction. We can use this right away, actually, because I want to create another method that I call animate. 
we need self and nothing else in here. And all I want to do is if self dot in start position, then I want to self dot animate or ward. If that is not the case, meaning else, I want to run self dot animate backwards. These two methods are what actually creates the animation. So let's start with animate forward. Define animate forward. What I want to do in here is first of all, I need an if statement. If self dot position is greater than self dot end position. I should probably draw while doing all of this. This one here would be our window, a bit squashed. The start position right now is this point, zero. This would be our start position, or rather this one here. Besides that, we have the end position. The end position right now is somewhere here, negative 0.3. That is a horrible three, that's looking better. Finally, we have a position, this position here. At the start, this is on the start position, meaning it's here. This position, I'm going to move a tiny bit further to the left every time we are calling animate forward. However, I'm only going to do that until we reach negative 0.3. For that, we have this if statement here. We are only going to move the position to the left until we are reaching the end position. If that is the case though, I want to update self.position and reduce it by 0.008. The number here is fairly subjective. It basically determines the animation speed. Just choose whatever you think looks good. Once we have that, we can run self.place again. Let me copy the numbers actually from up here because we can reuse quite a bit. For the X position, we now don't need start position. We just want the position. Relative Y, relative width and relative height can stay identical. Finally, what we are going to need is self dot after. I want to run another function after 10 milliseconds. The function I want to run is self dot animate forward. With that, we should already have something. Let me run the entire thing again. And now if I click on toggle sidebar, we are moving the button to the right. And that is because the button still gets the move button function. This I want to change. I want to get my animated panel in here, I want to run a method. The method I want to run is this animate, which means animated panel dot animate. Now let's try this again. If I now click on toggle sidebar, this thing is moving to the left. Although if I click on it again, nothing is going to happen. And to make it a bit easier to see what's going on, let me update these numbers here. Let's say to 0 0.3 and 0 0.1. Now if I run this again, this thing is much more in the middle, and if I move it to the left, now it only moves up to 0.1. I hope you can follow the logic here. I am going to stick with the original numbers, like so. And now we can keep on working on this. First of all, once we are reaching this position, which means an else statement will be triggered, I want to set self.in start position to false. That way, once we're clicking on the button again, we would run animate backwards. This we now have to create, define animate backwards. This one also doesn't need any parameters besides self. And now we have to do basically the same thing we have done here. As a consequence, I can just copy the entire code and paste it in here and make some updates. First of all, self.position, we only want to run if the number is smaller than self.end position. Actually, this should be the start position. The reason for that, let me draw all of this actually again. We have the window one more time. And again, we have the start position at zero and the end position at negative 0.3. Right now, the position when we are calling this method here is going to be on negative 0.3. And we want to move it a bit further to the right every time we are calling the method. However, we only want to call it until we reach the starting position, this line here. That is covered with this if statement. If that is the case, I want to increase the start position by the same amount. You could use a different number in here, but you probably don't want to. After that, you're calling place, although after now is animate backwards instead of forwards. 
Finally, if that is not the case anymore, instart position should be true again. With that, we should have a basic animation. If I now run this, I can toggle this and we have an animated sidebar. That's looking pretty good. Although right now it doesn't look very good. Let me run it again. All we get is a red frame that we can move, but it doesn't have any content and, well, generally I want to make this thing look a bit better. First of all, I want to have a gap between the frame itself and between the surrounding. This I do with relative y and relative height. For example, I could set the relative height to 0 0.0.05 and then the relative height is going to be 0 0.9. Running this now, we get a gap between the top and the bottom, while the frame itself is still in the middle. Besides that, for the start position, we can increase this by a tiny amount, let's say 0 0.1. Now if I run this again, we have, that's quite a large gap, let's go with 0 0.05, that's looking a bit better. The toggling itself still works, although we have to make a few more updates here. The problem, if I run this again, once I click on toggle sidebar, we are covering the entire height. So this we can change already. I want to copy all of these numbers here. And now when I'm calling place in here and in here, so animate forward, and animate backwards, I want to have these updated numbers. That way, this is looking a bit better. Although there's a small jump in the beginning, and that is because of this. We are setting the position to zero because we're getting start position from the parameters, but not from the updated value here. We can fix that by setting self.startPosition. And now this is much smoother. That being said, I think this is a tiny bit large. Let's go with 0 0.04. That's looking a bit better. Once again, you can play around with these numbers. It's entirely up to you. They're quite subjective. What is much more important though, I don't want to have a red background color. Instead, I want to minimize the side panel and work with the animated panel. What is really important to understand now is that this side panel is simply a frame, which means we can place any other widget inside of it and it would still work the same. For example, I could create a CTK and CTK label with the parent being the animated panel. After that, I can set some text. Let's call it label one, like so. And this I want to pack right away. Although any other layout method would also work just fine. I want to set expand to true, fill to both. And on top of that, I want to add a bit of pad X. Let's go with two and pad Y with 10. If I run this now, we have label one covering the entire frame. The rest still works just fine. I can do this again and change it to label two, run this again, and now we have two labels in here. The same thing would also work with another widget, let's say with a button. I simply called this one button. If I run this now, we have a button all the way at the bottom. Although the padding here looks a bit weird. Especially X padding doesn't work particularly well in here, but Y padding I think still works just fine. Yeah, that looks okay. On top of that, for this button, I want to remove the corner radius, so I'm going to set it to zero. Now, this is looking much better. Finally, one more widget that we can use that I don't think I have used yet is called CTK and then CTK text box. This is a text box with the parent being the animated panel. And this I want to pack as well with expand being true and fill being both. Now if I run this, we have a text box that we can type in. Although the background color here doesn't really fit. To update that, we have to set inside of the widget the FG color. The colors here should cover both the light mode and the dark mode. The colors we need are this. Now if I run this, we have no more background color, so this is looking much better. Although this might be very hard to see and it's a tiny detail, but in the bottom left, we have a sharp corner like this. Whereas in the top left, we have a round corner. This happens because now this text box has sharp corners and is overshadowing the frame. 
Unfortunately, we cannot cut this off, but what we can do is set vertical padding. So pad Y and set it to 10. Now we have a rounded corner because the text box widget only reaches to this point here. We have a text box that works over multiple lines. It's looking pretty good. We can still use it just fine. We are making a lot of progress. On top of that, since we have two different colors, we could also update the theme. So what I could be doing is CTK and then set appearance mode to light. And I can run this again. And we still have the same outcome with colors that look consistent. The animation, once again, still works just fine. Although I do prefer the dark mode, but choose whatever you like. With that, we are nearly done. There's one more thing that we have to do, and that is to make this slide panel a tiny bit more flexible. So if I run this again, I can click on the button and all of this works just fine. However, I want the system to work a tiny bit different. What I want to have is that by default, this panel here is all the way on the right and not visible to the user. Only once we click toggle sidebar, then it should be on the right side, like so. This, by the way, if I run the demo again, this is what I want to have at the end. By default, I can't see anything on the right. Only if I click on toggle sidebar, we get the sidebar window, and then I can remove it again. So by default, it shouldn't be visible. For that, we have to make a few updates, although none are too difficult. As a consequence, we can add a second exercise. What I want you guys to do is to update the panel so it moves in from the right. You would have to figure out a couple of things, but pause the video now and see if you can figure this one out. First of all, I want to update the positions. My start position should be 1.0, so the app isn't visible, and the end position should be 0 0.7. If I run the app now, we can't see anything because the actual frame now is roughly here. What is even better, if I click on the button, this still works just fine, which is a really nice start, which means now we can work a bit more inside of the button to fix some minor things. First of all, when I'm running this thing, you can see on the right side, we are losing the gap. This one is very, very narrow. To account for that, for the end position, I also want to add, let's say 0 0.04. Now, if I run this again, we have the gap back. Although again, it's a bit large. Let's make this smaller, say 0 0.03. That I think looks better. Once again, these numbers are fairly subjective. Just choose whatever you like. We have a pretty good app. This is working just fine. I guess the one thing you want to be aware of here is that the starting position always has to be to the right of the end position. Because in our case, animate forward reduces the amount and animate backwards increases the amount which means forward in our case is always left and backwards is always going to the right. Although this video is already getting quite long, so this you can implement yourself, it shouldn't be too hard. Another really important part for good looking user interfaces are images. In Tkinter, you can add images to some widgets. Labels, buttons and canvas is what you're going to use most of the time. That being said, for images that scale properly, you will need to create the logic yourself. So the scaling logic doesn't come with tkinter. That is something you have to make yourself. On that note, what I haven't mentioned yet, what we're going to create is going to be this one here. We have two buttons, one with TTK and one with custom tkinter. And then we have a raccoon. And this raccoon, we can scale and it's always going to cover the appropriate area. This kind of logic you have to make yourself. It doesn't work by default. Now, before we can do all of this, we have to do one more thing. And that is, we always need the Pillow library to use images. Pillow is the default Python image library. This one you have to install on your own, first of all. This you do either with the PowerShell or with the terminal. In my case, this is the PowerShell. What you have to type is pip install 
below. This is going to install quite a few things. Obviously, if you're on a Mac and using terminal, this would be pip3 install pillow. Once you have that, we can start working on some code. For the starting setup, I am importing tkinter and ttk. On top of that, I am importing custom tkinter. We are going to use both because they have slightly different setups for importing images. After that, we are creating the basic tkinter window and then we are running the main loop. The end result is going to be a basic window. Before we can start properly, we have to do one more thing. And that is we want from PIL import image and image TK. PIL is the pillow we just installed. For some reason, the import here is a different name compared to the import in the PowerShell or the terminal. PIL stands for Python Image Library. And somehow thought it'd be cute to call it pillow. I don't understand it either. It's quite weird. But this is how you would import it. Inside of pillow, you have one really important object, and that is called image. You basically always use that one. And image has a custom tkinter variant that is called image tk. On that note, I have made a really long tutorial on pillow itself. It's on YouTube. You can watch it for free. You can use pillow for all sorts of things, like scaling images, changing colors, adding text, and, well, lots of other things. So check it out if you are interested. Although for this video, I just want to import an image. To make that work, first of all, I need to cover our folder structure. Right now, I have one folder and this folder contains the code. The code file here is called images. In this folder, I have three more images. I have Python Dark, Python Light, and Raccoon. Those are the images I want to import. For the import, first of all, we need to import the image itself. So image, let's call it original. This we get with image.open. And now we need the file path. Since I want to import, let's start with the raccoon. I want to import raccoon and the file ending here is JPEG. With that, we have an image. So I can run the code. We're not getting an error. That's looking pretty good. Now I have to figure out how to get this image on a widget. For that, first of all, we need a widget. To get started, I just want to create a label. And this can be TTK label. The parent is going to be window. The text could be, let's go with raccoon. And let's pack the label. There we go, we have raccoon. A label can also take an image. Although what we cannot do is simply pass in the original image in there. We will get an error that the image specification must contain an odd number of elements. I don't know what that specifically means, but basically what tkinter wants is an image tk, not an image. We can account for that quite easily. I want to store this in another variable. I'll call it image tk. This image tk we create with image tk dot photo image. You only need one argument. That is the image original. With that, we can pass in image tk into the image and it should be working. There we go. The problem we have right now is that the image is way, way too large. For reference, the raccoon has a size of 6000 by 4000, while our window is only 600 by 400. So we can only see a very small part of this window right now, but we can resize the image. This we do when we are importing the image. This image here is returning an image object. This image object has a couple of methods. The one we care about right now is called resize. Resize wants a tuple with a new size and a new width. Let's say for now, I want to cover the entire window with the image. This would be 600 by 400. With that, we have the raccoon covering the entire image. Although if I resize the window, this breaks quite fast. But at the very least, we do have a start. Unfortunately, though, you basically never want to use an image inside of a label for the simple reason that you cannot resize the image if the window changes. You always have the same image size depending on what you get from here. To change that, you need quite a bit more logic. So I am going to cover that later on. Let me get rid of the resize and comment out the label. Running this again, we have a plain window, but we do have an imported image. Before I explain the logic on how to use images, I want to cover buttons.
because buttons are very easily usable with images. Let's say I want to create a button. This is going to be TTK dot button. The parent here is going to be the window. And for text, we can go with a button. This button I want to pack right away. Now we have a button. This button can also accept an image. I could add image TK. Now we have the raccoon again, but remember the raccoon is way too large. But the raccoon is not what I want to add to this button. Instead, I want to import a different image. That image is going to be Python dark, which we get with image.open. The name of the file is called Python underscore dark dot PNG. Important here, we have a different file ending because Python dark has alpha values, so we need a PNG. This once again, we have to convert. Let me call it Python dark TK. For that, we need all of this. I can simply copy it like so and paste in Python dark. This Python dark TK, I now want to use for the button like so. And this is still way too large. Although I guess a little bit better. Since the button isn't going to change size, for this one, it is fine to simply resize the button here, and then you don't have to worry about it anymore. In my case, I want to resize the button to a size of, let's go with 30 by 30. Now, we have a button with a Python logo. To see the text again, we need a compound argument. If I, for example, set right here, we now have a button and then the logo to the right. This can also be left. And then we have the image to the left of the button. For a bit more spacing, you could do a tiny bit of a hack here and simply add some spaces for the button. And now you get a bit more spacing between the two. However, if I duplicate all of this and change the button to, let me call it a button CTK, because I want to create CTK.CTK button. For that one, we are getting an error. That photo image object has no attribute create scaled photo image. Once again, I'm not quite sure what that means, but the concept you have to understand is that you couldn't use an image TK, this one here, inside of a CTK widget. Instead, what you would need to do is create a separate CTK image. This you get with CTK and CTK image. This is what you have to pass into a CTK widget if you want to have images. I'm going to store this one in an image CTK variable. The reason why this is different is because for custom tkinter, we always need a light image and we need a dark image. Those we have to import separately, but other than that, we are using it the same way. How you usually want to do this? Let me put it over multiple lines actually. What you can do with the import here is simply use image open as the argument. For example, I could paste image open Python dark in here. And then for the dark theme, I want to have Python light. This might look confusing here. Basically, you want the dark image for the light theme and the light image for the dark theme. For the simple reason that light image has a light background, so you want to have a dark image. And then the other way around is going to work the same. With that, we have an image CTK, and this is what you want to pass into this image. Now I can run this, and there we go. We have a Python logo for a button that is bright right now. If you were using custom tkinter and had a light and a dark theme, this would also cover the dark theme. Although since I am using tkinter by itself, this isn't really applicable, but it would definitely work. With that, we can actually cover how to use tkinter with images. The major problem that you have in tkinter with images is that images do not scale by default. We could have as large or as small of a window or any kind of container. The image, unless you add some custom code, is not going to update, which would break any kind of layout really fast. To account for that, we have to add an image to a canvas and then use the canvas dimension to update the size of the image. That we can do in real time, although we have to figure out a few mathy things in here. It's not going to be too bad. Although once we have that, we can add an image to a container and always make the image scale to that container. And before I start, I want to create a different kind of layout. I want to have a grid where those two buttons are on the left, and then on the right, we have the actual image. For that, I'm going to put it up here. I want to create a grid layout. I want to get window 
column configure. In here, I want to have zero, one, two, three, in total four columns that all have a weight of one, and I want them to be uniform, like so. So uniform is equal to A. Besides that, I only want to have one row. So row is just going to be zero. Uniform, we can just ignore for that. The image imports can stay the same, although for the buttons, we have to update them because we're using pack, but now we have a grid. As a consequence, I want to put both buttons inside of a frame. I'm going to call this button frame, and this is ttk.frame with the window as the parent. Both of the buttons are going to be mastered to this button frame. Finally, I want to place the button frame using the grid method. I want column to be zero. I want the row to be zero. And then I want to have sticky with north, south, east, and west. If I run this again now, there we go. We have the two buttons all the way in the top left. I think to make this look a tiny bit nicer, we can give both a bit of vertical padding, let's say 10 pixels. Now there's a bit of space between the two. With that, I can create the canvas for the image. This is simply going to be a canvas, so tk.canvas. The parent is going to be the window, and for now, this is all we are going to need. This canvas, I want to place right away. Canvas.grid. This is going to be column one. Column span is going to be three. We are covering all of the remaining columns. Finally, row is going to be zero. Also, I want this to be sticky to all four sides. If I run this now, we can't see anything because we don't have a background color, which I can change quite easily. Background, let's set it to red. And there we go. Now we can see the canvas itself. However, the canvas doesn't cover everything perfectly. For example, at the bottom here, we have this very thin line. Same on the right side, and we would have the same on this side and this side as well. This we have because of the border of the canvas. We can get rid of it though. All we have to do is set BD to zero. Then we need high light thickness and set this to zero as well. Finally, the relief should be rich. With these numbers, the canvas is now going to cover the entire area and we have no border. Also, let me set this to black so it looks a bit better. There we go. On this canvas, we can now add an image. This we do with canvas.create image. For the arguments here, we need an X and a Y position. I'm going to set it to zero and zero, which is the top left. And then we need an image. This needs to be a TK image, which in my case for the raccoon, I have image TK. Image TK, now if I run this, we can see one eye of the raccoon. What we could also do in here is set the anchor. By default, we're placing the center anchor like this, but I want to place the northwest. Now we can see a top part of the image again, but it doesn't do very much. The way you have to think about it is that the entire image starts here and then goes really, really wide to the right and to the bottom. I believe the numbers were six by 4,000, so much larger than our window. To account for that, we have to dynamically resize the image. I don't want to create the image right away. Instead, I want to do all of this inside of a function. This function, I'm going to trigger every time we are changing the size of the window. This we get with canvas.bind. In here, we need configure. This is going to trigger every time the size of the canvas changes. If that changes, I want to run a function. The simplest for the image is stretch image. You're going to see in a second what this one is going to do. But let me create it first of all. All the way at the top, I want to create stretch image. In here, since we are working with an event, we need one default argument, and that is the event. What we are going to do in here is we are going to get the size of the canvas, and then we are going to scale the image to that size. Finally, then we can actually place the image. For that, though, first of all, we need to get the window size. 
or more specifically, let me call it size, we want to get the width and we want to get the height. The width is going to be event.width and the height is going to be event.height. If I print both of those numbers, we have width and we have height. Now if I run this, we are calling this function and if I resize the image, we get updated numbers. So this is working quite well. Just to make sure now the thing is really narrow and very, very small, but now it's much larger. So the numbers seem to be pretty accurate. These numbers we can now use to create an image. Although what is really important, you already want to have one image imported and you only resize it when you resize the entire window. You do not want to re-import the image every single time you are resizing the window. That would be really inefficient. In my case though, I already have one image imported. This is what I want to work with. I want to store all of this inside of a new variable. I'm going to call this resized image. We need the image original and then resize it. Since resize wants to have a tuple with a width and a height, this is quite easy because we already have width and height. Although this is still just an image, but we need an image TK. We need another variable, let me call it resized TK. This is going to be image TK dot photo image. The same thing I have done down here, except now the one argument is going to be the resized image. Finally, this we can place on the canvas. For that, all we need is canvas.create image. The start position here is going to be zero and zero. The image I want to place is resized TK. Finally, the anchor is going to be northwest. Now if I run this, we only get a black background color. So something didn't go well. The problem is that the image TK, this line here, always has to be in the same scope as the main loop or wherever you call it. In our case, an easy fix here would be to set resized TK as a global variable. Resized TK, and now we can see the raccoon. So just to reiterate, we have our window in the global scope and we are also calling window.main loop in the global scope. Because of that, the image TK needs to be in the global scope as well. They always have to be in the same. And once again, I have no idea why. But with that, we have the image of a raccoon. And if I resize the window, the raccoon resizes with it because we are updating the size of the window every single time we're updating the canvas, which is working, but you can see a limitation here. We are stretching the raccoon quite a bit. To account for that, I want to create a second function. I'm going to call this one fill image. This one is not going to resize the image. Instead, we are going to fill the entire image and we're going to cut off parts of the image that don't fit. What we are going to do for this one, let me explain it first before I create a function. Let's say this one here is the canvas and the image might be as large as this bit here. Inside of this function, if the image is larger than the canvas, we are going to cut off this bit and this bit. That way, the raccoon is going to keep the same aspect ratio. Later on, we will create a third function that will keep the raccoon always inside of the canvas. But for now, let's fill the entire canvas. For that, once again, the one parameter I need is the event. I want to have global resized TK. Now, in here, we first of all need to get the current ratio of the event. Or of the canvas, the same thing. This we get, I want to store it in a variable, canvas ratio. All we need here is event.width divided by event.height. This number is really important and we need it both for the canvas and we need it for the image we have imported, this image here. This we can also get quite easily. I want to store it in a variable, let me call it image ratio. To get the width and the height, we need image original dot size. This is returning a tuple with the width and the height, which means the width is going to be zero. And this I want to divide by the height, so size one. If I print all of this image ratio, this one, 
we get 1.5. That number we get if I open the folder again, the raccoon has a size of 6000 by 4000 pixels. Dividing 6000 by 4000 gets us 1.5. This number is really important because it tells us how we are going to scale the image itself. For some context here, let me do all of this actually on a separate surface. Imagine we have a perfect square where all sides are one. If that was the case, and we would divide the width by the height, we would get one. This is telling us that we have a perfect square. If we have some kind of rectangle with a width of two and a height of one, in that case, we would divide 2 by 1, which would give us 2. Which tells us that the larger that this number gets, the wider the entire thing is. By the same logic, if we have a really narrow container, something like this, where we have a height of 1 and a width of 0 0.5, that is a horrible 5, 0 0.5, then we would do 0 0.5 divided by 1, which would be 0 0.5, which means the smaller this ratio becomes, the more narrow our container is going to be. This applies both to the canvas and to the image itself. This information we can use. So in our case, we know the ratio of the image and of the canvas. What we want to do, imagine this one here is the canvas or C in short. This we want to compare with the image itself or the aspect ratio of the image. Let's say this could be something like this. This would be I for image. If the canvas has an aspect ratio of let's say 1.8 with the image having an aspect ratio of 1.5, we know that the canvas is wider than the image. If that is the case, I want to scale the width of the image to the width of the canvas which right now would simply stretch out the image. So this wouldn't be particularly useful. However, since I know the aspect ratio of the image, I can simply use the width and then combine it with the aspect ratio to get a new height of this image. Even if I resize the entire canvas, I would fill the entire width and then the top and the bottom part of the raccoon, so the parts that are outside of the image are simply going to be cut off. I hope all of this makes sense. The math here isn't particularly difficult, but you have to get your head around it. I think if I implement all of this, this is going to make a bit more sense. What I really want to figure out is I want to get the coordinates of my image, which means ultimately I want to get a width for the image and I want to get the height of the image. Although for these images, first of all, I want to know if the canvas ratio is greater than the image ratio. If that is the case, we know that the canvas is wider than the image. If that is the case, I want the width of the image to be the event width. That way we are filling the entire width of the canvas. There's one thing that tkinter is a bit fussy here, and that is that we always need to have integers. A very easy thing to account for. Once we have that width, Let's say for some imaginary numbers, the width of the canvas could be 800. On top of that, we know that the image ratio is 1.5. These two numbers we can now use to calculate the new height of the image. All we have to do for that is rearrange this formula here. Initially, we got the canvas ratio, but now we want to have the height, this height here. This we get by getting event.width or the width of the image itself, this width here, and then divide it by the image ratio. This also needs to be an integer. Let me remove the white space. This information we can now use because with that we can create a resized image, which is going to be the image original. And then I want to resize it with the width and the height. After that, we can create a resized TK, which is just going to be image tk.photo image with the resized image. Finally, there's one more thing we have to cover. We still want to get canvas and create image. Although now for the X and the Y position, we want to place the image right in the middle of the canvas. 
all we really have to do is get event.width, that is the width of the canvas, and divide it by two. Tkinter, or the canvas more specifically, wants to have an integer. This we can do again for the y position. I simply want to divide the height of the canvas by two. Finally, besides that, I want to set an anchor. The anchor is going to be the center. Once we have all of that, ideally over multiple lines, so it's easier to read, we can place the image itself. The image is going to be resized TK. Now if I run this, we can see the raccoon and the raccoon scales with the canvas because I forgot to actually call fill image whenever we are resizing all of this. Now, if I run all of this again, we are getting an error because by default, this if statement here is not true. To account for that, let me change it to else with width being one and height being one as well. So we get at least something. With that, we can't see anything. However, if I make this less tall, there we go. We can now see the raccoon at least under certain aspect ratios. But if I make this smaller, at some point it disappears. That happens because this if condition doesn't apply anymore because in the else statement, the canvas is narrower than the image. This is what we have to account for as well. For that, let me copy the width and the height. Now I need these numbers here. For this one, we now want to have the image covered the entire height of the canvas, which means the height is simply going to be the event.height. For the width, I want to get the height once again and multiply this with the image ratio. This should be multiply, not plus. With that, all of this should be working. Now we can see the raccoon and the raccoon works just fine. We are never scaling this one. We are simply cutting off parts that are outside of the canvas. This is looking pretty good. For the math here, if you really want to understand this, I would recommend to go over this a couple of times. Basically, you always want to imagine that you are scaling a canvas and then you are fitting an image inside of it. When you're hearing this the first time, it can be quite confusing. So definitely go over this in your own time. The math really isn't hard. It's just some logic that you have to grasp. With that, we are nearly done. There's one more thing that I want to do. In this case, the raccoon is always going to be fully visible and we are scaling it in such a way that we never cut off anything, but the aspect ratio itself stays identical. This is going to be reasonably similar compared to what we have done here with fill image, which means it's going to be your exercise. I want you guys to create a third scaling behavior to always show the full image without cutting off parts. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out. You can reuse a lot of this. Since I am going to reuse quite a bit, I am simply going to copy the entire function, paste it in here, and rename it to show full image. This function I want to call right away. Down here, instead of configure, I want to show the full image. Inside of the function, global can stay the same, the current ratio we also need, and all of the stuff down here is also going to stay identical, which means the only part we have to change is this bit here. Specifically, we have to get new numbers for the width and the height for all aspect ratios. The way you have to think about this one, we once again check if the canvas ratio is larger than the image ratio, which means that the canvas is wider than the image. For example, if this one here is the canvas, the image would be something like this. What we have done before is we have scaled the width of the image to here, and then used that number to calculate the new height of the image. This I want to change now. Instead, what I want to do to show the entire image, I want to scale the height to only be as tall as the canvas itself. This number I am then going to use to calculate the width of the image. Which means, for this one, I want to have a new height. The height is simply going to be event.height, with the width simply being the height multiplied by the image ratio. We can try this one right away. If it's like this, we have the entire image, but now if I go even further, now we have a black background. 
and we can see the entire raccoon. Which only leaves us the last bit here. For this one, I want to start with the width, because now the canvas is narrower than the image. In this case, the width is going to be the event.width. For the height, I want to get the width and divide it by the image ratio. That should be all we need. With that, we have the entire raccoon, and we can always see the entire raccoon regardless of aspect ratio, and, well, the raccoon updates automatically. This image in all of its forms, so these three functions, work slightly differently. But once you have them, you can place the canvas in any kind of container and the size would always scale. That way you can use the image wherever you want, which is what makes it actually useful. Let's talk about image animations. What we are going to make will look something like this. I can click on a button and we have a star. If I click on the button again, the star disappears. The important part is that we have an animation for this star. To create something like this, you already know most of the steps. If you can import images and animate widgets, you know the basics. Although there are some problems. Let me go through them. Number one, for these kind of animations, you have to import a lot of images. So far, we may have imported one or two images. For this one, there are going to be a lot more. That very neatly brings me to the folder structure. This one looks like this. We have one Python file. This one contains the program we are going to make. Other than that, we have four folders and all of them contain images. For example, inside of yellow, we have a whole bunch of stars. What we're going to do is we're going to play one star after another. And if we do that fast enough, we have an animation. In case you're wondering here, the first image is only white because Windows is weird. The image here is actually empty. Going through the images is actually not that hard. We just have to configure a button. What is much more important is how can we import all of this? I guess you could write 30 import statements, but that would be kind of a pain because we also have other folders. We have the black folder. Here we have a black star. Then we have a dark folder. In here we have another kind of animation. And then we have the light folder. Here's one more animation. If you were to import every single file manually, you would have to write a lot of code, which means I want to find some smarter way of doing that. For part number two, we have to organize state management. This is going to toggle if the button has been pressed and goes forward with the animation, or if the button was already pressed and we have to run through the animation backwards. While doing that, we also have to make sure we are preventing interruptions. So what happens when the user is pressing a button while the animation is playing? In my case, I'm going to prevent any kind of button click. Other than that, it's just basic animation logic. So let's have a look. In my case, I am relying on custom tkinter because this one is slightly more complicated, but all of the logic would also work for TTK. The reason why I'm using custom tkinter is because, well, it looks much nicer. But, and if you can use this with custom tkinter, you can also use it with normal tkinter. Other than that, I'm importing from PIL image so we can have images. Then we are creating a basic window and we are running main loop. The result is going to look like this, a basic window. To stay consistent, one thing I forgot is the comment to say run before the main loop. Now for the button, I want to have a dedicated class. Class, let's call it animated button. For this one, I'm going to inherit from CTK button. I forgot this CTK first of all. This is the button we want to work with. So far, I only really inherited from frames, but you could inherit from any widget and add specific bits to it. In here, we want to create a constructor, so a dunder init method. This one needs four arguments in total, or well, parameters. Self, as always, then we need a parent. After that, we need a light path and we need a dark path. Those are for the light images and the dark images. Because remember, in custom tkinter, when we are creating images, we have to account for a light and a dark theme, which means you always need two kinds of images. I guess if you want to be lazy, you could have the same image for the dark and the light image, but that wouldn't look as good. What we have to do in here, first of all, is run the super dunder init method. The master is going to be the parent. Besides that, we want to have some text. What you put in here really doesn't matter. Let's say a button or rather a animated button. Once we have that, 
we can place the entire thing using the pack method. Or, well, any kind of layout method here is fine. I'm going to use pack because it's easy. With expand being true, the button is going to be right in the middle. With that, I can create the animated button. I can add in the window as the parent. Then I need two paths. Although for now, I'm just going to add none and none because we have nothing for the paths. If I run this now, we have an animated button. Although this one doesn't do anything right now. That is bringing us to the first part that we really have to care about. We want to write a method that imports a whole folder, or rather folders, because what I want to do in here is I want to add self, then I want to have the light path and the dark path. The argument I'm expecting here is a path to a folder. So if I reopen the folder again, we have the Python file here, and what I'm expecting is, for example, yellow or black, or dark, or light. Any of these folder names is what I'm expecting. Just to be explicit here, I want to have, for the light theme, I called this one black. For the dark theme, so the second argument, I want to have yellow. Once we have the actual images, we can play around with the colors here, but they all work in the same way. In here, we have to figure out how to work with that. First of all, though, I want to loop over both of these paths which is very easily done for path in then a tuple with the light path and the dark path. If I print the result path while also making sure that I'm running this method in the init method self.import folders with the light path and the dark path. This method needs to be run before the super method. That is really important. You will see later on why. Although if I run this now, we get black and yellow. Now we have to figure out how to get the folder contents from this path. For that, we are going to need another module. That module is called OS. However, I don't just want to import OS. Instead, I want from OS import walk. What walk is doing is if you give it a folder name, it gives you the content of a folder. For example, what I could be doing, instead of printing the path, I can print walk and then the path. If I run this now, we get a generator object that didn't go as planned. But if you convert this thing to a list, then you can see what's going on. This is looking much better. Let me extend this a tiny bit. We are getting two lists. This list here for the light path and this list here for the dark path. You can actually see for the first argument, we are getting black and we are getting yellow. Those are the folder names. For each list, there are actually only three arguments. The first one is the folder name. This one we don't care about because we already have that. Next up, we have an empty folder for both of them. If there were any subfolders inside of these folders, the names of these folders would be in this list. Since we don't have any subfolders, we can entirely ignore this one as well. It's simply not relevant for us. However, afterwards, we have a long list with all of the files inside of this folder. This is what we actually care about. On top of that, you want to be aware of the order here. In my case, I'm starting with 000, 0001, then 2, 3, and so on. On some operating systems, I think in particular for macOS, this order might be messed up. I'm going to show you later how to account for that, but it's definitely something you want to be aware of. It can mess with your animations quite a bit. Although another really important thing to mention is that what we are getting in here are just file names. All of these are strings. They are not files, they're not images. We just get a string of a file name. We still have to do the actual import. But that comes later. First of all, though, I want to add another for loop. For let's call it data in walk path. The result is going to be, if I print the data, we have the stuff I've just shown you although we can be a bit more elegant here. Since this walk path is returning three things, we can unpack them right away inside of the for loop. We get the folder name, we get sub folders, and then we get the, let's call it image data. All we care about is image data. This is what I want to print. So if I run this, we get all of the image names. To indicate that I don't care about the folder name, I will replace this one with an underscore. The subfolder I also don't care about, so this one is going to be a double underscore. 
Next up, the image data, if I print this again, we absolutely have to make sure that this data is sorted. It always has to start with 0000, 000, 000 and end with 000, 000 and 29, with the numbers going from the lowest to the highest. You might get this by default, you might not, and you really want to make sure. For that, I want to create a new variable. I'm going to call it sorted data. In here, we want to use sorted. What I want to sort is the image data. But to be a bit more specific here, I want to set a key. Because if we just passed in the image data, let me show one entry. I want to print image data and then the one with the index one. Also, let me comment out this bit here so we're not getting an error. If I just print one, we get this bit here. And this is a string. If we use this with sorted, Python wouldn't really know what to do with it. Because if you compare different strings, it's not really clear which one is smaller and which one is larger. Instead, what I want to do is only get the last five digits. If I then turn this into a number, Python can sort it from the lowest to the highest. And obviously, if you have different file names, the logic here would be different. It very much depends on what kind of system you have. In my case, I created these with After Effects, and this is the default name, so I can't really change that. Let's first of all only get the number here with this one item. We first of all have to get rid of the dot .png. That we can do using the split method, and I want to split this wherever we have a dot. Like so, if I run this now, we are getting a list with two items returned. I only care about the first one, which means I can use indexing here to only get the first one. With that, we get image and light 0001. Since we can do indexing on strings, we can use indexing here once more. I want to go from negative five all the way to the end. If I run this now, we are just getting the number itself. Although if I print the type of what we are getting, we are still getting a string, which means we have to convert all of this to an integer and now we are just getting a number. You can see we're getting a number because Python removes all of the zeros, which means this logic here is what we actually want to use. Let me uncomment sort it, put this over multiple lines. Now for the key, I have to use a lambda function. The lambda function will always get one, let's call it item. This item is now going to be my image data, which means I can copy all of this, paste it in here, and replace image data with item. Then I can comment all of this out, fix the white space here. On top of that, we have to remove this one here. We only use that to get one item from the image data. This we don't need anymore. Now, if I run this, we're not getting an error. That's a pretty good sign. But just to be sure, let me print sorted data. The result is still going to go from zero all the way to 29. Although now, I think if you are on a Mac, the result here should now be a properly sorted list. With that, I can get rid of the print statements, this one and this one, and we have sorted data. This is still not enough because now we need the full path. You might be wondering now, don't we already have that from this image data? The answer is not quite. Let me print it actually again. If I print sorted data, what we get is a file name, but this is not a path. What we have to do instead is, first of all, for the full path, we need the folder name, then plus, then a slash, and then we need the image name. Fortunately, we have everything we need. The image names we are getting from this list here. The folder name is either light path or dark path which we are getting from the path. Although since we have quite a few of them, I want to store all of this inside of a list. Let me change full path to full path data. And now we are going to use list comprehension. I first of all want to get the path. This is either light path or dark path. In our case, this would be black or yellow. After that, I want to add a slash and then I want to add one of these file names. I guess we can use item again. So I want for item in sorted data. 
with that, if I print the full path data, we are now getting actual paths. We go into the black folder and in there we have image 000, then black image 001 and so on. This is what we actually need. Although we have to get all of this out of this for loop, so we can use it a bit more efficiently. For that, I want to have another variable. I'm going to call this one image paths. This for now is going to be an empty list. And once I have full path data, I'm going to append that image paths dot append full path data. With that, after we are finishing the for loop, let me minimize it actually. I want to print image paths. This is now going to give us two long lists full of image paths. The first one is all of this, and the second one is all of this. This is a good start, but I want to modify this a tiny bit. Ideally, I'm going to have a list. Let me draw it here. Inside of this list, I want to have lots of tuples. Each tuple should contain one dark image path and one light image path. So one in here and one in here. Then I want to have another tuple with two more of those. So that would be this image here or this image path and then this image path here. I want to assign a new value to my image path. The value I want to assign is zip. And then I want to unpack the image paths. Let me print actually what we get. This might be a bit complicated. Image paths, what we now get is a zip object. That's not particularly helpful, but we can turn this into a list and now we can see what's going on. What we're getting now is one long list and this list is full of tuples. One tuple contains the first image for the dark image, so black image 000, and then the light image, so yellow image 000. And zero. Then we have another tuple here, and this continues forever. We keep on having more and more tuples. This makes it very easy to work with this data, which is exactly what I wanted. Also, in case you're wondering here, zip is a function that zips together two lists in a way that you take the first item from the first list and the first item from the second list, and then you combine those two into one tuple. Zip is expecting two arguments, which should be two lists, which we get by unpacking image paths, because this one contains two lists. With that, we have all the data that we need. So now we can turn all of this into actual CTK image objects. Those I also want to store in a list. So we're going to continue by creating CTK images, which is going to be another empty list. We are almost done, actually. This is the much easier part. What I want to do now is for image path in image paths. Let me print what we get, image path. We are simply getting a tuple with the light images and the dark images, or however you want to call them. The naming here doesn't matter terribly much. What I want to do with that is I want to create a CTK image. This I do with CTK and CTK image. This is what we need in custom tkinter to store image data. Inside of this, we need a light image and we need a dark image. Since in my case, the first item inside of the image path tuple is the light image, this is what I'm going to assign here which means we can now use image.open and pass the path in here, which would be image path zero. I should probably put all of this over multiple lines, otherwise this will be difficult to read. We are using image open on the first item. Now we are doing this on the second item as well, or the one with the index one. Once we have that, all we have to do is get CTK images and append the CTK image. With that, we are going to have one long list with all of the CTK images. This is what I want to return. So return CTK images, then we can close this method and never worry about it again. And this was by far the most difficult part of this tutorial. If you got so far, the worst part is definitely over. Once we have the imported folders, I want to store the return value inside, let's call it self.frames. Just to make sure this is working, let me print self.frames and we are getting a list of objects. This doesn't tell us very much right now, but at the very least we are getting something. 
I guess you can tell here, we are getting CTK images. So that's a pretty good sign. Once we have that, we need actually to create a bit more stuff in here. So let me create a proper section that I call animation logic setup. Besides the frames, we also need what I call a frame index. This by default is going to be zero. Later on, I'm going to explain the animation logic. But for now, this is what we're going to use to pick one item from the frames that we want to display. We can actually already use this. When I'm setting up the button inside of the init method, I can also add an image. This image is going to be self.frames. And since this is a list, I can use indexing. I want to get self.frameIndex in here. And once again, this should be over multiple lines, otherwise I'm cutting off some text. If I now run this, there should be an image. You can see there's an empty space, but nothing more. The reason for that is that the first image is completely empty. This is why you can't see it. However, what we can do now, if I change the frame index from zero to, let's say 20, now we can see one star. If I increase the number to 21, we get a slightly larger star if I go to 26. Okay, this is gonna be very hard to see, but if I go to, let's say four, we get a very small star. The differences between these images is so small, it's really hard to see if you see them by themselves. For now, just trust me, this is definitely working. Next up, we need self.animationLength. This is going to be the length of self.frames. Although from that, I want to subtract one. The reason for that is, imagine if we had a list right now with three items. The list would be zero, one, and two. This would be three items. However, if I want to use indexing, it would always be the length minus one. The final item would be the length of the list, so three minus one, this is going to be really important for this animation length because I only want to go up to this final item, but then I want to stop. So I have to know what is going to be the final index of the list, which I'm going to call length. It's not exactly accurate, but I think you get the idea. There's one more thing that we need, and that is self.animationStatus. This is going to be a tkinter variable, or more specifically, a CTK string var. This one is going to have the value of start by default. Now, why do I want the animation status to be a string var? Well, the reason here is because with that, I can use tracing. So self.animationStatus, and I can use trace. And anytime I'm updating the value, so I'm writing in it, I want to run a certain kind of method. This method is going to be animate. Let's create this one right away. I want to have animate. What is important here besides self, we also need unpacking and args. Because every time we are using trace, we got some default arguments. Although in our case, we don't really care about them. For now, I'm going to add pass in here because there's one more function that I want to create. That is going to happen inside of the super init method because I only want to start the animation when I'm clicking on the button, which means this one needs a command. The command function is going to be self, and I call this one trigger animation. I'm going to create this one above animate, so trigger animation with self and nothing else. In here, we are going to do state management, which means we are updating animation status. For example, if self.animationStatus.get, which would right now get us start. If that is the case, so if this is equal to start, then I want to set self.frameIndex to zero. So we are starting on the first frame of all of the images. On top of that, I want to set self.animationStatus with the set method to forward, which basically means that we want to start at zero and move the animation forward. Besides that, I also want to check if self.animationStatus.get is equal to end. If that is the case, I want to get self.frame 
index and set this to self.animationLength. Other than that, I want to set self.animationStatus with the set method to backward. Since with this, we are updating the tkinter variable with forward or backwards, this animate is going to be triggered. Now, we can check for different things. For example, what I could be checking for is if self.animationStatus.get is equal to forward. If that is the case, I want to play the animation, which in this case means I want to get self.frameIndex, frame index like so, and increase the value by one, which means that this number here, self.frameIndex, when we use it first time, gets the first image which we are using down here with the image. This I want to increase to one, two, three, four, all the way until the end of the animation frames. If I go through them fast enough, we are going to have an animation, which means I can use this now with self.configure. I want to update the image. The image is going to be self.frames. In here, self.frameIndex. Let me run this actually. If I now click on the button, we get a very small star. This is because we're only calling this animate once. So we only go from frame zero to frame one. We will need self dot after, after 20 milliseconds, I want to run self dot animate again. With that, if I click on this now, we have an animation and then we are crashing. Since we are running this method here forever, at some point we are going to run out of frames. Or more specifically, we have a larger index than the length of the list, which is giving us the error. Or more specifically, we get list index out of range. To account for this, we need an if statement. If self.frameIndex is smaller than self.animationLength, only then do I want to update all of this. If I try this now and click on the button, we have an animation. That's looking pretty good. If that is not the case, so else, I want to set self.animationStatus using set to end. That is telling us once we get to the end of all of this, I want to have a new status because I know the animation has finished. If we're then pressing again, this if statement here would run and we would set the animation status to backwards. By now, this wouldn't do anything because inside of animate, we only have this bit of code here meaning we're only running any kind of animation if the status is forward. To account for that, we need a second one that checks self.animationStatus.get is equal to end. If that is the case, I want to do very similar things compared to what I've done here, although not exactly. Let me start by copying it. And now I want to set self.frameIndex and reduce it by one every time we are calling this. Configure still works just fine. Although for this if statement, I only want to do all of this if self.frameIndex is greater than zero. This part is still fine, although in the else statement, if we are finishing the animation, I want to set the status back to start. If I'm running all of this now, I can click on an animated button and now we are almost done. The animation works, but we always go to the end and then back to the start. The reason for that is that we only want to do this if the status is backward. Now if I run this, this goes forward and now nothing happens. But if I click on it again, we're now going backwards. This I can do multiple times, still works just fine. On top of that, when I'm creating all of this, I can get CTK set appearance mode and switch all of this to light mode, we are now getting a different kind of animation. Or well, the same kind of animation, just different colors. If I open the folder again, we are importing yellow. This is the dark images. This one is all yellow. And then black has the same animation, just in completely black. Although besides that, we also have dark. This one has a hard animation either for white or for the dark path, which means if I add in here light and dark, we are importing those folders and now we get a heart that we can also animate. 
Although I think this should be the other way around, dark and light. That is definitely looking better. If I remove the appearance mode, I guess it kind of works. Let me stick to yellow and black. I think those look a bit better. Although I had this the other way around earlier. This was black and yellow. There we go. Now we have the yellow animation again. Cool. With that, we have made a lot of progress. Although there's one challenge I have for you. I want you guys to create another animation and this one should run forever. That means we go from frame zero all the way to the end. Once we reach that point, we're going back to the start. And then once again, we go from zero to the end. That way the animation will keep on starting over and over again. Try to implement this one. I want to keep all of the logic contained inside of a method. I will call this one infinite animate. No need for custom parameters. This I also want to trigger when we are pressing the button. To check if this is working, let's print infinite. If I now click on the button, we get infinite. That's a good start. Now we have to figure out the logic. For that, self.frameindex and increase it by one. Once I have that, I want to use configure again. I want to update the image. The value is going to be self.frames with the index of self.frameindex. Finally, I have to run self.after. I want to update this after 20 milliseconds and call self.infiniteAnimate again. If I run this one now, we get the first animation, but then we are crashing because we are running out of list indexes again. To account for that, we need one more line of code. Basically what I want to do, I want to update self.frameIndex and I want to set it to zero if self.frameIndex is greater or equal than self.animationLength. However, if that is not the case, else I want to keep self.frameIndex as self.frameIndex. The way you want to think about it is if we have a list with 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 items. Self.frameIndex is going to start here, then it's going to jump to this one, then to this one, then to this one, then to this one. And if we get to this point here, this if statement is going to trigger and it is going to put self.frameIndex back to the start. That way the animation will go on forever. Let's try this one now. If I click on the button, we get a continuous loop. Although I think because of the equal sign here, we are skipping the last frame. Let's remove it and play this again. There we go. You can't really see a difference, but well, there's one more frame in the animation now. And with that, we have animations. Obviously, we can make all of this a lot more fancy, but this should be a really good start. In this tutorial, we are going to work a bit more with colors. We already know how to color in the background of any app. Especially if you use custom tkinter, this should be fairly easy. However, what we don't know is how to color in the title bar. This one so far always had one color. It was either white or black. And unfortunately, there's no easy way of changing it. We actually have to use Python to target windows and then tell it to give it a custom color. And this is only going to work on windows. So we also have to make sure that if we're running the code on macOS or Linux, we're not crashing the entire app. And that is giving us quite a few things to work with, so let's jump right in. Here we are in the code editor, and first of all, we have to import tkinter. Now, in this case, I'm going to work with custom tkinter, but this would also work with the normal tkinter. What I want to do is import custom tkinter as ctk. After that, I want to create an app. This we get with ctk and ctk. I guess while we are here, we can also give this a geometry of let's say 300 by 200. The number here doesn't really matter. And after we have that, I can run main loop to start the app. With that, I'm getting a small window. That isn't looking too terrible. And I do have some control over the colors. 
Most importantly, to set the background color, when I'm creating the app with CTK and CTK, I can set an FG color. This could, for example, be red. If I run this now, we have a red background color. You could also use hexadecimal values. For that, you need a hashtag. And then let's say FF00 and FF, and that would give you a pink color. Just as a reminder, FF stands for the red color, 00 is for the green color, and the final FF is for the blue color, which means in our case, we have a full amount of red and a full amount of blue and combine these two colors and there's no green whatsoever. And the result of that would be pink. However, now we have one important thing that we can't do, and that is to change the title bar color. How can we do that? To get started, we have to import a couple of things. I want from C types, import win dll, then by ref, then size of, and finally C underscore int. All of those modules are quite specific. The one we really care about is WinDLL because this is giving us access to some system level functionality of Windows. And that we can use to color in the title bar. And for that, we will need a couple of steps. First of all, we have to target the current window because right now what we are doing is we are talking to Windows directly. And what we want to do first of all is to get our current window. This you usually store in a variable called HWND, which is standing for the window handle. And that window handle you get with win DLL, then user32, get parent. For get parent, make sure you spell this right. The G and the P should be uppercase. This is a method, so we have to call it. We have to add one argument, and that is app w info underscore ID. And this is also a method. Basically, what is going to happen? This app winfo ID is giving us the current ID of the window we have open, the app we just created. And this ID we are using to get the current window handle. This is what Windows as an operating system sees. So this is what we are now storing in the variable. With that, we have access to the window, which means next up, we can actually change the title bar color. And this we do with win dll, then wm api, and then uppercase d wm set window attribute. This method wants four arguments. The first one is going to be the window handle. This we just got, so hwnd. Next up, we will need one argument that tells us what attribute we want to address, because this set window attribute can target quite a few things. To give this a bit more context, here is the Windows documentation for this method. We have dwm set window attribute. And in there, we can target quite a few different attributes. For example, in there, we could target the border color, the caption color, the text color, and well, quite a few more things. Most of those we are basically just going to ignore. I'm gonna add a link to this website, but it's not gonna be too important. Back in the code, all we really have to do is add a 35 in there. This is the attribute for the title bar color. Next up, we will need the actual color. And you might be tempted to simply add something like red. Unfortunately, that would not work. Instead, we need a very specific kind of color. And this is called hexadecimal color. Let me store it in a separate variable, actually. I will call this one the title bar color. And this is going to be a weird format. We start with a zero, then an X, then zero, zero. And then we can add a color that looks something like this, except it's inverted, which means we are adding two digits for the blue color, then two digits for the green color, and then two digits for the red color. For example, if we want to have pure red, this would be zero, zero, then zero, zero again, and for the red color, FF. Once again, we are using hexadecimal values, which means zero is the absence of the color and F is the full amount of the color. You might be wondering now, what kind of value is this even? Because we have a bunch of numbers, but then a couple of strings. So is this a string or a number? The answer is this is an integer. If I simply print the type of the title bar color and comment out the DWM set window attribute and run all of this, we're getting a class integer. 
What we're creating with this one is a special kind of integer. Although we don't have to worry too much about it. This color we now want to use, but we have to convert it. And for that, we have byref and c underscore int. To use them, we first of all have to use byref. And this one wants the argument with c underscore int. And this one wants the actual color. Title bar color. And let me put all of this over multiple lines. That way it's a bit easier to read. There's one more argument we need to make all of this work. And this one is fairly technical and it's always going to be the same. What you need is size of. And this one wants the argument c underscore int. At this stage, don't worry too much about it. Just always add it and then you're good to go. But now, if I run the app, we get a red title bar color. That is because in the title bar color string, we have the full amount of red, we have no green, and we have no blue. If we change this to an ff for blue and 00, 0 for red, run all of this again, we get a blue title bar color. What you can also do, let me copy all of this and paste it right below. If you target attribute number 36, then you target the color of the title bar text, which means if I run this now, we can't see the text anymore. The bit up here is gone. Oh, well, it's not really gone. It's just the same color as the background. However, if I give this another kind of color, let's say the title text color, this would have to be the same format that we have used up here. Let me copy it actually. And let's say for the color, I want to have no amount of blue. I want to have the full amount of green and just a bit of red. So let's go with nine and nine. And this color I want to use for the text color. And if I run this again, we get some greenish looking color. That is because we have the full amount of green and some red. With that, you can change the title bar color and you can change the text of the title bar color. It's not terribly elegant, but it certainly works. However, there's one major issue that we have to address. All of this code is only going to work on Windows. And let me get rid of the white space. If you try to run this code on macOS, you would get a crash because Python couldn't import WinDLL. This one is exclusive to Windows. As a consequence, we want to add a tiny bit more code that if we are running all of this on another operating system that would cause an error, we are simply skipping this part of the code. Which means we want to add a try and an accept statement. And this I have covered earlier in the Python introduction. We basically need two important keywords. They are called try and accept. I hope you remember those two. In fact, this is going to be your exercise. I want you guys to make sure that this code would run on any operating system, which in effect means that if you're running this on anything other than Windows, we are simply skipping this line and all of these lines. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out. You might have to go back to the Python introduction, but see how far you get. First of all, we have to wrap all of this import into a try statement, which means I want to try to import this like so. And when I'm using try, I also have to use except. In this case, I simply want to add pass to all of this. I am telling Python to try to import all of this stuff. If we are on Windows, this is going to work. So Python is going to be happy and run this line. However, if we are on macOS, this is not going to work. And as a consequence, we're going to end up with the except statement. And in there, we simply have a pass, so this is not going to do anything. That is going to be the first part. We do, however, need a second part. If we left the code like this, we would skip this line so the code would work up to that point. This bit here would also work. However, now Python would try to run this code on any operating system. And since we don't have WinDLL, we would get an error. As a consequence, all of this also needs to be wrapped in a try except statement. Let me indent it and I will need try. At the end of all of this, since we're using try once again, I will need accept. And once again, I want to accept pass. We are telling Python to try this entire block of code and check if it is working or not. If it is working, everything's good and simply continue. However, if it is not working, Simply don't do anything, which we're doing with except pass. I can run the entire thing again. We are getting our current app. 
However, now, if you run all of this on macOS, although it would have the standard colors. So at the very least, we have something. And with that, we have covered another really important part about styling. Hello. In this part, we are going to create a BMI calculator. For this one, you can change the weight and the height, and then you get your body mass index. It's a fairly straightforward app. I guess the one extra thing I added here was you can change this to imperial units and then use ounces and inches. There really isn't anything complicated in here. I am just using custom tkinter with some basic sliders and buttons, and then the formula for BMI is also really simple. And before I jump in, really quick, here is the folder I'm going to work with. Let me make it a bit larger. We have BMI, and there we're going to write the code. Right now, it's entirely empty. Besides that, we have settings.py. This is going to cover the colors and the font sizes and stuff like that. Finally, we have empty.ico, and this is to hide the icon of the app. That is all we need. So with that, let's jump into some code. Here's my code editor. I have bmi.py open and I have settings.py. Inside of settings.py, we have a couple of basic information about the text sizes and then some colors. Finally, we have the title hex color. This one is also a color, but it works slightly differently. So what we're going to start doing is create a basic window using custom tkinter and color it all with one shade of green. This shade of green here in particular. For that, first of all, I want to import custom tkinter as ctk. And after that, I want to create a class. I code this one, the app. And for this one, I want to have ctk and ctk. This class app is going to need a dunder init method with self and nothing else. The first thing I want to do in here is some kind of window setup. This, as always, means to call the super dunder init method. We can call straight away an fg color, which is going to be green. That is going to be this green color here. Although right now I don't have my settings available. For that, inside of bmi.py, I want from settings import everything. Just to make sure this is working, I am going to call self.main loop inside of the app. After that, I'm going to create an instance of the app. With that, if I execute the code, we can see we have a small window that has a greenish background. What I want to do now is to write the title and the icon. This I do with self.title and set the title to an empty string. With that, I don't have a title anymore. Next up to hide the icon, I want to use icon bitmap. And for that, we are going to use empty.ico. That is the blank file we have inside of the folder. I am importing this one with this line. And now if I run the code, we don't have anything in the top left anymore. Meaning this area here is completely empty. Although right now, when I'm starting the window, the window is quite small. For that, I want to use self.geometry and give my window a start size of let's say 400 by 400. If I run this now, this is looking much better. On top of that, since this isn't a flexible layout, I want to self.resizable. I do not want to allow resizing the window, which means in here, I want to add false and false. This means the window cannot be resized. So if I try to click on the corners, nothing's going to happen. The main reason why I don't like resizable for these small apps is simply because there isn't that much to fill the content. If we have something this simple and we resize it, all of the elements just become really small relative to the window size. Although I guess if you wanted to add more elements, you could fill the space a bit more efficiently. But if you don't do it, it's just starting to look a bit silly. But all right, we are very nearly done. The last thing we have to do, and this I want to do in a separate method, I want to change title bar color. This is going to be a method. So I have to create the method here, and this one has self and nothing else. What I want to do in here, let me add pass for now. I want to change the color of the title bar. And since I covered this earlier, this could be a really good exercise. Although there's one additional thing I do want to add. 
this will only work on Windows. But I do want you guys to make sure it does not crash on Mac OS. Pause the video now and try to implement this one. It shouldn't be too difficult. First of all, we have to import a couple of things. All of those we are getting from C types. Specifically, I want to import WinDLL by ref size of and finally C underscore int. WinDLL, however, only exists on Windows, meaning if we tried this line here on macOS, we would be getting an error. For that, I want to use try. Spelling it correctly would also help. Try like this, meaning we are trying to run this code. However, if we are getting an error, then we are using except. And if that is the case, I simply want to run pass, meaning we are not doing anything. Once we have that, I can work inside of the method. And once again, in here, I also want to run try. Because if we couldn't import this line up here, then we definitely cannot run this line here. So both need to have try. In here, I want to get h and wd, and this I get with winDLL.user32.getParent. This one needs one argument, which is self.winfo underscore id, and do not forget to call this one. Next up, we have to get what is called a dwmwa underscore attribute, and this is simply 35. Next up, we need a color, and the color we already have. This we have inside of settings, this color here. It does look very strange, but I added a comment here. The hex order is zero, then x, zero, zero. This you can entirely ignore. After that, we have the blue colors, the green colors, and the red colors. So the green color that I want is this one here, which is the same that I have up here for the background color. Although in my case, all I have to do is copy title hex color, paste it in here, and then I'm good to go. Finally, I have to get win DLL, then DWM API, dot now comes to long name, uppercase DWM, then set window attribute. Inside of this one, we now need HWND, then we need DWM. M A attribute. Finally, we need by ref C underscore int of the color. For the last element, we want to have size of, and then here C underscore int. The last argument is quite technical, so you don't have to worry about it. But basically, what we're doing in here, just to recap, WinDLL DWM API, and then set attribute sets one specific attribute of a window. Inside of this one, we're getting the current window. Then we have to target one specific attribute. And the one we are targeting is the number 35. This targets the color of the title bar. And then we are giving it a color with this line here. The way this is working is a bit more cryptic, but that's just how it works. But well, with that, we are done. So let me run the entire thing. And I am getting an error that after this try statement, I am not adding an except. That is very easily fixed, accept and pass. If I now run this, we don't see a difference. So something went wrong. Most likely in this line here, because this one's really long and I can see the error, this should be a lowercase c. Now if I run this, there we go. Now we have a completely green window. With that, I can get rid of the exercise text and minimize the app for now. Although there's one more thing that I want to do. This app here should be wrapped inside of an if statement. And that if statement is going to be if dunder name is equal to the string dunder main. Only if that is the case, I want to create an instance of this app. If I run the code now, we're not going to see a difference. But if you have multiple files, this is generally what you should do. That way we don't accidentally run some code in some other file, like in settings, for example. Although in this case, there's no real code to run here. We're just storing some data. But it's good practice, so I am going to include it. 
In this part, we're going to create the four widgets that are visible inside of the app, meaning we're going to create the title for the BMI text. Then we have the weight buttons. After that, we have the slider for the height. And finally, in the top right, we have the metric imperial button. For now, they are not going to do anything, but at the very least, we are going to have a pretty good start. I want to keep on working inside of my class app. In here, before we can create any kind of widget, we have to create a layout. In my case, I have used a grid layout, although we only have a single column, which means I can run column configure. I have a column with zero and the weight is going to be one. The rows are going to be much more important. In my case, I have four rows, zero, one, two, and three, all with a weight of one. On top of that, I have set uniform to A. The way the app is going to work, if this is the entire window, we have four rows, one, two, three, and four. The BMI text is going to cover the top two buttons the weight buttons are going to be in this one here. And finally, the height slider is in the bottom one. All the way at the end, the imperial metric button is going to be in the top right. And this one we are placing with place, not with the grid layout. Since you can combine them, this isn't a problem. We have the layout, meaning I can minimize the class app and now create all of the widgets. Each of them is going to get their separate class. First of all, I want to have class, let's call this one the result text. Since this one is only going to be a label, I want to inherit from CTK label. Although this one, like any other class we're going to create, is going to need an init class. In here, we need self, and for now we need the parent. We have to call the super dunder init method to initialize the parent. The most important argument in here is the master, which is going to be the parent. To get something in here for now, I want to give this some text. Let's go with 22.5. Once we have that, I want to place this result text right away using the grid method. We are in column zero and row zero as well. Since I do want this widget to span two rows, I need a row span of two. Finally, sticky is going to be north, south, east, and west. This should be all we needed to get started with this text. Meaning now I can add another section in here. Let's call this one the widgets. I want to create my result text. I need the parent in here, which is going to be self. Other than that, there are no arguments needed. Let me run the code now. And there we can see 22.5 right in the middle. That's a decent start, but well, it is very, very small. For that though, we can make a few updates. Inside of settings, we have a font and a main text size. I want to use those two to create a font and then this font should define how large the text is. I suppose for this one to keep things a bit more organized, I can create a font inside of this result text. This I have to do before the super init method. And here I want to create a font. This I create with CTK and then CTK font. This font is going to need a family and a size. Both of those we are getting from the settings. The family is going to be the font. This one here. Next up, we need the main text size for the size. Let me copy it. The size is going to be the main text size. All we have to do now is send the font of the text to the font we just created. And now if I run this again, this is looking much better. There's one more thing that I do want to do inside of the font. I want to set a weight. The weight should be bold. And now if I run this again, this is looking significantly better. With that, we have the result text. The next widget is going to be the weight input. This one is going to inherit from CTK frame. As always, we need a dunder init method. This one itself and a parent. First of all, in here, I want to call the super dunder init method. The master needs to be the parent. And I guess while we're here, I can also set an FG color, which is going to be white. This white we're getting from the settings. I'm using this white here. After that, I want to place this widget as well with the grid. 
I want to use column zero and the row is going to be two. Also, sticky should be north, south, east and west. With that, we should be seeing something after creating an instance of this class, which means I want to create the weight input, add self as the one argument for the parent, run this in typing again, and there we go. This isn't looking terrible, although it needs a bit of refinement. Most importantly, when I'm using the grid method, I want to add a bit of padding. For the horizontal and the vertical, I want to use 10 pixels each. And now this is looking a bit cleaner. And while I'm looking at this, I can see I forgot one thing. It's probably very hard to see on your computer, but the color of the text is slightly darker than the color of this box. This is because when I created the text, I did not set a color. That we do with text color, and this one should be white as well. Now if I run this, both the text and the box have the same color. Inside of the weight input, we now have to create a layout for all of the buttons. As a reminder, here is the final app. What I want to create for the layout is once again, I'm gonna use grid. We have one row, and then we have a bunch of columns. We have column zero, column one, column two, column three, and column four. The easy part in here, I want to use row configure. The index is zero, the weight is going to be one, and uniform. Let's set this one to be simply because I have used A up here. Also, I don't need the class app right now. I just want to work inside of the weight input. Next up, I have to work with the column configure. I have to create five columns. So let me duplicate this a couple of times so that we have zero, one, two, three, and four, five columns in total. The middle column should be the widest one. So this one is going to get a weight of three. Column one and three are for the small buttons. I like to keep them at one. However, column zero and column four need a weight of two. So they are twice as wide as the columns one and three. Once again, to illustrate what this means, column zero and four are these large buttons here. They get a weight of two each. Next up, we have one and three. These are the smaller buttons. So they only get a weight of one. Finally, the text in the middle is going to be column two. This one needs to be the widest, which means this one's going to get a weight of three and I am incapable of drawing a three. This is giving us the layout. So now we have to create the widgets or the buttons, whatever you wanna call it. I guess it's not all buttons, so let me just call it widgets. The most important widget in here is going to be the label. This one will be a CTK and CTK label. Self is going to be the parent. For the text for now, let me just write in 70 kilogram. This label I want to place right away. So label.grid row is going to be zero, column is going to be two. And with that, if I run the entire thing, we can see something very, very faint, but there is a very faint 70. It's tiny and basically white, so we have to change the styling here. First of all, the text color should be, I think I called this black. If I go to settings, we have black here. So now let's run this. And this is definitely more visible. On top of that, I also want to create a font. Like I have done before, this is going to be CTK and CTK font. We need a family and a size, both we already have inside of the settings. The font size I want for this one is the input font size. For the family, I simply want to use my font. Now, once I have that, I want to set the font to the font I just created. And this is looking much more visible. Let me change this once again. The better comment here would be the text because now we can add the buttons. There are four buttons that we need. Let me start with one. I want the minus button. This is going to be CTK and CTK button. The parent is going to be self. And the text for this one is simply going to be a minus. 
This one is also going to need a font. And for the font here, we can simply reuse the font we created earlier, which means font is going to be font. While we are here, we can also set the text color to black. Let's add this minus button to the layout right away using the grid method. This one should be all the way on the left, meaning the row is still going to be zero and the column is also going to be zero. If I run this now, we are getting an error that this black is not defined. This should be in all uppercase letters black. Now if I run this, this is feeling a bit better, but I guess you can already see some problems. We first of all have the completely wrong colors. And if I hover over this, the hover color is also wrong. Also, this button is a bit too wide. First of all, I want this button to cover the entire height of the container. For that, I need sticky. And the argument I want in here is north and south. Now if I run this again, the button is going to cover the entire area. Although that's also not exactly what I want. Instead, what I want to do is give this a padding of eight, both vertically and horizontally. So pad X is eight and pad Y is eight. And this is looking much better, although the colors still don't work. For that, inside of the button, I need to add a few more arguments. First of all, I have to set an FG color. This FG color, I termed light gray. This, once again, we get from the settings, light gray in here. Now, if I run this again, this is looking significantly better. However, if I hover over this, we're getting a really ugly color. So the last thing we have to do is we have to set a hover color. The hover color is simply going to be gray. This is the gray we're getting here is slightly darker shade of gray. So now if I run this again, we have a hover color that works. And well, this is looking really good. Although that being said, there's one more thing that I did add, and that is a corner radius. I have set this one to six. Although this one is going to be very difficult to see, but I think it definitely makes the entire thing look a bit nicer. Although this corner radius here, I should add to the settings, which means inside of the settings, let me add it here. I want to have button corner radius, and this should be six. This I now want to copy and replace the six with the button corner radius. The result is going to be the same, but now we can change the styling from inside of the settings. So with that, we have the minus button. Once I have that, I can simply duplicate these lines and create the plus button. The only difference here really is that the minus should be a plus for the text. And when I'm placing this button using the grid method, the column is going to be four. Now, if I run this one, we have a plus and a minus button that both look pretty solid. Meaning now I can copy this entire thing one more time, because now I want to have, let's use the plus button again. I want to have a small plus button. This one is still going to show a plus sign. However, since we are placing it on column three, it is going to be smaller. Meaning now if I run this, we have a smaller plus button. This is almost working, but this covers the same height as the bigger plus button. To account for that, I simply remove this sticky argument, run this again, and there we go. Now, this plus button is much more square-ish, which is looking better. On top of that, I want to change the padding from eight to four. And with that, we have a much nicer looking button. There's just one more button that we need. So I'm going to duplicate all of this one more time because now we have the small minus button. The only two changes that we have to make is change the plus to a minus and the column shouldn't be three. It should be one. And now if I run this again, we have all four buttons. Meaning now I can hide the weight input and work on my next class. This is going to be the height input. This one, once again, is going to inherit from CTK frame. And then here, I want to have an init method that takes self, parent, and that's all that we need for now. And here, as always, I want to have the super init method. I want to set the master to the parent and the FG color to white. 
After that, this is getting a bit repetitive. I want to use the grid method. Row is going to be three and column is going to be zero. Also, we need sticky, north, south, east, and west. And pad X should be 10 and pad Y should be 10. This should be giving us a container. Although I do have to create an instance of this class, meaning inside of the app, below the height input, I want to have the height input with self. Now if I run this, we have the final container. That's looking pretty good. We now just have to fill this thing. Since this layout is pretty simple, we can stick with the pack method. So I can jump straight to creating the widgets. I want to create two widgets in here. I first of all want to have a slider. This I create with CTK and CTK slider. The parent here is going to be self as usual. And that is actually all I want for now. Once I have that, I want to pack this slider. The most important argument in here is the side because I want to place this on the left side. I also want to fill the entire horizontal space and I want to set expand to true. Also for a bit of padding, I want to set pad Y to 10 and pad X to 10. If I run the app now, this isn't looking terribly bad. Although we definitely have to work on the styling. Inside of the slider, I want to set a few more things and I am going to work over multiple lines because there are quite a few in there. Also, I want to use named arguments. So let me set the master to self and then we can work on the rest. First of all, I have to change the button color and this one should be green. The green here should be in all uppercase letters. Now if I run this, the button that we can drag on the slider, let me show my mouse, the button that we can show is going to be green. Although if we hover over it, it defaults to this ugly bluish color. To get rid of that one, we have to set a button hover color. The button hover color I set is gray. And now I have a green button by default. And if I hover over it, it becomes a lightish gray. Next up, I want to set the progress color. And this one should be green as well. What this one is doing is it colors the left side of the slider. So this side here is now green. The last thing that we have to do is to change the FG color. And this one I have set to light gray. This one updates the right side of the slider. So this side here, it's now light gray. That is giving us the slider. Although I also want to have some text. Let me name this the output text. This is simply going to be a CTK and CTK label. Although I can already see my typo, this should be uppercase T. In here, once again, the master is going to be self. And for now, the text is, let's go with 1.80. This output text, I want to pack right away. I want to set the side to left as well. And pad X, I want to have 20 pixels of padding. Now if I run this one, we can, once again, we have the same issue we had with the text earlier. The text here does exist, but it's really hard to see and it's also very small. But that we can work on. First of all, I want to set a text color to black. And now with that, this is much more visible. Also, I realized there should be a meter at the end, like so. And now we get 1.8 meters. Besides that, I have to create a font. And so far, I always created a separate variable, but we don't actually have to do that. I can do it straight in here. So I could simply create CTK and font with the family being the font. And the size is going to be, I call this one the input font size. And now if I run this, we have a much larger font. That covers the height input, so there's only one more thing to do. I call this one the class unit switcher. What this one is going to do, let me run the final app again. This one is going to be the text all the way in the top right here. By default, it's going to say metric and it's going to be a bold text with the same font, but a smaller font size. What is really important about this one is that it's not placed using the grid method, but rather the place method. 
This is really important to know because this final widget is going to be your exercise. I want you guys to create the text in the top right. The only important things that you have to know for this one is that inside of settings, we are using the same font, so Calibri, but now we have a switch font size. For the text color, go with dark green. That is all you have to know, so pause the video now and try to figure this one out yourself. First of all, we have to figure out the inheritance. For this one, I'm going to use a CTK label, simply because the entire widget is just going to be some text. Inside of the init method in the class, we have to use self and then get a parent. This parent we can use in the super init method because in here we have to set a master, which is the parent. On top of that, just to see something for now, I want to set the text to metric. Now we have to figure out how to place this kind of widget. And importantly here, we cannot use the grid method. Or oh, well, we could use it, but it wouldn't give us the right result. Instead, I want to use the place method. For this one, I want to use relative values, which means I want to set relative x, relative y, and then I also have to create an anchor. The way you want to think about it is that this one here is the entire app. The position I want for the widget is going to be roughly somewhere here. So I have to figure out how to get this widget in the top right with a tiny bit of padding. Also remember, the sizing here for relative numbers, so relative x for example, would go from 0 all the way to 1.0. And for relative y, we're also going from 0 to 1.0. These numbers we can use quite easily to create padding ourselves, because the place method doesn't have padding. The way I approach this is I set relative x to 0 0.98 and relative y to 0 0.01. Finally, I have set the anchor to north east, and this should be a string. Basically, I have set the anchor to northeast, which is this point here. Then relative y, 0 0.1, gives me almost the top, so almost this line here, except a tiny bit of difference. This would be 0 0.01. That way, we get a tiny bit of padding at the top. A similar thing I have done for relative x, I am going almost to the right side, but not quite. So if this line here is 0, I am going almost to the end, but not quite. 0 0.98 leaves this tiny bit of space. And now with that, I simply have to create an instance of this app. Let me call it in here, unit switcher with self and now. In the top right, we have our metric text. That is a really good start. Although we have to work on the styling a tiny bit more. First of all, I want to update the text color. And this one, I believe I called it dark green. Inside of settings, this dark green. That's looking good. Let's try this one. And there we go. We have a dark green text. Besides that, I have to create a font, which is going to be CTK and CTK font. The family is still going to be the font, all in uppercase letters. The size is going to be inside of settings. I have a switch font size. I want to use that one. And the weight for this one is going to be bold. Now, if I run it again, there we go. In the top right, we have the metric text. And with that, we have all of the widgets. Now this video is getting a tiny bit longer, but I did want to cover all of this in one go. So now we can work on actual functionality. For this part, we're going to start implementing the logic for, well, the entire app, which means if I now press on any of the buttons or use the slider, we are updating the BMI number. For now, I am only going to use metric numbers. In the next video, I'm going to cover how to use imperial numbers, or rather how to make the user think they are using imperial numbers but let's focus on the basic logic for now. Once again, here we are in the app, and now I have to start thinking about how to implement the entirety of the logic. For that, first of all, inside of the app, we have to add another section before the widgets. 
because to make any kind of logic work here, we have to account for the data. So I want to store some data. In here, I want to create three different variables. The first one is going to be the height, and this is going to be an integer. This I create with ctk and int bar. Don't forget to call it. And in here, I want to set a start value of, let's say, 170. Also, I just realized this should just be int var without the ctk in front. Now, if I run this, this is working again. Besides the height int, we also need a weight, although this is going to be a float, which we are creating with ctk and then double var. For a start value here, I want to go with 65 kilograms. Finally, I want to have self.bmi string. This is going to be ctk and a string var. This one does not have a starting value. But what we can do now is run a method that I call self.updateBMI. This we have to create. Let me do it on top of change title bar color. I call this one update BMI. For now, I will not need any custom parameters. And what I want to do in here is first of all, I need to get the height in meter. Oh, and I should mention the formula for BMI is the weight divided by the height squared. And by default in all of this, the units you would be using are kilogram and meter. The 65 here is totally fine for the weight. However, for the height, we have 170 right now. This would be 1.7 meter. For any American viewer watching this, I hope you understand the units. Just drop me a comment if this is too confusing and I'll explain more. Basically, the way you want to think about it, if you never encountered metric units, is one meter is a hundred centimeter. And the unit we're using in the height in so far is centimeter. On top of that, one kilogram is going to be 1,000 gram. Although this one we don't really need because kilogram is much easier to use. How these numbers relate to inches and pounds, I will cover in the next video. For now, don't worry too much about it. The most important thing for now is we have to get our height in meter. This is super easy to get. All I want is self.myheight integer. And importantly here, I want to get. Right now, this would get me the value of 170 which would be centimeters. To convert this to meter, I simply have to divide it by 100 and then I'm done. Next up, I want to get my weight in kilogram. This I get with self.weight float and get. Since we are already using kilogram, this one is totally fine by itself. Finally, we can calculate the BMI result. For this, I want to have my weight in kilogram and divide it by my height in meter, although this one needs to be squared. And as soon as I have that number, I can simply update my BMI string using set and pass in the BMI result. This would give me the proper value inside of this BMI result. However, there's one problem we have right now. This BMI string is not connected to this result text. We could update it as much as we want, it wouldn't be visible. To account for that, when I'm creating my result text in this line here, I want to pass in self.bmi string. And now inside of the result text, we need another parameter, which is going to be the BMI string. And this BMI string, I have to, inside of the super init method, set as the text variable, like so. So in here, I want to have my BMI string. And now, at the very least, we should see some kind of different starting text. Let me run the entire thing. Well, we can certainly see a change. The problem is that this number here has way too many decimal points. To fix that, I simply have to round this result. This I can do using the round function. The second argument here would be how many decimal points we have. I think two are totally fine here. Now if I run this, this is looking much better. Now we get a proper result. Now the issue is I can use the slider and the buttons. They don't do anything right now. To fix that, we have to connect the height integer 
to the height input and the weight float should be connected to the weight input. Let's get started with the height integer. This I want to do inside of the height input. I want to also pass in self dot height integer. Now, once we have that inside of the height input, we need another parameter. Let's call it the height int. This height integer, I now want to set inside of the slider as the variable. So in here, height integer. If I execute the code now, you can see that by default, the slider is all the way on the right. The reason for that is that by default, this slider goes from 0 to 100, which isn't ideal. To account for that, I want to add a from and to parameter. I want to go from, let's say, 100 centimeters, so 1 meter should be the minimum. If you are below that, the formula doesn't help anyway. Two, let's go with 250. This is 250 centimeters. I, I think that's a bit taller than eight feet. So very few people are going to be larger. And if they are, a BMI formula would not apply to them anyway. So now if I run this, we can see the slider is slightly to the left. So this would be 170, this would be 100, and this would be 250. We have the basic slider with a height integer. Now the problem with that, if I run the entire thing again, I can move the slider as much as I want. It is not going to influence anything. For that, let me minimize the height input again. Because what we can do inside, or rather after this data, I can add what I called racing. For the basic logic here, essentially all we have to do is whenever this height or the weight changes, then we want to call this method here, and this would update the text. The functionality for that is inbuilt into tkinter. We are getting this with, for example, for the height integer using the trace method. There are two arguments we need in here. Do we want to run a function or a method whenever we are reading the value or when we are writing on the value? In my case, whenever we change the value, so when we are writing on this variable, I want to run a method, which is going to be self.updateBMI. There's one more thing you have to be aware of, and that is if you run a method using this trace method, tkinter automatically adds a couple of arguments into it as the second argument. Those you usually capture with star arcs, and then you just completely ignore them. Meaning now, if I run this again, I can update the height, and we are updating the value for our BMI. So next up, we can do the same thing for the buttons. Which means for this one, as the second argument, I want to pass in self dot weight load. So now I can minimize the app to have a bit more space and I want to work inside of my weight input. I have to get the weight load in here as a parameter so the entire thing doesn't crash and we have the weight float available inside of the class. That's a good start. However, now we have a problem. Each of these buttons does something slightly different. We have to figure out some kind of system how to make every button change this weight float slightly differently. For example, if I click on the minus button, I want to reduce the weight by one kilogram. However, if I click on the small minus button, I only want to reduce the weight by 0 0.1 kilogram. For the plus and the small plus button, the same thing, just in the positive direction. Since this is going to be a bit of extra logic, I'm going to create a separate method. Let's call this one the update weight method. Besides self, I also want to have, let's call it the information. By default, this is going to be none. For now, all I want to do is to print the information. Now, how this is going to work is each of those buttons is going to get one method, this method here, and then we're using that to pass information in. For example, for the minus button, I want to add a command, and this command is going to be a lambda function. Although this lambda function is simply going to call self.update weight. The reason why I'm using lambda is because this allows me to add an argument when I'm calling this method. What I want to pass in here is a tuple with two values. 
The first one is going to be minus. The second one will be large. The reason is this is a minus button, so we have minus, and this is a larger button, so we have large. That's literally all it is. Then I can copy this entire line, paste it in here, because now we have the plus button, meaning this minus should be a plus. Next up, we have the small plus button, so I can paste this in again. This should be a plus button, and it is a small button. Finally, for the small minus button, I want to pass in the command line again. This should be minus and small. With that, let me run the app. And now if I click on the large button, we get plus large, plus small, minus small, and minus large. That way, within one method, we have all of our buttons. Inside of this method, I first of all want to get an amount. So by how much do I want to update this value? This will be one if info one is going to be large. This large only exists inside of the minus and the plus button. These two buttons here, they have large and large. If I have either of them, I want to change by one kilogram. However, if I don't, so else, then the amount should be 0 0.1. This would cover these two buttons here. Once I have that, I can simply check if info zero is equal to, let's start with plus, then I want to self and set the value. What the new value is going to be is self.weightload.get plus the amount. However, if that is not the case, so else, I can simply duplicate this line and the plus should be a minus. I hope these lines here make sense. Basically, all we are doing is we're getting the current amount of the weight and then we're either adding or subtracting the amount we have specified here. Although I think I realized this attribute self.weightfloat does not exist right now. All we have is this parameter, but we're never turning it into an attribute. Let's do this right at the top. So self.weightfloat is weight float. Now this should be working. If I click on any of the buttons, nothing is happening. Although, if I print self.weightfloat.get, let's see what's happening. If I now click on the small plus, we can see at the very least this is working. And yeah, we do have the proper values here. And don't worry too much about all the floating point numbers here. They are not going to make a difference. They just look weird, but to our computer, they're totally fine. All of this here is working totally fine, meaning we can minimize it. But when I am opening the app again, or the class app, nothing is going to happen. So why is that? And well, we're looking at it right now. We haven't set a tracing for the weight, meaning I want to duplicate this line. When I'm updating the weight load using trace, as soon as the value updates, I want to call the update BMI method. So now if I run this and I click on plus, we are once again updating the BMI value. That's looking really good. Also, the slider still works just fine. Now this video is getting a bit longer and I can't think of a good exercise. I guess what you should be doing is definitely understand how this tracing method here works and why it is important. It's a really important thing to understand because this one allows us to work inside of these widgets by simply passing in any of these variables. And as soon as we are making any kind of change, all of that will be captured by these two tracing methods. That keeps all of this much more organized. So definitely have a look and see how this works. At this point, we have a reasonably working app, which means I can click on the buttons to get a higher weight, and I can also move the slider to get a different kind of height. On top of that, we get an updated BMI number. All of that is working just fine. However, what we don't have is the weight and the height being updated, which makes the app feel a bit weird. And this is what I want to work on now. For now, I'm just going to work with metric units, but later on, we will also add the switch, the one up here, to switch to imperial units. As always, I'm starting in bmi.py. And we have to work either inside weight input or height input. 
depending on what we want to start with. Let's say I want to start with the height input. The order here really does not matter. What we have to do inside of this one, we have to update this output text here. For that, I have created another text variable. I called it self.outputString. This is going to be a CTK and string var without any starting value. Although inside of the output text, I want to set this as the text variable, meaning text variable is going to be self and output string. If I run the thing now, we can see that we can't see the text anymore. So this text here is gone. To make it reappear, I want to create another method. I called this one update text. Besides self, we are also going to need an amount. So what amount do we want to set for the height? For now, let me simply print the amount. The way we are going to use this is inside of this slider, I'm going to add a command. Let me do it all the way at the top. The command is going to be a function, which is going to be self and update text. Since the command for the slider automatically inserts one argument, which is the amount on the slider, we get the amount here right away. If I run this now and move the slider, I'm getting the current height. That's looking really good. Once again, we are getting a huge amount of floating point numbers, so all of this, but well, we can simply ignore it. It doesn't matter for our purposes. This number I now have to convert to meters. For example, if I get 182 centimeters, this is what I would be getting from a slider. Not centimeters, but just 182. And that I want to convert to 1.82 and meters. All of this needs to be one string. For that, first of all, I have to convert the amount to a string. Let's call it text string. And all I'm going to do is turn the amount into a string. Also, while we're here, I want to turn the amount itself into an integer. That way we get rid of the floating point numbers. They are going to be a bit annoying. Once we have that, I want to have the meter and the centimeter. And the conversion here is really simple. Because, for example, if we have, once again, 182, this would be the string right now. I simply want to get the first digit. This works reliably because my slider only goes from 100 to 250, meaning we go from 1 meter to 2.5 meters. It is literally not possible to be below 1 meter or greater than 10 meters, which means this first digit is always going to be the meter. To get this one, I want to get the text string and simply get the first element, which isn't going to be 1, but a 0. Next up for the centimeters, I want to get my text string again, and now I want to go from the first element all the way to the end. With that, I have my meter and centimeter. So now I simply have to update self.outputString using the set method. And in here, I have to add an F string. The F string needs the meters, meter in here. Then I want to have a dot. After that, I want to have the centimeters. And finally, I want to add the units, so meter at the end. With that, I can run the entire thing again. By default, we can't see anything. I will fix that in just a second. But if I move the slider, we can see the meters being properly updated. That's looking really good. To see the text right when the app is starting, we simply have to call this method somewhere after we have created this output string. Let me do it right after. Self.update text. And really important in here, we have to add the amount. If we are calling update text inside of a slider, this amount is added automatically. But if we don't do it and just call it by itself, we have to add it manually. This fortunately is quite easy to do. Because we know the current height, we're getting this from the height int. Let me copy it, paste it in here, and all I have to do is get, and then we should be good to go. Now if I run this, we can see 1.7 meter by default, and I can update this. This is working just fine. With that, we have finished the height input. Now we can work on the weight input. For this one, we have to follow a somewhat similar logic compared to what we have done in the height input, which means this label here is going to get a text variable. Once we have that, we can use update weight, we already have a method for that, to update the number as well. Since this should be reasonably straightforward, it's going to be an exercise. I want you guys to update the text to display the current weight. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out. 
First of all, I once again am going to need another output string, which is going to be ctk.stringvar. This we now have to connect to the label, which we can do very easily. I want to have a text variable, which is going to be self.output string. With this output string, we don't actually need text anymore. I can simply get rid of it. I should also do the same thing for the height input, just to keep things a bit cleaner. This text, 1.8 meter, we don't need anymore. Back to the weight input. Now that we have this output string, and we have connected it to the label, if I run the app, we shouldn't see any text anymore. And we don't. That's working just fine. Next up, we have to work inside of update weight to actually update the text label. And for that, I want to call this method right when the app is started, which means after I've created this output string, I want to call self.updateWait. If I run this, we are going to get an error. This error happens down here, because right now info is going to be none, and we are trying to get the index on none, which doesn't work. To fix that error, I have to put all of this stuff here inside of an if statement. That if info exists, only then do I want to do all of this. And with that, I can run this again. We still can't see the text, but at the very least, the app isn't crashing anymore. However, what I can do now, after the if statement, set the output string. What I want to have in here is some kind of string that looks like, let's say, 80.1 kilogram. The weight I already have, because I have the weight float, which means I can get rid of this string here, replace it with an F string. I want to get myself dot weight underscore float. And let's just see what happens. We are getting the name of the tkinter variable because I forgot the get method. If I run this now, and click on the button. This one is working just fine for full kilograms. However, if I click on the small buttons, this seems to be working. Ah, there we go. Now we have way too many numbers after the decimal point. Although this we can fix fairly easily, all we have to do is round the weight. Let's say with one decimal point. Now if I run this, the kilogram buttons, so the larger buttons, still work perfectly fine. And on top of that, the small buttons should also be working totally fine now. And this is looking really good. Although there's one thing I have to add, and that is the kilogram afterwards. Now if I run this, we have kilograms, although the rest of the buttons still work just fine. All right, and with that, I can minimize, or before I want to get rid of the exercise text, and let me add a comment here for output logic. Now I can minimize the weight input, fix the white space, and we have covered another important part. To finish the app, I want to activate the button up here so we can switch between metric and imperial units. For now, we only work with metric ones, so meter and kilogram, but obviously for Americans and British people, this isn't going to work. The logic for all of this one isn't complicated. I just have to talk about a couple of formulas to convert kilogram to pounds and ounces and meters to inches and feet. Shouldn't be too difficult. Let's jump right in. Back in my code, there's one thing I want to do inside of the app to get started. And that is I want to add one more variable to my data. I guess we can do it right at the top. I want to create self.metric and this is a boolean which I create with ctk and boolean var. The default value here should be true. This metric boolean we're going to pass into the weight input and the height input to change the units and into the unit switcher to control it. Let's get started with the unit switcher. And here I want to pass in the metric boolean. With that I can minimize the app for now and work on the unit switcher because in here we are going to have some important logic. We have to start by adding a second parameter. I call this one the metric pool. This we have to turn into a parameter right away. Self.metricPool is going to be metric pool. What we now have to figure out is how to turn this unit switcher into a button, which actually is quite simple. All we have to do is use bind, so we have to use events. 
The one event I care about is called button. This is simply a mouse button click. If that is the case, I want to run a method that I called change units. This one doesn't exist right now. Let's create it right away. Change units. In here, we need self and we need the event. Although the event we are going to ignore entirely. In here, we have to do two things. Number one, we have to change the metric pool. Meaning, if it is currently true, then we want to set it to false and vice versa. This is very easily achieved. All we have to do is get self.metricBool and then set it with a new value. Since we only have true or false, we are working with Boolean values, the new value is simply going to be not self.metricBool.get. If this value is true right now, the not is going to turn it into false. And if this value here be false, then not would make it a true value. That way, we can have the entire logic in a single line of code, which is quite handy. Next up, we have to update the text. That is also going to be fairly simple. I want to check if self.metricBool.get. If this is true, then I know I am using metric units, which I can use with the configure method to update the text to metric. However, if that is not the case, else I want to configure the text as well. Let me just copy it, except now the units are going to be imperial. With that, we should already have a basic start. Let me run the app. And now if I click on metric, we get imperial. If I click on imperial, we get metric. We essentially created our own button. With that, I can minimize the unit switcher and not worry about it again. Although the white space here does annoy me. Back in the app. I now have to work either on the weight input or on the height input. Let's get started with the height input. In here, I have to pass in the metric bool. And for that, let me minimize the app again and work on the height input. We are now going to need another parameter, metric bool. This one absolutely has to be an attribute. Let's do that right at the top. Self.metricBool is going to be the metric boolean. Although we are not going to use it anymore inside of the init method, we are only going to care about it inside of update text. Because in here, I only want to do all of this if metric bool is true. So if self.metricBool.get, if that is the case, I know I am using metric values. But if that is not the case, so else, then I'm using imperial units. For that, I have to figure out feed and inches. Right now, we have the centimeters inside of our amount. For example, the value we start with is 170. And this would be centimeters. These 170 centimeters, I now want to convert to inches. The formula to get an inch from centimeters would be one centimeter divided by 2.54. That's literally it. It's not terribly difficult. Next up, to get to feet, we have to get one inch and divide it by 12. These are all the units that we are going to need. All of this can actually be done in a single line of code. How I approach this. First of all, I want to get the amount and divide it by 2.5. This would simply give me the inches. But what I can do now is to use diff mod and then add a second argument, which is going to be a 12. For example, right now we are starting with 170 and 170 divided by 2.54 would be almost 67. What diff mod is then doing is divide this entire thing by 12. So divided by 12, which would be giving us a five and then point, let's say almost 0.7. Both of these numbers we are getting separately, which is literally all we need to convert centimeters to feet and inches. As a matter of fact, to make sure that this is working, let me print feet and inches. Now, if I run this again, 
I have to click on metric to get imperial units. And now if I move the slider, we are getting some units. The text doesn't update anymore, but at the very least in the bottom, you can see that this seems to be working just fine. To actually make it visible, I want to duplicate this line here because I want to set the output string. But this isn't going to be meters and centimeters anymore. Instead, I want to have my feet. The shorthand units for this is a single quotation mark, which is going to confuse Python, so we have to add the escape character. This one here and shows that we can only see the quotation mark or the single quotation mark. After we have that, I want to add the inches. And for this, we need a double quotation mark. And just to make sure that this isn't confusing to Python, I want to add the escape character as well. With that, we should be seeing something. If I now go to metric and update all of this, we can see that, well, we get a whole bunch of numbers. The issue, once again, is we have a huge amount of numbers after the decimal point. To account for that, I want to wrap both of those into an int function. And now let's try this again. I have to click on metric to get imperial. And now I get the feet and inches. This is going to give us the basic logic. So we have a good start. However, you might have already noticed there's one problem. I can update the meters individually. And if I now click on metric, I get imperial. However, the meters right now are still visible. Only once I update the slider, do I get to the feet and inches. So the issue is only when I'm moving the slider, do I run this method here to get the different kind of units. If I simply click on the unit switcher, nothing is going to happen. Let's work on this one next. This is going to happen once again inside of the app. In here, I want to use tracing one more time. I want to get my metric boolean. And once again, I want to trace and check if the value is changing. If that is the case, I want to call a method I called change units. This one doesn't exist right now. Let's create it right away. Change units. In here, we need self and we need the arcs. Although, once again, I'm going to ignore them entirely. Inside of this method, I want to run a method on the height input, which isn't possible right now because I didn't turn this instance of the class into an attribute. Although that I can change quite easily. I want to have this as the height underscore input. Now I can access this self dot height input. The method I want to use is called update text, I believe I called it. Let's check inside of height input. I have this update text method. This is what I want to use. This one wants one argument, and that is the current height, which we do have available inside of this height integer. Let me copy it and simply pass it in here with the get method. With that, this should be working. Now I can still update the height, but if I click on metric, I now immediately get the imperial units. I can still update them just fine. And if I return to metric, I am back to meters. With that, we have finished the height input. So next up, we can work on the weight input. For this one, like for the height, we first of all need another parameter, which is going to be the metric boolean. This we have to pass into it when we create the instance. So in here, self dot metric bool. And let me minimize the class app so I have a bit more space. First of all, I want to turn the metric bool into an attribute. Self dot metric bool will be the metric boolean. After that, I don't need the dunder init method anymore because the entirety of the logic is going to happen inside of update weight. In here, I still want to check if the info exists. However, now the amount I want to have a bit more flexibly. What that means is I want to check if self dot metric bool is true. And only if that is the case, I want to increase the amount by one or by 0 0.1. Those would be the sensible units for kilogram. However, if that is not the case, I want to use imperial units once again. 
the units for this one would be pounds and ounces. For that, once again, we have to talk about units. I am once again starting with one kilogram or 0 0.1 kilogram. And I'm not really going to convert them. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the pounds by one pound. One pound is 0 0.453592 kilogram. A G at the end. To get to ounces, we simply, let me write ounce in here. All we have to do is get one pound and divide it by 16. Since the units are actually fairly simple, all I really have to do in here is get my amount. And by default, this is going to be one pound, which would be 0 0.453592 kilogram. This I only want to get if info one is equal to large, which should be a string. If that is not the case, so else, I want to get this same number and divide it by 16. With that, I am either getting one pound or one ounce, except I'm expressing them in terms of kilograms and grams. That is actually the entire trick for how this logic is going to work. I am always working in metric units, like kilograms or meters and centimeters, except for the front end, I'm converting these numbers either to metric units or to imperial units. Because of that, this logic here can stay exactly identical. We simply change the amount that we are working with. However, at the bottom, we have to make a few more updates, because right now we are only working with metric units. To update this one, I want you guys to do an exercise. I want you guys to do some research and get the proper output for both metric and imperial units. Meaning we either want to have kilogram, this we already get, and if we're using imperial units, I want to display the pounds and the ounces. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out. The first step that we have to do is we have to check if we are using metric or imperial units, which we get with self.metricbool.get. If that is the case, I know I'm using metric units, so this line here can stay identical. If that is not the case, and I forgot the if statement here, if that is not the case, so else, then I want to use imperial units, which means what we now have to figure out is how to get the pounds and the ounces. The function we can use here is diffmod once again. However, for that, we will need just the ounces, which we don't have right now, because this is what we are trying to get. Although once we have the ounces, we simply have to divide them by 16, and then the remainder will be the ounces that are left. Now, how can we get the ounces first of all? Well, for that, I want to add another variable. Let me call it the raw ounces. For that, first of all, I want to get the current weight. So self.weight load and get. This would get me the kilogram. To turn this into pounds, I want to multiply this with 2.20462. And just in case you're confused, if we have one kilogram, this would be 0 0.45 pounds. This is what we have done here. However, what we do down here is the reverse. So we have one pound and that is going to be 2.2 kilogram. Also, I forgot the G here that needs to be there. With this, we would have the pounds. To get to the ounces, we have to multiply this by 16. Because remember, there are 16 ounces inside of one pound. With that, we have all the ounces that we need. And this is what I want to use diff mod with. Once I have that, I can simply get my output string and set a new value. For this one, we need an F string. We first of all want to have the pounds with LB afterwards, then a white space, and then we get the ounces. The short end for that is OZ. Now let's try this. If I now click on Imperial, we can still see the kilogram, but if I click on a button, we now get something else. Once again, the issue is that the rounding here creates way too many numbers. To fix that, 
I want to turn both of these numbers into integers. And now let's try this again. I click on Imperial, and now if I click on the button, this is looking much better. So I can change the ounces and the kilogram. With that, I can get rid of the exercise text. We don't need it anymore. In fact, I can minimize update weight entirely. The last thing that I have to do inside of the app, when I am calling change units, I also want to update the weight input. For that, I first of all have to create an attribute, self.weight input is going to be one instance of the class. Now that I have that, inside of change units, I want to get self.weight input. The method I want to call, if I scroll down a tiny bit, is simply update weight. This works because inside of here, we are only updating the units if we have information. But by default, this is none. So if we call the method by itself without any arguments, it is simply going to run this bit down here which is all we need. Meaning in here, update weight. With that, we should be done. I can now click on plus and minus for the kilogram. I can update the height in meters. And now if I click on imperial, we get pounds and ounces and we get feet and inches. All of those we can update quite easily. This seems to be working just fine. And we also get the BMI updated. So with that, we have finished another app. Let's get started by working on the calculator. You can see the result already. It is very much inspired by the iOS calculator. Although for the most part, let me show my mouse, I can simply add any kind of calculation in here and I would get a result. I can also clear the entire thing. And on top of that, I have the plus and minus button from the iOS calculator and the percentage sign. Other than that, it's, well, a calculator. There are two major changes compared to the original calculator. The first one is on the top. We now have the formula that we have typed in, which I think is really annoying that this doesn't exist in the original calculator. This is quite easy to add. The other change I made is that besides the dark mode, we also have a light mode. It works in exactly the same way, but if your system settings are light, then you're going to get a much brighter calculator, which fits much better into the system overall. All of this will be covered in this section, and there really isn't terribly much that is complicated to work on. The one slight complication is that we have to create a lot of buttons, and most of these buttons have some slight difference in functionality. For that, we're going to work quite a bit with inheritance, but I'll talk about that more when we get to it. For now, I want to set up a basic window. But before we get to that, I want to talk about the folder we have, because this one is slightly more elaborate. The folder I'll be starting with is going to look something like this. In here, we have calculator.py and settings.py in terms of Python. Settings.py is going to contain already quite a bit, but all of these are just settings. So what the calculator will look like and where the buttons are going to be. I'll show you that one in just a second. The entirety of the logic, though, is going to be inside of calculator.py. Right now, this one is completely empty. Besides that, we have empty.ico. I'm using this one to hide the icon. That's literally all it does. Finally, we have one folder called images. If I open this one, in here we have four images. One for division and one for the inversion, I think this is. We always have one for dark mode and one for light mode. The reason why we need those four buttons is because the character doesn't exist in the normal alphabet. As a consequence, when I'm creating these buttons, I will have an image and then use this image for the button. That covers the setup. Let's have a look at all of this in code. Here you can see calculator.py, it is completely empty. Besides that, I have settings, let me scroll to the top. In here, we do have quite a bit more. I start with some basic sizing information. This is giving us the app size and how many rows and columns I have. After that, we have some text information, so the font and the font size. Then I have a tiny bit on styling. And all of that is fairly simple. The really important bit here are these three dictionaries because they contain the position and some additional information about the buttons. For example, this entry here is for the button number two. This button should be in column one, row five, and span one cell. Or this entry here, for example, this is for the multiplication button. This one is in column three, row three. It shows the character X for multiplication, but the operation is going to be a multiplication. That's this sign here. I'll explain all of that later. Finally, all the way at the bottom, we have a huge amount of colors. This part should be fairly straightforward. 
Now inside settings.py, we are not going to add any logic. All of that is going to be inside of the calculator. Speaking of, let's create a basic window. This I want to do with custom tkinter, which means I want to import custom tkinter as ctk. Once I have that, I want to create a class that I called calculator. You could call it whatever you want, but I guess calculator makes sense here. This one needs to inherit from ctk and ctk. First of all, in here, we have to create a dunder init method with self, but no other parameters. Finally, the first argument we always need is the super dunder init method to initiate the parent. With that, we have a basic object. But to see the actual window, we have to add one more line. This would be self and main loop. Don't forget to call it. With that, we're going to have a window that we can at the very least see. All we have to do is create an instance of this calculator. With that, we have a basic window. This one looks pretty good. Although I do want to customize this quite a bit. While I'm doing this, I also want to be conscious of light and dark modes. Meaning for now, if the system settings are light, then I want to have a white-ish background. If the system settings are dark, then I want to have a black background. For that, first of all, we have to detect if the user is using a light mode or a dark mode. For that, we have to import dark detect. We can use this one. Let me put it above the calculator. I want to print dark detect, and then the method is dark. Don't forget to call it. Now if I run the code, I get true, because in my case, I'm using the dark mode. However, if I go to my system settings and I switch from dark mode to light mode and return to my code, I can run this thing again, and now this is going to be false, which means I now am aware if the user is using dark mode or light mode. In my case, I'm going to stick to dark mode, but I will switch around quite a bit. Back in here, I want to go back to dark mode. To account for all of this inside of the app, I want to add a second parameter that I called is dark. With that, I can simply pass all of this into the calculator, and then I know if the user is using dark mode and light mode, and I can account for that inside of this class. Although before that, I want to add one more if statement. This if statement is going to check if the name is equal to dunder main. Only then do I want to create an instance of the calculator. The result is going to be the same, but that way we prevent any kind of code not inside of this file to cause some accidental errors. Once we have that, we can actually come to customizing the calculator itself. Let me put all of this inside of a setup section. And in here, we have to add quite a few more things. Number one, I want to set the appearance to dark or light depending on is dark. If this is dark is true, then I want to call the dark mode. If it is false, then I want to call the light mode. Besides that, number two, I want to set the FG color and set this to white or black, depending on the light mode or the dark mode. These two colors you can get from the settings because all the way at the bottom, we have black and white. Black is pure black, white is not perfect white. If you understand the hexadecimal colors here, you can see that this is almost perfect white, but not exactly. These two colors you should be using. Number three, get the start window size from the settings and disable window resizing. The start window size you can get also from settings in here. Finally, number four, hide the title and the icon. I want you guys, let me resize this a tiny bit. This stuff here should disappear. These four things should be fairly straightforward. As a consequence, this is going to be an exercise. Pause the video now and try to implement this one yourself. Number one. For this one, I need ctk and then set underscore appearance underscore mode. This one is expecting either dark or light. Which means if I run it like this, we get light mode. If I run it with dark, we get the dark mode. This entry I want to make dependent on is dark, which I do with an F string. I want to have dark if is dark is true. If that is not the case, else, then I want to have light. Let's try this one, and it's looking pretty good. Next up, 
I want to update the fg color. This has to happen inside of the super init method. In here, I need an fg color. Since we have a color for the light and the dark mode, we need a tuple in here. The first argument is going to be for the light mode, the second for the dark mode, which means with a tuple white and black, I can run this again. And we're getting an error because white is not defined. That is happening because we're not importing settings. That we can change quite easily. I want from settings, import everything. If I fix my typo, this should be working. There we go. Now we can see the background color is completely black. Before this was a dark gray. Number three, I want to set the start window size and also disable window resizing. To set the start size, I want to use self.geometry. This one wants a string, something like 400 times 600. However, inside of the settings, we have a tuple with the app size. Let me copy this one right away, actually. To get this one, I want to replace the 400 with curly brackets. In here, I want app size and the entry zero. Then I can copy all of this and replace the 600 with app size and one. Now if I run this, we have a much larger window. Besides that, I want to disable window resizing. This I get with self.resizable. The arguments here are false and false. Those cover the horizontal and the vertical axis. Now if I run this, let me show my mouse. I can try to resize the window, it simply doesn't work. For the final part, I want to hide the title and the icon. The title is the easier bit. For this, I need self.title and an empty string. Running this again, now on the top left, we don't have a title anymore. To hide the icon, we need self and icon bit map. This is going to import an icon that we're going to set as the icon for the app. For this one, I have empty.ico. If I run this one now, there we go. In the top left, we have nothing anymore, which looks significantly cleaner. This also covers the exercise. Let me get rid of all of the comments because they are getting a bit tedious. That is much better. For the final part, if I run the app again, I want to color the title bar because right now this bit up here looks a bit weird. It doesn't fit at all with the rest of the app, which means I want to create another method that I called title bar color. For the parameters, we need self, and I want to pass is dark in here. In here, we can now run some code to color the title bar. However, for that, we have to import a few more things. Also, since this is only going to work on Windows, I want to wrap all of this inside of a try statement. That way, on the Mac, we at least don't get an error. I want from C types import win dll by ref size of and finally c underscore int. However, if we're getting an error, so except, then I want to run pass. So nothing at all. With that, inside of title bar color, the method, I want to create another try statement because in here I can now run the code to color the title bar. For that, first of all, I want to create a variable that I always call hwnd. This we get with winddll user32 and then get parent. To get the parent, we need the ID of the current app, which we get with winfo underscore ID. Do not forget to call this one. Next up, we need a dwm dwa underscore attribute, which is simply going to be 35. The one important difference here, in the earlier tutorials, I always had a single color. Well, we still have a single variable. But this variable now is either going to have the hex color for, let me open it inside of settings. We have either the dark color or the light color. Which means we have to add an if statement in there. I want to copy the title bar hex colors. I want to get dark, but only if is dark is true. If that is not the case, else, then I want to get title bar hex colors with the light color. Or oh, I think that's what I called it. Yeah, light color. That gives us all we need, which means finally, I have to call win dll dwm api 
Now we get to the long one, capital D, W, M, set, window, attribute. For this one, we want to target the window, which is A, W, N, D. Then I want to get the D, W, M, A attribute. After that, I have to add the color, except I have to convert it a tiny bit. For that, we have by ref, then C underscore int, and this one is getting the color. For the last argument, we need size of and then C underscore int. That should be all we need for this one. Although the last bit is we have to add an accept statement, which is not going to do anything. With that, all I have to do now is call self title bar color and pass is dark in here. If I run this now, we're getting an error. That is because I forgot the if statement in here. Now if I run this again, this is looking much better. On top of that, what I can do, I can set this is dark to false to check the light mode. So if I run this now, we have the light mode. Although I want to keep on working with the dark mode, which still is working just fine. With that, I can minimize everything because this covers the first part. We have our window. Now that we have a basic window, we can start working on the elements that are actually visible. There are going to be quite a few. What I want to start with, let me type a tiny bit in here actually. Let's do something like this. What I want to start with. I want to have this text here and this text here. Although for now, they are not going to do anything. I just want to have the basic widget. Later on, they will become interactive. Back in my code, I want to keep on working inside of the calculator. The first thing I have to do in here is I have to create a layout because without that, we can't add any widgets. I want to use a grid layout. In fact, let me talk about how this is going to work. The grid layout is going to be, well, a grid. For this app, I want to have seven rows and I want to have four columns. The columns should be fairly straightforward. We have column zero, column one, column two, and column three. For the rows, this part here is also quite easy to understand. This would be row number six, five, four, three, and two. After that, and those columns you can't really see, we have these columns here. One is looking something like this for the main output. This would be row number one, and finally, we have all the way to the top, row number zero. Those numbers I'm actually getting from the settings. If I scroll up, here we have main rows and main columns. Those I want to use to create all of these columns and rows dynamically. Although for that, first of all, I have to start with self and row configure. What I ultimately want to get in here is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 all with the same weight of 1. Also, I want to have uniform and set this to A. The thing that I have to create dynamically is this list here. For that, I'm going to use the range function and pass my main rows in here. I think that's what I called it, main rows. I'm using this variable here. This by itself is not going to work because row configure is expecting a tuple or a list. Whereas this range is going to give us a range object. But this we can convert to a list or a tuple, and then we have the proper outcome. With that, I can duplicate the line, because besides a row, I also want to have a column. The only difference now is going to be that I'm not going to use main rows. Instead, I will be using main columns. Or at least that's what I think I called it. Yeah, main columns. I can now run the app. And well, we can't really see a result, but now we have a grid that we can work with. To organize the text, I want to create a separate class, which means I want to minimize the calculator and create a class that I called output label. Since this is just going to be a label, I'm going to inherit from CTK label. Other than that, we need a dunder in a method and this one, for now, is just going to be self and parent. After that, as always, we need the super init method, 
First of all, I want to set the master to whatever the parent is. After that, I want to set the text so we can see something. Let's say I'm just going to type one, two, three in here. Next up, we have to place this output label. Since we're using the grid layout, this has to be a grid. In here, we have a column, which is always going to be zero. After that, I want to set the column span, which is going to be four. After that, we have to specify the row. And the row has to be more flexible because this output label, we are going to use twice, once for the formula and then for the actual output. As a consequence, we cannot hard code the row. This we have to get from the parameters, which means I want to add the row in here and pass it to the grid method. Once we have that inside of the calculator, I can start creating some basic widgets. Although later on, we're going to create a huge amount of widgets. As a consequence, I want to have a separate method to create the widgets. I'll call it create widgets. So I need a method called create widgets with self and nothing else. In here, for now, I'm going to create the labels. Or to be a bit more specific, the output labels. For this one, I want to create an output label with, for now, I will need a parent and a row. The parent is always going to be self. The first label is going to be in row zero. After that, I want to have the exact same output label, except this one should be in row one. With that, if I run the app, we can see we have one, two, three twice. Although the positioning here is not ideal. If I draw this one in, we have one cell here and we have a second cell here. Just imagine that I'm able to draw straight lines. The first thing that I want to do is I want to move this one to three here, the first one to the bottom right. It should be somewhere here. The other one to three, this one here, should only be moved all the way to the right, which means it should at the end be somewhere here. That way, later on, once we have larger font sizes, they are properly filling the entire available space in a proper way. Also, to achieve this kind of thing, this is going to be your exercise. I want you guys to update this class so you can control on what corner the label is going to be. I suppose I should be adding this in text. The exercise is going to be update the class so you can control which corner the label is attached to. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out. The argument that we need inside of self.grid is called sticky. This one tells the label which side to stick to. In here, for example, we can set this to E and then our text is going to stick all the way to the right. However, since I want each label to stick to a different side, I want to set this via the parameter. Let's call this one the anchor. This I want to pass through to the anchor. Now for both of these, we need one more argument in here. For the first output label, let me actually add a comment here. This is going to be for the formula. This one should stick to the southeast or the bottom right. Whereas the result should only stick to the east side. Now if I run this again, you still can't see much of a difference, but well, we will be getting there. To make this a tiny bit more visual, the first cell would be something like this, while the second cell would be looking roughly like this. Before I'm continuing, I'm going to get rid of this text here. We don't need it anymore. On top of that, I want to set some horizontal padding of 10 pixels. That way the text isn't completely attached to the right side anymore. What we have to do now is add a font so the text here looks significantly better. Unfortunately, we couldn't just create a font inside of the output label. For one, because these two labels need a different font because they're different text sizes. On top of that, later on, I want to reuse the font for the formula for the buttons as well. As a consequence, 
I want to create my fonts inside of the create widget method. That way I can pass them into the output labels and later on into the buttons. The first font is going to be, I call this one the main font, because this is what I'm going to use the most. We are creating this one with CTK and CTK font. In here we need a family and we need a size. The family, we are getting both from settings. The family is always going to be the font. I can pass this one in here. Next up for the size, I want to use the normal font size. Pass this in here and then we're good to go. This main font I'm going to use for the formula and for all of the buttons. Besides that, I want to have a result font. For this one, I can simply duplicate this line here because most of it stays the same. The one difference is that I now want to use the output font size instead of the normal font size. That is giving me two fonts and those I want to pass into the formula, which is going to get the main font. The output label for the result is going to get the result font. Once we have that, inside of the output label, we now need one more parameter that I called the font. This font we now have to pass into the super init method in here font is equal to font. Now if I run this again, that is starting to come together much nicer. The last thing that I want to do is that right now both the output labels are simply displaying text one to three. This has to become a tiny bit more interactive, although for now we are not going to use it. For that, Inside of the init method, before I'm creating the widgets, I want to add another section that I called data. In here, I'm going to create two string variables. First of all, I want to create self.resultString. This is a string, so ctk string var. The default value for this one should be a string of zero. This is what we should be seeing by default. After that, I can duplicate this because next up, I want to have another string var for the formula. Although this one for the default value has simply nothing. Basically, later on, when we have actual functionality, the result string is going to get the result we see from any kind of calculation. And the formula is going to, well, give us the formula. These two string vars, I now want to pass into these output labels and set them as the text variable for each of the label. Which means for the output label for the formula, the final argument is going to be self.formula string. Whereas for the result label, we need self.result string. Because of that, we will need one more parameter. Let's call it the string var. This string var, I want to set as the text variable which is going to be the string var. With that, if I run all of this again, we can see a zero for the result and nothing for the formula. To make sure this is working, let me add test for the formula and we have test. So this is definitely working. Also, because of the text variable, this text is now redundant, meaning we can get rid of it entirely to make all of this a bit cleaner. With that, we have finished the output label which means I can minimize everything because this covers a really important part. Next up, we can start working on the buttons. This is going to be a larger section. Now that we have the labels, we can start working on the buttons. For that, we need quite a bit for the simple reason that we have a lot of different buttons. Just to go through them really quick, we are going to have these number buttons here. Those are going to give us the numbers from zero to nine and the dot. Besides that, we have the math buttons. Those are divide, multiply, minus, and plus, and the result button I also added in here. At the end, we have, these are called the operator buttons. Those are clear, invert, and percentage sign. All of these work in slightly different ways, so we have to account for that. On top of that, what is also quite important is that for the division button, and the invert button, we have images instead of text. This we also have to account for. As a consequence, I will create quite a few different classes for the buttons, 
and then work with that. Should be a really good practice for inheritance, but let's jump right in and let's have a look at all of this. Back in calculator.py, I first of all want to get rid of this white space because it annoyed me. Now, since we're going to create quite a few different buttons, I'm going to store the logic in a separate Python file, meaning I want to, with Control and N, create a new file and save this one with Control and S. This file I'm going to call buttons.py. We are still going to use custom tkinter, but we only need one class, which means I want from custom tkinter import ctk button. This is the only part of custom tkinter I am going to need. Although besides that, I am also needing from settings import everything. To get started in here, I want to create a class that I called button. This should also start with a capital letter. This one, since we are simply going to create a button, I want to inherit from ctk and button. Importantly here, you do not have to add ctk at the beginning, because now we are importing a ctk button straight away. For this one, first of all, I want to have a dunder init method. This one needs self, we need a parent, we need some text, then we need a column and a row separated by a comma. And that is all I'm going to use for now. I should also specify for now, I am going to create this AC button and the percentage sign. Those are going to be basically the simplest buttons that we are going to have to create those inside of this dunder in the method for the button. I have to call super and dunder init as always. In here, I will need quite a few different arguments. So let me use named ones. I want to have the master, which is going to be the parent. Next up, text is going to be text. That is all we need for the super init method to place the button. I want to call self.grid. This one is going to get column with call and row is going to be the row. We are simply passing these two parameters in here and here. Besides that, I also want to make sure that the button sticks to all of the sides, which means I want to use sticky and north, south, east and west. This is going to give us an incredibly simple button that we can use, which means back in calculator.py, I want all the way at the top below custom tkinter from buttons, I want to import for now only the button. If I run the code now, this is not crashing. So at the very least, we know that this is kind of working. Which means now, inside of the calculator, I can minimize the init method and the title bar color. We also don't need. Instead, I want to create the AC button, which is going to be the clear button. Let me type it like this. That's a bit clearer. This is going to be simply a button, which is the button we just created. For this button, we're going to need a bunch of arguments to cover all of these parameters. Let me copy them actually and paste them in here. We definitely want to use named arguments because later on, there are going to be a lot more arguments in here. First of all, the parent is easy. This is going to be self. For the text, for now, I simply want to have AC. The column for this one is going to be zero. The row is going to be two. With that, if I run the code, we are getting an error because I stopped using the keywords. This should be column, this should be row. Now let's try this. And there we go. We have the first button. Doesn't do anything right now, but at the very least we have something. Although there's already one thing I do have to change because the text, the column and the row, I want to get from the settings. This is really important. I want to work with this operator dictionary. In here, we have the clear button, and this has the column, the row, the text. And if we had an image, it would also have an image path. The clear button doesn't have one, but the invert one does have one. This kind of setup is really important because I want to make sure for the styling and the layout of my button, all of this is organized separately. That way, I can make any kind of change in here and it would be reflected inside of the calculator. For anything more complicated, you do want to separate the logic and the layout. 
makes it much easier to work with a more complex program. All right, I want to get the operators. Use the operators inside of my button. As a matter of fact, let me put all of this over multiple lines so it's going to be easier to read. First of all, I want to get the operators. In here, the button I'm working on is clear. This one here. This is going to give me another dictionary. Inside of this dictionary, I have the keys column, row, and text. I want to have the text. Then I can copy all of this for the column. Instead of text, this should be call. Finally, for the row, the text should be row. If I run this now, we cannot see a difference because we have used the same data. But now, inside of settings, I could make an update here and it would be reflected in the app. Just to test this, let me rename AC to something, run the calculator again, and now we get something. Meaning all of this is at the very least working. But now, obviously, if I run this again, this button doesn't look very good. We have to make a few more changes here. Inside of the button, we have to do a couple of things. A very easy thing to work on is to set a corner radius. This corner radius we're getting from the settings. In here, we have styling. I want to get my styling. This is another dictionary. Inside of this styling, we have corner radius. With that, if I run this again, now we have no more corner radii. Another important thing is I want to add a font. This font we already have, which means I can set this to font and get my font via the parameters. This I can do because inside of the calculator, we have created two fonts all the way up here. I want to use the main font for this button as well, which means I can copy it. For this button, I want to set a font to my main font. Now if I run this, we have a much better looking text. What we now have to work on is the color. For that, I want to have another parameter. And let me explain how the colors are going to work. Inside of settings, at the bottom, there are a whole bunch of colors. The color we will use for now is dark gray. This is the color I generally want to use for the operator buttons. We have a foreground color, we have a hover color, and we have a text color. These colors are always going to be tuples. For example, for the FG color, we have this tuple here. One is for the light mode, the other is for the dark mode. This applies to all of the colors. We always have a tuple with two different colors, which means when I'm assigning the color here, I can simply pass in a default argument with dark gray. Although this by itself isn't going to do anything. I can run the code again. We cannot see this color. To account for that, when we are running the super init method, we have to add quite a bit more. For example, if I want to get the FG color, I want to get from my settings, I want to have the colors. Paste this in here. This colors is a dictionary, all of this stuff here. I now want to get one entry in here, which is going to be dark gray. This dark gray, I am getting via my color, this one up here. So all I have to do is pass this into this dictionary with the color. With that, I am inside of another dictionary in here. I want to get the FG which is the foreground color, which means another dictionary with FG. And now I can run the calculator again. And there we go. This is looking much better. If I hover over it, we still get a bad color, but at the very least we're making progress. On top of that, if I now switch to the light mode, meaning if I set is dark to false, we also get an updated color, although we do have to work on a text color. Let me revert this and now we can keep on working inside of buttons and make a few more changes. Besides the FG color, I also want to set the hover color and the text color, which is fairly easy to do. I want to have the hover color, which is going to be the same thing we have done before, all of this, except now we don't want to use FG. Instead, I want to use hover. Hover in here without any white space. And now if I run this again, show my mouse, the basic color still works. If I have over it, basically the same thing, just a tiny bit brighter, but it certainly works. Finally, 
I want to have the text color, which once again is going to be basically identical. I want to copy this one and now this shouldn't be hover, this should be text, or at least I think that's what I called it, yeah. And here we have text. Now, if I run this, this is still looking good. Hover should also work, this is looking nice. You can mostly see this when I switch to the light mode, meaning this one should be false again. Now this button is much more visible. I still want to use the dark mode. And with that, we have one of the buttons, at least to an extent. The problem we have right now is that this button doesn't do anything, which is not ideal for a button. To account for that, to get started inside of the button, I want to have, let me put it, right beside text, I want to pass in a function, which the button is then going to call. To connect this one to the button, we have to give this button a command, which is going to be the function. With that, we just going to need a function we can pass into this button. Since this is going to be the clear button, I want to create one method inside of the calculator, which I called clear. This will not get any parameters, and for now, I simply want to print clear. Once we have that, inside of this button, I want to add another named argument. The function is going to be self.clear. Really important here, do not call this function. We're just passing the function around, we're not calling it yet. This is only going to happen once we click on the button. In fact, let's try this one. Now, if I click on the AC button, we can see clear inside of the code editor. So this is working quite well. This is going to give us one button. There is a second button we can create right away. I call this button the percentage button. If I run the entire thing again, the button I want to create now is this one here. Since this should be reasonably easy, this is going to be your exercise. I want you guys to create the percentage button and you have all you need. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out. For the percentage button, we are going to use the same button class, meaning I can just copy all of this and paste it in here. We just have to make some updates. The most important one or the most visible ones are the text, the column and the row. This information, if I look inside of settings, we can get from the operator dictionary because in here we have percent. To access all of that, all we have to do inside of the button, I want to replace this clear with percent. If I run this now, we have the percentage button. Also works with the hover, so this was really easy to add. The main font we are also going to use, the only other change that we have to make is this function because, well, this button is not going to clear the calculator, it is going to, let's call it the percent, which needs self for now, and in here we're going to print percent. Once again, this button isn't going to do anything for now, we are just working on the UI. I have to replace clear with percent, and then test all of this. I have the AC button, this one still says clear, and the percentage button says percent. Alrighty, with that, we have two buttons. Definitely some progress. At this point, we have two buttons, this one and this one. Both of those are using text. Next up, I want to create this invert button here. And this one is different because it uses an image instead of text. For that, I'm going to create a separate class. Although for the most part, it is going to be quite similar compared to the other buttons. Let's jump right in. And let's have a look at this one. Back inside of calculator.py, let me run this again, we have two buttons. Not a bad start, but we need a bit more. Inside of buttons.py, I want to create another class, which I called image button. This one, once again, has to inherit from ctk button. We need a dunder init method with self, we need a parent, and then, well, we are going to need a lot of the stuff up here. As a matter of fact, let me just copy it all. In terms of changes, this one does not need a font, but we do need an image. This image we're going to create inside of the calculator. 
which means we don't have to create it in here. Once we have all of that, I have to create a super gender init method with the usual stuff. As a matter of fact, I can copy all of the stuff I created up here and simply paste it down here. With that, I can get rid of the font, but I do have to replace it with an image, which is going to be the image we're getting from the parameters. Also, let me put it up here, so we have the styling all together. Once we have that, I want to place this button using the grid method, which once again is going to be very similar compared to this grid method. So I can simply copy the entire thing and we don't have to change very much. While I'm here, I did realize I forgot one thing, and that is inside of settings, if I go up a bit, we have a gap. This gap I haven't used right now, but I do want to use it, which I can do by adding pad x is going to be styling. And this one I called gap, or at least I think I did. Yeah, gap. This is going to be pad x and will also be pad y, which I want to do both for the image button and for the normal button. This one up here, they both get this kind of padding. It's not going to be visible for now, but later on, it is going to be this tiny black line between the buttons. With that, I can minimize the button. And now for the image button, we are basically good to go. What we have to do now is actually use this button, which is going to happen inside of the calculator.py file. In here, first of all, I have to import this button, which means image button. With that, we can use it. If I run this, we can certainly import it, the program doesn't crash. Now inside of the calculator, I don't need the init method. Instead, I want to work inside of my create widgets. In here, I want to create the invert button. This button is going to be an image button. But before we can create that, we have to create the invert image, which is going to be a CTK and CTK image. Importing this is actually going to be your exercise. I want you guys, let me type it, import the image and create the image button. There are way too many typos in here. Image and the, this is looking much better. I want you guys to import the image and then create an image button in the appropriate place. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out yourself. Righty. First of all, we have to import the invert image. For that, inside of CTK image, we need two things. We need the light image and we need the dark image. Both of those we are getting by using image.open. Although this image we don't have available right now. We are getting that all the way from the top. Let me put it below here. I want from PIL import image. That way I can import images. With that, image.open, the file path I am getting from the settings. The one we are looking for right now is this one here. Inside of the operators, I want to get invert. This is going to give me another dictionary. This dictionary has image path. I want to get my operators. I want to get the invert dictionary. Inside of this dictionary, I have the image path, meaning now we are in here, which in fact is going to be another dictionary, which has light and dark. For the light image, this is going to sound a bit counterintuitive. I want to have the dark image. On top of that, for the dark image, I want to have, if I copy all of this, I want to have the light image. The way you want to think about it is that light image is the image for the light mode. Since we have a white background for this one, we want to have a dark image. Whereas for the dark image, so the image for the dark mode, we have lots of black. So for the actual image, we want to have the light image. Now we have to figure out the image button. For that, we need all of these parameters. The color can stay dark gray. This one is totally fine. For the parent, 
I want to have self, text. We can simply leave empty, like so. For the function, for now, this should be over multiple lines. We want to create another method. I call this one invert. Once again, no need for any parameters. And for now, I just want to print invert. The function is going to be self.invert. Next up, we have the column, the row, and the image. The image is the really easy bit because this is what we just created, invert image. Column and row, we are getting from the settings. In here, I want to get operators, invert, this one has column and row. Although this I can simply copy from the other buttons. I have operators, this shouldn't be percent, this should be invert. The same I can do for the row. This should be invert and row. With that, we should be having something working. Let's try. With that, we have a button. I can click on it, we get invert, and we also get the hover effect. On top of that, to check the light mode, I want to set this dark detect to false once again, run this again, and there we go. This also works in light mode, meaning I can go back to dark mode and this is looking really good. There's one more change that I do want to make, and that is that this text right now is not really necessary. However, if I go to the buttons and don't set a text here, run this again, we get CTK button as the default text, which is, well, not ideal. We do need this text in here. However, what we can do, we can set a default argument for the text. But for that to work, we have to put the text all the way at the end, and now we can set a default empty string. This text needs to be at the end because we have a default value, whereas for these we don't. Once we have that, we have a default value, so inside of this image button, I can get rid of the text, which is looking a tiny bit cleaner. The result is still going to be the same. With that, I can get rid of the exercise, and we have our image button. You might be wondering now, if I look at the buttons, the normal button and the image button look really similar. They are roughly 80% identical. So why didn't I use the button as the parent for the image button? And that is a really good question. What I could have done, for example, is combine these two classes where the button gets an image argument, which by default is going to be none. And after the init method, I can check if an image exists and if that is the case, I want to run self.configure and set the image to the image we get. That way, we could have skipped this entire bit. However, this didn't work in custom T Kinter. Whenever I tried this, I get some weird behavior around the images, which might be fixed in the future, but right now, this is some behavior that is there. That's why I'm creating two separate classes. For the next button, though, we are going to inherit from this button to create the number buttons. But that's gonna be the next bit. I'll see you there. At this stage, we have three buttons, which is a start, but didn't get us very far. So for this bit, we're going to create all of these number buttons. That is a terrible square, but we're going to create these buttons here. For that, we're going to use the base buttons we have created, and then use inheritance to create the other buttons. That way, we don't have to start entirely from scratch. Also, it's a really good way to practice inheritance. Let's have a look at this one. Here I am back in my code. I want to work inside of the buttons. And let me minimize everything. I want to create another class. I have called this one a num button. Really important here, this num button is going to inherit from the button. The one we created a tiny bit earlier, this one here. In fact, let me open both, then I can explain a bit better what's going on. As always, we are going to need the dunder init method in here. This one needs a couple of parameters now. Self is the usual one. After that, I need a lot of the parameters that we created up here. In fact, let me just copy all of them. We have parent, text, function, column, row, font, and color. There's one change that I already want to make, 
that is inside of color. These buttons shouldn't be dark gray. Instead, they should be inside of settings. I have the colors. They should be light gray. Let me copy this color here. I can paste it in there. And now we have a light gray color already. This covers the entirety of the color. Inside of the init method, we need super dunder init. What is really important to understand now is that this dunder init is going to call this init method. As a consequence, we have to get all of these parameters and find a value for them. We're going to put all of this over multiple lines. For the parent, we want to use the parent. For the text, we want to use the text. For the function, for now, we just want to use the function. Column is going to be the column. Row is going to be the row. Font is going to be the font. And color is going to be the color. In this case, since we simply duplicated all of these parameters, this might seem quite mundane. But what this is already giving us is all of the styling here. Basically what is happening, when we are calling this init method, we are taking all of these parameters, we're going to create them in just a bit, and then we are going to this init method. Inside of this one, we are adding arguments for all of these parameters. After that, we are going to create the actual button. Which means, for example, this color here, light gray, would now be this color here. So instead of dark gray, we get light gray. Because of that, these three colors here are now going to give us a light gray instead of a dark gray color. I hope all of that makes sense. Inheritance can be a tiny bit tricky, especially at the start. Let's actually create the buttons and then this should make a bit more sense. First of all, I have to import the num button. I think that's what I called it. Yeah, this num button here. Inside of the calculator, not in the init method, but inside of create widgets, I now want to create all of the number buttons. For that, I want to look at settings. In here, we have num positions. For each num position, we have a value and then a dictionary. The dictionary contains a column, a row, and a span. Most of the buttons only span a single column, with the exception of the zero button. This one spans two. We cannot account for this just yet, but we will cover that in just a bit. For now, I just want to go over this dictionary and use the column and the row to place all of the buttons. For that, inside of the calculator, I am going to need a for loop. For the number and the data in num positions, this is the dictionary here. On this, I want to get the key and the value, which I'm getting with items. The key I am storing in num, the value inside of data, meaning the data is going to be this dictionary here. Once I have that, I can create a num button. The num button now is going to need all of the parameters I have set up here. Color has a default value, so we can just ignore this one. But for all the other values, we need parent, text, function, call, row, and font. Font is the easiest one. Let's start with this one. I simply want to use the main font. Parent is also going to be really easy. This should be self. For the text, I simply want to use the num, because num is 0 to 9 or a dot. The function we don't have just yet. For now, let me add a lambda function in here that is going to print the text. So at the very least, we have something. For the column, if I look at the dictionary, inside of data, we have column and row. Which means I can get data and column. I can do the same thing for the row, which is going to be data and row. With that, we have a number button. If I now run the code, we can see we have a whole lot more buttons. This is getting much more efficient. However, we do have quite an obvious problem. There is a big gap in here. 
This exists because the zero button should cover two columns, like so, which we can't account for just yet. To achieve that, inside of buttons, we have to update this num button so it is accepting another parameter, which I'm going to call span. This span we have to use inside of this grid method here, which means we have to figure out how to get this span into this init method. And then from this init method, we want to go into this grid here. On top of that, we have to make sure that when we are creating the normal button, which we've done earlier for the operators, we are not getting an error. We know that all of the operator buttons don't care about span. They always have one. We really have to make sure that we're not breaking these buttons. All of this is going to be your exercise. I want you guys to get the zero button to span two columns. On top of that, make sure that you don't break existing buttons. Also, let me fix the typo. That looks much better. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out. You will need inheritance. Let's work backwards for this one. First of all, inside of grid, we have to add one more argument. Let me put it right after the column. We need a column span. For most buttons, in fact, all buttons except the zero, this is going to be one. However, for the zero, it should be two. As a consequence, this can't be hard coded. This needs to be span. This span I'm going to get from the parameters. I will put this one all the way at the end. We want to have a span value. Once we have this parameter inside of num buttons, we already have the span button here. So we can add span and span in here. With that, this is going to be passed into this span argument. And then this span argument is going to span two columns. However, now if I run the calculator, we are getting an error that non-default argument follows default argument. This we can fix quite easily. I can move span in front of the color. Although we are going to get another error, that button in it is missing one required positional argument, span. This error we are getting up here, this button and this button as well, the button for percentage and clear, they now both want an argument for this span, which we don't have. To fix this, you can approach this in two ways. You could either add a span of one in here when you're creating the button. However, since they both have one, this wouldn't be ideal. Instead, what I would recommend is simply add a default value here of one. With that, these buttons should still work, but now we're getting another error that when we are creating these num buttons, we're not giving them a span argument, which we can do quite easily because inside of settings, we have a span value, which means span is going to be data and span. Now, if I run this, there we go. All of this is working perfectly fine now. Also, I haven't clicked on any of the buttons yet. We are getting an error here, so we do have to work on that as well. The text here shouldn't be text, it should be num. Now, if I run this, we get, well, we always get nine. Something definitely went wrong here, which doesn't matter so much because we have to create a custom function here anyway. Since I want to capture the input, I want to create a method. I call this one num press. This one needs self and it needs a value. For now, once again, I simply want to print the value. This num press, I now want to use as the function here. Although this should be self.numpress. This, however, is going to give us an error. If I run the code now, we are getting calculator.numpress. That's the method we just passed into the number button is missing one required positional argument value, which means we are passing in the function, which right now is numpress, the one I just created, this one. The problem is that numpress is expecting one value. This value, however, we are not getting inside of this function. To fix that, we can use lambda. I want to get lambda and then my function. With that, I can pass in parameters. 
just to test this, let me add test in here. If I now run the code, I can click on all of the buttons and I'm always getting test. That's looking pretty good. What I can also do is pass the text in here. The text for now, we simply used for the button text, but we can also pass it into the function. And now I am getting the proper output for all of the buttons. That is looking significantly better. When we are passing in the numpress function, we are passing it in here. And from this function, we are creating a lambda function, meaning we are wrapping the function inside of a lambda function. That way we can add parameters. In this case, the text. All of this is going to create a new function, which we are then passing into the command of the actual button. That way we can create a function with parameters that is only going to be called when we are pressing the button or rather when the user is pressing the button. So with that, we have another major part, which means I can minimize the calculator and finish up this section. To finish up the layout, I want to create the orange buttons. They are mostly going to work like the number buttons, which means we have to pass in a function and this function gets one argument which is going to be the plus for the plus button, the minus for the minus button, equal for the equal button, and so on. The one difficulty is that these four buttons here are simple buttons, whereas the division button has to be an image button. But other than that, there isn't going to be anything new. So let's jump right in and let's see how far we get. Back in the code, let's go to settings and let's see what we have. What I now want to create are all of these math buttons. The information for that is inside of the dictionary math positions. We have a dictionary with the key being the operator. So divide, multiply, minus, equal, and plus. The value attached is a dictionary that has a column, a row, a character, an operator, and an image path. Although the only image we have is for the division button. From that, inside of buttons.py, Below the number buttons, I want to create the math button. This one has to inherit from button as well. Because primarily, this math button is going to work kind of like the number button. The only difference that for the number button, inside of the function, we are passing in the text. Which means the text for the button is going to be the same as the text for the function. For the math buttons, this is not going to work. Because if I look at settings, what the button is supposed to say is going to be inside of the character. Those have either x, minus, equal, or plus. This should be the text for the button. However, what we actually pass into the function is going to be inside of the operator. As a consequence, we can kind of copy this, but we have to make some updates. Since this should be quite doable, we can do an exercise right away. I want you guys to create the math buttons. The only important thing here is that you have to separate the character and the operator. Once you have that, also all the buttons with a for loop inside of calculator.py. In calculator and create widgets, there should be another for loop somewhere here for the math buttons. Try to figure this one out. Also, for now, don't worry about the image. I will cover that after the exercise. First of all, I need a dunder init method. As a matter of fact, I will need most of this. So I can simply just copy it all and then we can work on it. The first thing that I want to do is to update the color because I know that all of these buttons should be orange. Also, they don't have a span value because they all simply occupy a single cell, meaning I can get rid of span entirely. That is looking better. The final change that we have to make, I'm going to put this right next to text. Besides the text for the button, I also want to have an operator. This operator I'm going to pass into the function, which means now we have a separation between the text, so what the button looks like, and the operator, so what the button actually does. 
Other than that, we are good to go for the math button. There really wasn't that much to do in here. So now, inside of the calculator, first of all, all the way at the top, I have to import the math button. Once I have that class, I want another for loop, or let's call it operator and data once again. In the dictionary, I have called math positions. Don't forget to call items on this one. That way we get the key value pairs. I want to create a math button. This math button is now going to need all of these arguments. Let me copy them and paste them in here. First of all, the font is super easy. It is going to be the main font. We have done this a couple of times by now. The parent is also going to be easy. That one's going to be self. After that, we need text, operator, function, column, and row. Most of these are fairly easy. If I open settings, Inside of the dictionary, which is data in our for loop, we have column, row, character, and operator. Also, I realized in this one that I have duplicated data a tiny bit. These operators here and the keys for the dictionary are identical, meaning we could use either one. It really doesn't matter. I suppose what I could be doing is simply get rid of the operator, then all of this is going to be a bit cleaner. With that, we're getting the actual operator from the keys, which is good because I called them the operator. But now, inside of the text, I want to have data, this value I called character, or at least I think I did. We are using this character here. Also note for the division, we don't have anything right now, but that's okay. We will fix that in just a second. For the operator, we're just going to use the operator. The function we don't have right now. So below the number press, I want to have another function that I called math press. Like number press, this one needs self and a value. Although again, I simply want to print the value that we are getting for now. This function I'm going to pass in here, self.mathpress. Finally, we have the column and the row. This is information that's quite easy to get. We need the column and we need the row. With that, we should be having some buttons. And this is looking pretty good. Let me move it to the side. At the very least, we have multiply, minus, plus, and equal. And you can also see these buttons do print the required value. The one thing that doesn't work right now is the division button. This part here is looking very sad right now. For that, we are going to need an image button. To create this one, let me get rid of the exercise text and minimize all of the stuff we have so far. What I want to do now is use this image button and then create another math button that can take an image. This is going to be another class. I call this one math image button. This one has to inherit from the image button. This one is going to be quite similar compared to the math button. So let me copy all of it. Then we have something to work with. The major difference is that this math image button is going to need an image. Let me create a parameter by removing the font because we don't need that one anymore. In fact, we can't use it because the image button doesn't have a font. We don't need a font anymore. Instead, now we have to pass in an image, which is going to be image. To understand what is going on, we once again have to make sure that this super init is targeting all of the parameters of the image button init method. In there, we have a parent, this one we have. We need a function, this one we also have. We need column and row, those we also have. We need an image, this we have. Text, we don't need because we have a default argument. And color we do need because we want to have a different color, which we do have. Which means now we have a math image button. We just have to figure out how to create it in the for loop. All of that is going to happen inside of the calculator. Although once again, first of all, I have to import my math image button. 
I don't need the init method. Also, I can minimize all of these buttons. So this is a bit easier to see. Inside of this for loop, I now want to check if I want to create a math button or a math image button. This sounds very much like an if statement. Now I just have to figure out the condition, which is fortunately quite simple. If I look at settings, the thing that makes this division entry unique is it has an image path. All of the other entries simply have none for the image path. Since none is going to evaluate to false inside of an if statement, all I have to do is inside of this if statement, check my data and then the image path, which is telling me if this is true, I have an image. However, if that is not the case, so else I don't have an image, meaning I just want to create a math button. Just to test this, let me add a path statement in here, run this again. The calculator still works just fine, but now we have nothing in here because this is what we singled out with the if statement. This I now want to replace with a math image button. This one to get the parameters, let me copy it from the buttons in here. I need all of these. And once again, we need a parent and this parent is simply going to be self. I realized I didn't get rid of the text. Let's remove it right now. In fact, inside of the buttons, this text here shouldn't exist at all. I have to remove it from the parameters and from the init method. That's much better. Next up, the operator is simply going to be the operator. The function is going to be self.mathpress. Next up, we have the column. This, in fact, these two entries I can copy from the mathpress. Let me paste them in here, like so. And the final thing we need is an image. Since for this one, we have a slightly larger line, I want to create this in a separate variable. I'm going to call this one the divide image, which is going to be CTK, CTK image. We, as always, going to need two arguments. We need a light image, and we need a dark image. Both of those we are getting with image.open and then a file path. This file path we are going to get from inside of settings. We have image path, which is going to be another dictionary with light and dark entries. This we access with data. Inside of here, we have an image path. For the light image, so the image for the light mode, I want to have the dark image. Because remember, light image means we have a bright background, so we want to have a dark image. Without this, we wouldn't have any contrast. The same thing I want to do for the dark image, with the one difference that now we want to have a light image. This is giving us the divide image. This I'm passing into the image, and now I can run this thing, and there we go. We have the division button. I can also click on it, and we get divide. With that, we have all of the buttons working. On top of that, I can now minimize the calculator. I want to test if this is also working with light mode, which I can check by adding faults into the calculator. Run this now, and there we go. Now we are getting a dark image for this button, although it still also works. But once again, I want to use the dark mode. With that, I can minimize all of the classes, and we have made a ton of progress. This covers the entirety of the layout. Now that we have the entire layout, we can start working on the logic of the calculator, which means I can type some numbers and actually get a result. Unfortunately for all of this, we have to cover quite a bit of logic. I think this is best done when I jump right in and explain it while we are doing it. The logic here does get a tiny bit more advanced. Fortunately, we can work entirely inside of the calculator. That works because we don't need the init method. We also have all of our widgets. We have these methods here. NumPress is giving us all of the numbers. MathPress will give us the math buttons. And then we have clear, percent, and invert. These are all of the buttons of the calculator. 
which is quite handy. I don't have to worry about the buttons or the settings. Although, as a reminder, there's one important thing in terms of data that we have to be aware of. Inside of the init method, we have a result string and a formula string. Result is going to show the result and formula the formula. That was a very pointless sentence, sorry. But basically, what we want to start with is, when I'm pressing the button, I want to show the number inside of the result string. This is actually quite simple. All we have to do inside of the numpress, instead of printing the value, I want to update self.result string and then set this to the value. If I run this now, let me move this to the middle, I can click on all of the numbers and this is looking really good. Well, really good is relative because right now we only ever get a single number. So how can we get multiple? To achieve that, I want to create another entry inside of my data. I'm going to need a list. I call this one, let's call it the display nums. This is simply going to be a list. What we are now going to do inside of numpress, we are not going to set the value of the result string. Instead, we are simply going to get the display nums and append the current value. Although I really want to make sure that I'm only working with strings here. That is really important. Meaning when I'm getting this value, I want to convert it to a string right away. Let's see what this is going to give us. I want to print self.displayNums. Now, if I click on the buttons, I get a list that gets increasingly longer. This list, I now want to convert to an actual number. Let's do this with a variable. I want to have the full number. For this, we need a string and then the method join. Really important here, this string needs to be empty. Inside of this join, we need a list, which we have. This is our display nums. I want to print the full number. Now if I run this, let me move it to the side. I get a number that becomes increasingly large. I can also have the dot and this is looking good. Which means now I can set this full number as my value for self.result string, like so. With that, I can click on all of this and I'm getting a pretty good result. I can also use the dot and then at some point the number gets too long, but well, I'm not too concerned about that. Now that we have that, I can minimize numpress and work on my math press. As a reminder, in here, we're going to do our math operations. The very first thing that I want to check in here is that we actually have a number. Let me actually return to the print statement. Let's say we have the calculator. These buttons here for equal, plus, minus, multiply and divide, they should only be possible to use once we have a number. For example, if I have a six, then I should be able to use these numbers. However, if we don't have a number, they shouldn't be available. Or at the very least, when we are pressing them, they shouldn't do anything. For that, I first of all want to get my, let's call it the current number. This is going to be the same thing I have done inside of numpress. I can literally just copy it. Now, I want to check if the current number exists. If that is the case, let's for now print do stuff. Also, I want to print the current number just so you know what's happening. If I now click on the X, we can't see anything because we get an empty string that, well, doesn't do very much. But if I now click on 66 and now a minus, we get 66 and do stuff. And you can see here, we have two empty fields. This is this empty string, which means we know that this is working. Inside of the current number, we now have to figure out what to do with these values. The thing that I started with is another list. Inside of the init method, I want to have self dot, let's call it the full operation, which is going to be an empty list when we get started. With that, I can also minimize the init method because these are the only two lists that we are going to need. Basically what I want to do, if we have a current number, 
I want to get myself dot full operation and then append the current number. That way we're getting the current input. Besides that, what I want to do, I want to get self dot full operation again and then append the value, which in this case is going to be the operation. To demonstrate what's happening, let me print self dot full operation. I want to type on 56, then multiply it. Now we get 56 and multiply. If I now click on 3 and plus, we get some decently looking result, but it's not perfect. At the very least, we can work with this, but we do have to make some updates. First of all, I want to start with another if statement. That if the value is different from equal. Only then do I want to do some math operations. If that is not the case, let me add an else statement right away. I want to print result. The logic here should be quite obvious. If I run the calculator again, these four buttons here for divide, multiply, minus and plus, they should do actual math operations. However, the equal sign should simply give us the result. The logic for this one is slightly different. This is why I'm separating the two. If, however, we don't have the equal sign, then I want to append the current value. Besides that, I also want to get my display nums and then clear the list, which is simply going to empty all of it. That way, we don't get duplicate values. In fact, let me print self dot not display nums, but full operation. That's the one we care about right now. I can now get 12 and plus, which gives me 12 and plus, which looks like a decent operation. But now if I go to 34 and minus, now we are separating all of this properly. The way you have to understand this, this is quite important. So let me cover it in a bit more detail. We are always starting with a num press. At the end of it, in terms of data, we are getting display nums. This could, for example, be a list with one and two. Both are going to be strings, but this one doesn't matter right now. Once we have that and we are pressing a math button, if there is a current number, which we do have right now, we will be running this bit here, which is going to give us another list. Inside of this list, we are combining these values, which right now would give us a 12. After that, if we don't have an equal sign, we get to this bit here, which is going to append the value. This could be a plus. With that, we have another list. What is really important now is this line here. This is going to clear the display numbers, which means we're getting rid of this one and this two in our case. As a consequence, the next time we are clicking on the number press, we are adding new numbers in here. Those could, for example, be three and four, could be as many numbers as you want. After that, if we press on this again, we are now combining these two numbers, add them in here. And after that, we are adding the value once again. So we get 34 and then we would get minus which is then going to give us a really clear operation that we can work with. That is literally all that I wanted. The issue we have right now is that the result cannot be seen, but that we can fix quite easily. What I want to do is if we are clicking on any of the math operators, I want to get myself and my result string and set this to an empty value. That way we can't see anything in the result, to account for that, I want to get self.formula string and set this value. What I want in here is a string, then join. I want to join self.full operation. What this is going to give us, I can type in some numbers in here. And now if I add multiply, we get the operation. I can also add more numbers for as long as I want. This is working pretty well. Although what I don't like right now is all of this is really close to each other. To fix that, I have to add a space. I should have mentioned this earlier. The value you add inside of this string 
is what will be between the characters. If it's an empty string, it is simply going to be a tiny bit of space, which looks much cleaner. Although you could add, I don't know, XXX in here. Now this is going to look horrible. Now we get XXX a whole bunch. I simply want to have an empty value. Also, I should be adding comments in here. Let's call this one update data. And this one should be update output. With that, we are getting the value. So next up, I want to work on the result. The really important question you might have for this one is, let's say we have some kind of string that is 12 plus 43. We can print this, but how would we get the result? The answer here is one special function inside of Python that is called eval. Let me run this one actually. If I type any kind of number, then I can use these buttons here. If I now click on equal, we get 55. This 55 is 12 plus 43. Eval is simply going to evaluate some code and then give you the result. I mentioned this in the introduction to Python, but this eval you have to use very, very carefully. If, for example, you allow the user to type some text, then they could execute some code using this eval, which would be a huge security risk. In our case, though, we are making a calculator. The security here isn't terribly important. Also, we don't have user input, so this shouldn't be an issue. If, however, you're making a database for a website, then this is definitely something to keep in mind. So with that, we can evaluate a formula, which means we have to actually get our formula. Let's create another variable that I call formula. This needs to be a string. So I want an empty string with the join method and all of my operation is inside of this full operation attribute. Let me simply paste it in here. I can run this now. I can click on some math numbers so I get an operation. And now if I have a number here, I can click on equal. We are getting the math operation. This is looking quite good. To get the result, all I have to do is use eval and then we should be good to go. For example, if I have 56 minus 32 and click on eval and we're getting 24. That looks accurate. This result I want to store. The result is going to be eval of the formula. Once I have that, I want to update my output. I want to clear the full operation list. Finally, display nums should have the value of the result and nothing else. These three things are going to be reasonably straightforward, meaning they are going to be your exercise. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out. You're working entirely inside of this else statement. I'm going to start by updating the output. This is going to be quite similar compared to what we have done up here. In fact, let me simply copy it. I want to first of all update the result string using set. Although now I don't want to empty it, instead I want to get the result. For the formula, I could use this full operation here, but I don't really like that because I already have the formula up here. And there shouldn't be a space for this one. With that, we should be having a working output, meaning now I can type two plus three and then equal, and we're getting five. Also, we're getting the formula. However, there's no space between the values. This I can fix quite easily. All I need is a space in here. Eval doesn't care about that whatsoever, which means now let's say six minus five is going to be one and we have a nice looking formula. This is going to update the output. Besides that, to cover these two bits here, I want to update the data. This, once again, is going to be somewhat comparable to what we have done up here. I'm going to copy these two values. First of all, the full operation I now want to clear. That way, once we start typing again, we're getting completely new values. Although to retain the result we have gotten, I want to get my display num and set this to a new list that has a single entry, which is going to be the result. 
Although this result right now is going to be a number, but I only want to work with strings. What this means, if I now type 2 plus 3, get my equal, now I can type on multiply. And then you can already see we now have inside of the formula 5 multiplied, let's say by 9, and we get 45. From this, I can keep on working minus 31, and we get 14, which is going to give us a basic working calculator, meaning I can now get rid of the exercise text and we are nearly done. There's one thing I want to cover that isn't exactly breaking, but very annoying. If I run this again and I type something like 8 divided by 2, if that is the case, we are getting the correct result, but this 0, 0.0 is, well, entirely pointless. Also, it might be confusing to some people, so I would rather get rid of it. On top of that, if I run all of this again, if I have something like 8 divided by 7, we are getting a really, really precise result, but that isn't really necessary. I would rather round this so it doesn't get too confusing. Which means inside of this bit here, I want to add a tiny bit more logic. Let's call this one format the result. For this, I first of all want to check if the result is a floating point number, because only then do we get the weird behavior. This I can check with if is instance. In here, we need two arguments. The first one is the value we want to check. In my case, this is going to be the result. Besides that, the second argument is going to be the data type we're checking this result against, which in this case is going to be a float. Which means all of this is going to check if the result is the data type float, and this is going to return either true or false. Let's try this actually. If this is the case, I want to print float. Now, if I type 5 divided by 2 and get the result, we are getting float. The result here is looking really good, but this isn't a given. For example, if I divide this by 3, we're getting some very strange behavior once again, which I want to account for. The result you have just seen is we have too many numbers after the decimal. This is the first problem. The second problem is that we have an integer is formatted like a float, which means we get stuff like 4.0. These two cases we have to address separately. To account for them, I want to start with if the integer is formatted like a float. To check for this kind of behavior, if we have stuff like 4.0, Python actually has another inbuilt method. It is called if I want to check my result, and the method here is called is underscore integer. This is basically checking a number if it is an integer or not, which means if we have a floating point value with 4.0, this is going to be true. If that is the case, I want to get my result. The value I want to assign is integer of the result. To explain this one, right now, when we are getting this result here, we might be getting something like 4.0. Let me write it in here, 4.0. Inside of this if statement, we are then checking if this is a floating point value or not. Since we do have a dot and a decimal value, we know that this is a floating point value. However, this if statement here is going to check this value and see that it's simply dot zero, so we can simply ignore it. This is actually an integer. And because of that, we are going to force it to be an integer, which will remove anything after the decimal point, and we simply get the number. So I can run this again, and now 8 divided by 2 is simply giving us 4. That is feeling much better. For the other case, we can identify this with an else statement. So let me get rid of this text here. If this else statement is true, we know we have an actual floating point value. I'm going to keep the logic simple for this one. I am simply going to assign a new value to the result. This new value is going to be the rounded value of the result with, let's say, three values after the decimal point. With that, I can get rid of this comment as well. And now we should be good to go. 
If I now type 8 divided by 7, get the result, I get 1.143. Now, this logic is quite crude and not ideal, because sometimes a user really wants to have precise results. But, well, this is something you can work on yourself. It shouldn't be too hard to implement. For the next part, we are going to account for the three operator buttons, so clear, percent, and invert. But other than that, we are basically done. Now that we have the basic logic of a calculator, we only have to account for these three buttons here. To explain what they're doing, let me type some numbers in here, like so. AC is simply going to clear the calculator. To get a value back again, we can now use this plus and minus button. All that this one is doing is it gives us minus or plus, so it inverts the current number. The percentage sign divides the current value by 100. That way we are getting, well, the percentage. These are the three buttons we are going to create, and they are not terribly difficult. Let's jump right in. Here I'm back in the code, and I want to work inside of clear, percent, and invert. Clear is by far the easiest one, let's start with that one. All I have to do in here is clear the output and clear the data. I want to get myself dot result string and set this to a zero. This is our default value for the result string. Besides that, self dot formula string should simply be an empty string. I also want to clear the data which is going to be self dot display nums dot clear don't forget to call it. Besides that, self dot full operation. This should also be cleared. With that, we have one part covered. I can now type some numbers in here, get the result. If I now click on AC, everything disappears. That was quite easy. I can now hide this method and not worry about it again. Next up, we have to do either percent or invert. Let's start with invert. This is the slightly more difficult one. We first of all have to get the current number. I want to get the current number. This we get an empty string, then join, and then self.displayNums. This is the same thing we have done inside of MathPress. This button, like the math buttons, is only going to work if we have a number. So if current number, then we want to invert something. This should make sense because if we have zero as the default value, this isn't going to do anything. Plus and negative zero is just going to be zero. If we have a number, however, I want to check if it is positive or negative. This is going to be an if statement. To do an example, let's say instead of display nums, we have 1.5. Because of join, this is going to become 1.5 as a string. This number I now have to turn into a floating point number, that way I can check if it is positive or negative. Hence, inside of this if statement, I want to create a float from my current number. If this resulting number is greater than zero, then I know this is positive. However, if that is not the case, else then I have a negative number. What we now have to figure out is what to do with these results. Right now, we have this case here. Our value is positive. So how can we turn it negative? For this one, you do have to be careful because the number we want to make negative is this one here. The value we are working with right now, all of this, is only temporary. This is what we created here. This is not the actual number that the calculator is working with. What we ultimately have to do is add another value in here at the beginning. This value has to be a negative. And this we can do quite easily. All we have to do is get self.displayNums and then insert a value. This value has to be inserted at index zero and the value we want to add is a minus. To test this one in the else statement, I'm gonna add a pass and also what we have to do is we have to update the output, which we do with self.result string. I want to set this and once again I need dot join and self.display nums. Let's try this one now. 
If I simply click on invert, nothing is going to happen. This is because it only works if we have a number inside of display nums. Let's say if I click on 8 and 9, now if I click on negative, we get negative. However, if I click on it again, nothing is going to happen. But at the very least, we do have a start. This line here is working. We now have to figure out this one. To explain how we need to approach this one, let's do another example. We now have to create a negative number. The important thing here, inside of display nums, we have to start with a negative number. The numbers afterwards don't really matter. Let's say 1 and 2. What this join is going to give us is negative 12. Because of this if statement here, we know that this is going to be negative, so we are working inside of this else statement. Which means now we have to figure out what to do in here. The answer for this one is actually quite simple. We simply have to remove the first item from display nums, and then we are good because that way we are turning a negative number into a positive number, which means we're getting simply rid of this minus. Literally, all I want to do is delete self.displayNums, the value with the index zero. With that, I can run this again. Let me type in 56 now. Now if I click on invert, it's minus. If I click on it again, we get plus. And this keeps on working. Also, if I clear the calculator, I can do 1 plus 3. If I now click on the result, this is also going to work. So this is looking quite nice. We have covered invert. Next up, we have to work on percent. This one is going to be your exercise. Figure out what to do with this button. As a reminder, the actual functionality here is divide the current value by 100. Pause the video now and try to figure out this one. To get started with this one, I have to check if we have any kind of numbers inside of display nums. This is going to be kind of similar compared to what we have done with invert. However, for this one, I don't want to get the current number. I simply want to know if there's something inside of display nums or not. Which means I simply want to check if self.display nums or not. Only if that is the case, I want to create a current number. This has to be a float of I need to use join and now the display nums. Self the display nums to be accurate. You might be wondering now, why am I doing this this way? You might be tempted in here to type something like current number is going to be float and then the actual value and then check if current number. This unfortunately would not work. Let me get rid of it and demonstrate this on a separate code editor. I am printing a value and the value I'm printing is the float value of some kind of string. For example, in here, this could be 123.45. This would be working just fine. The problem is, if this float is completely empty, I'm getting a value error, which would crash the entire thing. And with this kind of setup, I'm avoiding that. Anytime I'm creating the current number, which I want to turn into a float right away, but I can only do this if the display nums, so the list is not empty. Although once I have that, I can convert this number, I call this one the percent number. This is simply going to be the current number divided by 100. Also, let me add some comments again. I want to get the percent pitch number. Once I have that, I want to update the data and output. I have to start with self.displayNums. What we now have to figure out is how to turn this percent number back into a list so we can keep on working with it. Also, I realized there's a typo. This is much better. Actually, let's first test if this is working. I simply want to print percent number. If I now run this again, I can click on 6 and then percent and we get 0 0.06. I can also clear this and 3 plus 6 is equal to 9 
and percent again gives me 0 0.09. I can also click on this again multiple times, but this doesn't do anything. That we're going to work on in just a second. What we now have to do is turn this percentage number back into display nums list. That way we can keep on working with it. To achieve that, we need list, string, and then percent number. The way you want to think about this, this percent number could be 0 0.06, which is going to be a floating point value. If we are turning this into a string, like so, we didn't achieve very much. However, a string is some kind of list in the very primitive sense, which means when we are putting it into the list function, all we're doing is we are separating each value with a comma, and then we have a list around it. That way, we get the list from the number. The last thing that we have to do now is to update our result. So result string dot set. This is going to be a string again with join self dot display nums, and then we should be good to go. Let's try. If I now click on nine, then the percent. This is working. And since I turned the result into display nums again, I should be able to click on it again. And now we get increasingly smaller numbers. Also, if I click on AC, this returns everything back to normal. And this is still looking pretty good. Cool. With that, I can get rid of this exercise comment. And other than that, we have a calculator. In this tutorial, we're going to create an image editor. You can see the result right here. I can click on open image and import an image. The one test image I have right now is called Otter. If I open this one, you can see we have the image. This is, by the way, also responsive, so I can resize it quite easily. But much more importantly, on the left side, I have quite a few different options. The first one is rotation. This one rotates the image. I can also zoom in or invert the image and revert all of this. Besides that, I can change the color, for example, the brightness or the vibrance. I can also use black and white or invert. After that, we have effects. And here I can set some blurriness or some contrast. And I can work with extra options. Like contour is going to be really visible. And all of those options also work together. For example, if I use blur with this one, you're not going to see anything. So you do have to be careful here. But for example, if I return to color, I can make all of this black and white. Or remove the invert, then it becomes white. Finally, I can export the image. I can give it a file name. Let me call it dark, otter. I can select a file path, open explorer. I want to save it on the desktop. So I select a folder. And finally, if I click on save, we have exported the image, which means now if I open my desktop, I have dark otter besides the normal otter, meaning this has worked. Also, I can close the image and open another image, for example, the dark otter, and then work with this image. Literally any image is fine. So you can do whatever you want in here. For this kind of project, we are going to need the pillow library, which we have already used to some extent. But for this video, I'm going to go into much more detail. Now, I am not going to cover everything. I will only talk about the parts that we actually need. That being said, if you're interested in Pillow, I have made a whole separate video on YouTube that talks about all of the library in detail. Check this one out if you're interested. But all of that is a couple of videos in the future. For now, I just want to create a basic window. Before I start with that, I want to have a look at the folder. This one is going to look like that. Let me increase the size a bit. We are starting with two files. We have main.py and settings.py. Main.py contains the entirety of the logic. Settings contains the settings. Let's jump right in and let's see what we have. Right now, main.py is completely empty. Besides that, we have settings.py. This one contains a couple of elements, not terribly much. All of this stuff here are the default values that we are going to need much later. For example, we have the default value for rotate, which is going to be zero degrees. Besides that, we have a couple of colors and this space shouldn't be there. These are the colors for the styling of the app. I am not going to go too crazy on the styling because I want to focus on the actual logic. 
but obviously you can apply your own styles here. It's quite easy to do. With that, let's create the basic app. By the end of this video, I want to have something like this. A basic window with one button in the middle. It should be really easily done. For that, first of all, I have to import custom tkinter as ctk. Once I have that, I want to create a class that I usually call app, which inherits from ctk. Then we need a dunder init method with self and nothing else. Once we have that, we can set up the window. The most important thing in here is going to be super and then dunder init without any arguments. Also for this app, I want to keep the styling a bit simpler, which basically means I always want to use the dark mode. This I get with CTK and set appearance mode with dark as the only argument in here. Besides that, I want to run the app so we have something this I achieve with self dot main loop. After that, I can create an instance of the app, run the code, and we are getting a basic window. This isn't looking too bad. With that covered, I want to add a tiny bit more styling. First of all, I want to set a starting size, which I get with geometry. The starting size here should be 1000 by 600. Let's see how that looks. This seems fine. Besides that, I want to update the title, which I do with self.title. I call this one the photo editor. And there we can see in the top left, we have photo editor. For this app, I am not going to color in the title bar because this one just seems fine. Although I do want to set a minimum size, which I get with self.min size. This one wants two arguments for the width and the height, which I want to set to 800 and 500, which means if I run this now, let me show my mouse, I can resize this window. However, I can only make it this small. Later on, when we have all of the widgets, if the app gets smaller than this, it's going to look really weird. With that covered, I want to create a layout. Once we have that layout, I can create my widgets. The one widget I want to create for now is some kind of import button. Although to be a bit more specific here, this import button is going to be another widget, which is going to be a frame with a button. But first of all, we have to think about the layout. For that, let me draw a tiny bit. This is going to be the entire window. Once again, imagine I can draw straight lines. What I want to create right now is going to be a simple button right in the middle. This we could achieve with basically any kind of layout method. Place, grid, and pack would all work for this one. However, later on, I want to have another kind of layout. I want to have a panel on the left, roughly here. Besides that, I want to have a main panel, this area here, for the image. As a consequence, our layout has to account for this button here and for this more elaborate layout. Although it's not that much more elaborate. Basically, all I have done is I have used the grid layout to create one row and two columns. The rows I get with row configure. We only have a single row, so row zero, with a weight of one. The more important one is the column. Let me duplicate it actually right away. Those two columns are going to have different sizes. The left one, so column zero, is going to have a weight of two. The right one, column one, is going to have a weight of six. That is all we need for now in here, which means now we can work on the import button or rather the frame with a button. This import button, I want to create in a separate file simply because later on, main.py is going to contain a ton of logic for the image manipulation, which means I want to create a new file with control S and save this as let's call it image widgets. Don't forget .py. Inside of this file, I'm going to contain the widgets for the image import and the image output. For both of them, we have to import custom tkinter as ctk. With that, I can create another class. This one is going to be called image import, which is going to inherit from ctk and ctk frame. This one is going to be fairly straightforward. 
I want this frame to cover the entire window. On top of that, it should contain a single button right in the middle. The button should say open image. This should be fairly straightforward, so it's going to be your exercise. Create this widget and then call it inside of main.py. The result should look something like this. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out. First of all, we have to create a dunder init method. This one needs self and we need a parent. Once we have that, we can call super right away. The only thing we have to add in here is master needs to be the parent. Next up, we have to place this widget, which we do with self.grid. This one wants a column, which is going to be zero. However, since I have specified two columns and I want my widget to span both of them, I have to add column span and set this to two. Row is going to be super easy. It's simply going to be zero. Finally, I want to have sticky with north, south, east, and west. That way, this widget is going to cover the entire window. Let's try it actually. Back in main.py, I want from image widgets and I want to import everything. Also, I should fix my typo. This is looking much better. What I can do now, down here under my widgets, I can create this image import. Let me paste it right in. We only need one argument, which is self for the parent. If I run this now, we can see that, well, we can't really see anything. That is because this app here and this image import have the same background color. We can change that though by setting FG color of the image import to something like red. Now if I run main.py again, we have a completely red app, which means all of this is working. That's a good start. All we have to do now is add the button with CTK and CTK button. The parent here is going to be self, text is going to be open image. That is all we need for now, although we do have to place this button. This we can do with the pack method by simply setting expand to true. Now if I run main.py again, we have a button right in the middle. On top of that, if I resize the window, this button is always going to stay in the middle which is perfect for my purposes. Before I finish this video, there's one more thing that I want to do. Let me run the app again. When I'm clicking on open image, I want to run a function. However, I want to contain all of the logic for the image inside of the app, which is going to be a tiny bit of a problem because I want to contain all of the logic in here, but the image import widget is going to call the function. As a consequence, I want to create the function in here. I call this one import image. This one is going to need self and a path. Although for now, we are simply going to print that path. The path we're going to get in the next video, it's going to be the file path towards an image. This import image, I now want to pass into the import image widget, which I do with self dot import image. The naming here arguably isn't ideal, but this one here is a class, whereas this is a method inside of the app class. So now inside of image widgets, I need another parameter. Let's call it the import function. I can also get rid of the exercise text and create an attribute with import. This shouldn't be func, this should be func or function, which is going to be the argument we just got. After we have that, this CTK button is going to need a command, which is going to be a separate method. I call this one the open dialog. Let's create this one right away. Define open dialog. Inside of this method, we have to create some kind of path. For now, we cannot really do that. So let me simply add test in here. Besides that, I want to import the image which I do with the import function, meaning I want to call it with the path I just created. This means now inside of main.py, I can run this method here when I'm clicking on this button. Let's try it. 
if I now click on open image, I can see test in the bottom left, meaning this is working perfectly fine. With that, we have a really good start. So in the next video, we can work on importing the image. Now that we have a basic window, I want to figure out if I click on the button, how can I get this dialog? On top of that, if I open an image like this otter, how can I display this image? Which means we have to create an opening dialog and a canvas to display the image. This shouldn't be too difficult to do. Let's jump right in. Back in my code, inside of the class. The issue right now is that this import image is simply printing a path. Later on, we actually want to import an image. For that though, we have to create a proper path. Right now, inside of the image import, we always have test for the path. This, I want to change right away. Instead, what I want to have in here is some kind of file dialog, and then this file dialog is going to return the path that I want to use. For that, tkinter has all we need. Although we do have to import something. What we have to import is from tkinter import file dialog. This is going to be a file dialog that can open a file or rather give us a path to a file. To use it, we have to get file dialog and then ask open file, all in one word. Also, don't forget to call it. What this one is going to do, if I run main.py again, I can now click on open image and we get a file dialog. On top of that, if I open this otter, I can double click on it and now we are printing something else. This is what we're getting from the path. This path here is what we are printing right now. Most of the information in here isn't really important. The only thing we really care about is the name because this one contains the file path to the image. This is what we actually want to get, which is quite nice because this part we can get very easy. It's inside of the name of this path, which means when I'm opening the path, I want to get all of this, which is going to return the object you have just seen. This object has one attribute called name. This name contains the actual path, which means now if I run all of this again, I can click on open image. Now I'm getting the proper path to the image of the otter. With that, I can minimize the image import class and focus on main.py. What I now want to figure out is how to actually use this path to import an image. For that, first of all, we're going to need the pillow library which you usually use with from pil import image. This I can now use to create an attribute. Let's call it self.image, which we are getting with image.open. The argument we have to pass in here is the path. Once we have that, Python is going to import the image and store it inside of an attribute that I called image. We can actually test if this is working right away. I can do, for example, self.image.show, and then Python or rather pillow is going to show the image. Let's try. I can click on open image, otter, and now I have to wait a bit. And there we go. Python has opened the image, meaning this is working just fine. Although this isn't actually what I want to do. Let me get rid of it. Instead, I want to display this image inside of tkinter. Now for that, we are going to need another widget. I put this inside of the image widgets. In here, all the way at the bottom, I want to create another class, which is going to be image output. Let me minimize the image import because we don't need this one. What is really important and what I talked about in the past is that to display an image in tkinter, you want to use a canvas, which means this image output is going to inherit from the canvas. Since the canvas is a part of tkinter, we have to import this one separately as well, which means besides the file dialog, I want to have the canvas. First of all, inside of the class, I as always want a dunder init method with self and parent. There are two things I want to do in here. The first one is super dunder init and set the master to the parent. Besides that, I want to use self grid and place the grid in row zero and column one. Also sticky should be north, south, east and west. 
On top of that, just to make sure that we can see this canvas, I want to change the background to red. Also, I realized I forgot row zero here. Once I have that back inside of main.py, I have to figure out something else. Let me run the app to demonstrate. Right now, we have the image open button. If I click on it, I can select an image, but now this image open still sticks around, which would be annoying to display anything else. As a consequence, I want to get rid of this image import, which could actually be a pretty good exercise for you. I want you guys to hide the image import widget. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out. First of all, we have to figure out how to target this image import. We do have an instance of it, but to target it, we have to store it inside of an attribute. I called this one image import. Now that we have this attribute, I can get self.image import. And now to hide it, I need grid or get. Let's try this one. I can now click on open image, click on the otter, and now the import button disappears, which means this part is already done. Next up, after hiding the import, I want to create output. This is going to be the widget I just created, this image output here. I can place it all the way at the end, add self for the parent, and now let's run it and let's see what we get. If I click on open image, the otter, now we can see we have the canvas on the right side. Although I don't like the border around it. To get rid of this one, inside of the image output class, we have to add a few more arguments in here. Those are BD is equal to zero. Then we have highlight thickness, which is also going to be zero. And finally, relief should be rich. Let's try all of this. I can click on open image and the author again. And now we have a plain red background. Although this red color is not exactly what I want. Instead, I want to have this color. This is the same color as the background for custom T Kinter, which means now if I run all of this, click on the author, we can't see a difference. Although the canvas is still there, it just has the same color as the background. This ensures that when we add an image later on, it looks like the image is just by itself. Although that being said, this color here should be inside of the settings. Let me put it all the way to the top. I got this one, the background, or rather the background color. This should be this color here, and I wanna replace it with background color. I can copy the color in here, and now inside of image widgets, all I have to do is from settings, import, everything. With that, I should have the same results, like so. This one is still working. The last thing that we have to figure out is how to put the image on the canvas. And for that, there's one really important thing to understand. You might be tempted to place this image inside of the image output, something like, as a second argument, self.image. This would be possible, but that's not what I want to do. Instead, I want to make sure that the image only stays inside of the app. Since there are going to be a lot of changes to the image later on, I really want to make sure that the logic stays contained, which for now means that this image output is not going to get the image itself. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create another method that I called resize image. For now, this image doesn't need any arguments. I simply want self in here. And what is going to happen at the end of this method is self.imageOutput.createImage. This create image we can use on any canvas. And since our image output, this one here, simply is a canvas, we can use this method. And with that, we're going to place the image. There are three arguments we need to place in here. We need x, y, and the image. Or more specifically, we need an image TK. X and Y for now can just be 0 and 0, although I will change those later on. Image TK we don't have right now. 
we simply have the image, but this we have to convert for it to work properly with tkinter. To create that, all the way at the top, besides image, I also want to import image tk. Once I have that, after I'm importing the image, I want to create self.image underscore tk. This is created with image tk, then dot photo image. The only argument we have to pass in here is self.image. With that, we have an image tk, which we can set as the image for the canvas. All we have to do now is call this method here, which I'm doing at the end of the import method self.resizeImage. If I now run all of this again, I can click on open image, click on the otter, and we can see we have one part of the otter. This isn't working perfectly yet. Also, if I resize all of this, we're getting some weird behavior. But at the very least, we can open a file dialog and we can import the image from this dialog. For the next part, we are going to make all of this look much better, which means the image is going to fill the entire available space and also resize with the window. We now have an image. However, the image we have doesn't look anything like the final thing, which means for this part, I want to make sure we can see the actual image. And also if I'm resizing the image, the image is being resized as well. For that, we have to add quite a bit of logic to update the image and to place it properly. Although the entirety of the logic I have covered in an earlier video on how to use images in tkinter, I am basically going to use all of that. So if you want to have a lot more detail, check out that video. Here I'm back in the code and let me demonstrate what we have right now. I can click on open image, open the otter, and now you can see that what we have isn't ideal. I suppose what we can start with is to place the image right in the center of the canvas, roughly here. For that though, I have to work inside of resize image. And in here, when I'm placing zero and zero, I need to know the size of my canvas. The best way to get that is to use an event. Although this event I can't easily get right now. I'm simply calling resize image in here. This I don't want to do anymore. Instead, what I'm going to do is when I'm creating the image output, I will insert this resize image method into it as an argument, self.resizeImage. What this is going to do inside of the image widgets in image output. First of all, I have to create a resize image method. And this resize image method, I want to call anytime I am creating or resizing this image, which we can get with self.bind. The event here is called configure. If that is the case, I want to get my resize image method, which means we are now going to call this method here and we get the size of the canvas via the event. As a matter of fact, let me print the event and let's see what we get. If I now run all of this again, open the image and the otter, we can now see at the bottom, we have configure event. We have an X and the Y position, those we don't care about, but then we have a width and a height. This is the width and the height of the canvas. We could use that, for example, with event.width and then divide it by two for x, for y. This is going to be event.height divided by two. Now, if I try this and I click on open image, we get something that looks significantly better. Also, if I resize the image, this will always stay in the middle, although since we're not getting rid of the previous images, we get a lot of weird stuff behind. But at the very least, we have a start. Also, let me get rid of this print here. That's going to be annoying. First of all, this resize image, we are now going to call when we are creating this image output and when we are resizing it, which means whenever we are resizing the window, this resize image will be called. The issue with that is that we are creating new images, but we don't discard the old images. As a consequence, we end up with way too many images and this is eventually going to tank performance. To account for that, 
I want to get myself dot image output and then delete with the argument the string all. This gets rid of anything on the canvas, which means now once again I can get the otter and now I can resize this thing and this is looking significantly better. With that we can place the image. What we now have to figure out is how to resize it. For that we are going to need quite a bit of logic and once again for the entirety of the logic that you need here check out the dedicated video. I will go over it briefly but for the full detail check out that video. I suppose let me start with the biggest problem. If I open the image again we want the image to always be fully visible. Which isn't the case right now. I can go a bit further to the right and we can see more of the image. So only with this do we show the entire image. However, if I make the image smaller, we are cutting off some bits. Which means what I have to figure out is how can I not cut off certain parts. For this one, I have to know the aspect ratio of the image and of the canvas. For example, if this is the canvas. If I have an image that looks something like this. In this example the image would be taller than the canvas but less wide. As a consequence when I'm resizing the image I want to scale the height down so that the entire image would end up something like this. However, the other side is if this is the canvas again, I could also have an image that looks something like this. In this example, I would want to scale the width of the image to fit into the canvas. As a consequence, we want to start by figuring out if the image is wider or taller than the canvas. For that, we will need the aspect ratio, both of the image and of the canvas. Let's start with the image. We have the image up here and I want to get self dot let's call it image ratio. To get the ratio all I want is the width divided by the height. Both of these numbers we can get quite easily. The width we get with self dot image dot size. This is going to return a tuple. I want to have the one with zero. That's the width. The height is going to be the entrance with one. So a one in here. Let's try this one. I want to print self.image ratio. If I now run this, I can open an image and we get 1.5. This means that the image is 1.0 times as wide as it is tall. The specific number here doesn't matter, but I do have to know it. Which means I don't need a print statement anymore, but instead now I have to figure out the aspect ratio of the canvas which I can do inside of a resize image. I want to get the current canvas ratio. Let me store this inside of a variable as well, canvas ratio. And this number I get with event.width divided by event.height. Basically the same operation we have done up here, except we're getting our width and our height via different methods. Once we have that, for the resizing, I now want to get a width and a height of the image. Although for that, I first of all have to check if the image is wider or taller than the canvas. For that, we can use the canvas ratii. For example, I can check if the canvas ratio is greater than self.image ratio. This means the canvas is wider than the image. If that is the case, I want to get a new image height, which is going to be the event dot height. The case we have right now, this one here, is this version here. What is really important to understand is that the canvas, the yellow area, is wider than the image. As a consequence, I want to scale the image in such a way that the top and the bottom touch the top and the bottom of the canvas, which means they have the same height, which I am achieving with this line here. Or at the very least for now, I'm simply getting the height of the canvas, but later on we're going to use the image height to resize the image. 
which means all I have to figure out now is the image width. This is very easily done because I have the image ratio. For example, for this image, I know it is always 1.0 times as wide as it is tall. Since I have the height, I can simply get the image height and multiply this with self dot image ratio. With that, we have a new height and a new width. This we can now use to resize the image before we are placing it. I am going to store this in a separate variable, resized image. This is going to be self dot image dot resize. This method wants a tuple with the new width and the new height, which in my case is going to be the image width and the image height. With that, we have a new image. This image we now have to set as the TK image, the one we created earlier, but now we have a new image, which means self dot image TK is going to be the same line I have used earlier. Let me just copy it and paste it in here. Although I don't want to have self dot image. Now I want to have the resized image. With that, we have a start. However, we only cover one of the cases. We need an else in here. Else like so, we have to cover the canvas is taller than the image. Which means in here, we are going to need an image width and an image height once again. Figuring out these two numbers is going to be your exercise. Figure out these two numbers. Once you have that, all of this should be working and we can display an image. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out. For this one, if I open the drawing again, the case we're working with right now is this one here which means the image is wider than the canvas. As a consequence, we want to scale the image to such a degree that we are covering the entire width of the canvas and then the height comes as a consequence. So to get started, I want to set the image width to the width of the canvas, which I can do very easily. This is simply going to be event.width. From that, I can also get the height. I simply have to get the image width. Now for this one, I know that the image is always 1.0 times as wide as it is tall. This we can also flip around, which we simply do by dividing the image width with self dot image ratio. These two operations here are doing the same thing. We simply move them around a tiny bit. With that, we have an image width and an image height for all aspect ratios. Let's try this one now. I can click on open image, the author, and now we're getting an error. That float object cannot be interpreted as an integer. The issue here is that when we are resizing an image, the resize method wants integers for both the image width and the image height. But right now, when we're doing some of these operations, we're going to end up with floating point numbers. That fortunately is very easy to fix. I simply have to get all of these results and then wrap them inside of an int function. Now if I try this again, I can click on open image, otter, and we have an otter. What is really important now, if I resize all of this, we are almost okay. We're getting a tiny bit of an error, but most of this is working. The error I got is that this event height is an attribute, so I cannot call it. Let's try it now. It should be working. There we go. We have the otters and they're always looking pretty good. This seems like the appropriate scaling behavior. With that, I can get rid of this comment here for the exercise, minimize all of the methods, and we have covered another really important aspect. There's one more thing that we have to work on before we can work on the actual input buttons. If I open all of this again, we do have the image, but we don't have a close button, which I want to add for this video. This is a very easy thing to add. Let's jump right in. Back in my code, I want to start by creating a widget for the close button. 
This I want to do inside of the image widgets. Might not be the perfect position, but I think it's good enough. We are only showing the close button when we are showing an image. So I think it fits in here quite okay. This is going to be another class that I have called close output. For the inheritance here, we are only going to need a CTK button. Although this button is going to need a dunder init method, we need self, and I want the parent. For now, we are just going to place it. To place it, we need this super dunder init method. Master is going to be the parent. The text for this one is simply going to be an X. After that, I want to use the place method to place the button in the top right. For that, I want to use relative x with 0.99 and then relative y with 0.01. Finally, I want to set the anchor to northeast. This should give me a button that I can see all the way in the top right of the window, which means inside of main.py after I have imported the image. I have created all of this stuff here. I now want to create the self dot, let me call it close button. This will be the close output button we just created. And we just need self in here as the one argument. Let's try this one. I can click on the otter. And there we go. We have a button in the top right. Doesn't do anything right now, but we have something. Although it looks pretty bad. But that we can work on inside of the widget. I want to update the text color, which should be pure white. This white we're getting from the settings, this white here. After that, what is even more visible is the FG color. This I want to be transparent. Besides that, I also want to set a custom height and a custom width. Both of those are going to get the same number, which means the width is going to be 40 and the height is going to be 40 as well. Since we are having a bunch of arguments, I'm going to put all of this over multiple lines. That is much easier to read. Also, let's try it before I continue, just in case I made a mistake. If I now click on open image and the otter, now on the top right, we have a button that looks much better. What I now want to add is a corner radius with zero. And finally, I want to have a hover color, which I have set to close red. Now, if I try this one, I can click on open image, the auto once again, and now I have a close button in the top right. Cool. With that, we have the close button, but it doesn't do anything right now. For that, I want to create another method. I call this one close edit. This one itself and nothing else. I want to hide the image and the close button. This is going to be your exercise. And it's going to be somewhat similar compared to what I have done here. Oh, also, I forgot. We want to recreate the import button. Essentially, I want to hide the image output and the close button and then show the image import button again. That way we can import another image. Pause the video now and try to figure it out yourself. To get started, I want to hide the image and the close button. Since I have the attributes for both, I can simply target self.image output and then use grid forget. For the image output, I also want to use forget, except this one has to be place forget because we're using the place method to place it. For the other part, to recreate the import button, I want to create self.image import is going to be, this is the same line we have used inside of the init. I want to copy this one here and assign it to image import. With that, we're getting rid of the image and the close button. Although this one shouldn't be image output, it should be the close button. And we are recreating the import. This is almost working, except there's one thing missing. We are never calling this close edit. Right now, we have this close button, but there's no command, which means it doesn't do anything. But that we can add quite easily. We need a command in here. This one is going to need some kind of close 
function. In this close function, we don't have available, but we can pass it into the widget. So I want to get the close function from the parameter. Now back inside of main.py, this close button, when we are creating it, needs self for the parent. And on top of that, we need self.closeEdit. That way, we are calling this method. Let's try now. I can open the image, open the otters. We can see the otters. And if I click on X, we are back to open image. I can click on this one and open another image. And this one seems to be working just fine. With that, we can open and close the editor. And that finishes another major part of this project. At this point, we have the image. This is the first major part done, which means now we can start working on the menu. This one contains quite a few different parts. I will be going through them step by step. The one I'm going to start with now is this main panel here. This is a custom Tkinter widget that is a container that has different panels. It's really easy to implement. Let's have a look at this one. Back in my code editor, I want to create another widget for this container. Since this is going to be a larger project, I am going to create a new file. I will save this one as menu.py. First of all, as always, we need to import custom tkinter as ctk. This allows me to create another class, which I called menu. What makes this one special is that for the inheritance, we are using ctk tab view. This is basically a frame with tabs. Although other than that, we need the dunder init method with self and the parent. And later on, we're going to add more, but that's enough for now. After that, we need super init and set the master to the parent. Last step, I want to place this menu right away using grid with row being zero and the column being zero as well. On top of that, I want to set sticky to north, south, east, and west. With that, we have a menu. Let's use it right away inside of main.py. For that, first of all, we have to import it, which means from menu import menu. This I will create inside of import image because in here we are first of all closing the input button and then we are creating the image editing stuff. So the image output and the close button. Besides that, I want to create a third thing, which is going to be self.menu. For that, I am going to use the menu class I've just created. The one argument we need for now is self for the parent. On top of that, for close edit, I should get rid of the exercise. In fact, I should get rid of all of the text. We don't need that anymore, like so. What I want to do inside of this method now is to hide this menu as well. Just like I have hidden the image output and the close button, which means in here, self.menu.grid underscore forget. Then everything should be working. Let's try. I get the usual menu, and now we get some slightly weird behavior. But at the very least, for now, we have a container, so something is happening. Although right now, there's an issue, and that is these columns are not properly represented. Let me run the entire thing again really quick. You can see here that roughly the image on the right this width here is roughly as large as this width here, which is not what I specified earlier. These two lines don't seem to work properly anymore. That is because I have to specify uniform and set this to some kind of string. It has to be the same for both of them. If I now run this, click on open image and an image, now this is looking much better. But all right, with that, we have the proper menu. So let me minimize all of this. Now we can work inside of the menu. First of all, what I want to create in here are the tabs. Those you create using self and then the add method. The one argument you want for this one is the name of the tab. For example, the first one that I want is called position. Let's try this one. If I now click on open image and an image, we can see position. This is going to be the only tab for now. Although in my case, I want to have four tabs. I want to have the color, 
I want to have effects, and finally, I want to have export. Let's try this one one more time. And there we go. Now we have four tabs that we can toggle between. So now we have to figure out how to attach a frame to any of these tabs. I am going to start with the class position frame, which is going to be just a CTK frame. This one is going to work like any other frame we have created so far, which means we need self and a parent. After that, call super dunder init and set the master to the parent. Once we have something like this inside of the menu, I can create the widgets. For now, I just want to create a position frame. Although now, when we are setting the parent, we are not using self. Instead, we are using self.tab and then the tab we want to attach the widget to, which in this case is going to be position. Although if I were to run this, you wouldn't really see a difference because this widget here is going to look identical to the background of the menu. We can change that by setting the FG color to something like blue. And to really make sure that this is working, let me duplicate the entire class and change position to, let's say, color is the second one. This one is going to work in basically the same way, except for now, I'm going to change the background color to green. Finally, for the position frame, I want to add a duplicate and change position to color, with the parent being the color tab, not the position. Let's try all of this now. I can run the app again, click on open image, click on otter, and now we can see that nothing happened. The reason for that is that these two frames, position and color, also need to be placed, like any other widget. For them, I can simply use pack because they're supposed to fill the entire area, which means I want to set expand to true and fill to both. Let me duplicate this one. And now let's try this again. Click on open image, otter, and there we have a completely blue tab. If I click on color, it's entirely green. Effects and export don't have anything yet, so they are empty. But at the very least, this is working. With that, I can set the background color for both of them to transparent. And now I have to figure out what to add inside of these frames. Since that is going to be quite a bit of logic in and of itself, I have created another Python file that I have saved as panels.py. The way you want to think about it, if I open the finished project and open an image really quick, basically what we have right now is a frame for each of these tabs. What we now have to create are these panels here. These are going to be reusable components. For example, this slider box here and this slider box here are the same class. The only difference between them is that I inserted different arguments. As a matter of fact, inside of color, we have two more slider boxes, these two here, and inside of effects, we have two more. All of these sliders are the same class. I simply use different arguments to customize them. Although besides them, we have other widgets like this one here, or like these toggles, or like this box here. All of these we have to create. For now, I'm simply going to start with this slider box. This is going to be a fairly simple one. Although for now, it's not going to do anything, but that I am going to work on in the next part. I want to work inside of the panels. In here, I have to, first of all, import custom tkinter as ctk. Once I have that, I want to create a class that I called panel. This one has to inherit from ctk and ctk frame. First of all, in here, we are going to need to done the init method with self and the parent. We have done this multiple times by now. After that, super done init with master being the parent. Finally, I want to use self.pack. This one should set fill to X. On top of that, I want pad Y to be four and iPad Y to be eight. This will create a fairly basic panel that doesn't do much by itself. Also, I forgot one more thing. I want to set an FG color in here, which is going to be dark gray. This is the dark gray that I'm getting from the settings, this dark gray. 
Although for this to work, I have to add from settings, import, everything. Let's try to use this one right away. Inside of menu.py, I want from panels, import, everything. With that, inside of the position frame, I want to create a simple panel with self as the parent. Now let's try to use this one. Open image, otter, and there we have a simple container, which is ideal because in here we can now add a slider, some text, we could add switches, basically whatever we wanted. The idea basically is that this panel is going to be a parent class and from this, I'm going to create the actual panels that you are going to see. For example, the one I will be using the most is the slider panel. This one is a child of the panel, which means inside of the init method, after self, I have to specify a parent. Also, I now want to specify some kind of text to display what kind of box we are going to have. Although I am still going to need super init, for this one, I have to set the parent to the parent. Because remember, this parent here refers to this parent, which is going to set the master. What we are now able to do inside of the slider panel, I can, for example, create a CTK and CTK label. Self is going to be the parent. The text I can now set from the text, the one I've specified inside of the parameter. Just so we can see something, I want to pack this thing right away. Once I have that inside of menu, I don't want to have a panel anymore. Instead, I want to have a slider panel. Besides self for the parent, this is going to need some kind of text. Let's add test in here. Once again, I can run this, open image, otter, and now we can see we have one panel that says test. That is working really good. Which means now we can create all of the stuff for an actual slider panel in here. As a reminder, what this is going to look like, let me open the final thing. I want to create this slider box here, or this one here, they're the same. Creating this layout is going to be your exercise. I want you guys, let me clean this up a tiny bit. I want you guys to recreate this slider box. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out. Let's get started. In my case, I used a grid layout, which means I want to start with a layout. We need self.row configure. I have zero and one rows that both have a weight of one. The same thing I want to do for the column configure, which means we have two rows and two columns. With that, the CTK label shouldn't use pack anymore, instead we need grid. And this text I want to have in the top left, which means column is going to be zero, row is going to be zero. And let's stick with that for now. Besides that, I want to have a second piece of text that for now is simply going to say 0, 0.0. I should draw all of this actually. This is going to be the text box and because of these two lines here, we have basically created this kind of layout. The first item I have set in here is the first CTK label, which is going to occupy this top left cell here. This is zero and zero, these numbers. Next up, I want to create another CTK label that should be 0.0, .0 in the top right, which means we are still going to be in row zero, but column should be one now. Let's try those two. I can click on open image again, otter, and now we get test and zero and zero. However, I want to make one more change. This test should be all the way on the left, roughly here, while this 0.0, .0 should be all the way on the right, roughly here. To achieve that, I can use sticky. The title text for this box should stick to the west side. The 0.0, .0 should only stick to the east, which means the right side. Let's try this one again now. And that is an improvement, but now I think the issue is that both of these text labels are far too close to the border. This I can fix as well by using some padding. Both of these labels should get pad X of 5 and now we should have a good result. 
There we go. I am happy with this one. You could probably add a tiny bit more padding, but well, experiment around. Finally, I want to add CTK and CTK slider. For the parent, I'm going to set self here, and then we can place this using the grid method right away. Row should be one, column should be zero, and since I want this slider to span the entire width, column span should be two. Let's try this one, open image, click on the auto again, and there we have a slider that's not looking bad at all. Although a few tiny more changes, I want to set sticky to east and west, so we are covering the entire horizontal space. Although, just like with the labels, I want to add a tiny bit of horizontal padding. Now let's try this again. Open image, otter, and well, this looks basically identical, but now we have a bit more control over it. Also, we can try to add for the slider a bit of vertical padding. Let's go with five as well. I think that's going to make the entire thing look a bit more open. Yeah, I do like this one better although the difference is quite minor. All right, what we can do now, inside of position frame, rename this label to rotation. What this allows us to do, if I open the entire thing again, we now have the rotation text box. This one is looking pretty good. Oh, although there's one thing that I did forget. Inside of panels, for this slider, I want to set an FG color which is going to be slider BG from settings, this color here. What this one is going to do is make the slider background a tiny bit brighter so it's easier to see. The change, once again, is not very pronounced. Now we have the actual box for the slider. What is even more important now, we have the rotation box, this is this slider panel. But now I can duplicate this because the second box I want is called Zoom. What this one does, if I rerun everything, we now have a second box that can work independently. So with that, we have made a ton of progress. Although, unfortunately, neither of those do anything. So this I do have to work on. Although before we get to that, there's one more change that I would like to make. There is right now no padding between the menu and the image which seems a bit cramped. So I want to add a tiny bit of padding both for the menu and for the image. For the menu, when I'm using the grid method to place it up here, I want to add pad Y, which is going to be 10, and pad X is also going to be 10. Besides that, inside of the image widgets, the image output in the grid method, I also want to add pad X and set this to 10, pad Y is going to be the same. Finally, I can run main.py again, the otter. Now the entire thing looks a bit more spacious. So next up, we can make all of this actually work. Now that we have the basic layout, we can start working on the actual functionality of this image editor. What I want to start with is the rotation, which means this rotation slider actually rotates the image. To make this kind of thing work, we are going to need a couple of things. Most importantly to understand the basics is that this rotation slider is going to be connected to a custom tkinter variable. And when this variable changes, we are going to update the image in a certain way. For this particular case, we're going to rotate the image, but this could also later become a zoom, or it could become an invert or any of the color or effects. But let's do all of this in code. This is going to be much easier to understand. Once again, I am inside of main.py. What I want to do in here is, first of all, I want to create another method that I called init parameters, which will need self and nothing else for its own parameters. What I want to do in here is to initiate the parameters that are going to track the data for the image manipulation. Later on, there will be quite a few in here. But for now, I simply want to create self.rotate, and this is going to be a float. This is going to be an object, ctk and double var. This one is also going to have a start value. 
which I set with the value, the start value I am getting from the settings. This rotate default here is what I want. I can copy it and use it for the value. With this, we have some kind of way to track the value of the rotation of the image. By default, it's going to be zero. Now, once we have that, we want to do a couple of things. Number one, we want to connect the var to the slider, which means this rotation needs to be accessible or rather changeable from inside of this slider panel. So we have to somehow get it in there. Once we have that, number two, we need to trace changes to the var, which means once this slider panel is changing the variable, we want to do a certain thing. Finally, number three, we want to use the var value to change the image, which in this case means anytime we're moving the slider, we're updating the var and then we're updating the image. So let's go through this one by one. Number one, we have to connect the var to the slider. Although before we can do that, we have to call this method. This is going to happen inside of init. Before we are creating the widgets, I want to self.init parameters. I suppose we can do this right at the top. It makes a bit more sense there. With that, I can minimize the init method because now I want to work inside of import image. The reason for that is that the menu needs to have access to this self.rotate float. That way, let me pass it right in, self.rotate float. That way, inside of menu, the class, I can create another parameter. Let's call this the rotation. The rotation, I want to pass right through to the position frame, which means the next argument in here is going to be the rotation. With that, inside of the position frame, I have the rotation available, and now I can pass this into the slider panel rotation for this one. That way the slider panel has access to the rotation, which means inside of the panels, I can work inside of the slider panel. Although first of all, I have to give this another parameter, the rotation. What this allows me to do, for example, I can set the text, well, I can remove it right away and instead get a text variable, which is going to be the rotation. I can do the same thing for the slider, Although this one is going to be a variable, which is also going to be the rotation. With that, when we're moving the slider, the text should also update. Let's try this one actually. I can open the image and now if I click on rotation, we get something. So definitely we're making progress, although the number here is way too precise. Also, let me comment out the zoom for now because this one is going to cause an error. For now, I want to keep on working inside of the rotation. There are two major problems actually. The first one is that this CTK slider, I think goes from zero to one, which is fine for a starting value, but I want this to go from zero to 360. As a reminder, a full circle, so a full rotation starts at zero and then goes all the way around to 360 which means the slider, let me do this over multiple lines right away. The slider is going to need two more arguments. We need from and underscore. This should start at zero and then go to, and this should be 360, which means now we should get the numbers from zero. This is a good starting point and I can go all the way to 360. Although the problem now is that the number is way too precise. We don't need this many numbers. Before we can get to that, we have another issue. This zero and the 360 are only unique to this particular slider panel. If I want to create another slider panel, for example, for the zoom, the numbers might be different. As a consequence, these numbers cannot be hard coded. Although that is very easy to change, I want to add another parameter or rather two parameters that are min value and max value. From is going to be the min value to is going to be the max value for the slider. With that back in menu, 
I can add two more arguments that are going to be 0 and 360. That way, this slider panel becomes actually a reusable component, where we have a name, a variable, and then a start and an end value. Later on for the zoom panel, we can simply copy it and add different numbers and then we have a completely new panel. Before we can work on that, we have to update this CTK label. The issue once again is that the numbers we are getting from the text variable are much too precise. To fix that, I want to round them. But for that, we have to add a tiny bit more logic. First of all, I want to get access to this CTK label by turning it into an attribute. Let's call it the num label. This is simply going to be the widget we just created. After that, I want to place it with the grid method. So self.num label. So far, this is going to be the exact same result. Although this one is not going to get a text variable. Instead, I am just going to set the text, which is going to be self.rotation dot get. By default, this one is going to be zero. With that, let me run the code again. We are getting an error. This isn't going to be self. This is just going to be the rotation. Now let's try it again. There we go. Now we have rotation and the number on the top right doesn't do anything because we are simply getting the value of the rotation, but then not using it. This one here doesn't do anything right now. For that, I want to create a separate method. I call this one update text. This one is going to need self for the parameters. Besides self, we are also going to need a value. This value we need because we are calling this update text from the slider via the command. This is going to be self.update text. What this update text is doing, let me demonstrate right away. I want to print the value. If I now run this again, the slider is going to print whatever number we have inside of it, which means now the numbers go from 0 to 360. These numbers I want to use to update this num label, which means I can copy it and use configure to update the text in there. I simply want to update the text, which is going to be an F string. I simply want to round the value I'm getting from the slider with two decimal points. With that, I can run main.py again, click on the author, and now we have the text updating in the proper way. This looks significantly cleaner. Righty, with that, we have connected the var to the slider. Although inside of the panel, this shouldn't be called rotation because later on the slider panel should also connect to other kinds of variables. Let me simply rename rotation to data var. That way the slider panel becomes a bit more generic. Righty, but now we have covered the first bit, which means I can get rid of it. Now we have to trace the changes to this variable which means whenever this rotation flow changes, we want to do something. That is actually super easily done. All we need is self dot the rotation float. And I want to run the trace method. Whenever we are changing the value or more specifically, whenever we are writing a new value in it, then I want to call a method. The method I want to call is going to be manipulate image. That doesn't exist right now. Let's create it self.manipulate image. For this one, we need self and we need the arcs. These arcs are passed into it automatically whenever we are calling a method using trace. Inside of this manipulate image, we can now make changes to the actual image, which means we have covered the second part as well. Now we have to cover how to update the image. Essentially, what we are going to do we're going to take this self image and then run some methods on it. The pillow library has lots of methods to change an image. For example, we could blur it, rotate it, zoom it, flip it, add some contrast or some other effects, also change the brightness or the grayscale. There are lots of things that we can do. However, for this one, we have to be careful because we don't want to make changes that we cannot reverse. For that, when we're importing the image, 
I am actually going to create a self.original and this is where we are storing the image. So image open.path is going to get the original and then self.image is going to be a copy of self.original. That way I can make whatever change I want to the image, whereas original is going to stay unchanged. That way, if I make too many changes, I can always revert back to the original. That is a super important thing to start with. Now inside of manipulate image. First of all, I want to override self.image with self.original once again. That way I am always starting with the original image. Once I have that, I can apply the different changes to it. For example, if I want to apply rotate, I could get myself.image and to apply rotation, I want self.image and then rotate. This method wants a single argument, which is going to be the rotation, which I'm getting from self.rotateFloat.get. That method is going to return a new image, which we're now storing inside of the original image. All we have to do now is to set this new image as the image we are outputting, which we have done earlier inside of this resize image down here. We essentially want to call all of this again, except now with a new image, which means I want to reuse this code. As a consequence, I'm going to turn all of this into a separate method that I called place image, which needs self and nothing else. Although with that, we have to make a few more changes. First of all, after we are resizing the image, we have to call self.place image to make sure that this works in the first place. Unfortunately, now we have to make a few more changes because of the local scope of these methods. The basic issue is that these variables are only available inside of this scope, while they are not available in this scope, which is going to cause an error, so we have to account for it. The way around it, the way I approached it is, let me actually minimize all of these methods, otherwise this will get confusing, inside of the init method. Before I'm creating the widgets, I want to create some canvas data. This is going to be self.image width, which is going to be zero by default. Then we have an image height, which is also going to be zero. Then we have a canvas width and a canvas height. Once we have those numbers inside of resize image, every time we are resizing the image, I want to update the numbers I have just created. This means all of these image width and image height variables need to be parameters, which I do by adding self in front of them. Also, this image height and this image width needs to have self as well. With that, I have covered the image width and the image height, but I also have to update the canvas width and the canvas height, which means I want to add another section here with update canvas attributes. This is quite easily done. All I need is self.canvas width is going to be the event.width. Then I can duplicate this and simply change the width to height. With that, I can minimize resize image, although I do have to make some changes to place image. Image output.delete all still works just fine. Although resize image now needs to work with the attributes self.image width and self.image height. Self.image decay is working just as before. This one doesn't need any changes. Although for the image output, this image width divided by two should be replaced with self.canvas width divided by two. Same for event height. This should be self.canvas height divided by two. This should be all the changes that we have to make. Let's try all of this again. I can click on the otter and there we go. The otter still works, although the rotation right now doesn't work at all because inside of manipulate image, we're not calling this place image. We are simply updating the image, but we're not setting it to the output. For that, I simply have to call self.placeImage at the end of manipulate image. Now let's try this again. 
open the image, otter, and now the rotation is working just fine. And with that, we have the first part of the rotation. Now, I think so far, this is probably a bit confusing. I think the best way to approach this is to do another example. Inside of the parameters, I want to create a second attribute, this time for the zoom, which means I want to have self dot zoom underscore float. This is also going to be a CTK double var. As a matter of fact, I can simply copy this one, although the start value is, well, it's also going to be zero, but I want this to connect properly. So zoom default here is the start value. Also, I can get rid of this text. That's going to be confusing. This zoom float, I now have to pass into the menu, which is happening inside of import image in here. Besides rotate float, I also want self.zoom float, which means now inside of the menu, besides rotation, I also need zoom. This zoom, I want to pass right away into the position frame, right after rotation, which means zoom in here. And I am also going to need another parameter, which is going to be zoom. What this allows me to do is to simply uncomment the slider panel and add in the zoom in here. This one should go from 0 to 200. With that, I have connected the variable to the panel. So I can minimize the import image. Next up, I have to trace it. For that, I can simply duplicate this method and change rotate float to zoom float. With that, we are calling manipulate image whenever we are changing the zoom float value. With that, I can call manipulate image in here. I want to have the zoom. This is going to work just as before. I want to update self.image. To change this one though, we have to import another module from the pillow library. This one is called image ops. The way you are using this is you first need image ops and then dot prop. This one wants two arguments. The first one is going to be the image, which in our case is always going to be self.image. Besides that, it is expecting a border. This border we are getting from self.zoomfloat.get. With that, we can run the entire thing. I can click on open image, get the otter. Now we have two panels. I can rotate it still, but now zoom is also going to work. Although it's not perfect zoom, it stretches the image a tiny bit, but this is the easiest way to get zoom in pillow. And I guess for our purposes, this is good enough, but you could totally update this to get proper zoom. I guess what is really important to understand here is that we first of all copy the original to the image. Then we are creating a new image if we are rotating the image. Then next up, this rotated image, we are zooming if we are using the zoom. That way we are applying both of these changes. Now, before I'm changing this video, I have made a couple of changes to how the image is being displayed. And I think I should talk about those because it's probably a bit confusing. So let's go through how the image output is going to work. First of all, when we are calling the edit method, we are declaring a couple of basic variables. We need to get the image width and the image height and the canvas width and the canvas height. All of those are zero by default. That one should be fairly easy. After we are doing that, we are calling import image. In here, we are importing the image, but then most importantly, we are getting the image ratio. This we only have to get once because we care about the ratio of the original image. For the rest, we're simply getting rid of the import button and then display the image. So this we can ignore for now. What is much more important next up is we are resizing the image. For that, we're getting the canvas ratio, and then we're updating the attributes for the canvas width and the canvas height. After we have that, we are resizing the image in such a way that it fits into the canvas perfectly. Finally, inside of place image, we are getting whatever image we currently have. This could either be the original or the manipulated image. And then we're getting the image width and the image height we have set up here. This we are then turning into an image decay. And finally, we are creating an output. And to get the center of the canvas, we are getting this canvas width and canvas height and divided by two. 
I am not quite sure how confused you are by this, but your main exercise for this part is to try to understand the logic here of how the image is being displayed. Ideally, try to recreate all of this and try to do all of this from scratch. The logic for this one, unfortunately, does get a tiny bit more advanced. But, well, we can continue. So let me minimize all of this and I'll see you in the next video. At this point, we have the basic layout and some rudimentary functionality, which means we can rotate the image and we can zoom into the image. From this point forward, we have to cover two important steps. Number one, we have to create a whole lot more variables to cover all of the different options. For example, right now, we have a variable for the rotation and for the zoom. We are also going to need one for the invert. After that, we need three more variables to cover everything inside of color, three more to cover these final panels. Which means we're going to need nine variables in total which means we have to organize our data management a tiny bit better. This is what I am going to start with. Other than that, we have to create a few more panels. For example, this invert panel here doesn't exist yet. This switch panel here, we also have to create. And finally, for the effects, we have to create this box here, which is a drop-down menu. For example, for these kind of effects. Back in my code, I want to work inside of init parameters. This one creates two attributes right now, rotate float and zoom float, which is fine, but that's not exactly what I want to do. Since we have to create quite a lot of variables, this is not going to be efficient. What I want to do instead is create a couple of dictionaries. For example, the first one is going to be self.posvars. This one is going to have an entry for rotate. The associated value is the one we have created earlier, the CTK double var with the start value of rotate default. I can copy this one more time. Next up, we have zoom. This is also going to be a double var, although the default value is going to be zoom default. Finally, there's one more that I want. This is going to be flip. This one we haven't used yet. This is going to be a CTK string var. For the start value for this one, we are going to need one, but it's going to work a tiny bit different compared to what we have done before. Essentially, if you look at settings, we have flip options and this is a list. Later on, when we have the effects, this is going to work in a similar way. The idea is that we have a couple of options and zero is always the default, which means when I assign the value, I want to have flip options with the index zero. This would cover all of my position variables. With that, I can get rid of these two entries here, although I do have to cover the tracing. This one also wouldn't work right now. To replace that, let me add a comment in here, tracing. I want to use a for loop. For var in, I want to check self.posvars.values. And don't forget to call this one. This is going to give me all of the vars. This double var, this double var, and this string var. I want to get all of them and then use the trace method. The arguments are going to be the same that we have covered down here. With that, we can get rid of this bit as well. And now we are organizing our data much more elegantly. Although that being said, when I am running import image, Rotate float and zoom float don't exist anymore, so I want to get rid of them. I will replace them with self.posvars, which means now in the menu, we also have to update the parameters. I am just going to have the position variables. Those I'm going to pass right through to the position frame, and here I want to have the posvars. This also means inside of position frame, rotation and zoom should go. Instead, I want to have my position vars. Finally, when I'm creating the slider panels, instead of rotation, I want to have my pause vars in here. I want to get the key rotate. I think that's what I called it. Yeah, rotate this one. For the zoom, I want to have my pause vars dictionary with the key zoom. With that, the app should work just as before. If I open the image, 
I can still rotate. Well, I can't. And I do know why, because inside of manipulate image, we are still using rotate float.get and we're using zoom float.get. Neither of those exist anymore. Instead, I want to get my self.posvars. The first one is going to be rotate. Zoom float should be posvars with the key zoom. Now this should be working. Let's try the otter. And now we're getting another error. Ah, right. I see the error. I forgot the get method for both of them. Now this should be working. I hope. I don't want to overpromise. Otter, rotate. Now this is working, both for zoom and for rotate. Cool. Which means now we have the basic variables and tracing for the position. Next up, I want to create another dictionary with self.color vars. This is going to work in basically the same way that we have seen up here, except we are creating variables for other attributes. Also, I want to indate these key value pairs that makes all of this look a bit cleaner. <clears throat> for the color vars, we have four values in total. We have brightness, this one is going to be a CTK double var. The start value for this one, we're getting from settings. Somewhere in here, we have brightness default. This one is going to be one. Next up, we have grayscale. This one is a CTK Boolean var. The start value for this one, once again, we are getting from settings, grayscale default. It's just going to be false. After that, we have invert. This one is also going to be a boolean var, meaning I can just copy all of this. Although I do have to change the start value, this one is invert default. Finally, we have vibrance, which is going to be a ctk double var, which also has a start value, which we are getting from vibrance default. There we go. This covers all of the data for the colors. There's one more that we need, and that is self.effectVars. And for this one, I don't want to bore you, so let me just copy it in. This one is going to look like this. We have blur, contrast, and effect. Blur being a double var, contrast being a CTK int var, and effect is going to be a string var. Blur and contrast both have a simple default value, whereas the effect is going to work like the flip, which means effect options inside of settings is going to give me a list where the first value is none. But other than that, we have emboss, find edges, contour, and edge enhance. I am for now simply picking the first entry. With that, we have all of our tkinter variables that are going to track the changes we are making to the image. Let me minimize them. What we now have to figure out is how to trace through all of them. For that, you could create three for loops, but that wouldn't exactly be elegant. Instead, I want you guys to try an exercise. I want you guys to apply trace to all of the nine variables using a single for loop, the one I have already created. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out. The way you want to approach this one is you can simply add a plus to get, for example, self.colorvars.values. Although this by itself, if I run all of it, is not going to work. Because right now, we are trying to add dictionary values to other dictionary values, which isn't going to work. You can only add lists together, and that way you are getting a combined list, which should be giving you the answer, because all we have to do is convert both of these dictionary values to a list. That way, all of this is simply going to work. Although, since we have three dictionaries, we have to do this one more time plus a list of self.effectVars.values. There we go. With that, we have one for loop that applies trace to all of the variables. 
Although in my case, I want to store all of them inside of a separate variable. That way you don't have to scroll. Let's call it combined vars is going to be the list I just created, which I want to loop over. So for var in combined vars, then we are applying the tracing to it. The way you want to think about this kind of logic in here is that you can very easily combine lists, but dictionaries are much more difficult to work with. As a consequence, it's quite a common thing to convert a dictionary to a list and then work with it for a bit because lists are much, much easier to work with. All right, but with that, we have initiated all of the parameters. What we now have to do is to pass all of them into the menu, which means besides the position variables, we also have self.colorVars and we have self.effect variables. To make all of that work inside of the menu, we need two more parameters. We have the color vars and the effect vars. The color vars I want to pass right through to the color frame. After that, I can create an effect frame that is going to have self.tab effects as the parent. Besides that, it is going to get the effect variables. This effect frame doesn't exist right now. Let's create it all the way at the bottom. I want to have class effect frame. This one is just going to be a CTK frame with a dunder init method. As a matter of fact, I can copy all of this since it's going to be the same. Although the color frame is going to need the color vars while the effect frame is going to get the effect bars. Now this is going to work. With that, we can work purely inside of these frames because they have all the data that they are going to need. First of all, inside of the color frame, I want to create two more slider panels, which I can do very easily. I just have to copy the slider panel. The first one is going to be brightness with the color vars of brightness. The minimum for this one is going to be zero, but the maximum is going to be five. Then I can duplicate this panel and change brightness to vibrance. The color vars variable we are looking at is going to be vibrance as well, which is also going to go from zero to five. Neither of these panels are going to do anything right now, but at the very least, we should be able to see them. Although if I run the code, I get an error that a bracket was never closed. This happens inside of when I'm creating this list, which is going to be inside of init parameters. For this one, all the way at the end, I forgot one bracket. Now let's try this again. We can still open an image. This is looking good. And now if I go to color, we have brightness and vibrance, both of which start at one. I can move the slider, but it doesn't do anything right now. But at the very least, we can see something. While we are here, I can also work on the effect frame because this one is going to get two slider panels as well. We get one slider panel for the blur, which is going to have the variable from effect vars with blur. The values here go from zero to three. Then I can duplicate this one because the next one is going to be contrast, which is going to get the dictionary entry for contrast and the values go from zero to 10. And I hope while you're watching this, you can see why these panels are super useful. I can simply duplicate them and then I get a whole panel that can influence one specific variable. All right, let's try all of this we should be having three panels now. We have position, color, and effects, and all of this is looking really good. The numbers also update along with it. I'm very happy with this one. Which means now we have to create a few more panels to cover the other kind of variables. This is going to happen inside of the panels. First of all, I want to create another class for I call this one a segmented panel. 
Let me run the final app again. The panel we are going to create is this one. It's quite simple, to be honest. We have a label at the top, and this thing here is a CTK widget. Although both of those are going to be inside of a panel, which is going to be the parent. Inside of this one, I want to have a dunder init method with self. This one needs a parent. Then we have some text. Next up, we need a data variable. Finally, we're going to need the options for this panel. First of all, we need the super dunder init method, which sets the parent to the parent we have gotten from the parameters. After that, I want to create a CTK label. The parent is going to be self, and text is going to be whatever we are getting from the parameters. Since the layout is going to be simple, pack here is totally fine. The actually interesting widget for this panel is going to be CTK segmented button. I hope I spelled that correctly. It's looking good. This one wants to have a parent, as always, and then we are going to need values. These values we are going to get from the parameters. This is going to be options. After we have that, I want to pack the widget as well. I want expand to be true, fill should be both. Finally, I want to have pad x to be 4 and pad y should also be 4. This is going to give me a segmented panel. We now have to figure out how to call it. This will happen inside of the menu. And since I'm importing everything from the panels, I can use it right away. This segment panel I want to use inside of the position frame because in here I have my position variables. I want to get my segment panel. The parent is going to be self. Besides that, the other parameters are text, data var, and options. Let me copy them in. The text we can just set as whatever we want. I call this one invert. The data variable we are getting from the position vars which I called invert, or at least I think I did. If I look at the position vars in here, we have flip, which means there should be flip instead of invert. The options I am getting from the settings. I want to get flip options and add them for the options. This should be all I need. If I now run all of this, select the auto once again, we are getting an error that segment panel is not defined which probably means I made a typo. I called this the segmented panel, not the segment panel. Let's fix that one. Let's try it again. If I now try it again, there we go. We have an invert button or a panel or segmented button, whatever you want to call it. Although it doesn't do anything right now, but we can work on that in just a bit. For now though, there's one more thing that I want to do. And that is anytime I am clicking on any field inside of this segmented button, I want to update this data var. For that, inside of the segmented panel, we can add a variable, which is going to be the data var. With that, we have the segmented panel. I can now create another class, which is going to be a switch panel. Once again, the parent here is going to be the panel. Let me demonstrate what this is going to look like at the end. In the final app, inside of color, we have this top panel here, where we have a couple of switches that either activate black and white or invert color. Not a particularly difficult panel to create. I want self and the parent, as usual. However, now for this one, I want to account for an unknown number of switches which means there could be two, there could be one, there could be five in here. I want a panel to handle all of these cases. As a consequence, the parameter here is going to be arcs, or asterisk arcs to be more specific. What I am expecting ultimately is a tuple, and this tuple contains other tuples. Inside of these inner tuples, we have a variable and then some text. The variable will be connected to the switch, and the text is going to be the name of the switch. Inside of this tuple, you can have as many inner tuples as you want. This is actually very easy to add. Although, first of all, we're going to need super dunder init, where we set the parent to the parent. 
Next up, we have to account for all of these arcs. This is going to happen inside of a for loop for var and text inside of the arcs. This is going to give me a variable and a text. This I want to use to create a CTK and CTK switch. The parent is going to be self as always. Since I have the text right away, I can set this as the text for the switch and I can also set the variable for the switch as the variable I'm getting from the tuple. For these sliders, I also want to apply a tiny bit of styling. They get a button color, which is going to be blue. This blue I'm getting from the settings, blue. Also, they are going to get an FG color, which will be the same as the slider background. The resulting widget, I want to store, let's call it switch. Once I have that, I want to pack this switch widget. The important thing for this one is the side should be left. Other than that, expand should be true, fill should be both, and then I want to have pad X of 5 and pad Y of 5. This is going to cover the panel. Let's try to use this one. I am going to need this inside of the color frame. I want to create a switch panel. The parent is going to be self as always. Next up, we have to cover these arcs, which are going to be, well, basically tuples. I can add one tuple in here. We need a var and some text. The text is the easy bit. The first one is black and white. I shorten this to B slash W. The variable we are getting from the color vars. The entry name is gray scale. Then I can duplicate all of this because the next entry is going to be color vars and invert. The name for this part is going to be invert. With that, we have another panel. Let's try and click on Otter and Color, and there we go. We have the invert buttons. Once again, they don't do very much, but at the very least, we have the visible part. Next up, inside of the panels, there's one more of the main panels that we have to create. This is going to be a class of drop down panel. This is going to be a tiny bit different because we are not going to use the panel. Instead, we will inherit from CTK option menu. I should actually demonstrate what this one is doing. If I open the final app again, inside of effects, we are creating this widget. It's simply a drop down menu. I can click in here, find edges, contour, edge enhance, and then you get different effects applied to the image. The effects apply part we don't do yet, but we are going to create this drop down menu. This one works kind of similar compared to the segmented panel, or rather the CTK segmented button, in the sense that you need a variable and some values. Which means this should be fairly doable. It's going to be your exercise. Create this drop down panel. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out. You will have to apply a bit of custom styling, so play around and see how far you get. As always, we have to start with a dunder init method. This one needs self, it needs a parent, it needs a data variable. Finally, we need options. Pretty much exactly what we have done for the segmented panel. For this one, we are now going to need a super init method. There are going to be a couple of options, so I'm going to do this over multiple lines right away. The most obvious one is now we have to set the master. It's not going to be the parent anymore because we inherit from a CTK widget, not from the panel. Other than that, we have to set values, which are going to be the options. Once we have all of that, I want to use self.pack to pack the widget. I want to set fill to x and pad y to 4. With that part covered, we should at the very least have something. Let's see what we get when we create it. I want to create this panel inside of the effect frame. Once again, all the way at the top, 
I want to have a drop down panel. For that, we have to copy all of the parameters, parent, data var, and options. Parent is the easy one, self. For the data variable, I want to get the effect vars. The key we are looking for here is called effect. Finally, for the options, this one we are getting from the settings. Effect options, I just want to copy and paste, and then we should be good to go. Let's try main.py, open image, author, effects, and we get a drop down menu. This one looks pretty good. We can click on things and we get the right option, although the styling doesn't work out right now and this also doesn't do anything. But this we can work on quite easily. First of all, for the styling, I want to set an FG color to dark gray. After that, we have to set a button color. Then we need a button hover color. Finally, we're going to need a drop down FG color. All of these colors we are getting from the settings. Although I did realize I didn't actually create them. So let me paste them in at this point. There we go. These are the three colors that I want to use. We have drop down main color, drop down hover color, and drop down menu color. Drop down main color is going to be the button color. The button hover color is going to be the drop down hover color. Finally, the drop down FG color is going to be the drop down menu color. Sorry about the colors, I completely didn't realize. Let's try all of this one now. If I click on open image, author, effects, and there we go. This is looking significantly better. Finally, we have to connect the variable to this menu. So it actually does something. What you do by setting the variable, this one is going to get the data var. With that, we have all of the main panels. Let's try all of this. I can click on the otter. The rotation works and the zoom also works. Both of those do something. But for the invert, we get nothing. Next up, we have colors and some sliders. And then we have effects that works and we have blur and contrast. So all of this is working, but well, this video is getting quite long. So for the next part, we are going to make all of these variables actually do something. At this point, this is quite easy to implement. So I'll see you there. At this point, we have all of the panels and all of the data to organize our app. We can actually start working to implement all of the functionality. I'm going to work on the invert button, on the colors. So we have brightness, vibrance, invert, and black and white. And we are getting the colors like blur, contrast, and stuff like contours. We are going to apply all of that in this video. Back in my code editor, I want to work inside of manipulate image. This method is going to organize all of the image manipulation. We already have a couple of things in here. Now, the really important thing that you absolutely have to understand is that we always start this method by assigning a new image. This image always starts with the original. This image we are then going to transform. For example, we are starting by rotating it. This is going to give us a whole new image. This new image we are then using inside of this line and then adding a zoom. That way we have a rotation and a zoom at the same time. This we simply have to continue forever. For example, to add a blur or to change the brightness or to flip the entire thing. We basically take the image we have and we keep on adding changes. For example, what we could be doing to finish up the positioning is the flip logic. Although this one is a tiny bit different compared to what we have done with rotate and zoom. First of all, though, I have to check if self.posvars, the key I'm looking for here is called lib. I want to get the value of this variable. And for this one, we have a couple of different options. For example, we have capital X, then we want to do a certain thing. For now, I'm going to write pass. Besides that, we also have that the flip could have the value of Y. Finally, we could have a value of both. These are the values I specified in settings. We have X, Y, and both. 
these flip options we are passing into the panels specifically let me minimize all of this in the segment panel we are passing in these options which means when we are clicking on one of these buttons this data variable becomes the option we have selected i suppose just to test this let me print x i want to print y and finally i can print both let's try this one now i can click on open image the otter and now i have none this one doesn't do anything but if i click on x y and both we get x y and both this is working really well although i don't want to print x y or both instead i want to assign a new self dot image this new image we are getting once again from image ops the one we have already used up here except for this one we need either mirror or flip mirror is going to flip the image in the horizontal axis which means we are only going to need a single argument in here which is the image we already have so essentially what's going to happen at this point we are taking our original image then we are rotating it then we are zooming it and if this condition is true then we are flipping it on the horizontal axis this should already be working let's try once again i can open the image and now if i click on x we have a flipped image this is working perfectly fine which means next up i can duplicate this line get rid of the print statement the only change i have to make is that this mirror should now be flip this is flipping the image on the vertical axis let's try this one i can click on the otter and y and there we go now we have x and y separately which means to combine the two i simply have to run both of these methods i want to get this one and this one i want to mirror and flip the image if both is selected which means we can try this one more time now we get none then we have x y and both and this is working perfectly fine with that we can work on the next bit i'm going to put it right below let's work on the brightness as a matter of fact let's work on brightness and vibrance because they work in basically the same way although for this one we're going to need another module of pillow which means all the way at the top i want to import image n Hands. the way this one is working is we first of all have to create what is called an enhancer for example if i want to create a brightness enhancer i have to get image enhance and then write this this one now wants to have the image by itself this is not going to do anything that is going to be visible however what we can do now is get our image and then use the brightness enhancer to enhance this one spelling this correctly would also help inside of this method we can now add the argument in my case i want self.colorvars the key is going to be brightness and don't forget get with that this should be working let's try I can click on the otter this one is in colors and now brightness makes the image brighter or darker and i can make this really bright or completely black now that we have covered this part we can also create the vibrance enhancer because it's going to work in the same way i want to have image enhance this one is called color once again it is going to need self.image with that I can get myself.image, the vibrance enhancer, and then enhance. For this one, we need self.colorvars. The key for this one is vibrance, and once again, I want to get this value. This covers another important part. Let's try it. Color, vibrance, and there you can see this is working really well. And I can also make this image black and white via this vibrance method. Also, I can combine the two. I can make the image more vibrant. Also, this is going to work with rotation and zoom and invert. All of this is coming together quite nicely. Next up, we can work on the colors. 
This is going to include, let me actually write it, grayscale and invert of the colors. This returns to simply getting self.image, the value here we are getting from image ops, the one we have already used a couple of times, for example, for the zoom. The method we need for this one is gray scale. As the one argument, it wants the image. Although the issue for this one is that we are always applying the grayscale mode. As a consequence, we have to make sure to wrap this thing inside of an if statement so that we only apply it if a certain condition is true, which in my case is if self.color vars with the key gray scale. This is a Boolean var, which means if I get the value, this is either going to be true or false. Only if it is true do I want to apply this effect. Don't forget the colon. Also, now I can duplicate these two lines because invert is going to work in basically the same way. I want to check the invert key and inside of image ops, I want to use invert with self.image. This should be enough to activate the grayscale and the invert effect. Let's try this one. Open image, the otter, color. Now we have black and white and we have invert. Also, this is still working with the other sliders. So everything is going pretty well. Finally, we have to apply the blur and the contrast. Those are special effects, which means we are going to need another part of pillow. All the way at the top, I want to import image filter. To apply this effect, I want to get self.image and assign self.image.filter. The argument here needs to be image filter and then dot the kind of effect that you want. For example, for the blur, I want to have a Gaussian blur. There are different kinds of blur that you can apply. Gaussian blur is one of the really common ones. This one is expecting a single argument, which is going to be self.effectVars, the key blur. And from that, I want to get the value. This should be all we need. Let's try this one. I want to get my author. Inside of effects, we have blur. And this one is applying a tiny bit of a blur. It might even be difficult to see. To make this effect a bit stronger, let's go to menu. For this one, I want to look at my effect frame. Right now, blur is going from 0 to 3. Let's go from 0 to 30. And let's see how much that changes. Back to my author, effects, blur. Now this is blurring significantly more. This is covering the blur. Next up, we can work on the contrast. For that, I duplicated this line because I only really have to make some minor changes. Instead of the Gaussian blur, I want to have what is called an unsharp mask. This is going to apply a contrast. For that, the value is not going to be blur, it is going to be contrast. With this, I can try the same thing again. Effects, now I have a contrast, and this is applying a lot of contrast. Nice. There's only one more thing that we need, and that is the effect vars. For that, I'm going to use a match case statement. I want to match self.effect vars. For this one, the key is going to be effect. This effect is going to work somewhat like the flip in the sense that we have different options we want to look at. To get all of them, you have to look at settings. We have none. Emboss, Find Edges, Contour, and Edge Enhance. We have to account for the latter four cases, none we can simply ignore. This one isn't supposed to do anything. Which means, inside of the match case statement, I want to have one case, for example, for Emboss. This would be the second entry inside of Effect Options. If that is the case, I want to get self.image, and assign self.image.filter. For this one, we once again need the image filter dot all in uppercase letters M boss. This one doesn't expect any arguments. We simply have to apply it like that. Let's try it actually. 
If I now click on Open Image again, Otter, I can go to Effects. We have the drop-down menu. If I now click on Emboss, we are getting nothing. And I think I know why. I keep on making the same mistake. In the match case statement for match, I am only getting the tkinter variable. I am not getting the value inside of it. Now let's try it again. Open image, otter, effects. Now emboss should be working. And there we go. A strange effect, but well, it is what it is. This is giving us the first case, which means I can simply duplicate this three times because besides emboss, I want to have find edges. I have contour. And finally, I have Edge and Hans. These are the options I've specified in the settings. Although I did realize this should be a lowercase edges. To apply these filters, we have to update the image filter. For example, for find edges, we want all in uppercase letters again, find underscore edges. For contour, we want contour. Finally, for edge and hands, we want to have edge and hands more. Let's try all of that. Open image, otter, effects, emboss is working, find edges is working, contour is working, and edge and hands is also working, although it might be a bit hard to see. If I compare edge and hands to none, you can definitely tell the difference. With that, we have applied all of the effects. Now, there's one issue that I want to address, and that is performance. Let me run the entire thing again and apply a couple of effects. So far, I only really ever applied one or two effects at a time. However, if I now apply rotation, zoom, invert, some brightness, vibrance, and if I come to blur, you can see that everything is getting really, really slow. This is happening because we always apply all of these effects. And Python and Pillow simply aren't designed for that. If we wanted to have something like Photoshop, where these effects are instantaneous, then we would have to add a whole lot more logic. There's a ton of optimization that you could be doing with this. But in my case, I want to keep it simple. I only want to apply, for example, rotation if the rotation value is different from the default value, this one here. Figuring out how to do that is going to be your exercise. I want you guys to only apply the effect if the value is different from the default. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out. The way you want to think about it is I only want to apply the rotation if self.posvars and rotate is different from this rotate default. Only if that is the case, it doesn't make any sense to apply the rotation, which means only then do I want to apply this method and create a new image. If the value for this one is simply zero, then we don't have to apply the effect. That is literally it. Although, once again, I did forget get. I keep on doing that. Sorry about it. But, well, all we have to do now is to apply this logic to all of the effects. I only want to apply the zoom if the zoom is different from zero. I only want to apply flip if self, posvars, flip, and get is different from. I want to get the flip options with the value zero. Only if that is the case, then I want to do any of this. Next up, for brightness and vibrance, I want to get the value of brightness, for example, and only apply all of this if the value is different from my settings, the brightness default. This bracket shouldn't be there. Next up, I only want to apply the vibrance if self colorvas vibrance.get is different from vibrance default. Next up, we have the grayscale and we have the invert, although those are already perfectly fine. 
because we are applying this effect only if this variable or this variable return true. Those we can just leave as they are. Although next up we have blur, contrast and the effects. Those are particularly difficult to process, so they definitely need an if statement. I want to check if self.effectvars.get is different from the blur default. Also, besides that, I want to get the value for contrast. This one, if this effect is different from the contrast default, only then do I want to apply the effect. The match case statement we can leave as it is, because if none of these cases are true, then this isn't going to do anything. With that, we should have significantly better performance. Let me run the otter. I can now rotate it. I can zoom it. I can invert the thing. Then for the color, I can apply some colors. And this does feel much snappier. Probably very hard to see on video, but definitely try yourself. Now, that being said, if I apply all of the effects, then this is still going to get slower. Simply because we are doing a ton of different things anytime we are updating the image. At this point, we have a really processor intensive app. So you have to be aware of that. Although for our purposes, this is still fine. Which means I can minimize all of this and this covers a really important aspect of the app. At this point, we have all of the effects. Let me apply a couple. There we go. What I want to do now is to add a revert button. That way I can revert all of this and start from scratch. This revert button is going to work for every single panel, which means in color, I can change the color and then revert all of the colors. Once again, since we have all of the data in place, this should be fairly straightforward. Back in the code, I want to have a look at the menu. The menu itself is totally fine. We don't have to add anything for this one. However, inside of the position frame, the color frame and the effect frame, I want to add another panel at the bottom. This would be a revert button. This one doesn't exist right now. Let's create it inside of the panels. I want to create a new class that I call revert button. This is just going to be a button, so CTK and CTK button. After that, we are going to need a thunder init method. This one is going to need self and a parent. After that, we are going to need one more argument. Basically how I want to approach this. When I am inside of the menu, for example in the position frame, this revert button has to have access to all of these variables. We need rotation, zoom and invert. On top of that, we have to get the value. For example, rotation should be set back to zero, the value we have specified inside of the settings. Also, this needs to be flexible, so we can use it for the position frame, the color frame and the effect frame. For example, for the position frame, we have three different values, whereas for the color frame, we have four. The way I approach this in terms of the arguments. First of all, I am always going to add self in here for the parent. After that, I'm going to do roughly the same thing I have done for the switch panel. Which means we have a couple of tuples that always have a variable and then some other information. For this revert button, I want to add a tuple with, for example, the position vars and rotate. After I have that, I want to set the value I want it to set once we're clicking on this button, which is going to be rotate default. Also, all of this is going to be over multiple lines because we have a couple of values in here. Besides the pos vars, I also want to get the zoom, which has a zoom default. Finally, I want to have the lip. The default value for this one is going to be flip options with the value zero. These are the values I want to set. Also, let me clean this up a tiny bit. That looks a bit better. I suppose if I organize it like this, this is the most readable. These things are a bit subjective. But now I have to create some kind of logic to capture all of these arguments. 
This is going to happen inside of panels. This one is going to need an asterisk and then arcs. You could name it whatever you want, but arcs is what people usually call it. Once we have that, first of all, I have to create super dunder init, set the master to the parent. Also, we're going to need some kind of text. Let's call it revert. Also, we have to pack this revert button. Since all of these panels are simply using pack, this one, for example, we can use pack for this one as well, with the one difference that I want to set the side to bottom. To give it a tiny bit of padding, I want to have pad Y and set this to 10. This should actually already work. Let's try. I can open main.py again. And now at the bottom, we have revert. It doesn't do anything right now, but at the very least, we have something. What we now have to figure out is how to get the variables via this arcs and then update the value. To demonstrate what we have inside of arcs, let me just print it. If I now run main.py again, open image, otter, you can see we have a tkinter var somewhere in our memory, and then we have the value. For example, this first entry is the rotation variable and rotate default is the zero. This is going to bring us to the exercise. When clicking on the button, get the variables and set the value to the default. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out. First of all, we have to make sure that we can run some kind of function when we are clicking on this button or when the user is clicking on the button. For that, I want to have command. I will call the method I want to call revert. To create this one, I need define revert without any custom parameters. Next up, we have to make sure that we have access to the arcs inside of the revert method, which we don't have right now. To account for that, I want to create an attribute. Let's simply call it the arcs. This is going to be arcs. With that, I can use them inside of a for loop. I want for var and value in self dot arcs. What this is going to give me, let me print it. I want to print the var and I want to get the value. Let's try it again. Open image, otter. By default, we can't see anything, but if I click on the button, we are getting the variable and the value. That is looking really good, which means now back in the revert button, I can simply use the var and then set the value. We are targeting the var, then we are using set, and then we are assigning the value to the var. That's literally it. I can get rid of the exercise text back in main.py, run all of this again, change a couple of values, and now if I click on revert, we are back to normal. Although there's one more change that we do have to make. You might have seen it already. These numbers here don't work out anymore. Let's have a look what's going wrong. Back in the panels, the revert button is working just fine, so I can minimize it. But if I open the slider panel, the issue for this one is that we are only updating the text, the text to display what number we have, when we are moving the slider from this command. If we're updating the value in any other way, this method is not going to be run. As a consequence, the number doesn't update. To account for that, we have to make a couple of changes. First of all, I want to store the data var inside of an attribute, which means self.dataVar is going to be data var. Once I have that, I want to use tracing. Data var dot Trace. I want to check when the value is changing. Then I want to call self.updateText. Because of that, we have to update this update text. I don't want to have value anymore. Instead, I want to have arcs. Because once again, when we are calling a method using the trace method, then trace is going to automatically add a couple of arcs. Although we're not going to use them, but you do have to add a parameter. Because of this logic, we don't need this command anymore. 
for the simple reason that the variable is still attached to the CTK slider, which means when we are using the slider, this data var is going to be updated. Although to be a bit more consistent here with the naming, let me call it self.datavar. Which means what is going to happen? When the user is using the slider, the slider updates the variable. Because of this update, this trace method is going to be triggered, which triggers this method, which is then going to update the label. On top of that, what is much more important, when I'm now clicking on revert button, and we are updating the value inside of this for loop, this update text is also going to run. It is going to run every time we are updating the variable. Although before we can run it, I have to make one more change. This bit here is not going to work anymore because we don't have value. Instead, I want to get self.datavar.get. Now all of this should be working. Let's try. I want to open the image, get the otter, apply rotation. All of that is still working just fine. And now if I click on revert, we are all back to zero and zero. With that, we have the proper logic. The last thing we have to do is to use this revert button for the other frames as well. For example, the color frame needs a revert button. Let me copy in the values actually, otherwise you have to watch me type for ages. I want to have these four tuples, color vars and brightness with brightness default. Then we have grayscale, invert, vibrance, all with the default value. Finally, for the effect frame, I want to have the revert button again with self. After that, the tuples I want to pass in this one are these ones. Let me format them a tiny bit better. There we go. We have effect was blur, blur default, effect was contrast, contrast default, and effect was effect, effect options zero. This should be all we need. Now we can try the app, open the auto once again, rotation and zoom and invert should still work just fine. This is looking good. Next up color, I want to have black and white, more brightness and more vibrance. Now I can click on revert and we're all back to normal. Finally, I want to apply some blur and some contrast and find edges. Now you can't see anything anymore, so I want to revert all of this and we are back to the authors. Perfect. With that, we have the app itself. The last thing we have to figure out is how to export the image and then we have finished the entire thing. We are nearly done with the app. At this point, let me apply some changes. I want to have rotation and brightness, vibrance, doesn't really matter what it is. What I now want to do is to work on the export. For this one, we have two panels. I can type a name. Let's call it weird otters. I can also select JPEG or PNG. Depending on what I select, I am getting a preview of the file name. Importantly for this one, the user can type a space in the input field, but when we are outputting it, we're getting an underscore. This isn't actually necessary for Windows, but I think it's a nice thing to add here. Other than that, I can click on Explorer, select a folder, and then I get a preview of the folder. This can also be changed. For example, if I didn't want the desktop or anything in here, I could simply type whatever I want. Although this is not what I want, I want to work on the desktop. Once we have all of that, we can work on the export. Although for now, let's simply work on the panels and let's see how far we get. Back in the code, I want to work inside of the menu. For this one, we already have a position frame, a color frame and an effect frame. I want to add one more, which is going to be the export frame. This, just as before, is going to be a CTK frame. As a matter of fact, I can literally just copy most of the stuff from the effect frame because they're all quite similar. With this, we have an export frame. We do have to make sure that we are attaching it to the menu though. Also, we have to create it, which means export frame, self.tab and export. Although this one is not going to get a tkinter variable, which means the effect vars we can simply remove at least for now. 
With that, we have to populate this export frame with a couple of panels. This is going to happen inside of the panels. I want to minimize everything in here. First of all, let me put it below the switch panel. I want to create a class that I called file name panel. This is going to be just another panel. In here, I'm going to need a dunder init method. This one will need self, it will need a parent, and then we need two more things. I called them a name string and a file string. The name string is going to account for the name. The file string will be the file ending. This could either be JPEG or PNG. I will create those in just a second. Although first of all, I want to run super dunder init and set the parent to the parent. Now we have to figure out how to get the name string and the file string. So far, we created all of the variables in the app, specifically inside of the init parameters. All of these are important, but for this particular case, we don't need to go that far. We can create these variables in the export frame. For this one, I want to have self.name string. This one is going to be a CTK string var without a default value. Besides that, I want to have a self.file string, which is also going to be a CTK string var, although this one is going to get a default value of JPEG. Also, I should add comments here to organize all of this a bit better. Let's call this section the data, because next up, I also want to create widgets. The first widget we already have is the file name panel. Let me paste it in. We need self, we need self dot name string and self dot file string. With that, we have the tkinter variables for this one. Although those I want to turn into attributes, which means self dot file string is going to be the file string. Self dot name string is going to be the name string. Although name string should come first, that just feels better. You don't have to do it. Once we have the data, I want to create the widgets. We are going to need a CTK entry, which is going to need self. Then we need a text variable, which is going to be self dot name string. After we have that, I want to pack the entire thing. I want to fill X. I want to have pad X of 20 and pad Y of five. And let's actually run the entire thing to see if all of this is working. I now click on open image, otter, export, and there we have one panel with an entry field. We can also type in here, although it doesn't do anything at this point. Next up, I want to create two checkboxes. To draw all of this, this is going to be the panel. On the top right now, we have an entry field, the entry field we created here. Besides that, I want to have a frame below, which is going to contain two checkboxes. For that, we have to create a frame, which is going to contain the two checkboxes. I want to start by creating the frame, which is going to be a CTK frame. Self is going to be the parent. Also, I want to set the FG color to transparent. Next up, I want to create a CTK and CTK check box. The frame will be the parent. The text for this one is going to be JPEG. I guess I want to assign this to a variable. Let's call it the JPEG check. Next up, I want to get my JPEG check and pack the entire thing. Site needs to be left because I want to create a second one and they're supposed to be next to each other. I want to set fill to X. Finally, expand should be true. With that, we have one check button. I want to duplicate all of this because besides JPEG check, I also want to add PNG check. The text for this one is going to be PNG, although other than that, 
the pack method is going to work in exactly the same way. Finally, I want to pack this frame by setting expand to true, fill to x, and pad x to 20. With that, we should have the two switches. Let's try this one, water, export, and there we go. Right now, we can activate both. We are going to work on that in just a second. Before that, I want to add one more thing. Let me reopen the drawing. One thing I forgot all the way at the bottom of the widget is some kind of preview. So when we are typing into the field and select one of the boxes, the text field is going to give us a preview of what the final text is going to be like. This text I want to store in an attribute, let's call it output. It is going to be a CTK label. Self will be the parent and text is going to be nothing. This output text I want to pack right away without any arguments for the pack. Now with that, I can run all of this and we're not going to see it, but there's a tiny bit more space at the bottom of this panel. Which means at the very least we know that this output exists, but well, we're going to work with it. Also, as always, I want to add a few comments here to organize all of this better. Let's call this one the checkboxes for file format. Finally, I want to have the preview text. What I now want to work on is to connect this name string to the output, which basically means that in the name string, we could have a value like, I think I called it weird otter earlier, this inside of the output should become weird otter. Later on, when we account for the logic for these switches here, this is going to become dot PNG or JPEG, but this I'm going to not work on for now. To get that, I want to get myself dot name string and use trace once again. I want to check if this value changes. If that is the case, I want to run self.updateText, which means once again, I need a method called updateText with self and the args. In this method, I want to check if self.nameString.get actually exists. If it doesn't, there's no point doing any of this. If that is the case, I first of all want to get my text, which is going to be self name string dot get. Although right now this might have some white space. For example, we could have weird otter and I want to get rid of this bit here. Or more specifically, I want to replace it with an underscore. To get that, I want to add one more method, which is called replace. This replace wants two arguments. The first is the character we want to replace which in my case is an empty character. The second argument is the character we want to replace the value with, which in my case is an underscore. Once we have that, I simply have to get my output, the text we have created up here, and then configure it and set the text to the text we just created. With that, I can run main.py, click on open image, the otter, export, now I can type in here, we are getting some text. On top of that, if I now type weird otter, we are getting an underscore between the two words. That is a really good start. We have covered the first bit. Next up, we have to work on the checkboxes. Right now, we can check both of them, which is not what I want. To account for that, let me actually put them right next to each other. We have JPEG check, the widget, and then PNG check, also a widget. And below that, we are packing them. This way, it's easier to compare the two. This is important because both are going to get the same variable, which is going to be self.filestring. This right now would get us some weird results. To make all of this work properly, we are going to need an on value and an off value. Basically, for the JPEG widget, the on value is going to be JPEG, while the off value is going to be PNG. Whereas for the PNG check, 
the on value is going to be PNG, while the off value will be JPEG. That way, self.filestring can either be JPEG or PNG, and it will activate or deactivate one of these buttons. Although on top of that, we are going to need one more thing, and that is a command. The command I want to create is going to be a click. Although this click is going to need self and a value. The value we are going to get when we are calling the command. Because of that, we will need a lambda function. I want to use lambda self.click. Because of that logic, I can now pass in an argument. For the JPEG widget button, I want to have JPEG as the argument. For the PNG widget, I want to have PNG. And this is a really long line. I hope you could follow along. But now we are going to call the method click either with JPEG or with PNG. All I need for this one is self dot then the file string and set this to the value we have specified. The value we are getting from click, it could either be JPEG or PNG. After we have that, I want to call self dot update text again without any arguments. That way, we are going to update all of this. Although before that, let's actually try all of this. Open image, otter, export, and now JPEG and PNG will only ever active if the other is inactive. The reason why that is working is because they have these on and off values, which means when we are setting file string to JPEG, then JPEG is activated for this one and off for the other switch and then the other way around for PNG. Finally, the last thing that we have to work on is update text should also give us the file ending. We already have the text. I want to add a tiny bit at the end. I want to get self.filestring.get and that is literally it. Although I forgot one thing, there needs to be a dot between the two, which means I simply want to add a string dot between the two. With that, we should be good to go. If I now run main.py one more time, otter, export, by default, nothing is going to be visible. However, once I type some text, we get JPEG and we get PNG. Also, if I add a space multiple times, this is working just fine. Cool. With that, we have the first panel. This was the more complicated one. I can minimize it now. Next up, we are going to need a class file path panel. Once again, this is going to be a panel. We are going to need a dunder init method with self. We need a parent and then we need a path string. This path string I want to create inside of the export frame. Once we have that, Inside of the file path panel, I want to open a file dialog and then select a folder. All of this is going to be your exercise. What I want you guys to do is this bit here. Number one, I want you guys to create a path string variable in the export frame and pass it to this widget. We already have the parameter, so this you should be using. Next up, add a button and an entry field to this widget. Finally, when you click on the button, you should get a file dialog that will return the path as a string. I have already done this earlier, so check this bit out. Finally, the entry field should display the return path. I suppose I should show you the final thing is going to look like this. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out. Let's work on it together. First of all, number one, we have to create the path string variable. This happens inside of menu. I want self.path string. This is going to be a CTK string var without any default value. Once we have that, I want to create a file path panel. This needs self for the parent and then self.path string. With that, we can work inside of the class. The entire first bit is covered. Although I should also add the super dunder init method, 
with the parent as the parent so that we have some functionality. Besides that, I also want to turn the path string into an attribute, meaning path string is going to be the path string. Next up, and let me reorganize all of this a tiny bit. I want to add a button and an entry field, which means I want to have a CTK button with self as the parent, the text I called open explorer. That is all we need for now. And I want to pack this thing with a pad Y of five. Besides that, I want to have a CTK entry widget with self. This I want to pack right away as well. I want to set expand to true, fill to both. Finally, pad X should be five and pad Y should also be five. This covers the second bit. What I did forget was the colon after the dunder init method. And I think at this point, it's a good idea to check if all of this is even working. Since we can see some widgets, there is at the very least something. Inside of export, we now have open explorer and an entry field, although neither is doing anything right now. For that, we have to work on the third part. All of this is going to happen inside of a method. I want to open file dialog. This one itself and no other argument. What this one is going to do is going to be quite similar compared to the image import. For this one, we're getting a file dialog and ask open file. Although for this one, we have to import from the Kinter file dialog. This I want to copy and paste at the top below my custom tkinter import. Now we can use it. I want to get my file dialog dot ask. This one is called directory. And at this point, I realize I didn't teach you this bit. You only knew about where is it? Ask open file. The difference between these two is that ask open file is asking for a specific file, whereas ask directory is only looking for a folder. Sorry about that. I should have mentioned it. But other than that, this one is working in the same way. This open file dialog I want to call whenever we are pressing the button, which means the button is going to get a command self dot open file dialog. Let's try that one. I can click on open image, otter, export and open explorer. And there we go. We are opening a file dialog. What is really important about this one is that now we are clicking on select folder. We are not selecting a specific image anymore. You can tell because in the desktop, we cannot see the images we created earlier. There's no otter or weird otter in here because right now we are only looking at folders, not files, which is perfect for my purposes. The last thing I have to do is to capture the string or the path that is being returned by this ask directory. All I have to do for that is self.pathString.set and then whatever we get returned from ask directory. To connect this to the entry widget, I want to set a text variable and this should be self.pathString. This is going to cover the third bit of the exercise. Let's try all of that. I want to open the image, otter, export, open explorer. I want to select my desktop and there we go. I have the path to my desktop. On top of that, I can type a name in here, weird otter with the file ending. And with that, I have a file name and a path so for the next video, we can export this image. I'll see you there. Righty, this is going to be the last video for this project. Let me apply a couple of changes. I want to have rotation, zoom, invert, and let's add a bit of vibrance and blur. Now I have a changed image. This I want to export. For that, we already have the name panel. For the name, I want to go with last otter. I want to export a JPEG file, then I want to open the Explorer, save all of this on the desktop. And what I want to do for this video is implement the save button, which means if I click on save, we have the file exported, which means if I open the folder for the desktop, now we have the last otter. This is then finishing up the project. I guess you could implement some kind of message that the image was saved, but you can work on this yourself. It's not that important for this project. 
Back in the code, I want to work inside of my app class, because this one contains the image itself. To export it, I want to create another method. I call this one export image. This one is going to need three arguments besides self, obviously. We need a name, we need a file, and we need a path. All three of those we are getting from the menu because in the export frame, we have a name string, a file string, and a path string. Those we want to use to export the image. The way I want to use them is I want to create an export string. This is just going to be an F string where I'm connecting the path, then a slash, then I am adding the file name. After that, I have a dot, and then we have the file ending. I suppose the best way to demonstrate what this one is doing is to actually call export image. This we can do by going into import image, the method, because this one creates the menu all the way at the bottom. This is going to get another argument, which will be self.export image. With that, inside of the menu, we can add another parameter, which is going to be export image. This export image, I want to pass right through to the export frame. I just have to copy it in. Now we are good to go for the menu. With that, in the export frame, we can have the export image as another parameter. Although the issue right now is that we don't have a button that can execute this method. This I want to create inside of panels. Let's do it below the revert button. Let me add a tiny bit of white space. I want to create a class that I'm calling save button. This is going to be a CTK button, meaning CTK and button. We are as always starting with a dunder init method. We need self and we need a parent. After that, we also want to capture the export image method. Finally, to make the export image work, we have to get the three string vars, name string, file string, and path string, which means for the parameters, I want to have a name string, a file string, and a path string. Once we have that, I can get the super dunder init method, pass in the master, which is going to be the parent. Next up, we have to specify some kind of text. I simply called this one save. For the last thing, we are going to need a command. I called this one self.save. This method we can create right away. Define, save, with self and nothing else. This method is supposed to execute export image. Although for that, it needs to have access to it via the attributes. To achieve that, I want to create an export image attribute, which is going to get the export image method. That allows me to self.export image and call this thing. Although now we are going to need three arguments. Inside of main.py, we can see the actual method. We need the parameter for a name, for a file, and for the path. I approach this by creating three more attributes, self.name string is going to be name string and self.file string is going to be the file string. Finally, self.path string is going to be the path string. That way I have access to everything I need. All I have to do now is get self.name string. Also do not forget the get. Then we need self.file string.get and for the last one self.path string.get. This is going to give us the button. With that, back inside of menu.py, we can, at the bottom of the widgets, create the save button. This one needs self for the parent. Then we are going to need the export image, which we have. It is the export image. We are getting this from the parameters. After that, we need self.name string, then self.file string and self.path string. Although while I am looking at it, there's one important thing missing. We're not placing this button. 
This we can change quite easily. All we need is self.pack. The site, importantly here, needs to be bottom. Besides that, I want to have pad Y being 10. But with that, we have the panels and inside of export frame, we also have the save button. If I run main.py, I can open an image, click on the author, then inside of export, I can type some text, choose whatever file ending I want, open the explorer, get the file, and now on the bottom, we have a save button. If I click on it, nothing is happening. And I can also tell you why. It is because I'm not printing the export string. Let's try all of this again by actually printing the export string so we can see something. Sorry about that. Export, some gibberish, open explorer, select folder, now save. And there we go. The path you can see printed right now is a combination of the path, the name, and the file. Path is the first bit, all of this bit here. Next up, we have the slash. This we are adding for this one. Then we have the name. This one's quite straightforward. Finally, we are adding a dot and the file itself. The dot is this one, the file is this one. This is all we are going to need to export the image. The last command that we are going to need for this one is going to be self.image.save. This one simply wants to have an export string, the one we just created. Since we also have the file ending, it is either going to export a PNG or a JPEG file, depending on what the user specified. And, well, this is all we need. If I run this app again, click on the author, I can make a few more changes. Let's say for this one, I want to have some really vibrant authors that are inverted. I want to export, let's call them the disco authors on the desktop. Also, this should be a PNG file. If I now click on save, nothing happened, at least on the surface. However, if I open the desktop, we have some disco authors. Also, this is a PNG file and it looks like we applied all of the effects, which means this is working just fine. I guess you can work a bit more on all of the logic here to maybe clear the fields, but I think for all practical purposes, we have finished this app.